Hi guys, uh, this is Campanilla Revision Marathon. As you can see, this is for almost like 11 and a half plus hours, almost close to 12 hours. So this marathon is be being handled by DV Subramaniam sir, our rest of faculty. By the way, please listen to this introduction, just this three, four minutes of my introduction for sure without failure. So I'm going to explain you what is covered in this marathon, all that. <clears throat> so anyhow, you know that at CA Inter, company law is having a weightage of 60 marks and with choice like excluding other laws only company law with choice like paper is for the paper entirely is for 120 marks right so company law will be approximately will be tested for 65 to 70 sometimes 75 marks also of the paper will be tested for company law so in this we are covering entire syllabus except two chapters so these two chapters we are not covering that is prospectus topic we are not covering another topic that we didn't cover is audit and auditors getting it audit and auditors you can watch my marathon audit marathon is there right so you just watch my audit marathon you can just simply search CR Harsha company audit like that you search you will find some video that itself is more than enough <clears throat> prospectus chapter we are not covering rest entire syllabus entire all entire whatever the chapters that you have dividend you know accounts of companies like management and administration incorporation you know even the basic concepts to company law everything the share capital charges deposits everything is covered getting it and believe me if you watch this marathon you will get like complete comprehensive clarity you will feel like a comprehensive revision on this company law and same faculty with the DV Subramaniam sir, we already uploaded other loss marathon for May 23. In other loss, there were no amendments. So that marathon also you can find in the same playlist. You, you just go to, you know, YouTube. <coughs> yes, like uh, if you open this YouTube, uh, you will find here. So my YouTube channel, see Ram Parsha. So inside this playlist, if you open, inside this playlist, if you open. So November 2023 marathon. So see and other loss marathon is there. It's costing we have uploaded, GST marathon we have uploaded, audit we have uploaded, FM is coming, even income tax marathon also coming this week. Getting it? So that's about company law. Now remember, this marathon is inclusive of amendments. We are even covering amendments itself. In fact, this marathon is taken from our PDF, which is finalized for the new scheme. Because company law is same, no, whether it is old scheme or new scheme. So you can download here PDF resources. You can download PDF resources here. Just open our website, rest of CACMA.com. If you open our website, you can download there the PDF. And even alternatively, if at all you're an app student, already if at all you're watching any class on the applications, rest application, like you, there's a Play Store app, rest of a CACMA. Inside that also, you can download this material. Getting it. So here, if you just click group one, so you will find it here. And the network was little poor. Yes. And you see here, new scheme paper 2. So module 1, module 2 and other laws. Getting it. Or even old scheme, if you, old scheme if you open paper 2 company law. So you can you can even download this. I think all of our existing rest of students are using this particular material. Okay. In this, you will find all the amendments at the last. As a separate, uh, you know, chapter. So in this, you will find amendments completely at last. You see here, there is a last folder. Getting it. Only from this material, this entire marathon has been taken. The PDF is free. Anybody can download and use. Or alternatively, we have given new scheme material also PDF, which where company law that is amended provision. So where amendment is not discussed separately, it's amended in the main provision itself. So in the marathon, we have used this material. Whether you are following this material or this material doesn't make any difference. Just that in this amendment is already included. Here amendment is discussed separately. But believe me, whatever it is, you will understand it very well. Okay, so please make use of this marathon. Uh, do well, all the very best. And Subramaniam sir will take you very in a realistic way. You can you can see a lot of difference between the law which you know and after seeing to this class, believe me, you will understand in a different dimension for sure. Okay, all the very best. Have a nice time. And continue watching the Subramaniam sir class. Hello students. Welcome to Stress of a CNCMA. Myself, DV Subramaniam, Chartered Accountant and faculty for corporate and other loss paper at CA inter level. This video lecture is all about marathon of corporate loss. For other loss, I made separate video which is already available in YouTube and that video lecture is sufficient for upcoming CA inter examinations. Under corporate loss, we are having 10 topics. From examination point of view, you can expect minimum 4 marks and maximum 8 marks from each and every 
topic particularly if you look at small chapters like preliminary deposits charges dividends four topics roughly you will read some 20 sections and in examination you can expect 20 marks from these small topics so don't ignore these small topics clear and the first topic of our marathon lecture is preliminary under preliminary chapter we are having two sections section 1 is all about applicability of companies act section 2 is all about uh, definitions so let's look into section 1 applicability of companies act first of all what is meant by company company means company incorporated under companies act 2013 or any previous company law under previous company law you can observe companies act 1956 companies act 1913 companies act 1882 and companies act 1866 that means if your association if your association if it is incorporated under present companies act 2013 or incorporated under companies act 1956 or incorporated under companies act 1913 or 1882 or 1866 yes our companies act 2013 is applicable to all these associations it is immaterial whether you are incorporated under previous company law or present companies act so simply companies act is applicable to all new companies which are incorporated under new act as well as old companies which are incorporated under previous company laws and our provisions of companies act also applicable to banking companies insurance companies generation or supply of electricity companies however if there is any conflict between banking regulation act and companies act insurance regulatory development authority of india act and companies act electricity companies act and companies act in that case you have to follow special provisions simply you know you have to follow respect to provisions of respect to acts simple rule conflict between general rule and special rule always special rule overrides general rule yes or no this point i explained in general clauses act also best example schedule 3 financial statements as well as accounting standards you know every company is required to prepare financial statements according to schedule 3 as well as accounting standards however banking companies insurance companies generation or supply of electricity companies are not required to comply schedule 3 as well as accounting standards but still those financial statements can express true and fair view next one companies incorporated under separate statutes or special acts like life insurance corporation state bank of india and our institute institute of chartered accountants of india all these associations had special statutes these associations came into picture because of those uh, statutes now whether companies act applicable to these statutory companies you now which were incorporated under separate statutes the answer is yes next one notified body corporates notified body corporate example foreign company foreign company comes under the definition of body corporate foreign company means what company incorporated outside india and having place of business in india whether physically or electronically yes or no a body corporate definition if you look at body corporate definition body corporate includes company incorporated outside india under companies act 2013 there is a separate chapter ma you know <clears throat> it starts from section 379 ends with uh, section 393 so these sections are applicable to foreign company is it clear so it is all about applicability of companies act 2013 next one yes of course area point of view it is applicable to whole of india next uh, definitions definitions important definition private company and small company subsidiary company these three definitions are very very important from examination point of view private company small company subsidiary company so first i'll start with private company come on students tell me what is meant by private company a company with minimum two members and it should have minimum paid up share capital as may be prescribed till date no order from government of india with respect to paid up share capital so minimum two members are required fine next 
its articles of association should contain three clauses first one restricts restricts transfer of shares to protect the privacy to provide confidentiality of private matters so there is a restriction on transfer of shares next uh, limits number of members to 200 next one prohibits prohibits public offer prohibits public offer many students you know in examination they are they're writing wrong points ma no they are writing like this prohibits transfer of shares transfer of shares is permitted but with some restrictions it is not prohibited any member if he want to transfer his share yes he can transfer subject to board approval so first he need to write his willingness to transfer his shares you know he need to share his idea of transfer with board of directors then board of directors will permit you to transfer shares to the existing members if existing members are not willing to take your shares then offer shall be made to the persons known to board of directors at a price fixed by the board of directors and certified by the company auditor so following these restrictions transfer of shares is permitted it is not prohibited it is permitted next sir, limits the number of members to 200 while counting 200 two conditions you need to satisfy one is joint shareholding if you observe joint shareholders you should not count them you know according to their number you should count them as one suppose 10 members holding one or more shares jointly under a single share certificate then you should not count them as 10 you should treat them as one next one employees 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 who became members during their employment whether present employees or past employees but if they become if they become members during their employment then you have to exclude them while counting for the purpose of 200 next uh, private company name itself is selling private private so this association should not invite public to get share in the ownership of company so it is prohibited from making public offers clear next one coming to public company coming to public company public company definition is very simple a company which is not private company which is not private company and it should have a paid up share capital you know minimum paid up share capital as may be prescribed and very simple here transfer of shares permitted freely um, i mean members can transfer their shares freely without any restriction and coming to the members no limit no limit on number of members unlimited it can have unlimited members and coming to public offer yes permitted the so public company transfer of shares permitted public offer permitted limit on number of members there is no limit and this is one part of definition of public company there is another part of uh, definition that is any company whether it is a public company or private company if it is subsidiary to public company if it is subsidiary to public company then also it becomes a public company you know deemed public company have you heard about it deemed public company deemed public company means what any private company or public company if it is subsidiary to public company then it is deemed to be a public company it is immaterial whether its articles of association contain the, these three clauses you are a subsidiary to public company you will be a public company clear everyone so with this private and public company definitions we completed next one small company small company two to three times this topic was tested in examination small company on what basis you know one can categorize a company as a small company very simple see first of all it should satisfy three conditions condition number one not a public company it should not be a public company that means always a private company condition number two paid up share capital shall not exceed four crores third condition turnover turnover during preceding financial year preceding financial year very very important word remember preceding financial year the turnover of the company shall not exceed 
40 crores if all these three conditions are satisfied then we can call a company as a small company and we need to check these limits every year ma every year suppose in the financial year 2022-23 the company paid up share capital is 1 crore and turnover is uh, 10, uh, 10 crores for example 10 crores now coming to financial year 23-24 yes this is a small company this is a small company and coming to financial year 2023-24 turnover increased to 50 crores turnover went up to 50 crores now for financial year for financial year 2024-25 it is not a small company so for each and every year you need to check the status of small company how to check sir go to preceding financial year financial statements preceding financial year financial statements if turnover is less than or equal to 40 crores if paid up share capital is less than or equal to 4 crores then of course it should not be a public company then you can call it as a small company now coming to financial year 24 25 paid up share capital same there is no change 1 crore turnover fall into 10 crores sir turnover fall into 10 crores now with respect to financial year 2025 26 whether the company is treated as a small company or not a small company come on come on students respond is it a small company or not a small company the answer is yes it is a small company so don't come to a conclusion once lost forever lost wrong generally you know once small company status lost always lost it is a wrong statement every year every preceding financial year you have to check into the figures of turnover as well as paid up share capital if they are within the limits now coming to current year it will be a small company or else it is not a small company understood everyone now being a small company it had many advantages coming to financial statements no need to re no need to prepare cash flow statement cash flow statement is not required under financial statements next rotation of auditors is also not applicable that means a company can have a, a single person as an auditor for you know 10 years 15 years 20 years there is no problem and next one annual returns it is sufficient a single director signing annual return no need of company secretary signature annual returns next one caro not applicable you all know caro yes or no so many privileges many privileges small company is having today the only reason reducing compliance cost so that it encourages many associations to come and register under companies act 2013 then you know government of india definitely will have a control on these associations or else many associations will do business under a partnership type of organization where registration is not mandatory and then government can't have control on them so in order to get control over such associations this is like a, an encouragement provision understood everyone and one point i ignored i missed that is small company you know following companies are not treated as small companies five companies we are having public company is not a small company holding company is not a small company subsidiary company is not a small company companies registered under section 8 you know company with charitable objects not a small company and companies registered under separate statutes simply you know i call them as statutory companies so these five entities are not treated as small companies even though they satisfy paid up share capital limits and uh, turnover limits that's it all about small company everyone next uh, holding subsidiary associate companies holding subsidiary associate companies holding company definition very very easy we can call a company as holding company if it had subsidiary companies any company having subsidiary or subsidiary companies we can call that company as holding company now coming to subsidiary company coming to subsidiary company a company can be treated as subsidiary company if it satisfy either of these two conditions either of these two conditions condition number one control over composition of board of directors control over composition of 
composition of board of directors so composition of board of directors means what you know you all know maximum in a company 15 directors you can have maximum in a, any type of company whether it is a private one person or public company maximum a company can have 15 directors of course you can increase this limit by passing special resolution and by making a alteration to articles of association okay so max to max it can have 15 directors now control over composition of board of directors means more than half of the directors more than half of the directors now if you look at 15 you know more than half means 8 8 out of 15 directors if another company is having a control control means how sir you know removal power appointment power if these powers are vested with another company then another company is treated as holding company our entity is called a subsidiary company to this to that holding company are you all getting my point students so control over composition of directors that means you know if a, an entity is having if a if a body corporate or if a company is having composition you know if a body corporate or any other company is having control over composition of board of directors then this entity is treated as subsidiary company that company is treated as holding company next condition number two condition number two possess not less than or simply more than half of total voting power of course voting power comes from equity share capital only i agree with you i agree with you so if you possess if your entity if your company possess more than or simply not less than half of the total voting power then this entity will be subsidiary company and holding company you know which hold more than half of the total voting power this type of control you know it can be exercised in three ways one is direct the other one is indirect the next one combination combination i'll tell you example just see ma a limited is having 60 percent of voting power in b limited now b limited is a subsidiary of a limited Director subsidiary. Next, B Limited is holding 54% voting power of uh, C Limited. Now, C Limited is subsidiary to B Limited as well as C Limited is subsidiary to A Limited. You know, now C Limited is controlled by A indirectly. How? A is controlling B and B will control C. Finally, C is under control of uh, A. Understood? The entity controlling other entity, we call it as holding company. And controlled company we call it as subsidiary entity subsidiary company understood so total indirect next one a limited is holding 60 percent of voting power in b limited and 40 percent in c limited this b limited is holding another 25 percent of c limited now if you observe in c limited general meeting who can attend a limited representative as well as B limited representative. B is already under the control of A limited, yes or no? So now B will listen to A and B limited will cast vote according to the will and wish of A limited only. So now A limited is having 40% control in C limited, B limited is having 25% control in C limited. Finally, 65% control A limited is having in C limited. Now C limited is also treated as subsidiary to A limited, subsidiary to a limited are you all getting my point students everyone everyone so c limited is a subsidiary to a limited this is you know direct and indirect combination and i forgot to tell you one point ma suppose me individual me individual holding 60 percent paid up share capital or 60 percent voting power in Reliance Industry Limited. Now, can you call Reliance Industry Limited uh, as a subsidiary to V? The answer is no. Why? I am an individual. I am not a body corporate. So, holding company status will be given to company and company includes body corporate. So, if an individual is holding more than 50% of voting power, you can't call individual as a holding company. Company means company incorporated under Companies Act 2013 or previous company law. I am an individual. I am a natural person. I am not an artificial person. Are you getting my point? So here there arises no holding and subsidiary relationship. 
in order to call a uh, entity as a holding company it should be either a company or body corporate understood next uh, associate company associate company very simple ma we can call one company as an associate to another company if that another company is having significant influence what kind of influence significant influence sir significant influence means how much sir at least 20% of voting power if a company is having at least 20% of voting power in another company then this company becomes associated company now if you observe sir 60% is also more than 20% no sir yes that means you know if a company is holding 60% of voting power in a, our entity then will it become associate company or subsidiary company subsidiary so that clarification is provided ma all associate companies exclude subsidiary companies all associate companies exclude associate companies so simply just observe 20% but less than or equal to 50 percent 20 percent of total voting power total voting power so 20 percent of voting power 50 percent of voting power so minimum 20 minimum 20 maximum 50 in that case there arises associate company relationship what relationship associate company relationship now 50 and above so simply not sorry sorry it's not 50 and above more than 50 percent and up to up to 99.999 percentage there are just holding subsidiary relationship if it is equal to 100 percent then there are just wholly owned subsidiary what kind of company wholly owned subsidiary 100 percent owned by another entity clear and one special point associate company includes a joint venture companies is it clear everyone everyone okay fine so with this uh, major important definitions we covered we completed so private company public company small company you now very recently small company figures have been enhanced so paid up share capital to 4 crores and turnover to 40 crores holding subsidiary and then associate company also we completed and one special point special point how to remember you know if a examiner want to twist a question we want to pro give tricky questions then you know there is a chance of asking questions like this so one such question I already explained, you know, one year paid up share capital, you know, turnover crossed 40 crores. The another period, you know, the another financial year, other financial year, it is within the limit. So small company status will be lost forever or once again a small company. Like that one, one topic I explained. Another one, fiduciary capacity. Other topic, fiduciary capacity. While determining holding subsidiary relationship, while determining uh, associate company relationship, shares held by these entities in a fiduciary capacity. What capacity? Fiduciary capacity shall not be considered. Means what? Suppose, suppose A limited company is there, B limited company is there. A limited is holding 46% of voting power in B limited okay sir managing director of a limited is personally holding some 10 percent voting power in uh, b limited personal holding ma it's not a uh, uh, you know on behalf of a limited it's not a representative relationship it's a personal relationship managing director out of his personal funds he invested in b limited and it constitute 10 percent voting power so a limited is holding 46 percent voting power Managing director is holding 10% voting power. Okay. One day, he got heart attack and he is going to die. He called his lawyer, advocate and he prepared a will. According to this will, his son till 
he attains age of majority you no know, 21 years 18 years i know but in some cases 21 years till his son attains 21 years of age all my properties you know all his properties will be under the control of a limited so simply a limited is going to act as a legal representative of yes a guardian a legal guardian how long till son attains age of 21 years because of this will now a limited is holding 46% of voting power directly as well as 10% voting power on behalf of uh, managing director you know deceased managing director according to the will now sir can i add this to can i write 56% voting power is having with a limited so a limited is a holding company b limited is a subsidiary company is it correct the answer is no shares held in a fiduciary capacity shall not be considered for the purpose of uh, checking holding and subsidiary relationship are you all getting my point and similar rule is also applicable here company as well as associate company status everyone next up and we had one more important definition that is government company government company so government company means what now it's a company in which central government alone state government or state governments alone or sometimes central government as well as state government as well as state governments put together hold at least 51% of paid up share capital then this company becomes government company this is one part of government company definition the other part if any company is a subsidiary to government company subsidiary to government company then this company is also deemed to be government company so two conditions ma either of these conditions if it is satisfied then we call it as government company first one at least 51% of paid up share capital is held by central government alone or state government or state government companies alone or you know combination of these all governments then we call the entity as government company and any company if it is subsidiary to government company then we call it as government company suppose central government is holding 56% of voting power in indian oil corporation limited now indian oil corporation limited is automatically a government company and iocl is holding for example you know 52% of voting power in a limited now a limited is also a government company understood everyone sir how can we identify government companies very simple if it is a central government company you know in sin corporate identity number you can observe goi in state government companies you can see sgc state government companies in sin you can observe these three words looking at these three words you can come to a conclusion whether it is a government company or not a government company clear and next one you can see you know company limited by shares company limited by guarantee company unlimited unlimited companies so what is the concept of uh, these companies very simple on the basis of liability companies are classified into three types limited by shares here each and every member is liable to the extent of unpaid value multiplied by number of shares held by the person so how many shares i am holding 20 shares what is unpaid value 2 rupees 20 into 2 rupees 40 rupees is my maximum liability and suppose you know my colleague my neighbor is holding 2000 shares 2000 shares into 2 rupees 4000 is maximum liability understood so in the event of liquidation a deficit some simply if assets are not in a position to meet liabilities so assets less than liabilities there is a deficit sir you know deficit amount or unpaid value whichever is lower is the maximum liability of members understood and there is no concept of joint and several liability each and every member is liable for his own share not for other shares under partnership firms you know each and every partner is liable not only for his share but also for other partners also sr no so there is no concept of joint and several liability under company limited by shares as well as under company limited by guarantee 
unlimited companies you know in the event of liquidation and if assets are not in a position to meet liabilities now not only business assets but also personal assets are held liable to the business liabilities so members personal assets are also responsible to company liabilities clear where this i completed preliminary topic preliminary chapter completed next one incorporation of company and matters incidental there to 20 sections we are going to cover section 3 to section 22 section 3 to section 22 examination point of view you can expect six marks and very very important from practice point of view those who choose practice as their career this chapter is very important you can earn minimum 15 to 20 thousand for each and every company in corporation clear so examination point of view important from career point of view very 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 important the first topic is concept of promoter concept of promoter who is a promoter ma so we had a definition promoter promoter the person who falls under this any of these three categories any of these three categories we call him as promoter one is who has been named as promoter in the prospectus or annual return so company before making public offer it is required to prepare a document called prospectus in prospectus company has to disclose the details of the promoters if your name is mentioned as a promoter in the prospectus you will be the promoter of company and every company is required to file annual returns with roc in that annual returns you can find the details of promoters if your name is written as promoter in the annual returns then you will be promoter of that company next one one who has control over affairs of the company either as a member or as a director or any other character any other character you know simply your creditor financer banker who is having control over entity according to an agreement executed between company and uh, you know uh, creditor suppose you know our association required funds and one person agreed to provide finance and he put one condition any key decision in the company before you implement the decision you have to take my approval so my prior approval is required to implement any new business policy now i'm not a member of the company i'm not a director of the company still i had control over affairs of the company so i'll be treated as promoter so promoter by way of name will be a promoter by way of having control will be the promoter next one next one shadow promoter shadow see on whose advices instructions directions on whose advices instructions directors the board of directors are accustomed to act accustomed to act in that case that person is also treated as promoter that person is also treated as promoter however under this third category one person is excluded that excluded person is professional professional Sima. Business people know how to do business. They don't know the provisions of Companies Act, Income Tax Act, etc., etc., etc. So every month he is asking me, sir, what to do this month? I told you, okay, this is the month of September. You need to conduct general meeting. You need to prepare financial statements. And those financial statements should get audited. And those financial statements should be approved in the general meeting. So according to my advisors, instructions, director, directions, the directors are following. The directors are implementing. Now, sir, can you call me as a promoter? No, I'm a professional. So, any professional rendering services in professional capacity, as long as he render uh, services in professional capacity, he is not treated as a promoter, as a professional, he is excluded from the definition of promoter. Of course, in additional to professional services, if I render any business services, if I render any management services to that person, sir, you, you should go to that place, you should uh, get permissions like this. You have to dig this much quantity. You have to sell this much quantity to this supplier. That means, you know, business advices, business strategies. If I'm rendering those services and advices, then I'll be treated as promoter. Very simple definition. 
named as a promoter in prospectus or annual return control over efforts of the company as a member or director or otherwise or on whose advices instructions directions the board of directors are accustomed to follow then these persons shall be treated as promoters clear everyone next one section 3 section 3 so section 3 is all about formation of company so here we are having two topics section 3 and 3a section 3 formation of company so before you form company a company act is giving you three options what which uh, you have to select uh, one option opc private public coming to opc members you know minimum opc one member private company two public company seven and maximum it is not prescribed under section 3 my it is prescribed under respect to acts suppose if you look at section 3 opc maximum one person private company section 2 clause 68 is clearly mentioning a point max to max the number of members are limited to 200 and public company unlimited okay sir what about directors sir directors you know minimum one in opc two in case of private company three in case of public company sir maximum yeah maximum in all companies you know 15 directors they can have 15 directors okay sir a selected private company sir okay once again you know three options will be enabled once again sir what are those three options you have to choose whether you need company limited by shares ha huh? limited by guarantee okay uh, next uh, unlimited companies so you have to select one option sir i'll go with limited by shares okay so this is all about section 3 formation of company yes of course opc is there i'll tell you now oh, section 3a no breach of condition of minimum number of members so what i told you public company minimum it should have seven members so this condition i should satisfy not only at the time of incorporation but also subsequent to incorporation that means as long as i do business under company type of organization i should have minimum seven members suppose if number of members fallen below 7 then what is the consequence sir what is the consequence imagine seven members are there you know imagine a b c d e f g or seven members of public company f g working abroad ma you know f is working in france g is working in germany this company is incorporated some 5 years back no on 1st april 2020 you know covid pandemic happened yes or no covid pandemic is there because of this pandemic you know mr d and mr d e deceased they expired now as on 1st april 2020 how many members are there in company five members are there fg they don't know about the death of d and e they are innocent they don't know the death of d and e only a b c these people came to know that company is having a less number of members less than seven members okay now you know uh, law maker is giving you six months time not six days six months from the date of reduction of number of members six months time you are giving you so by 1st october 2020 this five should be increased to seven if you do this no problem Sir, that association failed to increase number of members from five to seven, sir. Acha. From this point onwards, there is no concept of corporate bill. Separate legal entity is ignored. As long as separate legal entity is there, company is liable for its uh, acts. Uh, members are not liable for company acts. Are you getting my point? So till this point, company is liable for any debts, any obligations up to this point, company is liable. subsequent to this date you know it's not company members not all members you know only a b c simply you know members who are aware of the fact who are having the knowledge technical word cognizant cognizant of fact that you know company is doing business with reduced number of members only those people are held liable for the debts obligations subsequent to expiry of 6 months from date of reduction of number of members oh my god 
अरे एग्जाम्पल सपोज यू नो अप टू दिस डेट कंपनी डेट्स आर यू नो थर्टी क्रोर्स ड्यूरिंग दिस सिक्स मंथ्स यू नो कंपनी इनका एडिशनल डेट ऑफ फाइव क्रोर्स एंड ड्यूरिंग दिस पीरियड ड्यूरिंग दिस पीरियड कंपनी इनका एडिशनल डेट ऑफ सिक्स क्रोर्स नो अप टू हियर टोटल डेट इज थर्टी फाइव क्रोर्स फॉर दिस थर्टी फाइव क्रोर्स यू नो कंपनी इज पर्सनली लाइबल एंड सब्सिक्वेंट टू एक्सपायरी ऑफ सिक्स मंथ्स यू नो वॉट एवर एडिशनल डेट्स इज देर यू नो सिक्स क्रोर्स For the six crores company is not liable, you know, Mr. A, Mr. B, Mr. C personally liable and jointly and severally liable. That means if C fails to pay the six uh, amount, then A, B should pay three crores each. If C fails to pay his contribution, then A and B should contribute three crores each. Understood the punishment, ma? So debts incurred during six months after reduction of number of members. For this debt, members are not responsible. Company is responsible. Remember this point. Subsequent to in co, subsequent to six months, uh, subsequent to reduction of members, no liability on members. But after six months, I remember. Sorry, it's not. Ah, uh, remember this point, ma. After six months, whatever additional debts, additional obligations incurred by that association. It's not company, you know, members. Nature of liability: unlimited, joint, and several. Clear. I repeat. It's not. I remember. I repeat. Debts contracted during the six months, company is liable. Debts contracted after six months from the date of reduction of number of members. You now, for those debts. members who are cognizant of the fact that company is doing a business with reduced number of members only those people will be punished sir how government knows this every year company is required to file annual returns yes or no in annual returns you have to give the status of existing members you have to give the status of existing members so definitely roc will come to know yes company is doing business with uh, just five members only initially punishment will be on five members So, however, F and G will prove like this, sir. We are doing business in France and Germany. We don't know about the death of D and E. We didn't receive any communication, so we are innocent. In that case, you know, F and G will be protected. A, B, C are held liable, sir. Why this much power, rigorous punishment? Very simple. I told you condition: seven members. You ignored it. Now I will ignore corporate will. Very simple, right? Okay. So with this section three also completed breach of minimum number of members. So after those six months is very important. After those six months, next one one person company. I'll discuss one person company and then we'll discuss a uh, incorporation procedure ma incorporation procedure. One person company. You'll find you know only one member in one person company. In addition to member, you can find a nominee. Nominee. In the event of death of the member, you know nominee becomes member of OPC. Nominee becomes member of OPC. So okay, let's see the conditions, restrictions on OPC. You know conditions with respect to OPC. Conditions with respect to OPC. OPC can do any business. however there is a prohibition some prohibitions on opc opc can't carry section 8 activities the main objective of opc is to promote entrepreneurship the main objective of entrepreneur is profits it's not charity so section 8 company is disqualified you know opc is disqualified to carry section 8 activities next opc is disqualified to carry investment in body corporate activities investment in body corporate activities You do in your personal capacity by OPC. Next, OPC is prohibited from carrying NBFC activities. Clear. Next, uh, conditions with respect to member as well as nominee. Conditions with respect to member as well as nominee. Max one OPC. They can become member or they can become nominee. Maximum in one OPC. And that member or nominee should be a natural person. must be citizen of india may be resident of india i'm using the word you know shall 
and male shall compulsory that person should be citizen of india he must be citizen of india but he may be a resident of india however his period of stay in india shall not be less than simply greater than or equal to 120 days in preceding financial year right now we, we are in financial year 2023-24 so you have to check preceding financial year status 22-23 if his period of stay in india is uh, 120 days or more then he is eligible to incorporate opc he is eligible to act as nominee in one opc so what are those three conditions natural person citizen of india maybe resident of india sir can infosys company can infosys limited incorporate opc no it is a company it is not a natural person sir mr glenn maxwell australian cricketer glenn maxwell australian cricketer he wants to incorporate opc in india no why because he is australian citizen once he revoke australian citizenship and once he get indian citizenship he is permitted next uh, resident of india very simple look at his passport in passport you know date of leaving country and date of entering into country you can see these two dates so the period between these two dates ignore now count it if 120 days concept is 120 days condition is satisfied then he is eligible to incorporate opc and you know in one attempt i think 2019 attempt there is a tricky question on this topic actually correct question only but you know students didn't imagine that kind of question what is that kind of question sir? very simple see m incorporated m opc private limited company in this m is member and is nominee so this company is incorporated in the financial year 2021-22 very good on 1st July 2022, N married to X and N left India permanently. And left India permanent after marriage. You know when it happened? 1st July 2022. Now, if you observe for financial year 2022 23, repeat for 22 23, if you observe his period of stay. In India is just 92 days, if I'm not wrong, April, May, June, April, May, June. So 91 days. First July, he left India. So next year, there is no nominee in the company. There arises a vacancy in nominee clause. So what is the consequence? Very simple. There is a vacancy in nominee clause. Members shall appoint a new person. Say for suppose why? New person as a nominee. And the same matter shall be communicated with a ROC within 30 days of a such vacancy that means these three conditions you know natural person citizen of india resident of india you have to satisfy these three conditions not only at the time of incorporation of opc but also subsequent to incorporation of that means every year after incorporation you have to check these three conditions sir one condition failed sir uh, there are just vacancy Suppose, you know, M cancelled his citizenship in India, sir. Nominee becomes member automatically. And after becoming a member, you know, nominee has to nominate another person as a nominee. And the same shall be communicated with ROC. Suppose M got diseased, sir. M died. Then nominee shall become member of the company. And after becoming member, the new member shall nominate another person as nominee and the same matter shall be communicated with roc are you getting my point simple point very very simple point but you know students didn't imagine such kind of questions and coming to the concept of nominee ma you know before incorporating the company before incorporating the company member has to nominate one person as a nominee for that he need to take a written consent from nominee and such written consent and that written consent can be withdrawn at any point of time by simply you know giving a notice to company as well as sole member sir i'm withdrawing my consent to act as nominee in your company now what sole member and company should do within 15 days of such vacancy shall appoint another person as a nominee 
and within 30 days of vacancy shall communicate the same matter with uh, ROC. You know, change in nominee will not affect a uh, memorandum of association. So, change in nominee will not lead to alteration of uh, MOA. Are you all getting my point, students? Everyone. And you know, this nominee can also be uh, removed by member. You know, change of nominee change of nominee one is withdrawal simply like resignation the other one is change change of nominee so change of nominee means what sir change of nominee means what come on students change of nominee means what member terminating existing nominee and member proposing new person and one more time you know there will be a vacancy nominee clause that is you know member deceased member disqualified then nominee becoming member and one special point i have to tell to you special point yeah sir what is that special point sir suppose you know we had a rule that you know one person can act as a member in only one opc we discussed it right max to max in how many opcs you can act as a member one opc sir we had two one person companies sir one is you know x opc y opc in XOPC, member is Mr. X and YOPC member is Y. And coming to nominee, in XOPC, Y is the nominee, X is the nominee in YOPC. Understood? Oh, yes, X is acting as a member in one OPC and X is acting as nominee in one OPC, another OPC. Max only one, the limit is one correct. Suppose if Y got deceased. Now, Legally, X can become a member of this YOPC, yes or no? In the event of death of the member, you know, X can become, the nominee will become member of the OPC. Now, here if you observe, X is already a member of XOPC and now X is becoming a member of YOPC. So, he is holding a membership in two OPCs simultaneously. Possible or not possible? Possible. Possible. Now, in this case, you know, in this case, Lamaker is giving a time of 180, 180 days, 180 days to X. Come on X, you have to choose only one OPC. If you want to continue with X OPC, come on, close Y OPC. If you want to continue with Y OPC, come on, close X OPC. So 180 days discretionary time period is provided to X in order to reduce his membership to one OPC. Are you all getting my point students? Everyone, can I proceed? I'm asking you, can I proceed? Yes. So this is all about marathon. Once again, I'm telling you, this is all about marathon. It's not a detailed lecture. Clear? So next topic is incorporation. Procedure for incorporation of company. Section 7 is all about procedure for incorporation of company. Section 7, subsection 1, you know, filing of documents with ROC. Filing of documents with ROC. You all know promoters. So they will file documents and information with ROC. So what documents are, what information are? First and foremost info, important document, MOA and AOA, duly signed by all the subscribers of the association. Second one, address, temporary address for correspondence. Next, details, details of subscribers, details of first directors, details of first directors. Upon incorporation, who will become directors of the company? You know, the people who become directors of the company, we call them as first directors. Along with the de details of first directors, you know, they need to give written consent in order to act as a director of the company. So no objection certificate plus interest of directors, interest of directors in other body corporates, in other body corporates. So they have to disclose the details of the entities in which they are having interest. Okay. Along with these documents, you know, they have to give uh, two declarations ma you know declaration it's like a promise a written promise 
so one declaration is all about you know compliance of uh, companies act compliance of act and rules made there under so whatever the company you are incorporating you know the proposed company we are incorporating it is according to the companies act 2013 and rules made there under so this declaration shall be signed by a professional practicing professional he may be a ca in practice or cma in practice or i'm using word or any person any person or cs in practice or advocate in practice any person so must sign declaration along with the professional you know one more person you know either director or secretary or manager who is involved in the incorporation of company who is participated who is participating in the incorporation of the company so these people should certify or should declare that you know proposed company incorporation is as per company act 2013 and rules made there under second declaration now this declaration is all about you know not convicted any offense not convicted by any offense any offense no breach of trust no no breach of uh, trust or misfeasance or not held guilty for any frauds just observe the grounds ma observe the grounds you know i'm not convicted under any offense during the promotion promotion incorporation or management let me write complete words promotion incorporation management of any company now not been a guilty for any fraud or not breach of any trust or misfeasance in any company during the last 5 years during last 5 years once again i'm explaining you i'm repeating you so i have not been convicted under any offense for the time being in force you know not convicted under any offense during incorporation promotion or management of any company during the last 5 years or have not been con- uh, not guilty of any fraud no breach of trust or misfeasance in any company during the last 5 years the next one for proposed company the documents and information we are filing with roc is complete correct and true complete correct and true so this declaration should be signed by two groups two groups 1 2 3 these three points yes declaration should be given by two groups who are they subscribers of the company as well as first directors of the company first directors as well as subscribers remember how many declarations are there two declaration one is uh, given by professional as well as director or secretary or manager who participates in incorporation of the company this declaration is all about compliance of company act and rules made there under suppose if you take one person company sir one person company is prohibited from carrying a nbfc activities investment in body corporate activities section 8 activities so we drafted moa and aoa according to section 3 of company act we followed entire company act we followed entire company rules for incorporating this company and second one you know the subscribers of the proposed company the first directors of the proposed company should not convict any offense uh, during promotion incorporation or management of any company during the last 5 years if they commit any offense if they commit any fraud you know 5 years prohibition period they are banned from becoming subscriber of new companies becoming first directors of the new companies so this this is the you know this is the documents and information you know promoters has to file with uh, roc next step next step registration of company so what roc will do roc shall issue certificate of incorporation and that certificate of incorporation shall contain corporate identity number you know it's a 21 digit number 21 digit alpha numeric uh, number ma 21 digit uh, number you can see you know it starts with l or u listed or unlisted company next five digit is an industry code next one you can see you know uh, state of incorporation year of incorporation private limited or public limited and last six digits is a serial number of the company next one maintenance of documents and information so whatever document and whatever information you file with roc the documents and information you have to preserve at registered office till liquidation of company till liquidation of company so all this information and uh, documents you have to preserve at registered office till liquidation of the company understood everyone suppose sir for incorporating company 
for incorporating company the promoters furnished false information sir the promoters suppressed material information sir suppressed material information sir then what would be the consequence very simple ma see in a company you know there are seven subscribers ma all these seven subscribers actually they are minors but these promoters what they did you know they forged aadhar cards pan cards you know they edited date of birth and they projected all these minors as uh, majors so these people actually incapable to enter into the contract but these promoters you know they made minors as majors they forged uh, all material documents so they furnished false information for incorporating the company or suppressing material information suppose last year i convicted you know i committed one fraud in one company now according to company act 2013 i am prohibited from incorporating a new company for a period of 5 years however i failed to disclose this information and you know myself a, a proposed director i am having interest in other body corporates i am not furnishing this information so suppressing material information any false information you file with roc or suppressing material information sir roc came to know this matter during incorporation so while verifying roc came to know that yes company documents proposed company information is false then you know consequence applicant shall be punished as per provisions of section 447 repeat applicant the person who filed application with roc applicant is going to get punishment under section 447 sir roc came to know about this matter after incorporation sir you know all these uh, subscribers are minors so roc came to know about this matter after incorporation then you know what would be the consequence here you know applicant as well as professional applicant as well as professional the persons who are associated with this incorporation are going to get punishment under section 447 in addition company is also going to get punishment so what is the punishment sir so roc will file a petition with the national company law tribunal ma now he is in the hands of tribunal so tribunal will decide tribunal will decide either to change moa or aoa no it may pass order yes come on change moa aoa change subscribers or you know it may convert members liability limited to unlimited or you know it may remove the name of the company it may order for removal of name from register or it may order for winding up of company liquidation simply liquidation or any other order as it thinks fit any other order as it thinks fit but before passing any order you know tribunal will give an opportunity of being heard to that association company these are the allegations against you is there anything to tell come on so it's nothing but opportunity of being heard so yes nclt will give an opportunity of being heard to the company and it will also consider the transactions entered by the company during the time period you know after incorporation till the date of petition so after considering these two aspects nclt will pass either of these orders very 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 important you know in one attempt this particular concept came for five marks so company was incorporated by furnishing false information by suppressing material information so state the powers of nclt what kind of orders nclt can pass very simple nclt can order for change of moa or aoa nclt can convert members liability limited to unlimited nclt may order for removal of name nclt may order for liquidation of the company or nclt may pass any other order as it thinks fit but before passing any order nclt shall will give one opportunity of being heard to the company and nclt shall also consider the transactions entered into by the company during this during the time period of its existence completed so section 7 we completed ma section 7 we completed next one section 9 effect of incorporation effect of incorporation so once you know promoters file information as well as documents with uh, roc roc now roc shall issue certificate of incorporation the moment certificate of incorporation is issued section 9 comes into the picture all the subscribers to the memorandum of association shall become members of the company automatically once shares are allotted to the subscribers they become shareholders next company will get its characteristics you know perpetual succession next separate legal entity next can sue or be sued next one next common sale 
Hmm. Next, members limited liability. So can enter into the contracts, can acquire properties, can incur liabilities. You know all these characteristics. You know that body corporate will get upon incorporation. That is what section nine effect of incorporation. Understood. Next one. We'll discuss section eight company ma. Section eight company. You now basic conditions. Section eight company should satisfy. Basic conditions. You now three conditions are there. Object clause of MOA should contain should contain the following objects. Object clause of MOA shall always contain these objects. Any of these objects, you know, social welfare. Hmm. Come on, tell me. Sports. Next, art, culture, environment protection, education, commerce, charity. Etc. So, objects clause of Section Eight proposed section company should contain any of these objects: social welfare, sports, you know, art, culture, environment protection, education, provide providing education, commerce, charity. Next one, surplus. I won't use word profit, ma. Why? Because this is an this is an association not meant for profits. This is an association not meant for profits, but for charity. So, coming to the surplus. So, excess of income over expenditure. You know, this surplus. You can't declare and pay dividends. You know, dividend is strictly prohibited. Then what I can do with this surplus? You know, invest surplus in promoting other objects. Invest in promoting objects of company. Objects of company. Many students got it out, sir. Why Section Eight company, sir? We had a concept of trust, no, sir. Trust will take care of all these activities, no. Yes, correct. But you know, coming to the differences between trust and Section Eight company. Section Eight company is having India-wide recognition, nationwide recognition. This association is getting certificate of incorporation. You know, it will be issued under Ministry of Corporate Affairs uh, stamp. So it will have a national recognition. Coming to the trust, its recognition is restricted to a state, particularly state. And coming to Section Eight company, you will find better transparency. Why? Because Every year, company is required to prepare annual returns. Every year, company is required to prepare financial statements, and these financial statements and annual returns, company should file it with ROC. And for Section Eight company, audit is mandatory. An independent person will come and he will verify the books of accounts and he will express opinion. It, so it enhances confidence among the users of the financial statements, readers of the financial statements. So you will find better transparency in Section Eight company. Compared to trust and society, the Section Eight company, uh, it will have a global recognition, not only nationwide global recognition. It can get uh, you know uh, donations from international sources as well. Are you getting my point? So compared to trust, Section Eight company is better. It's not better. It's a best thing. And you had separate legal entity concept also being a company. It had separate legal entity status. The company is responsible for its own acts. Members are not responsible for company acts. Understood? So tell me, what are the basic conditions company should satisfy in order to get, in order to become Section Eight company? The basic conditions are object clause of MOA and next, uh, don't declare dividends out of surplus. Invest surplus in promoting other objects of the company. Understood? Next, next one. So once these conditions are satisfied, then you know promoters. Has to file an application with central government. Of course, you know the power has already been granted. You know, delegated to ROC. Okay, along with this application, you know they are required to prepare some more documents. Ma, additional documents they need to uh, file with uh, central government. So there should be a declaration from professional as well as a director, as well as directors about compliance of Companies Act. Next one, estimated. Estimated income and expenditures for next three years. For next three years, so they have to prepare these documents and they need to file it with central government. Upon verification, central government shall issue a license subject to two additional conditions. Subject to additional conditions, central government can grant license to this association. Immediately, they have to register license with ROC as per Company Act. But power already vests with ROC only. Now ROC shall register the same and will issue certificate of incorporation. Here you will find NPL, not for profits. So in Sin, 
you can identify section 8 company you know by looking at thin that thin corporate identity number will have three letters you know npl not for profits and the liability of members is limited understood everyone everyone next sir. so what benefits being a section 8 company benefits you know coming to benefits even a partnership firm can become member of section 8 company firm which has no legal identity in the eyes of law it can become member of section 8 company and notice calling for general meeting 14 days is sufficient next one no need to constitute various committees you know nomination remuneration committee shareholder relationship committee these committees are not at all required understood and it can enjoy all other advantages being a company you know limited liability perpetual succession all these advantages quite common clear and moreover these companies are not required to use words limited or private limited in its name clause no restriction to use these words limited private limited clear so with this one part of section 8 company we completed benefits you know conditions and uh, obtaining license from government we discussed next one important part ma revocation of license i can expect a question from this uh, topic ma revocation of license very very important revocation you know reasons as well as consequences reasons as well as consequences students you have to remember this particular area you know basic conditions benefits you know procedure for obtaining license very simple but this particular area you know somewhat you know tricky as well as important so i can expect a question and from this particular concept you know revocation of license you know reasons violation of section 8 objects violation of section 8 provisions violation of central government conditions you know at the time of granting license they will give you uh, they will give you license with uh, some additional conditions if you violate those conditions or if you violate provisions of section 8 company violate the provisions of section 8 of company sir simply you know you are declaring surplus as a dividends you are converting your objects into profitable objects you, you are starting profitable business activities understood and you are violating central government conditions or activities carried by section 8 company are prejudicial prejudicial to public simply you know it is having some negative impact on the public negative impact on the public you know you are dealing with uh, you know some kind of you know activities which are opposed to public policy for example you told that we will provide basic necessaries to the people so our company is meant for necessaries to the people and you are promoting you know you are providing you know brown sugar to the public the people who need drugs you know you are supplying to them and you told that you are providing education training to the people in fact you are providing you know uh, how to kill a person how to rob you know you are providing training you are you are giving you are giving training to some students but the training is with respect to you know how to kill a person you know how to rob something you know uh, stealing theft but all these will have a negative impact on public these are the activities opposed to public policy so if you do this those kind of activities then you know government government after giving opportunity of being heard to you after giving opportunity of being heard to you it will revoke license upon revocation you have to add words limited or private limited in your name clause limited or private limited in your name clause next thing fund left with company section 8 company fund you know whatever donations contributions section 8 company received so far this amount shall be transferred to insolvency and bankruptcy fund maintained under insolvency and bankruptcy court or a similar section 8 company you know company with similar section 8 objects similar section 8 company you know the company the the authority will order for either winding up of company winding up of company or amalgamation with similar section 8 company amalgamation with similar section 8 company and whatever the fund left with this section 8 company that amount shall be transferred to ibf or similar section 8 company that means a section 8 company with similar objects you know this company is in sports association 
no you need to find another company with the same object of sports you can transfer this one to similar section 8 company and if authority came to know that you know a fraud was committed by fraud in case of fraud committed by any person in section 8 company that person is going to get punishment under section 447 and there is a general punishment under uh, you know section 8 for violation of uh, section 8 provisions general punishment for violation of section 8 provision general punishment that is you know company minimum 10 lakhs maximum 1 crore penalty how much ma minimum 10 lakhs maximum 1 crore and officer who is in default the person who is responsible for such defaults he is going to get punishment you know minimum minimum 25000 maximum 25 lakhs maximum 25 lakhs and in case of proven frauds that person is going to get punishment under section 447 so this is all about section 8 company so so far we covered section 7 that is procedure for incorporation of company you can let, look at this chart you know determine the nature of company reservation of name so these points i covered next one so we discussed a section okay so some technical glitch is there okay just wait ah uh. so we discussed uh, one person company we discussed conditions of one person company we discussed concept of nominee and then formation of company with charitable objects i covered all these points ma now revocation of license particularly revocation of license the uh, area is important so company contravents requirements or conditions subject to license is issued uh, affairs of the company are conducted fraudulently violation of the objects of company are prejudicial to the public interest you know add limited or private limited against the company name opportunity of being hurt winding up or amalgamation and penalty yes correct penalty only 10 lakhs to 1 crore 25,000 to 25 lakhs office in default shall be liable for action under section 447 in case affairs of the company were conducted fraudulently everyone so so far we completed section 3 section 7 section 8 section 9 okay the remaining provisions we'll discuss so our next topic is memorandum of association but before section 4 before section 4 let me discuss section 10a section 10a you know we are going in an order section 10a this is all about commencement of business commencement of business sir when a company can start business sir when a company can start business a company can start business if two conditions are satisfied condition number one condition number one company should file inc 22 with roc within 30 days of incorporation 30 days of incorporation sir what is this inc 22 you know verification of registered office generally you know i don't tell form numbers ma why because frequently these forms will get updated frequently these form numbers will be changed but some forms you know they are you know fixed they're permanent you know uh, almost 10 years completed but still these forms remain unchanged only those form names i'll tell you understood so condition number one company should file a verification of registered office inc 22 is all about registered office address so verification of registered office address with ROC and this form should be filed within 30 days of incorporation and condition number two company you know, on behalf of company board of directors should file a declaration with ROC in form number INC 20A and this INC 20A is all about a declaration so declaration with respect to what sir all subscribers who subscribed MOA had paid sufficient amounts, you know, cash to the company. So whatever amounts they promised to contribute upon incorporation, they paid that amount to company, sir. Understood. So company should start business only with its own funds. Initially, it should start business with own funds. And this form should be filed within, you know, 180 days of incorporation. 180 days of incorporation 
So these two conditions company should satisfy before it commences business, before it exercises borrowing powers. So two important conditions, one is verification of register office, the second one is declaration about subscription money. So subscribers had paid sufficient money and had paid promised money, contributed promised money to the company. So like that board of directors should declare and they should file INC 20A within 180 days of incorporation with ROC. And you know this section is not applicable to all companies ma. This section is applicable to only companies with the share capital, company with share capital and incorporated on or after 2nd November 2018. Companies incorporated on or after 2nd November 2018 and company with share capital should comply these two conditions. The consequences of our default, consequences. In case of default, what would be the consequence sir? What would be the consequence? You know, company is going to get punishment, penalty of 50,000 rupees and you know, officers in default per day, 1000 rupees penalty, 1000 per day and max 1 lakh rupees. So how many days they will make delay? You know, they're going to get this much punishment. Company flat 50,000 rupees, officer in default, 1000 per day, maximum 1 lakh rupee. You know, these punishments will apply in case of delay filing, delay. Sir, in case of non-filing, suppose, you know, company incorporated in the year 2019, till date they didn't file INC 22, till date they didn't file INC 20A. In that case, what would be the consequences? You know, non-filing, very simple, ROC shall conduct an inquiry, shall verify whether company is carrying business operations or not. It will give notice to the address, you know, of temporary correspondence. I told you initially, you know, at the time of incorporation, you need to give address for temporary, uh, temporary address for correspondence. So it will send notices to that address. If there is no reply. Then ROC had power to remove name from register, removal of name, A removal of name from register of companies, register, ROC is having that power. So simply closure of company. So this is all about section 10a come on come on tell me section 10a applicability it is applicable to all companies uh, which are incorporated on or after 2nd november with share capital simply company without share capital this section will not apply and what are the conditions under section 10a so uh, conditions verification of register office and uh, declaration with respect to subscription money so after fulfilling these two conditions the company is permitted to carry business operations companies carry company is uh, entitled to exercise borrowing powers Sir, before satisfying these two conditions, if company enter into any contract or company exercise any borrowing powers, all those acts become void ab initio acts, null and void. Company is not liable. Such acts are not enforceable against company. Are you all getting my point, students? Everyone. So this is all about section 10A. Next, uh, I'll start section 4. Section 4 is nothing but memorandum of association. Section 5 is nothing but articles of association. Two constitutional documents of the company is ma. One is, you know, what a company can do, what a company can't do. Memorandum of association, you know, it defines the scope of company and it confines the scope of company. It restricts the scope of company. What to do, what not to do, MOA will tell you. It defines the scope as well as it restricts the scope. Infosys company, it can do any business connected with software, 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 software. It can't do any business other than software. So positively defines the scope of company, negatively confines the scope of company. Articles of association, how to do, you know, company being an artificial person, it can't do activities on its own. It requires human agency, board of directors, management. Now powers of directors, powers of management, you can get under articles of association. Both are external documents and both documents, you know, these documents act as a contract between company and members. Company and members. You know, company is bound to members because of MOA, AOA. Members are bound to company because of MOA and AOA. So this is a general concept, but if you look at the definition of MOA, MOA means MOA originally drafted at the time of incorporation and it includes altered MOA. Such alteration might happen under old companies act or under new companies act. So MOA means memorandum is memorandum. 
originally drafted at the time of incorporation or altered from time to time in pursuance of a previous company law or company act 2013 similar definition aoe articles means articles originally framed at the time of incorporation and it includes altered aoe altered according to previous company law or present company act 2013 so definitions very very simple now we we'll look into the clauses ma first clause you know name clause so before selecting name you have to satisfy few conditions what are those conditions your name shall not be identical with or resemble to identical with or resemble to existing company registered trademark your name shall not be identical with or resemble to the name of existing company as well as existing registered trademark and the name shall not be undesirable undesirable in the opinion of central government not undesirable not identical with not resemble to existing company existing registered trademark so simply unique unique next one next one the name of a company shall always ends with ends with private limited in case of private company ha huh. limited in case of public company however these rules are not applicable to section 8 company as well as government company section 8 company is not required to use words private limited as well as limited government company even though it's a private company i repeat government company even though it's a private company or uh, because of restricts limits prohibits in articles of association still government company name shall always ends with limited only are you getting my point for section 8 company private limited limited words are not applicable for government company only word limited is used even though it is a private company understood next one next next after satisfying these conditions you know what promoters will do you know promoters will file an application for reserving unique name reservation of unique name with roc and you know if roc thinks correct if roc thinks that okay this name is not identical with or not resemble to the name of existing company or existing registered trademark if roc is of that opinion roc shall reserve name reserve the name sir how long this name shall be reserved sir if it is a newly incorporating company you know proposed company you know if it is getting incorporated you know newly incorporating company incorporating then name shall be reserved for a period up to 20 days how many days up to 20 days sir existing company wants to change its name sir no change of name sir change of name existing company change of name in that case the name shall be reserved for a period of 60 days from the date of approval you know 20 days 60 days is from the date of approval so 20 days 60 days during this time period even pradhan mantri ji modi ji or corporate affairs minister you know nirmala sitaraman madam even if these persons file an application for same name roc shall not permit them roc shall not permit them so the name shall be reserved for 20 days in case of newly incorporating company for 60 days in case of existing company during this 20 days you know promoters will prepare moa aoa details of subscribers details of directors declaration by professional declaration by first directors declaration from first subscribers everything promoters shall prepare and they will file this information with roc for incorporation suppose suppose you know uh, filing this information you know filing this document filing this document roc came to know that you know this information the document contain false info or you know some material information got suppressed false information there is a false information example you know if you want to copy the name of existing company if you want existing company name then you should get a permission from existing company directors you have to obtain no objection certificate from existing company directors in order to copy the their name or if you want to register a company with a trademark registered trademark then you need to get permission from registered trademark holder sir i need to use your name please grant permission now if they grant permission you can use that name no promoters they forged documents 
actually they didn't get any objection no objection from they didn't get any permission from existing company or existing trademark holder but still they forged the documents and they filed the application with roc roc came to know that yes this application was filed by furnishing false information now roc will verify whether company incorporated or company not incorporated suppose company not at incorporated sir company not at incorporated sir acha okay company not at incorporated right ah uh, applicant my dear applicant come pay penalty up to 1 lakh rupee sir company incorporated sir roc by mistake issued a certificate of incorporation now you know roc shall give you 3 months time period 3 months why to change your name change name or roc may remove name of company from register removal of name or roc uh, roc shall file petition with tribunal now tribunal will take care of this company tribunal will take care of this company come on winding up of the company what tribunal will do winding up of the company understood so this is all about name clausing memorandum of association next clause is situation clause under situation clause you can see the name of a, sorry the name of the state in which company is getting incorporated name of the state in which company is getting incorporated the every point each and every point each and every material point i discussed with you italic content you just give one time reading you will get to know everything so reservation of name okay next one reserving name, name how long 20 days 60 days if you want uh, more time period you can extend it by paying you know prescribed fees you know by paying 1000 rupees you will be given extra 20 days time period and you know punishment for furnishing false information for reserving the name not incorporated incorporated not incorporated you can observe you know the uh, name will be cancelled and penalty up to 1 lakh rupee up to which may extend to 1 lakh means nothing but up to 1 lakh incorporated change the name within period of 3 months strike up the name of the company petition for winding up of the company understood next the situation clause so it will contain the name of state in which the company is getting incorporated understood everyone everyone the power fluctuations are there ma power power fluctuations is there so don't worry the video lecture will uh, I'll, i'll give you i'll give you 100% clarity so sometimes if fluctuation is there just ignore that 5 to 10 seconds is it clear okay fine you know i didn't give a brief discussion about moa in this uh, lecture why because you all know this is a marathon and you know about moa you know purpose of moa it defines the scope of the company confines the scope of the company it's a public document every person before entering into contract with company should have a knowledge of moa moa all these points you already read at your ca foundation level as well as at ca inter level so some basic points which are not important from examination point of view i'm not discussing in this lecture why because this is a marathon lecture in reality entire company law i'll teach for 150 hours i'll teach 150 hours but this marathon lecture is you know around you know 10 to 12 hours right so basic discussions i'm not going to provide in this marathon lecture once again i'm telling you once again i'm repeating the point so situation clause you will find only the name of state so you can't find complete address in situation clause you'll find only name of state only name of state complete address you know company will file inc 22 with roc within 30 days of incorporation and registered office clause is very important from three aspects point of view cji chief justice of india right cji all communications with company shall be addressed to registered office and any complaint any legal action if you want to take against company the jurisdiction is subject to registered office jurisdiction and if anyone want to carry inspection activities investigation activities straight away they will come to registered office that's what you know you have to maintain all statutory records books of accounts documents and information you file with roc for getting certificate of incorporation everything you need to preserve at registered office so communication jurisdiction inspection 
subject to registered office jurisdiction understood everyone so now company upon incorporation within 30 days it has to file information with roc about its registered office next one object clause in memorandum of association now these objects are of two types one is main object the other one is incidental or ancillary objects you know main objects defines the scope of company you know for what purpose company came into existence first of all ca and cma it came into existence for providing commerce courses education understood you know commerce courses main object incidental you know for providing educational services for providing a, a commerce courses yes we need staff you know recruitment of staff we need infrastructure you know laptops computers acs lights furniture etc we need infrastructure and next we need a building we need a, a office premises so now we can purchase or we can construct or we can hire any building for providing these services now you know purchase of infra you know purchase of uh, infrastructure purchase of a building uh, all these are incidental activities we are taking only in order to promote our main object see you can't carry incidental objects as main objects remember remember this point you can carry incidental objects only for the purpose of attaining main object only for the purpose of attaining main object you should carry incidental objects if you want to carry incidental objects as a main objects you need to alter memorandum of association you need to pass special resolution you need to get approval from members next you need to file this information with roc roc shall issue a certificate fresh certificate then you can change your objects you can invest money in new objects the main objects what purpose company came into incorporation incidental objects in order to attain main objects you have to carry one or more incidental objects understood understood everyone everyone next one next paragraph sorry next matter doctrine of ultravirus so what is meant by doctrine of ultravirus come on tell me my dear students what is meant by doctrine of ultravirus the doctrine of ultravirus ma you know this ultravirus is of three types ultravirus as to companies act ultravirus as to moa ultravirus as to aoa so ultra wides ultra means beyond wides means powers of the company if company does any activity which is beyond the powers of companies act beyond the provisions of moa beyond the provisions of aoa we call it as ultra wides ultravirus as to companies act is illegal and void suppose if you take one person company investment in body corporate section 8 activities they are not illegal actually they are not Ill Ill illegal they are legal only whereas for one person company these activities are covered under prohibited activities list company can't carry these activities even though they are legal but opc is prohibited from carrying these activities now if opc perform any activity like you know investment in a body corporate now it becomes you know ultra virus as to companies act it is illegal and punishable offense so member will get punishment member will get punishment understood next one ultra virus as to moa so beyond the powers of moa initially i told you object clause of moa defines the scope of the company so if you do any activity which is beyond the object clause of MOA, it comes under ultra virus as to MOA. So we had a decided case law, you know, Ashbury Railway Carriage and Iron Company Limited versus Ritchie. Now their finance transaction is there. Actually, company had no power to enter into finance agreement. Now what is the effect, sir? Now ultra virus as to MOA is void ab initio. If something is void ab initio, it can't be ratified subsequently. Even whole body of members can't ratify ultra virus acts. Company is not liable for any responsibility or any obligation that arises from ultra virus acts. Board of directors are personally liable for ultra virus acts. Next one, ultra virus as to AOA. It is valid provided members approve ultra virus acts as to AOA. So sometimes board of directors perform any activity which is beyond their powers. However, within the powers of member, however, within the powers of members, 
then if member approves such activity you know ultraviolet as to aoa it will be valid and enforceable understood so it is the duty of each and every person to have knowledge of moa and aoa before they enter into contract with company so that is all about ultraviolet ma void can't ratify can ratify when it we can ratify it when it is ultraviolet to aoa can't ratify when it is ultraviolet to companies act or ultraviolet as to moa next one protection to the stakeholders you know because of ultraviolet today company is not responsible to the outsiders company is not liable for any ultraviolet acts in this manner you know members funds will be protected members funds can be utilized only for the purpose of achieving main objects other than that you know not next we had liability clause liability clause determines the liability of members of the company so liability of members of the company is decided by this clause next capital clause capital clause share capital clause you know here three amounts you should furnish one is total authorized share capital second number of shares divided into number of shares and nominal value or face value three amounts you have to mention under share capital clause next under liability clause we had one point ma many of the students you know don't know they don't have clarity with respect to this point so what is this point sir you know summary of this point is two members ma one is present member and the other one is past member we call them as list to be contributors if you had knowledge of uh, liquidation of companies in accounts in accounts liquidation of companies chapter you can understand this point very well you know all present members as well as past members whose membership got terminated uh, within one year before winding up one year before winding up see one year one year why one year word is used the reason is going concern concept if you look at going concern assumption you know the company can do business for the next two upcoming one year if company is able to do business for the next one year going concern assumption is appropriate sir no sir company can't do business uh, for the upcoming one year sir then going concern assumption is inappropriate going concern assumption is inappropriate are you all getting my point students so going concern assumption appropriate means for the next one year company is able to do business company can do business it is then we, you can call that going concern is appropriate okay so here the point is these two people are liable for deficit amount deficit means you know assets liable less than liabilities the difference between assets and liabilities if assets are not in a position company assets are not in a position to clear their liabilities to discharge their liabilities we call the difference as deficit deficit along with expenses of liquidation next one you know adjustment among contributors adjustment among contributors so these three amounts these two people are liable these two three amounts these two people are liable i'll tell you when past members will be liable first of all present members are liable ma to what extent to the extent of unpaid value or to the extent of guarantee amount if present member fails to pay if present member fails to pay fails to discharge that unpaid value or guarantee amount then we we'll look into the past member see present member from whom from which person he got the shares from which person he got the shares identify that person you know when this transfer happened sir within one year before liquidation sir within one year before company wind up winding up uh, date sir in that case bring that person also bring that person suppose you know we had a uh, we had seven people ma seven people a b c d e f g okay seven people are there these seven people started company in the year 2020 and in the year 2021 you know exactly date first april 2021 mr g transferred his share to yes h mr g transferred his share to h and you know on 31st december 2021 you know company went into liquidation liquidation proceeding started so at this point of time we observed a deficit amount is some 6 crores expenses of liquidation is some 1 crore so total 7 crores amount is required for liquidating this company each and every member you know they agree to contribute 1 crore in the event of liquidation ma 1 crore 1 crore each they promise yes we will contribute 1 crore in the event of liquidation to cover deficit amount like that you know they gave guarantee how much each person 1 crore 
जी ट्रांसफर इज शेयर टू हेच ऑन फर्स्ट अप्रिल टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी वन एंड फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ ट्रांसफर विद इन वन ईयर फ्रॉम द डेट ऑफ ट्रांसफर विद इन वन ईयर कंपनी वेंट इन टू लिक्विडेशन लिक्विडेटर केम टू ईच एंड एवरी पर्सन ए बी सी डी एफ हेच कम ऑन पे हेच ही इज फाइनेंशियली नॉट साउंड इज नॉट हैविंग दैट मच अमाउंट हेच फेल टू पे वन क्रोर रुपीज नो वॉट लिक्विडेटर विल डू फ्रॉम विच पर्सन हेच गॉट दीज शेयर from g and when this transfer happened sir this transfer happened on 1st april 2021 okay past member you also come into the picture sir suppose if this transfer happened on 1st april 2020 oh from date of transfer to date of liquidation there is a period of more than 1 year so g is not liable g is not liable are you all getting my point students g is not liable but transfer happened within 1 year before winding up uh, date so now bring past member now these people are liable for this 7 crores suppose suppose if b paid 2 crores money you know 1 crore b money and 1 crore a money now you know liquidator will ask a to pay 1 crore to b this is nothing but adjustment among contributors adjustment among contributors so two persons present members past members liable for three amounts one is deficit amount next expenses of liquidation next one adjustment among contributories okay so next we saw capital clause also next subscription clause you can see subscribers of memorandum of association and articles of association next articles i told you articles of association of a company as originally framed or altered from time to time or applied in pursuance of any previous company law or of this uh, act so articles of association contains internal rules and regulations of the company okay next one so it contains regulations regulations that are necessary for whom that are necessary for internal management internal governance okay so very important point that is entrenchment of aoa entrenchment of aoa generally ma to alter articles of association to modify articles of association special resolution is required any clause you take in articles of association you will have some 100 clauses or 200 clauses any clause if you want to modify general rule special resolution is required now in the place of special resolution if you if you write something you know which is more powerful than special resolution suppose special resolution means what you know votes in favor not less than 3 times of votes against simply 75% of votes should be in favor 75% of votes should be in favor then we can call it as a special resolution now if you write like this 90% voting power is required to amend particular clause to amend particular clause in that case we call it as entrenchment we call it as entrenchment generally entrenchment provisions are meant for protecting minority interest protecting minority interest for example today i want to start a company with the name v industries limited and in this company you know in articles of association clearly i mentioned a point that mr v will be managing director of the company will be managing director of company and he will be terminated only in the case of proven misconduct mr v will be the managing director of the company and he will be terminated only in case of proven misconduct where you found this clause you know where this clause is there in articles of association this clause is there are you all getting my point in articles of association i mentioned this clause mr b is the managing director of the company and he will be terminated only in case of proven misconduct so today i incorporated company 100% of capital left with you know 100% of capital you know me and my family is holding but tomorrow there is a chance i may go for public offer public may become members of our company okay as a result my and my family members holding you know my family members and my personal holding may fall to 20% 10% 15% possible yes possible today we started company with 10 lakhs ma and in the entire 10 lakhs me and my family members contributed tomorrow i am making public offer of 90 lakhs so public contributed 90 lakhs so total 1 crore in this 1 crore my worth of capital is just 10% my worth you know my portion my portion my portion is just 10% now definitely i'll think that you know if these people you know who contributed 90 lakhs you no know, they may come to general meeting 
by passing special resolution they may amend AOA removing this clause and very next minute they may terminate me from the position of managing director you are getting my point possible or not possible so simply by passing special resolution first they will delete clause in AOA and the very next minute they may remove me from the position of managing director my job is at risk so to protect my interest to protect myself you know what i'm doing the time of incorporation only i'm writing a point that in order to amend the aoa with respect to removal of managing director removal of this clause 92 percent voting power is required so definitely without my consent this clause can't be terminated this clause can't be deleted and I'll be continued as a managing director as long as you know I commit a default. So till I commit a default, I can be the managing director of the company. So simply to protect my interest in the company, I can entrench my articles of association. Entrenchment is nothing but you know making a simple procedure complicated. So making simple thing as a complicated thing, you know, it is nothing but entrenchment. So general rule for amendment of AO is special resolution but if you write anything you know this particular clause can be amended by passing a, a resolution with 92 percent in favor then we call it as entrenchment so you can have entrenchment provisions at the time of incorporation sir at the time of incorporation i forgot to entrench my aoa sir then after coming into existence you can insert entrenchment provisions for inserting entrenchment provisions if you are a private company all members approval is required all members approval required in case of public company special resolution is sufficient so at the time of formation you can have entrenchment provisions sir i forgot sir okay after incorporation you can have entrenchment provisions but if you are a private company you need uh, approval from all the members if you are a public company simply by passing special resolution you can insert entrenchment provisions clear clear okay next one doctrine of indoor management doctrine of indoor management so i told you doctrine of ultra virus if company enters into any act beyond the powers beyond the powers of moa we call it as ultra virus effect of ultra virus company is not liable company is not responsible board of directors are personally liable continuation to this doctrine of ultra virus we had doctrine of constructive notice sir constructive notice means what you know notice is of two types ma notice is of two types one is actual notice the other one is constructive notice actual constructive actual means you know giving notice personally communicating the matter personally loudly or through notice form constructive notice means you know deemed here we are not giving actual notice ma here we are not at all giving any actual notice but you know we assume that notice has been given suppose if you look at ICA examinations ICA won't call student personally my dear student November 1st onwards, we are going to conduct examination and you are required to attend examinations. You know, ICA is not giving any personal intimation. ICA is not communicating with each and every student. You know, there is no actual notice concept. No, the moment ICA host examination schedule in the website, when it posts that matter in the website, that's it. ICA assumes that we have given notice to all the students. We have given notice to all the students. That's it. So here you can't find actual notice, but it is demo to be a notice, demo to be a notice. So accordingly, every person before dealing with company, they should have a knowledge of MOA and they should have knowledge of AOA. Ignoring MOA and AOA, if you enter into any agreement with company and if company had no power to sign that agreement, then company is not personally liable to you. Understood? So that is what constructive notice means. And to this constructive notice, we had one exception. That exception is doctrine of indoor management name itself is telling indoor management indoor with respect to internal matters with respect to internal policies outsider can make a presumption outsider can make a presumption outsider can straight away presume that all the board of directors all the management uh, personnel will have a powers to do to enter into contract on behalf of the company they can make that presumption now, according to doctrine of indoor management, company is liable to outsiders. Outsiders shall be protected. Outsiders shall be protected. Company is held liable. 
understood and to this doctrine of indoor management we had exceptions suppose in case of forgery this doctrine is not applicable in case of negligence suppose there is a scope for inquiry there is a scope for inquiry but still outsider they are blindly thinking that yes company had power you know company directors are having power company directors are having a power like that you know they are making you know they are acting negligently they are acting negligently in that case also you know doctrine of indoor management is not applicable understood ma so doctrine of indoor management the main theme is protect public interest protect uh, public from company malpractices is it clear so stakeholders need not enquire whether the necessary meeting was convened and held properly or whether a necessary resolution was passed properly. They are entitled to take it for granted and company had gone through all the proceedings in a legal manner. Next one. So next. Act overrides MOA and AOA. Section 6. Section 6. Very simple. Just remember. You know, one side companies act 2013. Other side MOA, AOA, members resolution, members resolution, next board resolution, next agreements executed by the company, agreements executed by the company, so other side. If there is any conflict between Companies Act and these documents, you know, remember always Companies Act shall prevail. Companies Act shall prevail. Companies Act shall override provisions of MOA, AOA, Member Resolution, Board Resolution and agreements executed by the company. Suppose one person company is prohibited from carrying investment in body corporate activities. And this one person company, they inserted this point in MOA. By making alteration to MOA, they inserted investment in body corporate activities in their MOA. Now there is a conflict between Companies Act and MOA. Now which one shall prevail, sir? Companies Act shall prevail. Next one. Inconsistency between Companies Act and AOA. Suppose underwriting commission. Underwriting commission. You know, company wrote this point. You know, company can pay underwriting commission 10%. But maximum 5% in case of shares, 2.5% in case of debentures. You all know. Now there is inconsistency between Companies Act and AOA. Companies Act shall prevail. Similarly, Companies Act and Members Resolution. Suppose Doctrine of Ultravirus. Members can't ratify Ultravirus Acts. However, Members passed resolution to approve Ultravirus Acts. Now there is inconsistency between Companies Act and Members Resolution. Which one will prevail? Companies Act shall prevail. So inconsistent provisions. Ignore MOA, AOA, Members Approval, Board Approval, Company Agreements. You just follow Companies Act. Consistent provisions, there is no problem. I am talking about inconsistency provisions. Next one. Effect of MOA and AOA. See, the moment company gets incorporated, MOA, AOA become contractual documents between company and uh, members. So now members are uh, bound to company, company is bound to members. Company can't utilize member funds for some other activities. And members, whenever company may call shares, member is liable to contribute call money to company. Member is like, liable to pay call money to company. If company violates any provisions, doctrine of ultravirus. If members violate call monies, you know, if member fails to pay call money, then company will forfeit member shares. Company can reissue forfeited shares to other members. Understood? It's like a normal contract. Under normal contract, you can observe any party. If any party commits breach, the aggrieved party can take action against party who is guilty. Yes or no? Similar concept applies here also. So company liable to members, members liable to company, and members are not liable to each other. Next one, company is not responsible to outsiders. Outsiders are not responsible to company because of MOA, AOA. The reason is, the reason is, hmm, MOA and AOA are contractual documents between company and members, but not company and outsiders. Is it clear? Everyone, next one. The last topic of uh, Incorporation of company and matters incidental to there, there too is alterations. Alteration as to MOA and alteration as to AOA. So alteration is nothing but modification. Any addition or deletion. Any addition of uh, new clauses or deletion of existing clauses. We call it as alteration. Previously many times I told you. 
MOA and AOA are the contractual documents between company and members. It's like a contract. It's like a contract. Sorry, it's not like a contract. It's a contract between company and members. You all know under Indian Contract Act 1872, if you want to modify the terms of contract, consent of both the parties is required. And we call it as novation. Do you remember? Novation. So here also, modification of MOA, modification of AOA requires approval of members. Now on behalf of company, board of directors will request. So we want to modify these clauses, you know, MOA, AOA. We need your approval and members has to approve it. General rule for modifying MOA and AOA, special resolution is required. I told you special resolution means three-fourth majority, simply, you know, three times majority. Three times majority is required. Votes in favor shall not be less than three times of votes against. And this MOA, this MOA, this is altered because of name change, capital change, next one, object change, and next one, situation change. And there are two more clauses, you know, one is, you know, association clause will never get changed, ma. Association clause, association clause. At the time of incorporation, who are the subscribers? So, during the lifetime of company, association clause will never be changed except in case of order by the tribunal. Except in case of order by the tribunal under section 7, we discussed. So, in all cases, association clause remains unchanged. Next, liability clause. Yes, you can change with the approval of members. You know, special resolution is required. But this is not there in our uh, syllabus right now. Alteration of capital clause we will discuss under share capital chapter. Section 61, I'll discuss with you. So, in this particular chapter, we'll discuss name change, object change, and situation change. So, by discussing these three points, we can complete this chapter marathon. So, almost one and a half hour from one and uh, the past one and a half hour, I'm discussing with you second chapter. I covered almost all the provisions. Now it's time to discuss alteration of MOA. So, name change name change you need to check it whether it is voluntarily or compulsorily voluntary or compulsory so compulsory change is nothing but you know rectification rectification of name and this is covered under section 16 voluntary change of name you need to read section 13 voluntarily Suppose due to change in management, due to change in ownership, due to change in object of the company, you know company decided to change the name of the company. Company decided to change the name of the company. Satyam Computers, you know Mahindra Satyam, now it is Tech Mahindra. So Satyam to Mahindra Satyam, you observe name change. Next, Idea Cellular Limited Company. Now we are having Vodafone Idea Cellular Limited Company, name change. So voluntary change of name. What is the procedure sir? Procedure is very simple. You had certificate of incorporation. According to certificate of incorporation, your name is Idea Cellular Limited. Now you want to modify it as Vodafone Idea. That means you need fresh certificate of incorporation. Fresh certificate of incorporation, ROC will issue only upon submission of documents with ROC. That means you need to file documents and information with ROC, with ROC for change of name. Sir, what documents, what information we need to, uh, we need to submit to ROC, sir? We need to submit to ROC. Very simple. Alter MOA, altered MOA, altered AOA. You need to submit to ROC for getting new new name. And this alteration of MOA, alteration of AOA requires member approval. What kind of approval? Special resolution. Where we can take special resolution? In general meeting. In general meeting. So Call for a general meeting, obtain members approval, special resolution. Now, M and MOA, AOA, file all these documents and information with ROC. ROC shall issue fresh certificate of incorporation. Upon issuing fresh certificate of incorporation, your name will be changed. Understood? The point is, your proposed name shall not be identical with or resemble to the name of existing company. For that, you have to take prior approval of ROC, whether the proposed name is available or not. If available, ROC shall reserve that name for a period of for a period of 60 days. So within 60 days, you have to take special resolution from members. You have to alter MOA, AOA. You have to file these documents and information with ROC. And ROC shall issue certificate of incorporation. See, I wrote procedure in a reverse manner. 
now you know this is the first point second point third point like that understood i told in a reverse manner in order to understand the procedure looking at certificate we will get to know the company name this certificate should be modified who is having power to modify this certificate roc upon filing of documents and information with roc roc shall change the name what kind of information and documents altered mo altered avo and copy of special resolution so for calling uh, for getting approval of members i need to call for general meeting but before that i need to reserve name whether the name is available or not i need to reserve it are you all getting my point so that is voluntary change of name and two important points you have to remember two important points two years from date of change you have to disclose common name common name is old name you have to disclose old name for a period of two years after change of name next one this benefit of changing name is available only to the companies who are regular in filing annual returns under section 92 who are regular in filing financial statements under section 137 with roc so a company which is regular in filing annual returns and the financial statements with roc as well as the company has not committed any default in payment of you know debentures you know deposits interest thereon so a company which is regular in payment of interest on deposits interest on debentures debentures redemption deposits repayment and which is regular in filing annual returns with roc regular in filing financial statements with roc only those companies are permitted to change its name understood so voluntary change of name completed voluntary change of name completed special resolution hmm. next uh, name change next one change in constitution not a name change that is you know if you want to convert private limited to public company public limited to private company then what is the procedure i'll discuss that procedure under section 18 next one prohibition of change of name i told you right non filer not allowed and next one deposits debentures interest you know in payments if you had any defaults you are not permitted so if you had any kind of these defaults first rectify those defaults and then you are permitted to change the name next one entry in register on any change in the name of a company registrar shall enter new name in the register of companies in place of old name and issue fresh certificate of incorporation with a new name and change in name shall be complete and effective only after issuing a certificate next one rectification of name by central government that's what you know compulsory change of name <clears throat> see we add word rectification only when there is a mistake when there is a mistake you know we'll use the word rectification this mistake is of two types one is name of a company similar to name of existing company or name of a company is similar to name of registered trademark registered trademark Sima. name similar to name of existing company you see nowadays you know we had the technology we had information technology so everything online form only today you can observe when the moment you file document with ROC, it gets updated. But past, you know, 1950s, 1970s, there is no such advancement in technology. So manual forms filing is there. Understood. Now, you know, one association, they registered their association under Karnataka ROC with the name ABC Limited. Two days later, another association from Jammu and Kashmir, they registered their association with the ABC limited name only. Lack of information between these two ROCs, you know what happened? Each ROC issued a certificate of incorporation with the same name. Later, central government came to know that two companies were incorporated with the same name. Now, what central government will do? Central government, you no know, power already delegated to ROC. Power already delegated to ROC. Okay, as per the act, central government will give a notice to company to change its name within three months come on rectify your name within three months and second case if a registered trademark is infringed you know infringement of trademark without permission trademark name is used we used a trademark name without permission without permission of a trademark holder now trademark holder owner can go to central government can file an application sir my trademark name is copied without my permission so this application should be filed within three years of 
incorporation of company now here also central government will give notice to the company come on your name is similar to the name of existing trademark come on change your name and the time period given is three months so within three months you have to change the name so in two cases central government will grant to three months time period to change the name now what company will do so company will call for a general meeting and here ordinary resolution is sufficient not special resolution remember this point by passing ordinary resolution yes company is permitted to rectify its name so once you get ordinary resolution alter MOA as well as AOA no name change name change and file these documents with uh, ROC ROC shall register the same and will issue certificate of incorporation this entire procedure should be completed within three months time period of course whether the proposed name is available or not for that company has to file a special you know RUN form with ROC if name is available it shall be reserved for a period of 60 days you know existing company if it want to modify the name you know it will be given a time of 60 days for rectification understood so yes three months just remember the cases you know identical with or resembles to the name of existing company or you know the trademark name got infringed then you know owner of registered trademark has to file application within three years of incorporation of the company there is a practical question on this concept you know owner of registered trademark filed application with central government after five years of incorporation you know five years after incorporation of company now can central government take any action can company is uh, is there any obligation on company to rectify its name the answer is no central government will react only if application is filed within three years of incorporation three years is for infringement of trademark cases and for point a there is no such time limit there is no such time limit and rectification will take place by passing ordinary resolution while all these documents with the roc roc shall issue fresh certificate of incorporation understood in case of default you know if section 13 is get section, section 13 is violated then thousand per day is a penalty thousand per day is a penalty and officer who is in default minimum five thousand maximum one lakh rupee this is the punishment for default understood understood only two branches we saw under name class one is voluntary change of name the next one is compulsory change of name next one ma next one registered office address change change of registered office so this is possible in uh, three ways ma one is one is change within city or town or village next one change in city or town or village next one change in state change in state and the second branch is again of two types one is without change in roc jurisdiction without change in roc second one change in roc first understand the uh, understand these branches ma so registered office change is possible in how many ways how many ways four ways first one no change in city town village no change in city town village second one change in city town village but no change in roc change in city town village yes there is change in roc and last one simply change in state just change in state you know within this city suppose if you take hyderabad you know from area a to area b amir pet to begum pet amir pet to begum pet that is within the hyderabad only so in this case the procedure the procedure you need to follow is board resolution approving the shifting of register office plus roc filing that is you know inc 22 within 30 days of uh, shifting you need to file inc 22 with ROC by following this procedure you can shift your register office from one premises to another premises where there is no change in city no change in town no change in village so procedure very simple board resolution and ROC failing now come on next one change in city change in city 
बट विद इन सेम और वो सी जुरिस्टिक्शन विद इन सेम स्टेट सपोज इफ यू टेक आंध्र प्रदेश अमरावती टू विशाखापटनम नो चेंज इन आरओसी सर यू नो बोथ अमरावती एंड विशाखापटनम आर अंडर आरओसी आंध्र प्रदेश आरओसी विजयवाड़ा ओनली देन व्हाट इज द प्रोसीजर फर्स्ट बोर्ड रिजोल्यूशन कॉलिंग फॉर जनरल मीटिंग इन जनरल मीटिंग अपटेन स्पेशल रिजोल्यूशन नेक्स्ट आरओसी फाइलिंग कम्युनिकेट द सेम विथ आरओसी कम्युनिकेट सेम विथ आरओसी दिस इज आल्सो वेरी सिंपल प्रोसीजर नेक्स्ट वन चेंज इन आरओसी जुरिस्टिक्शन देयर इज चेंज इन जुरिस्टिक्शन and this particular case 3 is applicable only to two states one is tamil nadu the other one is maharashtra and the two in tamil nadu there are two rocs one is chennai the other one is coimbatore in maharashtra we had one roc in mumbai the other one is in pune so if your company wants to shift register office from chennai to coimbatore or coimbatore to chennai jurisdiction or mumbai to pune jurisdiction or pune to mumbai jurisdiction then only this case 3 is applicable so under case 3 we had two registrar of companies before change and after change that's the reason here we are not going to roc directly here we are going directly to regional director first you you should know the hierarchy ministry of corporate affairs representing central government under ministry of corporate affairs you can find a regional director seven in number total under regional director you can observe roc so case 1 case 2 case 1 and case 2 roc is sufficient but case 3 you are shifting from chennai to coimbatore so before change you are with chennai after change you are with coimbatore so which roc i should go sir go with regional director a level above roc a level above roc so here you know what board of directors required to do first first by passing board resolution they should call for general meeting by passing special resolution they should take approval from members and they should file application with regional director regional director you know copy of board resolution copy of special resolution along with that they should give declaration declaration sir all workmen dues all workmen dues discharged completely discharged we are not pending with any workmen dues sir we are not pending with any workmen dues another declaration is all about no change in jurisdiction no change in jurisdiction for pending prosecutions for pending prosecutions right now there are 10 civil cases against our company and all these 10 civil cases were in so and so court even after shifting there will be no change in jurisdiction for pending cases for pending cases whenever court calls us we will attend those cases so there will be no change in jurisdiction for pending prosecutions and acknowledged copy of some chief secretary of the state chief secretary of the state so yes they need to file an application with uh, chief secretary of the state they need to get acknowledgement from chief secretary so this copy is all about you know due to proposed shifting you know from chennai to coimbatore or mumbai to pune there will be no adverse impact on workman there will be no negative impact on workman suppose here you know some 5000 people are losing job okay but after shifting to new premises we can create 10000 job opportunities understood so all these documents board of directors has to file it with the regional director regional directors had a 30 days time limit whether to approve it or to reject it whether to approve it or to reject it seema the board of uh, board of directors simply you know representing company they will file application with regional director a regional director has to dispose the order within 30 days within 30 days of uh, application now company once it get clearance once it get clearance it has to file documents with roc so within 60 days company has to file documents with roc along with copy of regional director approval and roc within 30 days within 30 days shall register the same and issue certificate with respect to the same issue certificate within 30 days to company so simply here the approvals if you look at equation format board resolution special resolution rd approval plus roc filing you know each and every case one one and one 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 approval is getting added one one approval is getting added understood next case 4 change in state change in state 
here company will go with the central government government of india of course power delegated to regional director okay so here company has to file application with regional director so what are the documents sir you know copy of board resolution copy of special resolution and copy of altered moa sir why in moa you will find only situation clause you will find only name of the state you will you can find only name of the state in moa now under case 1 case 2 case 3 there is no change in name of state under case 4 there is change in name of state so you need to alter moa along with this you need to give copy of creditors list of creditors creditors list and you have to furnish advertisement copy advertisement copy this should not be older than 30 days ma this should not be older than 30 days you know 30 days before you file application with central government you have to advertise the matter in two newspapers one is in vernacular newspaper the other one is english newspaper about shifting of register office from one state to another state and all other declarations quite common now the moment central government receives the application it will enquire whether creditors consent is there or not creditor approval is there or not sir creditor approval is there adequate security has been provided to the creditor sir adequate adequate sir total loan amount is 10 crores and we provided 20 crores security sir finally creditors consent is there now after looking at creditors after looking at debenture holders you know central government shall approve the shifting of registered office from one state to another state and for for passing the order you know for passing any order you know approving or rejecting central government is having a time limit of 60 days 60 days of application yes central government shall dispose that order now company has to file this information with two rocs roc old roc new so this filing should be done within 30 days of uh, order now old roc shall register the same and issue certificate issue certificate within 30 days of filing within 30 days of uh, filing with roc yes old roc shall issue a fresh certificate to company and new company new roc you know that means uh, we want to shift to state of karnataka so karnataka roc shall issue certificate of incorporation new roc shall issue certificate of incorporation to the company understood understood the lengthy procedure but i am giving you main main points i am highlighting main main points so here you know shifting of registered office from one state to another state the approvals if you look at the approvals first board resolution next members approval next creditors consent creditor consent and finally central government approval of course power delegated to regional director next roc filing roc filing so simply if you look at four cases first case case 1 board resolution plus roc filing case 2 board resolution plus special resolution plus roc case 3 board resolution plus special resolution plus rd approval so rd rd original director approval it should be given within 30 days of application plus roc filing and case for change in name of the state change in name of the state sorry change in state it's not change in name of the state change in state i told you board resolution special resolution altered moa copy of creditors advertisement along with this you know copy of minutes prepared in the general meeting copy of minutes prepared in the general meeting how to provide this information now central government will take 60 days time to dispose the order so board resolution plus special resolution plus creditors approval plus uh, tg approval and finally roc filing is it clear so you can see each and every point you now within a city board resolution special resolution special resolution permission from regional director special resolution approval of central government and you can see same time limits you know 30 60 30 60 30 60
So same time limits I mentioned in lecture also. Just give one time reading ma. Just give one time reading. Sufficient. Sufficient. All these points I covered. Place of register office from one state to another state. Copy of MOA alter with alterations. Minutes of general meeting. Hmm? Next board resolution. List of creditors. Acknowledgement copy, service copy, applicant with complete annexures to ROC, Chief Secretary of the State, Union Territory, where register office is situated at the time of filing of application. Next, advertisement in newspapers, you know, not more than 30 days. That means it should not be older than 30 days. Central government is having a time of 60 days to dispose the order. Sir, here the word regional director is there. No, no confusion. Act central government. However, as per rule, central government delegated power to regional director. And before passing of order, central government may satisfy itself. Consent of the creditors, provisions and security, filing with ROC. Finally, issue of press certificate of incorporation. Next one, alteration of MOA with respect to alteration of object to clause. Alteration of MOA with respect to alteration of object to clause. You know, for this, uh, same kind of approval. Ma. What kind of approval? Same approval. That is... Special resolution is required. What kind of approval is required? Special resolution. But for getting this special resolution, you know, members has to send notice calling for general meeting. See, company is planning to conduct meeting on so and so day, so and so place, so and so time. When you yes or no, so to tell date, time, place, agenda of general meeting. Yes, it is the duty of company to send notice to all its members. Along with notice, company is required to dispatch, you know, company is required to prepare explanatory statement. In this explanatory statement, you know, company should clearly tell the members, Sir, we had this much amount, you know, we received this much amount, total, total money received, total money received, received money from public. In this, we utilized some portion for existing objects and we are left with this much amount, unutilized money. And we want to, uh, we are planning to start a new business. So objects of new, new business, simply new objects. A risk and rewards, risk and rewards associated with new objects. Amount required for pursuing new objects. Profits that company will get after uh, following, after implementing new objects. Everything, a detailed explanation company has to provide to the existing members. And the same thing should be published in newspapers also. So after giving notice and explanatory statement to the members, you know, members will come to the meeting and in general meeting, definitely, you know, voting will be conducted in general meeting, you know, voting will be conducted. So some votes may be in favor, some votes may be against for alteration of object clause. Once again, I'm telling you for alteration of object clause, special resolution is required. Imagine we had total hundred shares. Persons holding 90 shares gave approval favor. And persons with uh, holding 10 shares are against to the alteration or against to the alteration. Are you getting my point? Now, the persons who are against to the alteration, we call them as dissenting shareholders. We call them as dissenting shareholders. Now, the point is promoters of the company or controlling shareholders, controlling shareholders has to give exit offer to the dissenting shareholders see we want to uh, change our objects we want to change our objects but you are not giving approval right okay please surrender your shares we'll pay you money so that's what you know exit offer means who will give exit offer company or promoters answer is promoters don't write company ma why because if company is giving exit offer it is nothing but buyback Again, section 68 to section 70 provision shall apply. Again, section 68 to section 70 provision shall apply. So, company won't give any exit offer. Exit offer shall be given by promoters or controlling shareholders only. So, once everything is completed, come on, company, file information with ROC. ROC shall register the same. You know, company has to file this information within 30 days of uh, special resolution. ROC shall change the same. 
and issue the, sorry roc shall register the same and issue the fresh certificate within same time period of 30 days of filing 30 days of filing ma one blind concept you have to remember ma blind concept is moa aoa or contractual documents between company and members company and members any modification to these documents requires approval from members general rule special resolution however in case of rectification of name ordinary resolution is sufficient whenever these documents got modified all these documents you know company has to file it with roc that's it if you remember this topic you know blindly finish next one and one more point ma in case company is having more than 200 members you know in all the above cases if company is having more than 200 members then you know voting shall be conducted through postal ballot remember this point so that means you know members less than members having a company up to 200 members postal ballot is not required so after alteration each and every copy of MOA and AOA should have a note point that you know this is an altered MOA this is an altered AOA you make any default you know thousand rupees is the penalty thousand rupees is the penalty next one alteration of articles of association very simple you know here also you need to get special resolution and this alteration includes conversion of companies you all know how can we differentiate private company and public company in private company in articles of association you can see restricts transfer of shares limits number of members to 200 prohibits invitation to public offer yes or no if these points are there then it is a private company now if a private company wants to convert into public company simply delete these provisions or if a public company wants to convert into private company simply insert these provisions one case you are deleting the other case you are making insertion addition so delete or insert delete or insert it comes under what it comes under alteration so alteration of AOA it requires approval from members there is special resolution so just look at the one note ma private company to public company in private company in original AOA you can have these points you know restricts limits prohibits if you delete these points you know it it leads to altered AOA alter AOA alteration of AOA so for doing this you need to get special resolution from members now file altered AOA and copy of special resolution with ROC ROC shall register the same and shall issue fresh certificate of incorporation very simple now if a public company wants to convert into private company public to private public to private in that case what is the procedure you know you need to insert you need to add restricts transfer of shares limits number of members to 200 prohibits a public offer and moreover the existing members should come to 200 and existing public deposits existing public money should be repaid immediately so whether it happened or not so central government will come and central government will check so central government approval is compulsory for converting public company into private company are you all getting my point students of course power granted to roc that is under rules per act i am telling you so from public to private conversion requires alteration of aoa and it requires copy of uh, members approval sorry copy of special resolution along with that you need to get central government approval also is it clear next one see a private company into a public company public company into a private company even where a private company alter its articles in such a manner that no longer include see this paragraph is telling that private to public conversion provide further that any alteration having the effect of conversion of a public company into private company shall not be valid unless it is approved by an order of central government and on an application made within 60 days from the date of passing of special resolution filed with rd in form number rd1 along with the fees now once required approvals you got it 
file it with ROC. So file it with ROC within 15 days of alteration to AOA. An alteration shall be valid only if it is uh, registered with the uh, ROC. If it is not registered with ROC, then alteration is not valid. And alteration will have original effect. Same like, you know, if our original articles, what is the effect we are having? Altered AOA will also have same effect. And this is common point. Disclosure of alteration on each and every copy. Disclosure, disclosure of alteration on each and every copy. If there is no such disclosure, then, you know, penalty of 1000 rupees. Next one. Next one. Section 17, it's a general section, ma. you know, distribution of MOA and AOA. See, under Companies Act 1956, or, you know, uh, way back 2000, uh, before 2006, before 2006, we had no uh, rich technology. You can call it as, you know, we had no uh, separate public domain where you can download documents just by paying 100 rupees. Right now, you know, mca.gov.in, here you can view public documents, you can download public documents at just 100 rupees per company. So previously, this much uh, facilities are not there. So any member, if you want to go through MOA, AOA, copy of board resolution, copy of members resolution or agreements executed by the company, you know what members used to do? Members used to request a company in writing, in writing, they used to request company. So we need a copy of MOA, we need copy of AOA or we need agreement or we need resolutions referred under section 117. So along with the request, along with the request, these members are required to pay sufficient fees, ma, fees, you know, for fees for taking printouts, fees for dispatch of uh, documents to the members. You know, when these two conditions are satisfied, company is uh, bound to submit these documents to members within seven days. Within seven days. So very simple. You know, any member, any member, can request for copy of MOA, copy of AOA, a resolutions mentioned under section 117, that is some board resolutions, some member resolutions, and agreements executed by company. So any member can request for copies. So this request should be uh, done in writing. Along with the written request, there should be some fees. Sorry, you need to pay some fees. So once these two conditions are satisfied, company is bound to submit documents within seven days of Return request and receipt of fees. Failure, then company is liable for a penalty. Company is liable for a penalty. How much, sir? 1000 rupees for each day during such default continues. Maximum 1 lakh rupees. Maximum 1 lakh rupees. Next, uh, section 10a, I discussed with you. Section 10a already completed, ma. Conversion of companies, I told you. Right now, under articles of association alteration, I told you. So even after conversion, private to public, public to private, just constitution of company is getting changed. Private to public, public to private. So there will be no impact on existing debts, existing obligations, existing liabilities. They will continue. They will continue. There is no change. Next point. Subsidiary company is prohibited to hold shares in its holding company. What is this point? We discussed holding company, subsidiary company. So a company will become subsidiary to another company. If holding company is having more than half of total voting power or holding company is having control over composition of directors, control over composition of directors, yes or no, board of directors. Now, once a company becomes subsidiary to one entity, now, from that minute onwards, subsidiary company should not acquire shares of holding company. Holding company shall not allot, shall not allot any fresh shares, any fresh shares to subsidiary company, including rights issue, including rights. Bonus is different. Holding company can give bonus shares to subsidiary company. So the rule is the rule is very simple, ma. On the basis of control, we are we are classifying companies into two types. One is controlling company, and the other one is controlled company. One is in controlling, the other one is controlled company. Yes or no? 
again if you permit subsidiary to acquire shares of holding company now there is a clumsiness there will be clumsiness you can't observe which you can't find out which company is controlling another company which company is controlling which company suppose 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 h is uh, having 60% voting power in s yes. s is also having 60% voting power in uh, h now tell me which entity is controlling which entity sir h controls s sir acha even s is also controlling h so which entity is controlling which entity no clarity so that's the reason subsidiary company after becoming subsidiary it should not acquire shares of holding company holding company should not allot shares to the subsidiary company but to this general rule we had three exceptions one is one is before becoming subsidiary before becoming subsidiary a limited b limited two companies are there ma b limited acquired 10% share capital of a limited b limited is having 10% share capital of a limited it happened in the year 2022 now there is no relationship between a and b a is neither holding nor subsidiary b is neither holding nor subsidiary and there is no relationship between a and b subsequently in the year 2023 in the year 2023 a limited acquired 60% share capital of b limited now because of this you know b limited become subsidiary to a limited b limited became subsidiary to a limited now from date of becoming subsidiary b limited should not acquire new shares of a limited up to the date of subsidiary up to the date of becoming subsidiary whatever shares held by subsidiary company it can continue to hold such shares there is no problem with any one there is no issue at all so till the date of becoming subsidiary any shares held by subsidiary company it can continue to hold such shares no need to surrender in the year 2014 this question came for 5 marks how you know sir i'm the student of 2014 attempt i am the student of 2014 attempt and i wrote wrong answer that's why i still remember this question so until the date of becoming subsidiary if subsidiary holds any shares no need to surrender it can continue to hold such shares the point is no voting power no voting power in such cases there will be no voting power with respect to subsidiary company that means in a limited general meeting b limited can't participate with voting power b limited can't exercise any vote this is first exception second exception as a legal representative third exception as a trustee as a legal representative as a trustee subsidiary can hold shares of holding company subsidiary can hold shares of holding company suppose suppose company a limited b limited B Limited is already subsidiary of A Limited. B Limited is already subsidiary of A Limited. One of the director of B Limited, out of his personal funds, out of his personal funds, bought A Limited shares. Some two percent, two percent paid up share capital. You know, director is holding. One day, director got heart stroke, and he prepared a will. According to the will. b limited will be the legal guardian legal representative of son accordingly accordingly you know accordingly b limited is holding shares of a limited now b limited is not holding shares for its personal purpose it is holding shares as the legal representative representing son of the director it is holding shares of a limited so this is also permitted this is also permitted as a legal representative as a trustee subsidiary can hold shares of holding company in these two cases voting power is permitted why because subsidiary is not holding these shares for itself subsidiary is holding shares on behalf of some persons so voting power is permitted in case one voting power is prohibited in case one voting power is prohibited the no company either by itself or through its nominees hold any shares in holding company and no holding company shall allot or transfer its shares to any of its subsidiary companies any such allotment or transfer of shares to subsidiary company shall be void i told two points subsidiary shall not acquire shares of holding company holding company shall not allot its shares to subsidiary company what are the three exceptions 
one is as a legal representative the other one is as a trustee in both the cases participation in voting rights voting power is there voting power is there next one before it becomes subsidiary it can hold shares existing shares but it can't increase it it can't increase it in one attempt there is a question sir holding company issued bonus shares sir is this issue valid or invalid answer is valid why because allotment of bonus shares is at free of cost and because of bonus shares there is no change in percentage of holding there will be no change in percentage of holding even before it is holding 10 percent after issue of bonus shares also same 10 percent there is no change in voting percentage there is no change in holding pattern the bonus shares permitted rights fresh issue transfer all these are prohibited understood and you have to remember this point man you know in one examination attempt they asked voting rights sir. exclusively they asked for voting rights so voting rights are available in case of a trustee as well as legal representative but voting rights are not available if subsidiary company is holding shares for itself next signing of document self study you can read it on bone ma next last concept ma you know authentication of uh, documents proceedings and contracts sir generally company will enter into contract yes or no yes company is entering into contract with one of the supplier ma one of the supplier of goods now this contract document who will sign this contract document sir who will sign this contract document so the answer is kmp key managerial person or any officer or employee duly authorized by the board if these people are signing this contract that means company is bound by the provisions of that uh, contract company is bound by the terms of the contract so the document should be signed either by kmp or an officer or employee of the company authorized by the board so if you look at the definition of kmp ceo md manager cs full time director cfo and any officer below the directors a level below the directors who should be in full time employment and who has been designated as kmp precondition c any officer a level below directors it's not you know two levels three levels below the directors a level uh, in a hierarchy a level below directors who must be in full time employment and who is designated as kmp if these three conditions are satisfied then that person is also a kmp and such other officer as may be prescribed in future government may prescribe any person as kmp so these people will come under the definition of kmp next one next one you know authentication of hundis bills promissory notes and other documents so on behalf of company who can authenticate these documents very simple if company is having common seal first fix common seal first fix common seal sir company is not having any common seal sir then ignore common seal that letter <coughs> that letter of authorization for delegating power that letter should be signed by two directors <coughs> i'm sorry two directors in case company is having secretary then one director and one secretary should sign it suppose suppose reliance industry limited is having a branch office in guntur ma in guntur andhra pradesh one area one area guntur andhra pradesh one area so with respect to guntur andhra pradesh i'm the branch in charge i'm the in charge with respect to reliance company you can see mukesh dhirubhai ambani neeta ambani madam all these are directors and they are having you know more than 30000 branches for all these branches they need to pay rents they need to pay salaries yes or no for each and every payment you just imagine director signing the checks that means you know every day every minute they need to sign checks they need to sign checks no directors busy in signing the checks every month they should sign every day they should sign for making payments we had one clause in uh, income tax act any expenditure in excess of 10000 if you make payment in cash or bearer check that expenditure will be disallowed remember so now for making payments of you know rent salaries you know they can delegate the authority to staff for such a delegation for such a delegation they need to sign an authorization letter 
that authorization letter should contain form and seal plus two directors two director signature sir common seal is not there sir and then two director signature is sufficient suppose sir company secretary is there sir in that case common seal plus one director plus one company secretary signature is required sir common seal not there sir then one director plus one company secretary signature is sufficient that means that authorization letter if it is signed by two directors or one director and secretary uh, company authority can be delegated to that in charge now you know after getting this letter you know i can i can sign checks with respect to payment of rents with respect to payment of salaries so how authority is getting delegated that is all about this point are you all getting my point students so with this ma chapter number 2 incorporation of company and matters incidental there to we completed our next topic share capital and debentures as you all know company can raise money through various sources broadly i can classify these sources of finance into two types one is share capital and second one debt capital under share capital you can observe equity share capital and preference share capital under debt capital you can observe borrowings from banks financial institutions debentures acceptance of deposits provisions related to equity share capital preference share capital debentures are covered under chapter 4 share capital and debentures and provisions related to deposits are covered under chapter 5 acceptance of deposits so we'll start with share capital and debentures section 43 to section 72 on an average you can expect a uh, 8 marks from this topic including multiple choice questions okay so first of all share capital what is meant by share ma the definition of share is share means share in the share capital of the company and it includes a uh, stock that means the provisions of companies act 2013 that are applicable to share are equally applicable to stock so wherever you read word stock you know the provisions applicable to share are equally applicable to stock share is a smallest component of share capital a portion of share capital and stock means bundle of shares bundle of shares so you can call like this you know 10 shares 15 shares 20 shares but coming to the stock you know it is expressed in number you know monetary number you know 2 lakh stock 3 lakh rupee worth stock 4 lakh rupee worth stock like that you no know, stock is expressed in rupees share is expressed in number you know 10 shares 15 shares 20 shares bundle of shares if you surrender to company company will issue stock after taking back shares okay share you know you can't divide it into fractions like you know half share 3/4 share 1/5 share it is not possible but coming to stock you can transfer even in fractions also you know 20% stock 10% stock 5% stock you can transfer it understood so share means share in the share capital of the company and includes the stock next one the nature if you look at the nature of share you know it is a movable property it is transferable subject to aoa why because if you are a public company you know shares are freely transferable if you are a private company shares are transferable with some restrictions restricts the transfer of shares do you remember next one next one each and every share should be distinctively numbered so distinctively numbered this two conditions you know this condition the shares uh, share should satisfy so next one section 43 kinds of share capital kinds of share capital i'm not talking types of share capital i'm talking about kinds of share capital we had two kinds of share capital one is equity share capital the other one is preference share capital sir what is equity share capital sir any share capital that is not preference share capital we call it as equity share capital then what is preference share capital sir any share capital carrying two preferential rights two preferential rights one is with respect to payment of dividend the other one is with respect to repayment of capital in the event of liquidation yes yes equity shareholders are there preference shareholders are there to whom you give priority sir i'll give priority to preference shareholders so in terms of payment of dividend in terms of repayment of capital i'll give priority to preference shareholders so preference share capital carry two preferential rights 
and there is one more type of preferential capital that is you know participative preferential right participative preferential right sir even these two conditions are not satisfied you know dividend condition repayment of capital preferential rights are not there but at the time of liquidation along with equity shareholders you know suppose assets the total 100 crores liability 60 crores now there is a surplus surplus of 40 crores at the time of liquidation in this surplus along with equity share capital holders if uh, preference share capital holders are given a right then those shares we call it as preference shares those shares we call it as preferential shares the first part of preference share capital definition is capital which is having two priorities when compared to equity share capital so those two priorities are one is payment of dividend the other one is repayment of capital and there is another part of preference share capital definition that is you know a share capital which is having participative rights participative rights you know in the surplus arising out of uh, winding up proceedings or arising during liquidation proceedings so that portion of capital we call it as preference share capital you know issue and redemption of preference share capital we will discuss under section 55 now coming to equity share capital again this is of two types one is normal rights equity share equity shares with normal rights the other one is equity shares with differential rights differential rights as you all know holding equity share will give you many rights many rights popular two rights one is right in the share of profits i call it as dividend the other one is voting rights whenever a company calls for general meeting in that general meeting equity shareholders are entitled to cast vote now these two are very popular rights one is dividend the other one is voting power now under normal rights under normal rights each and every share is entitled to equal dividend and uh, equal voting rights but coming to differential rights you know here dividend may be high or may be low next one voting rights may be high or may be low example if you look at tata motors tata motors two types of shares they are having normal rights as well as differential rights under differential rights you know 10 shares holding 10 shares you will get only one vote general rule you know one share equal to one vote ma one share equal to one vote if they are fully paid up if they are fully paid up each share is entitled to one vote whereas Tata Motors differential rights you know 10 shares constitute one vote and to satisfy public you know you are getting less voting power right so for you the normal dividend plus 5% extra you are going to get 5% extra dividend suppose if normal dividend is 12% you will get 17% dividend sir why differential rights or differential rights will be given sir why company will prefer differential rights only one thing ma see we can categorize uh, members into two types one is promoters promoter group the other one is public group promoter group public group promoter group always focus on control over company so they don't focus on you know dividends why because company belongs to them yes or no major portion of capital lies with them promoter definition one who controls the affairs of the company as a member or a director or otherwise do you remember so they don't focus on dividend they focus on control so for them normal rights is okay for them normal rights if they hold normal rights no problem so each share will give one vote now coming to the public you know they will hold shares only for one purpose that is you know income revenue every year how much revenue will you pay to me how much income will you pay to me so there is nothing but dividends i need more dividends sir voting power no problem sir no problem see we won't come to the general meeting we won't participate in voting rights okay chalo even if you give voting power even if you give less voting power there is no problem and from promoter's point of view if they prefer differential rights if they if they look into differential rights only less control is getting diluted to the public suppose promoter is holding one share he will get only one vote now you know if you want to give one share to same share to the public public will also get one vote now dilution of control is happening dilution of control is happening now promoter's point of view issuing you know differential rights with less voting power you know promoter interest is getting protected there is no much dilution of control understood so tata motors issued a differential rights with a high dividends and less voting this is all about you know background of differential rights ma but for issue of differential rights so what are the conditions we need to satisfy you know issue of equity shares with the differential rights so what are the conditions we need to satisfy sir 
very simple first aoa authorization compulsory articles of association authorization is compulsory suppose if aoa is silent then do one thing implement section 14 pass special resolution alter aoa file documents with roc within 15 days and obtain certificate from roc now aoa authorization is permitted next one ordinary resolution from members if you are a listed company if you are a listed company then such ordinary resolution should be passed through postal ballot postal ballot kind of voting you have to conduct unlisted companies you know you can call for a general meeting in general meeting obtain ordinary resolution from members understood next one limit limit so to what extent i can offer differential rights sir very simple voting power from differential rights shall not exceed 74 percent of total voting power you know total voting power is nothing but voting power from differential rights plus voting power from normal rights so these two put together 74 percent you know out of that out of total 74 percent you know voting power from differential rights uh, limit so maximum maximum voting power from differential rights shall not exceed 74 percent of total voting power post issue of equity shares with differential rights and then next one and then next one defaults so the company should not have following defaults the company should not have following defaults sir what are those defaults sir very very important ma very important so what are those defaults I classify these defaults into you know two types for uh, easy remembering for easy remembering I classify these defaults into two types one is you know time defaults one is time defaults just one second ma so one is three years defaults and the other one is five years defaults the next one no subsisting default for remembering only i'm giving this chart just observe the so last three years last three years company should not company should not default in following aspects one is roc filing Every year, company is required to file, you know, hmm, annual returns under section 92, financial statements under section 137. So, there should be no default in the last three financial years. Suppose, sir, I committed default in the year 2022, sir. I didn't file annual return. I didn't file financial statements in the year 2022, sir. Okay. From then, three years, you are prohibited from issuing uh, equity shares with the differential rights. After three years, you are eligible to issue differential rights understood next one not penalized not penalized last three years you should not be penalized under you know sectorial regulators like rbi sebi scra fema any other sectorial regulators so last three years you should not be penalized under these uh, regulators so, sorry sectorial regulators next one coming to the subsisting default subsisting default means what sir at the time of issue of equity shares with the differential rights, you should not possess these defaults. You should not possess these defaults. Sir, what are those defaults, sir? You know, debentures, repayment of debentures, interest on debentures, deposits repayment, interest on deposits, preference share capital, preference share capital, and dividend on preference share capital. Next one. Next one. So, yes, so these three defaults you should not possess at the time of issue of equity shares with the differential rights. Everyone, next, sir. five years defaults means what? Five years defaults. Just remember, just listen carefully and remember this point, you know, tricky point. Three years means, you know, last three years you should not commit these defaults. Five years means, upon rectification upon rectification of these defaults upon rectification of default there is a ban of five years on you five years so it's not from default date it's from rectification of default year onwards 
five years there is a prohibition on you there is a ban on you sir what are those defaults sir very simple term loan interest on term loan if you commit any default in repayment of debentures interest on debentures deposits repayment of deposits and the payment of interest on deposits preferential capital and dividends understood next one you know term loan interest on term loan next one preference dividend preference dividend yes it is repeated twice ma in bear act also i observed you know preference dividend repeated twice here there is a point here also there is a point it is a mistake it is a mistake but uh, you have to read it next one iepf transfer of amounts to iepf next one employee statutory dues employee statutory dues like you know pf esi tds so if you commit any of these defaults you know if you commit any of these defaults first rectify them upon rectification prohibition of five years will be imposed on you that means suppose sir i committed default in the year 2023 sir the default is non payment of interest on term loan sir i failed to pay interest on term loan sir acha acha when you rectified it sir i rectified this default in the year 2025 sir now add five years so from 2030 onwards you are eligible to issue equity shares with differential rights observe the difference between 3 years defaults and 5 years defaults under 3 years defaults you know last 3 years you should not have these defaults last 3 years you should not have these defaults subsisting default means at the time of issue of equity shares with differential rights you should not possess these defaults 5 years defaults means yes default happened sir failed to pay term loan sir failed to pay preference dividend sir failed to transfer amounts to iepf amount sir failed to transfer dues sir employee statutory dues to the government authority sir in that case first rectify them and wait for 5 years after completion of 5 years you are eligible to issue equity shares with uh, differential rights understood so this is all about uh, defaults lengthy points ma but you have to remember next one next one so proper disclosures you know disclosures in register of members disclosures in board report regarding what you know number of shares offered hmm? uh, type of differential rights you know terms and conditions amount raised and to whom shares were offered so separate disclosure is required the next one conversion is not possible ma conversion that means you know normal rights to differential rights differential rights to normal rights it is not possible it is not permissible so if you want you can issue differential rights if you want you can issue normal rights next coming to the rights coming to the rights except voting and dividend except voting and dividend you know equity shares with normal rights and equity shares with differential rights will enjoy same privileges yes normal rights people are entitled to attend general meeting differential rights holders are also entitled to attend general meeting normal right holders will get notice calling for general meeting differential right holders they will also get notice calling for general meeting each and everything is same except voting and dividend even when you offer bonus shares you can offer bonus shares separately to normal rights as per same terms and say and uh, same terms you know you can offer uh, differential rights bonus shares to the differential rights holders that means when you offer bonus shares or rights issue you can offer same class of shares to the respect to class of shareholder suppose if i am holding normal right shares i'll be given bonus share with normal right only if i am holding a share with differential rights i'll get bonus share with a differential right only are you all getting my point students so this is all about conditions for issue of equity shares with differential rights you can see aoe condition unlisted company ordinary resolution listed company postal ballot Hmm? Next, max is seventy four percent of total voting power. Next, regular filing with ROC. Next, no default. Declared dividend to its shareholders. Dividend, deposits, preference capital, debentures, interest, dividend, term loan, employee statutory dues, IEPF dues. With respect to these points, you know, upon rectification after completion of five years, you can issue equity shares with differential rights and not penalized under regulator sectors. Sorry, sectorial regulators. So these four points I covered. Next, conversion is not possible, and same privileges they are also entitled to. Next, register of members separate disclosure, board report separate separate disclosure. Next one, non applicability. IFSC public companies, private companies. You know, if their MOA and AOA prescribe that section forty three is not applicable, then section forty three is not applicable to them. However, hmm. However, 
they should be regular in filing annual returns under section 92 and financial statements under section 137 with roc is it clear ma everyone so section 43 completed next section 46 section 46 very simple section section 46 speaks about share certificate section 46 covers not only original share certificate it also covers duplicate share certificate duplicate share certificate the so original share certificate ma it should be issued in form number sh1 you know format is sh1 next uh, you know rule of estoppel is applicable with respect to title of share certificate so share certificate you know three components are very very important you know name of the owners of the shareholders number of shares held by the persons and next one face value and paid up value so name you know who is the owner number of shares you know how many shares he is holding face value and paid up value so tomorrow what would be his liability you know maximum unpaid value maximum liability is unpaid value yes or no so with respect to these three components you know share certificate will act as a prima facie evidence understood next one you know signing share certificate is valid only only if this condition is satisfied that condition is if company is having common seal fix the common seal sir no common seal sir and company is having company secretary then one director and one secretary one director and one company secretary has to sign the financial uh, so, sorry has to sign the share certificate or else share certificate is invalid sir company is not having a secretary sir in that case two directors has to sign two directors has to sign share certificate understood if com common seal is there fix the common seal and get signature of director and secretary or get the signature of two directors common seal not there sir in that case no secretary is there one director plus one secretary sir no secretary sir then two directors two directors should sign share certificate and sir what is the time limit for issue of share certificate sir what is the time limit for issue of share certificate you know at the time of incorporation or at the time of allotment uh, you know within two months within two months within two months of incorporation date or within two months of allotment date share certificate shall be issued in the name of allottee or subscriber so the time limit is two months understood next one coming to the duplicate sir when duplicate share certificate will be issued sir no, when original share certificate is lost or destroyed this is case one and case two share certificate is defaced sir or turn turn into two pieces or you know five pieces ten pieces so if you observe you know we had two cases one is you know lost destroyed there is no share certificate at all original share certificate i lost sir share certificate is there sir but it is in two pieces sir or you know uh, some letters on the share certificate got erased sir you know defaced turn now under case one case one the applicant applicant for a duplicate share certificate should submit documents to the board of directors you know first one an application along with application he need to submit you know proof you know evidence that i lost share certificate and i am the member of the company sir you know proof or evidence next indemnity bond indemnity bond Sir, really, I lost share certificate, sir. Tomorrow, because of this share certificate, if you incur any loss, if you suffer any loss, I'll compensate you. Sometimes, what happened, you know? I'll have share certificate, you know, I'll give it to my friend or I'll give it to banker for the purpose of obtaining loan. For the purpose of obtaining loan, I'll give that uh, document to my friend or my or banker. Now, innocently, I'll come to bank and I'll I'll say, sir, I lost share certificate. Please give me duplicate share certificate. Now what happened tomorrow if I don't pay the amount, you know, either my friend or banker will come to the company and they will claim, you know, original share certificate in their name. Yes or no? They will, they will obtain share certificate in their name. In that case, you know, for company it is a loss. Giving share certificate to me and giving same share certificate to banker or, you know, to my friend to, with, uh, from whom I obtained money. So, such in such cases, you know, company will be at loss. Company will be at loss. So, that's what, you know, I'm telling to company. Because of my application, tomorrow if you suffer any loss, I'll compensate you, indemnity bond. And then fees, maximum 50 rupees ma, maximum 50 rupees. So upon submission of these documents, you know, board of directors, after giving approval, 
board of directors after giving approval so they shall issue duplicate share certificate in the name of a member in case of deface dot turn you know the document list is very simple you have to submit original share certificate original share certificate next one fees not exceeding 50 rupees now you know subject to board approval now subject to board approval company will issue duplicate share certificate in the name of applicant now here you know disclosure is very important ma. disclosure on the duplicate share certificate you know there is uh, you should mention a point you now duplicate share certificate issued in lieu of original share certificate number like that you know you have to make a disclosure and you have to maintain a register separately for duplicate share certificate and next one sir is there any time limit for issue of duplicate share certificate yes there is a time limit for issue of duplicate share certificate so time limit time limit so here companies are classified into two types a listed company unlisted company listed company you have to issue duplicate share certificate within 45 days unlisted company just double 45 days into two times how much 90 so write it in months three months so within three months of application unlisted company within 45 days of uh, application a listed company shall issue duplicate share certificate in the name of applicant and the duplicate share certificate shall contain a point that you know duplicate share certificate issued in lieu of original share certificate number and separate register has to be maintained is it clear up to here is it clear next the if these duplicate share certificates are issued you know duplication is genuine no problem any fraud sir you know duplicate shares issued with fraudulent intention fraudulent intention in that case officer in default come punishment 447 what is the punishment section 447 next one company a company you are also having a penalty how much you know minimum minimum five times of face value of the securities duplicated five times maximum you know there are uh, two limits ma you have to remember two limits option a is 10 times of face value of share certificates duplicated option b 10 crores whichever is higher whichever is higher you know what is the penalty on the company ma minimum five times of face value maximum two limits out of two limits whichever is higher you have to consider one is 10 times of the face value the other one is 10 crores one is the 10 times of the face value the other one is 10 crores understood so with this section 46 we completed so yes distinctively number to be issued under common seal signed by two directors everything i covered duplicate share certificate loss deface uh, mutilated turn you know fees uh, not exceeding 50 rupees disclosure duplicate issued in lieu of share certificate number so time limit you know three months for unlisted company 15 days already you know amendment came up 45 days 45 days from the date of submission of complete documents uh, with the company separately next one separate record you have to maintain but all these provisions are not applicable to dmat shares you know shares dmat form means you know shares in electronic form only one difference that is you know having 2000 rupees in your pocket it's a physical money it's like a share certificate now same 2000 rupee money if it is there in a bank account it's nothing but money in bank can you show it to me no can you tell me the denomination how many 500 rupee notes how many 100 rupee notes 50 rupee notes can you tell me no and you can transfer that money online also you can withdraw it or you can transfer money online also so now if money is in bank can you tell me the serial number of the currency serial number so each and every man each and every note will have a serial number can you tell that serial number if money is with bank no sir understood so distinct to numbering these provisions are not applicable to the shares which are in dmat form next one manner of issue of certificates you know duplicate certificates i told you prerequisites everything i told you records of particulars maintenance of share certificate all these points are covered next one punishment for defraud so what is the punishment i told you right company minimum five times maximum 10 times or 10 crores whichever is higher every officer of the company is in default or liable for action under section 447 next uh, section 47 so next concept section 47 voting rights very simple topic only very simple topic 
47 voting rights here i classify this section into two types one is equity share capital a preference share capital in every general meeting in every general meeting equity share capital holders are entitled to vote they are entitled to vote on every resolution placed in front of them in the general meeting however these voting rights are subject to three conditions one is no voting rights with respect to calls in advance calls in advance means any amount you paid extra you know extra whatever amount called by the company if you are paying any extra amount that extra amount i call it as calls in advance for calls in advance no voting rights and your voting rights are subject to differential rights i told you under tata motors you know sorry in tata motors company if you hold 10 shares of differential rights you'll get one vote next one a related party transaction a related party transaction so in any resolution if you have any interest if you or your relative is having any interest then you are not entitled to vote you are not entitled to vote understood so except these three conditions you know on every each and uh, in front of uh, you in the general meeting on every resolution you are having a power to cast vote under show of hands you are entitled to one vote one vote one person one shareholder one vote one shareholder whereas in case of poll in case of poll votes depends upon number of shares held by you so proportion to the paid up share capital so what is the total paid up share capital in the total paid up share capital how much portion you are holding to that much or no for that much uh, portion to that portion you are entitled to voting power however in case of nidhi company there is a, a note point the note point is member exceeding five percent of uh, paid up share capital holding you know five percent of paid up share capital he is entitled to vote only up to five percent five percent voting power only he will have he will not have you know if he is holding 10 percent paid up share capital 10 percent voting power 20 percent paid up share capital 20 percent voting power like that you know in nidhi company that clause is not there you know that uh, that privilege is not there that privilege is not there any portion in excess of five percent of paid up share capital you know for that portion you are not entitled to voting up to five percent voting is allowed clear next one the preference shareholders preference shareholders so will they get voting power generally no however matters affecting their rights matters affecting their rights suppose you know you promised at the time of issue 10 percent dividend every year now you know company is not performing well you want to reduce it to eight percent so yes this is a matter affecting their rights so you need to call for a meeting you need to call them for a meeting class meeting in that class meeting you have to take approval of from them after getting approval you can reduce uh, 10 percent to eight percent next one in the event of capital reduction sorry during capital reduction capital reduction event so section 66 i think I'll discuss under section 66 don't worry so reduction of capital next during liquidation of company winding up you know they will get voting rights so matters affecting their rights capital reduction liquidation or winding up of the company apart from these uh, three conditions you know apart from these three cases you know when preference dividend when preference dividend remains unpaid consecutively for a period of two years or more two years or more if preference dividend remains unpaid then they will get voting rights similar to equity shareholders similar to equity shareholders suppose you know last two years you didn't pay dividend to preference shareholders equity share capital suppose you know 10 crores rupees is there preference share capital also 10 crore rupees is there now you know last two years you didn't uh, paid any dividend to preference shareholders now the next general meeting you know upcoming general meeting both equity shareholders and preference shareholders are entitled to attend general meeting and entitled to cast vote in the general meeting so equity shareholders will have 50 percent voting power preference shareholders will have 50 percent voting power why because you know total 20 crores right out of 20 crores equity share capital is 10 crores preference share capital is 10 crores so equity shareholders are 50 percent voting power preference shareholders 50 percent voting power once you repay the sorry once you pay dividends to them once you pay dividends to them then they will lose their voting rights 
they will lose their voting rights understood everyone so you can see here poll shall be in proportion to his share in the paid up equity share capital of the company total paid up share capital of the company 100 crores and you are holding you know 10 crores so 10 out of 100 means 10 percent now you are having 10 percent voting power coming to nidhi companies your voting is restricted to five percent of uh, voting power understood understood next one voting right of member holding preference share capital i told you right matters affecting their rights winding up of the company reduction of equity share capital or preference share capital next uh, poll so proportion to his share in the paid up preference share capital of the company and this point also i discussed with you just give one time reading you'll get to know next one yes special benefits to private company ma you know private company which is regular in filing uh, returns with roc and in this in the in articles of association of that company if they write that section shall 47 shall not apply then section 40 shall sorry section 47 is not applicable to private companies so simply section 47 is not applicable to private companies which satisfy two conditions one is aoa should specifically exclude section 47 second one the regular in filing annual returns and financial statements with a roc understood everyone next one you know specified ifsc companies common point just go through this chart you'll get clarity next one section 48 section 48 so variation of rights section 48 is simply variation of rights five minutes back i told one example you know 10 percent preference share capital redeemable after 10 years redeemable after 10 years now reading this statement reading this statement you can get this point you know preference shareholders are having two rights one is every year 10 percent dividends and after 10 years after 10 years complete redemption complete redemption yes or no so if you are holding this share you are entitled to two rights one is dividend 10 percent second one is after 10 years 100 percent redemption right right now company is in bad position company is not performing well company is not in a position to pay 10 percent dividend company want to reduce it to eight percent now whose right is getting affected your right is getting affected yes or no and company is seeking modification in the terms of the contract so terms of the contract if you want to modify mutual consent is required so preference shareholders consent is required yes or no that means you have, you need to get approval from them so condition number one check your moa and aoa moa aoa authorization is there or not sir no sir authorization is not there then check issue terms you know when you are offering shares when you are offering uh, when you offered uh, preference shares so you might have mentioned some terms and conditions so look at those issue terms so issue terms should not have prohibition not have prohibition hmm, on variation you need to check it sir there is no prohibition on variation sir then you can proceed with variation suppose sir moa authorization is not there and in issue terms there is a prohibition on variation sir now you can't change rights of the members you can't change rights of the members condition number two sir condition one satisfied next condition two and before that one small point you know 48 is applicable 48 is applicable only if company had different classes of shares different classes of shares you know equity shares with the normal rights equity shares with the differential rights equity shares preferences like that you know company must have more than one class of shares and then condition number one moa OA authorization if no authorization then check issue terms the condition one satisfied no condition two if you are able to call for a class meeting if you are able to call for a class meeting then obtain special resolution from them no sir i'm not calling for any meeting sir in writing i want to get approval sir in that case three-fourth of a capital three-fourth of that class capital 
simply suppose you know preference share capital is suppose uh, say for suppose 60 crores 60 crores now 60 crores rupees into 3 fourth means how much 45 crore rupees holders preference shareholders i'm not talking about count of preference shareholders i'm telling that 45 crores worth holders must give approval in writing if you are able to call for a meeting then obtain special resolution no sir we are taking approval in writing sir you know like postal ballot then three fourth of a class capital should give approval and here there is one more point ma that is that is variation of one class affects the other class other class members variation of one class members is affecting other class members then you have to take approval from other class members also you have to take approval from other class members also example you want example right see ma normal rights equity share with normal rights one share equal to one vote ma differential rights you know 10 shares equal to one vote okay in a company imagine in a company total there are you know 90 shares of normal rights differential rights also 90 shares are there 90 shares are there now voting power if you observe into 1 90 into 1 by 10 9 so total 99 ma total how many 99 so out of 99 if you observe you know these people are holding how much portion you know maybe 91 percent they are holding this one you know maybe you know 9 percent 9 divided by 99 i'll wait i'll calculate 9 divided by 99 you know it's a 9.09 so out of total voting power differential rights are holding 9.09 percent and normal rights holders are holding 90.1 percent or 90.9 percent 90.9 percent you understood you understood this example you know normal rights 90 shares will give 90 words differential rights 90 shares will give you 9 words now you know company decided to change the terms the terms is you know one tenth is there no for every 10 shares they are entitled to one vote right now we want to modify it as one share equal to one share equal to two votes sir one share equal to two votes sir in that case you know after variation what happens see normal rights 90 into 1 differential rights 90 into 2 total 90 plus 180 270 you know normal rights shareholders actually they are holding 90.9 percent capital however now they are holding just 33.33 percent of total voting power differential rights they are holding you know 66.67 percent of the voting power so variation of one class is affecting variation of other class sorry sorry variation of one class is affecting variation of one class is affecting other class rights in that case you need to get approval from other class also what kind of approval sir three-fourth capital holders approval is required three-fourth class capital three-fourth capital of class holders approval is required understood everyone next one next point so with this two conditions fulfilled next sir next one once you get approval variation is permitted however members holding members holding not less than 10 percent of class capital 10 percent of that that class capital you know who casted votes against to the variation we don't want that variation sir we are opposing the variation we call them as dissenting shareholders now these dissenting shareholders can file a petition with nclt within 21 days 21 days of variation so who can file petition with a uh, nclt ma dissenting shareholders not uh, holding not less than 10 percent of capital not less than 10 percent of capital can file a petition what is the time limit 21 days of variation now nclt will decide whether to permit the variation or eliminate the variation so nclt will pass the order ma and company has to file that order with a roc within 30 days so within 30 days of nclt order the same copy should be filed with a roc that is all about section 48 one point you have to remember 
one one tricky point you have to remember the tricky point is how much approval we need to take if you are able to call for meeting if you are able to conduct a meeting then you know special resolution sir in my company there are more than 200 members sir compulsory postal ballot kind of voting you have to implement under postal ballot capital value Three fourth, you know, three fourth of issued shares of the class. That much capital holders must give approval in writing. Understood. And same points are already covered, ma. So yes, dissenting shareholders can file a petition with NCLD, but they should hold at least ten percent of the class capital. So time limit for application twenty one days. Tribunal decision is binding. Next, file copy of order with the ROC. So section 48 also we completed. Next section 49, 50 very small points ma. No, that is you know calls on shares. One is calls on shares. So whenever company is making calls on shares, you know they should be on uniform basis. That means with respect to particular class, the call amount should be same, same for all members, and the time limit for making call payment, time limit for making call payment, that should be also same. Suppose for one member, come on, pay half rupee. Another member, pay me two rupees. Another member, pay me five rupees. It is not permitted. Same on uniform basis. Understood? So there should be no differentiation in a given class of security holders. Next section 50 is all about calls in advance. Calls in advance. Calls in advance, you know, company can accept only if there is authorization from AOA. And with respect to calls in advance, there is no extra voting rights. There is no extra dividend rights also. No voting rights, no extra dividends, no extra voting. Suppose, you know, face value 10 rupee. Called up as well as paid up value is 8 rupee. One member paid, you know, entire 10 rupees to the company. So in this 8 rupee is paid up value. 2 rupee is calls in advance. Now with respect to 8 rupees only, he is entitled to vote. With respect to 2 rupees, he is not entitled to vote. Why? Because the 2 rupees is not a part of capital. It is a part of liability. For the 2 rupees, you are like a creditor. Creditor is not entitled to vote in the general meeting of company. Understood? Next one. Section 51. Dividend ma. The company may pay proportionate dividend on such paid up capital. Subject to AOA. Suppose, you know, one class of shares, you know, we had two types of clauses. For example, you know, normal rights, differential rights. Tata Motors having no face value two rupees, two rupees each ma. Paid up value normal rights two rupees. Differential rights only one rupees. Generally, generally dividends are paid on face value. Actually, general, uh, generally, you know, on face value dividends will be paid. If AOA permits, AOA authorization is there. Then on paid up value will pay dividends. On paid up value will pay dividends. Next. Next one. So may pay proportionate dividend on paid up capital, including calls in advance, subject to AOA. Subject to AOA. They are using the word subject to AOA. If AOA permits, they will pay dividends proportion to paid up capital. That means on two rupees and on one rupee. Suppose 20% dividend, no 20% on paid up value, 20% on 1 rupee paid up value. Nothing is mentioned. You can pay on face value. Your choice. Next step. Preference shareholders, you know, dividend is always a fixed rate. Normal point only. Next one. Issue of shares at a premium. Very simple topic. Issue of shares at premium. Section 52. Securities premium. You know, under section 52, there is no condition to fix the securities premium. See, securities premium is nothing but issue price minus face value. There is no condition on import, you know, there is no condition on calculation of securities premium. You know, you can fix only 20% of face value. You can fix 100% of face value as security premium. There is no such condition. There is no condition on uh, limit of share capital. There is a condition on utilization of securities premium. Utilization. So there are some restrictions on usage of uh, restrictions on usage of security premium. So first of all, whatever excess amount you collect, you know, in excess of face value, that amount shall be transferred to securities premium account. 
that amount shall be transferred to securities premium account and that amount you can utilize for stated purposes only so here companies are classified into two types one is companies following accounting standards while preparing financial statements you know companies while preparing financial statements you know following accounting standards as per section 133 and all other companies like you know banking company insurance company electricity company like that so companies preparing financial statements according to accounting standards they can utilize securities premium for three purposes one is you know buyback the other one is expenses of liquidation sorry expenses of issue issue related expenses next one bonus issue bonus issue now coming to all other companies you know securities premium can be used for five purposes buyback bonus issue issue related expenses you know issue related expenses next uh, premium redemption premium premium on redemption of preferential redemption premium and to write off preliminary expenses to write off preliminary preliminary oh my god preliminary expenses understood so for all other companies security premium can be used for these five purposes whereas uh, section 133 companies that means companies following finance sorry companies following accounting standards in preparation of financial statements they can utilize securities premium for three purposes only except to the stated purposes if you utilize securities premium then instead of debiting securities premium you have to debit share capital account generally securities premium you know it's a credit balance credit balance you can utilize securities premium for stated purposes other than stated purposes if you utilize securities premium then you can't debit securities premium instead of debiting securities premium you have to debit capital that means section 66 reduction of share capital provisions shall apply understood so AOA authorization is also not required you can fix securities premium it's your discretionary powers but if you fix more amount then you know income tax act 1961 will apply so they will compare you know issue price with the fair value of share fair value not face value fair value if issue price is more than fair value then you know fair value i'm calling once again fair value the difference will be taxed under income from other sources income tax act subject is there you know income tax act income from other sources uh, this provision is there under companies act there is no restriction on fixation of securities premium the restriction is only on usage of securities premium clear next one issue of shares at a discount issue of shares at a discount Dima, issue of shares at a discount is void general rule is void however we had two exceptions exception one sweaty equity shares where is that point see except in case of issue of sweaty equity shares you know this is exception one exception two issue of shares to the creditors under statutory resolution plan or debt restructuring scheme you know in past i i borrowed money from non-trade creators i obtained materials from trade creators but now i'm not in a position to repay them i want to survive i want to do business however i'm not having money to pay money to pay them so now what i will do i'll implement a plan or i'll implement a scheme you know debt restructuring scheme or statutory resolution plan under this scheme or plan, I'll invite creators. Creators, I'm liable to you, right? I'm liable to you, right? Come. Just uh, wave off my debt. I'll give you shares. Just cancel my debt. Equal amount, I'll give you shares. Equal amount, I'll give you shares. Sometime I'll give extra shares. Suppose, you know, debt amount is 80 crores. Sir. I'll give you 10 crore equity shares. Each face value 10 rupees. So I'll give you 100 crores face value of equity shares for waiving of 80 crores debt. Now if you observe here, if you observe here, 20 crores is actually discount on issue of equity shares. Permitted or sir, general rule not permitted, but if it is as per statutory resolution plan or debt restructuring scheme, permitted. Okay. Except to these two cases, if you offer equity shares, you know, if you offer shares at a discount, then we call it as default. In case of default, you know, the penalty as well as refund, two conditions will apply. Two things you have to follow. One is refund. Sir, you have to refund entire money. Along with that, you have to pay interest also, 12% per annum. 
so you need to refund money in addition to refund you have to pay 12 percent interest per annum from the date of uh, uh, accepting money you know date of uh, receipt of money to date of payment and then penalty penalty how much sir you know option a five lakh rupee option b amount raised through issue of equity shares uh, at a discount i'm sorry it's not equity shares 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 include equity as well as preference shares includes equity as well as preference so penalty to both company and officer in default is rupees 5 lakhs or amount raised through issue of shares at a discount whichever is less whichever is less remember these words very very important understood understood so you can prepare chart on your own ma very simple you know issue of shares at a discount at a discount void uh, exceptions what are those exceptions ma one is sweat equity shares second one is you know creditors issue of shares to the creditors under statutory resolution plan or debt restructuring scheme violation suppose violation consequence refund along with refund you have to pay 12 percent interest per annum and then company as well as officer in default liable to pay penalty how much sir rupees 5 lakhs or amount raised through issue of shares at discount whichever is less completed section 54 also we completed next one sweat equity shares what is the next concept sweat equity shares but equity shares means equity shares they are also equity shares how to remember this word ma they are also equity shares they are also equity shares issued by a company to its directors or employees at a discount or for consideration other than cash for providing their know-how or making available rights in the nature of intellectual property rights or value additions whatever name you call whatever name you call you know today company can survive only with the efforts of employees ma particularly if you look at service sector companies telecom companies you know infosys wipro reliance geo infocom employee contribution is compulsory without employee contribution you can't run these companies in a long run infosys you take infosys you take you know one particular employee or one particular director he really worked very hard and you know he got one new contact a new contact a new customer new client so we can build to that client you know almost thousand crores every year so that much uh, you know that much worth of revenue he contributed to the company now you know what we are doing we are offering shares to him either at a discount so generally you know face value face value 10 rupee but director you worked a lot your efforts are really wonderful awesome you just pay me two rupees only we'll give you one crore shares one crore shares each share 10 rupee face value but you just pay me 2 rupees now the difference 8 rupees is nothing but discount this is discount next one for consideration other than cash suppose you know in dr reddy laboratories one employee is there he worked very hard and he invented a medicine to cure covid covid so he he developed a formula he developed a medicine which can cure covid now it comes under you know intellectual property rights intellectual property rights the value of that intellectual property rights for example you know 10 crores now we are calling that employee come come my dear employee because of your efforts we got this intangible asset of 10 crores we'll offer you shares you know 1 crore into 10 rupee share don't pay me 1 rupee also no need to pay 1 rupee so here you know for consideration other than cash i'm getting consideration from you but it is not in cash it is in the form of intellectual property rights know how services value addition etc so now what entry I'll record, you know, very simple, you know, intangible asset account debit uh, to equity share capital. So simply 10 crores, 10 crores. If I'm getting asset, I'll capitalize it. If I'm not getting asset, what I'll do, you know, I will charge that amount to profit and loss account under the heading of employee benefit expense. Employee benefit expense. Now, you know, to which director or which employee a company can offer sweat equity shares? Do you think all directors and employees are eligible for sweat equity shares? No, no, no. Only directors, employees, you know, working in our company or our holding company or subsidiary company. Maybe in India or outside India, but they should be in permanent employment. 
they should be in permanent employment you can see this condition man see here you know definition of employee permanent employee temporary employee disqualified from getting sweat equity shares only permanent employees he may work in india or outside india he may work for our company or for our subsidiary company or for our holding company either in india or outside india so coming to the director either whole time director or part time director no problem these people are eligible to get sweat equity shares either at a discount price or for a consideration other than cash now looking at the conditions what are the conditions you know company should satisfy before issuing sweat equity shares first one special resolution obtain special resolution from members and this special resolution is valid only for 12 months after 12 months you know special resolution is lapsed once again you need to get special resolution then only you can offer sweat equity shares or else you can't offer sweat equity shares next you know for getting this resolution you need to give notice calling for general meeting along with the notice give them explanatory statement in that explanatory statement furnish the details you know number of shares what is the current market price and what consideration you are getting and to whom you are offering a sweat equity shares if you are a listed company in addition to company set you have to comply sebi also and coming to the sweat equity shareholders you know coming to the sweat equity shareholders these people will carry same rights similar to the existing equity shareholders so same rights limitations restrictions provisions that are applicable to equity shareholders same rights limitations restrictions provisions shall apply to sweat equity shareholders there is a, a limit there is a limit the limit is at the time of issue you know new issue new you can offer 15% or 5 crores whichever is higher 15% of existing paid up share capital in a year or 5 crores rupees whichever is higher subject to do a cumulative number subject to do a cumulative limit of 25% in the lifetime of the company for understanding this point definitely one example is necessary one example is necessary a limited company is there paid up share capital is 200 crores in the year 2019 they issued sweat equity shares of 10 crores ma now in the year 2023 they are planning for sweat equity shares they are planning to issue sweat equity shares planning to issue sweat equity shares how much sir you know uh, 15 percent max 15 percent max or 5 crores whichever is higher so 15 percent of 200 crores existing paid up share capital so that is 30 crores 30 or 5 whichever is higher 30 is the highest amount already i issued 10 crores right now cumulative effect that is you know 25 percent max lifetime lifetime uh, lifetime you know 25 percent right so 200 crores into 25 percent it will be 50 crores so existing 10 proposed 30 total put together they are within 50 crores only they are within 50 crores only so happily they can offer sweat equity shares of 230 crores there is no issue no problem next next example b limited company is there same paid up share capital excluding sweat equity shares is 200 crores in the year 2018 they offered 30 crores sweat equity shares in the year 2018 they offered 30 crores sweat equity shares now in the year 2023 they are planning to issue sweat equity shares of uh, 25 crores possible or not possible we need to check individually for year 2023 you can offer 15 percent of 200 crores so 30 crores now during the lifetime of company a company can offer sweat equity shares up to 25 percent of 200 crores paid up share capital that is 50 crores already 30 crores issued now 30 plus 30 put together 60 it is violating second condition that is 25 percent of 200 crores so this time 30 is not permitted max 20 is only permitted why because existing one existing already 30 you issued now new existing plus new should be less than or equal to 25 percent of paid up equity share capital paid up equity share capital so that means 30 plus x less than or equal to 50 crores now x should be less than or equal to 20 crores so this time you can offer sweat equity shares up to 20 crores only coming to the startup company up to 10 years of incorporation the limit is 50 percent it's not 25 percent 50 percent 
startup companies generally grow based on employee contribution only employee will work hard only when they get better incentives next lock in period ma this is applicable only for unlisted companies unlisted companies lock in period so lock in period means what during this period employee is not permitted to transfer these shares up to 3 years from the date of allotment you are prohibited from transferring these shares lock in period compulsorily you have to hold next valuation sir share share price intellectual property rights know how value addition these two should be valued who can value sir you know a registered valuer it should be carried out by a registered valuer just telling about myself you no know, apart from uh, you know along with the ca qualification i am also holding this qualification i'm holding qualification of registered valuer under security financial assets also so my signature is compulsory my my calculation <laughs> it's not signature my calculation and i should value you know the share and intellectual property rights and know how value addition so definitely you know company will prepare that value i'll verify so far you know if you look into my uh, practice look into my practice you know basically you know company will determine the values i will also calculate values if my calculation and their calculation is matching then i will fix that price if there is any difference you know definitely i'll disclaim it or you know i'll fix another value and i'll submit my report to the management so far i think uh, i issued a uh, 8 to 8 to 10 reports ma fixed a valuation of shares 8 to 10 companies not sure okay so registered valuer is eligible person to value the share and value the intellectual property rights know how as well as value addition next board of directors report board of directors report for the year in which such shares are issued specify the details of uh, issue of credit equity shares next members register separate disclosure is required why because Three years you impose lock-in period, right? So that the disclosure should be there, yes or no? So disclose them separately in members' register. Next one, treatment of non-cash uh, consideration. I told you, if sufficient amount we are receiving a asset, the amount of equity shares you are offering, amount value of equity shares you are offering, if that much value if you are getting asset, just capitalize it, capitalize it, or as expense, charge it to the profit and loss account. next one employee definition value addition definition already covered next next one write about provisions of companies act regarding issue of preference shares you know section 55 section 55 is having conditions with respect to issue as well as redemption of preference shares issue as well as redemption of preference shares issue related conditions uh, redemption related conditions we are having at one place one place that is section 55 issue simple conditions aoa authorization next sir, special resolution from members is required why because preference shareholders carry two preferential rights one is dividend the other one is capital so compared to equity these people will get dividend first these people will get capital first in the event of liquidation so existing equity shareholders right is getting affected so you have to get approval from existing equity shareholders the kind of approval is special resolution next irredeemable preference shares can a company offer irredeemable preference shares no and maximum tenure is 20 years in case of infra companies companies with infrastructure projects 30 years is the maximum tenure however 21st year onwards every year 10% redemption should happen every year you know 21st year 10% 22nd year 10% 23rd year 10% like that you know 10 years each year 10% redemption is must and should next one no subsisting default important important you know at the time of offering preference shares the company should not have following defaults one is payment of preference dividend payment of preference dividend the other one is repayment of a preference share capital to preference shareholders logic very simple if you are not able to satisfy existing preference shareholders why new preference shareholders if you are not able to satisfy existing preference shareholders why new preference shareholders first satisfy existing preference shareholders pay them dividends regularly repay the capital whenever you know due hap due occurs So if you have these defaults, first rectify them, and then you can offer 
preferences. So this is all about conditions with respect to issue. Very simple. Next, the redemption. You know, AOA authorization not at all required. Suppose if there is no clause in AOA regarding redemption, can you say like this? My AOA didn't permit me to redeem preference share for capital. So I am not redeeming preference share capital. Permitted? Ah? No. No, you have to repay irrespective of AOA authorization. Next one, the class of share should be fully paid up. Preference share should be fully paid up. Next one, sources. Very important, sources. Now here, you need to classify the redemption amount into two parts. One is face value. The other one is premium on redemption. Premium on redemption. Suppose you know, face value is 100 rupees and you promise that you will redeem it at 120 rupees redemption value 120 if you observe 120 is of two components 100 face value 20 premium on redemption coming to face value you have two sources one is you know profits of the company reserves the second one is issue proceeds issue proceeds of fresh issue suppose if you select profits of the company then nominal value of shares to redeem that amount you have to transfer to CRR account, Capital Redemption Reserve account. Issue process, there is no problem. Now coming to premium on redemption, you had two sources. One is profits of the company. The other one is securities premium. You know, section 133 companies, 133 means what? You know, companies uh, preparing financial statements according to accounting standards. They can use only profits. Other companies, they can use profits or they can use securities premium for premium on redemption of preference shares so this is about sources next one once redemption happened you know roc filing within 30 days you know file uh form with roc along with the uh, moa memorandum of association roc filing is also compulsory next point sir failed to redeem sir failed to redeem sir we are not in a position to redeem in that case, we call them as unredeemed preference shares. UPS, such a preference shares, we call them as unredeemed preference shares. In case of unredeemed preference shares, you know, company will take back old shares, old shares, and company will issue new shares to the preference shareholders. But this requires, uh, you know, consent of preference shareholders, consent of preference shareholders, not less than three fourths of capital value. 3 fourth of capital value. Suppose 60 crores is the preference share of capital, sir. In this 3 fourth means how much? You know, 45 crores. 45 crores worth of preference share capital holders must give consent. Next one, you know, pay off to dissenting shareholders. Pay off to dissenting shareholders. Suppose, you know, I got approval from 59 crores worth of preference share capital holders, sir. Remaining 1 crore, return their money. Finally, take NCLT approval. Approval from NCLT is also required. Now, you know, these new shares, you know, they can, uh, they can have, you know, these new shares can cover two amounts. One is preference share capital. The other one is dividends that remain unpaid, unpaid dividends. So, yes, you can issue shares covering these two values. Sir, in that case, share capital may increase, no, sir. Now, increase of share capital provisions will apply or not applicable. You know, even if you issue new shares, which is more than existing share capital, you know, increment in share capital provisions will not at all apply. So with this section 55 also we completed. Section 55 also completed. So redemption is must. Tenure is there. Redemption condition out of profit fresh proceeds. Redemption shares to be fully paid up. Out of profits, out of fresh issue. CRR condition, I told you. Sources for premium on redemption. You know, if you are a company covered under section 133, you know, you can use only profits. Other companies, they can use securities premium. Out of company securities premium. Unable to redeem. We call them as unredeemed preference shares. Uh, obtain resolution, approval from them, 314 value. Approval of NCLT. Descending shareholders shall be paid off. No increase or reduction of capital provision shall apply. So with this section 55 also I completed. Section 55 also I completed. Are you all getting my point students? Everyone. The beginning of this chapter I clearly told you shares nature is movable. 
they are mobile in nature they are transferable subject to aoa in case of private company on transfer there are some restrictions in case of public company the shares are freely transferable right so with respect to transfer we had some provisions those provisions were listed under section 56 now let's look into section 66 you know conditions for transfer of shares so what can be transferred first if it is a company with share capital transfer of securities if it is a company without share capital transfer of interest each and every member will have some interest in that company so since there is no share capital ownership will be measured in terms of interest 10% interest 20% 25% 30% now these two can be transferred the following conditions shall be satisfied in order to register about transfer what are those conditions first to proper instrument ma sh4 it should be duly dated signed stamped so it should be executed by both transferor and transferee understood so here transferee has to detail specify the details you know name address occupation you know if you look at incorporation documents you know initially subscribers will furnish their name details address occupation everything at the time of allotment also you know for the for, for, for getting shares you know looking at public offer or private placement the applicant should furnish name address occupation everything now under transfer also transfer should furnish complete details so this transfer document you know along with original share certificate in case original share certificate is issued original share certificate plus proper instrument if share certificate is not at issue then letter of allotment plus instrument either transferor or transferee should submit uh, these documents with company within 60 days of execution within 60 days of execution of uh, instrument you know uh, transfer deed and these rules are not applicable to bonds of government company and shares held in a dmat form so whatever we are discussing under section 56 these provisions are not applicable to bonds of government company as well as shares held in dmat form so 60 days time limit we are having ma instrument along with original share certificate you know it should be submitted to company within 60 days from date of execution if instrument is lost then no problem submit indemnity bond submit indemnity bond under section 46 issue of duplicate share certificate we discussed that point right same point once again i am telling you indemnity bond if instrument is lost or if share certificate is lost submit indemnity bond next one if shares are partly paid up you know shares involved in the transfer is partly paid up and if that application is executed by transferor alone i repeat two conditions condition 1 shares are partly paid up condition 2 application executed by transferor alone then company should not register company shall not register this transfer deed shall not register this transfer until and unless it gives two weeks intimation to the transferee transferee the shares involved in the transfer is partly paid up tomorrow if company calls on shares if company makes calls on shares you are liable to pay call amount so you had two weeks time limit within two weeks you have to give your opinion if no reply from you we assume that you approved this transfer and will register this transfer you know registration of transfer the effect is transferor name will be removed from transfer register of members transferor share certificate shall be cancelled transferring name details are added to the register of member new share certificate in the name of transferee you know company will issue and what is the time limit one month is a time limit within one month of submission of these documents with company company shall issue new share certificate in the name of transferee understood so total three time limits we discussed under section 40 sorry 56 one is 60 days of execution you know transferor or transferee should submit these documents with company and if shares are partly paid up partly paid up instrument is executed by transferor alone then company should give notice to transferee and transferee is having a two weeks time limit to reply to company next one if everything is clear company has to issue share certificate in the name of transferee within one month from the receipt of complete documents next one transmission you know these provisions are not applicable to transmission what provisions you know execution of transfer deed consideration stamp duty value 
all these conditions are not applicable in case of transmission first of all what is transmission sir you know transmission is also like transfer but it is not transfer you know it is a purely under operation of law suppose you know one member got deceased now legal representative or nominee automatically becomes member of the company now shares in the name of this member are transmitted to legal representative or nominee suppose you know member became insolvent now through operation of law all the properties are held by mr m shall be transmitted to official assignee who will sell all these assets in order to clear discharge liabilities so this is also transmission case so in case of transmission you know transfer instrument transfer deed you know consideration stamp duty value 60 days time limit are not applicable and company should register the documents in the name of nominee so cases of transmission you know death case insolvency case lunacy case time limit for issue of share certificates issue of security sorry not share certificates securities why because here debenture point is also there so what is the time limit of issue of securities you know at the time of incorporation within two months at the time of allotment of shares you know shares two months from the date of allotment of shares this is specific for shares only in case of debentures you know we are having time limit of six months six months from date of allotment next one in case of transfer or transmission you know the time limit is one month from the date of receipt of instrument of transfer or intimation of transmission and if it is ifsc company you know for the double time limit that is you know 60 days 60 days after incorporation allotment transfer transmission everything 60 days unique time limit easy to remember ifsc companies easy to remember 60 days after incorporation 60 days you know transfer documents transmission documents 60 days from the date of allotment whereas for other companies two months from incorporation two months from allotment one month from uh, date of receipt of uh, uh, transfer deed or intimation of transmission and in case of debentures six months from date of allotment next one next one ma. very simple point no in case of death of a member in case of death of a member by way of transmission by way of transmission legal representative will become member of the company now legal representative he is having two options option a register shares in his name ma. register shares in his name in the name of legal representative or transfer of shares to some third party transfer of shares to third party sir i don't want shares sir i need money i will transfer all these shares to the interested candidates i'll transfer shares to the interested candidates now actually who is the original member who is the original shareholder m is the member of the company m is a shareholder so in the shares you will find the name of m however particularly in this case the transfer date you know m can't sign why because m already deceased so legal representative signing on behalf of deceased member is sufficient the transfer is valid and the third party who gets shares from the legal representative of a deceased member the transfer is also valid so he can choose any option transmission he can choose or directly he can transfer to third party next one default section 56 default so company and officer in default penalty 50,000 rupees so depository if shares are held in demat form you know depository is responsible for those shares if you commit any fraud he will be punished under section 447 of companies act 2013 so with these provisions related to transfer completed ma forged transfer forged transfer somewhat tricky point tricky topic tricky point just listen carefully o is a original member ma o is a original member f obtained shares under forgery transfer forgery you all know the meaning of forgery forgery means imitating the signature of a person imitating signature of a person so f executed a transfer deed you know sh4 so transfer details you know f signed and f also signed o signature it looks like a o signature only now f submitted all these documents with company company in good faith only registered this transfer one year completed during this year, you know, F claimed bonus, F claimed dividends, F claimed ride shares, etc, etc. Everything, you know, F claimed. Bonus shares, F claimed. Dividends also, F claimed. 
one year you know oh observe you know i'm not getting any dividends i'm not getting any intimation from company regarding general meetings so oh approached the company and oh came to know that this transfer deed was executed you know fraudulently this transfer deed you know oh signature got forged now oh the original member is having a right to get back shares in his own name we call it as restoration so restoration of oh's name in register of members and oh is entitled to get the shares oh is also entitled to claim dividends from the company company is liable to original member sir if company started paying all these amounts to oh then company will be at loss no sir no problem company can claim all these amounts from f f is liable to compensate company any damages you know company suffer all damages all amounts you know f is liable to pay to company why because this is a forged transfer next one suppose you know f transferred the shares to innocent buyer ma ib this person obtained shares in good faith this person obtained shares in good faith now after completion of this transfer you know oh approached company sir i am not getting any dividends i am not getting notice calling for general meeting show me your register you know in the register oh's name was just uh, you know oh name was removed after observation o oh came to know that you know after analyzing what happened you know o oh came to know that uh, o oh shares got forged you know o oh transfer deed got forged and now the shares are in the hand of ib insolvent buyer insolvent buyer now in this case also you know in under case 2 also o oh has complete rights to claim his shares o oh has right of restoration of his name in the register of members why because forged transfer and subsequent uh, transfers are null and void the title remains with o only so company has to re company has to take back shares from insolvent buyer sorry insolvent buyer not innocent buyer company has to take back shares from innocent buyer and company has to return shares to o sir in that case innocent buyer will be at loss no sir yes company has to indemnify innocent buyer why why because innocent buyer looking at share certificate in the name of f uh, innocent buyer paid amount to f on the belief that you know company you gave share certificate in the name of f on that belief i acquired shares i paid money to f now i am at loss correct only so company should compensate a uh, innocent buyer sir now company finally at loss no sir no problem company will claim that amount from f company is eligible company is entitled to claim all these amounts from f are you all getting my point students so that is what you know complete question number 12 so in any case original member is entitled to get back his shares he is entitled to restore his name in the register of members any loss to the company any loss to the innocent buyer you know complete amounts you know company can claim from the person who executed shares under forged transfer who executed transfer it under forged transfer understood so while restoring the name of original shareholder the company may be asked to compensate a new genuine buyer innocent buyer i told you right who exercised good faith in purchasing the shares the remedy to the company as a remedy company may get itself indemnified by the first transferee who used forged instrument of transfer to get shares transferred in his name Not. But demat shares, these concepts will not apply, ma. But demat shares, forged transfer will not apply, right? Next one, punishment for personation of shareholder. Punishment for personation of shareholder. What is this concept? Right now, I told you one point, right? One second. Ah, huh. just now I told you point, Mr. Yaf. He signed the transfer date. pretending to be o yep intimated signature of o yes or no forged transfer right he intimate sorry he imitated it's not intimated he imitated the signature of o it is nothing but personation personation is nothing but acting like someone acting like someone now you know f yep, he took transfer deed as a transfer he signed it and as a who also he is making a signature that means you know he is imitating another person he is imitating someone so he is making personation he is changing his identity and signing as if he is a who so any person if he make personation a personation in order to get shares in order to get any benefits linked with the shares 
now that person will get punishment what is the punishment sir imprisonment up to one year sorry imprisonment shall not be less than one year so minimum imprisonment one year and a fine end 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 see the point you know imprisonment minimum one year one year one year less than or equal to imprisonment less than or equal to three years and fine what is the fine amount sir one lakh to five lakh rupees and fine you know one lakh less than or equal to fine less than or equal to five lakhs any person making personation so acting like a original shareholder you know in order to transfer shares in order to claim any benefits associated with the securities then that person will be punished what is the punishment imprisonment minimum one year maximum three years and next uh, fine minimum one lakh rupee maximum five lakh rupee section 58 a refusal to register transfer of shares refusal to register transfer of shares Tima. so transfer or transferring what they will do they will execute transfer date form sh4 is it right now along with sh4 you know they will they has to submit original share certificate with company now these two documents you know either transfer or or transfer should submit these documents to company what is the time limit within 60 days of execution of transfer deed now you know in front of company two options are there two options one is register transfer and issue share certificate within one month within one month of date of receipt of transfer deed date of receipt of transfer deed the second option is reject reject in that case company has to give notice company has to give notice notice of refusal the notice of refusal shall be given within 30 days of date of receipt of intimation of transfer now you know the transfer agreed party why because he already paid amount to transfer so transfer is waiting for share certificate however transfer received notice of refusal now transfer is having an option to go to nclt sir i applied for a company share sir under in secondary market i paid sufficient consideration to transfer and company refused my transfer sir company refused my transfer and that refusal is not on valid ground sir like that you know transfer has to file an application with nclt sir is there any time limit is there any time limit for filing an application with a nclt yes there is a time limit sir what is the time limit i'll tell you i'll tell you the transfer or transfer or filing an application with nclt about a refusal to register transfer refusal to register transfer the time limit is whether you received notice of refusal or not sir notice of refusal received notice of refusal not received sir notice of refusal not received so two branches just observe carefully and your company is private company or public company private company or public company two two time limits are there that's what you know i'm telling you the notice of refusal received received a okay so within 30 days if you are a private company within 30 days of a notice file application with nclt if you are a public company then within nine, 60 days within 60 days of notice within 60 days of notice file application with a nclt Sir, notice of refusal not received, sir. Acha, acha. Shares belong to private company, right? So within 60 days of, within 60 days of submission of transfer deed with company. Public company, sir. Within 90 days of submission of transfer deed. Within 90 days of submission of transfer deed. Submission of transfer deed with company. Very simple ma. See, notice of refusal. What is the time limit for notice of refusal? 30 days, right? If you didn't receive notice of refusal to this 30 days, add this time limits, you know, 30 plus 30, 60. 60 plus 30, 90. Very simple only. 
very simple you receive notice of refusal right from notice of refusal within 30 days file application with nclt if you are if your shares are belonging to private company no sir shares of public company then within 60 days of notice of refusal file a petition with nclt the notice of refusal not received sir then when you submit a transfer deed with company from that date onwards in case of private company 60 days in case of public company 90 days now you know nclt will pass an order either it may dismiss dismiss the appeal no company is correct only a valid grounds only so no registration refusal is valid like that you know dismiss the appeal or you know ask will uh, order the company to register transfer along with that uh, you know compensate reimburse compensate or transfer it you now the expenses incurred for filing an appeal against you and everything everything so whatever transfer incurred whatever losses transfer incurred yes compensate transfer like that you know nclt will order company understood so appeal to the tribunal that's what i told you 30 days within 30 days of date of receipt of refusal of notice if you are a private company for a public company 60 days so this is all about private company conditions ma appeal to the tribunal now if you look at the public company you know 60 days of such refusal or 90 days of the delivery of the instrument of transfer i told submission of transfer date okay delivery of instrument of transfer or intimation of transfer appeal to the tribunal so now tribunal it may direct you know register the transfer rectification of register contravention of nclt order you know penalty punishment what is the punishment sir one year to three years and fine one lakh to five lakhs just one second ma One second. So next section is section 58. 57 we completed. 57 is all about refusal to register transfer or transmission. And the punishment is one year to three years and fine one lakh to five lakhs. Next one rectification of register of members. You know this happens. This happens because of a wrong inclusion of a outsider as a member or exclusion of member details from register of members suppose i'm the member but my name is wrongly removed from register next one i'm not a member but my name is recorded in register sir happy no what happy tomorrow if company may call sanchez i'm liable to pay that call amount immediately i should get you know i should remove my name from the register so there is a mistake in the register sir please rectify the register like that you know you can file an application with company if company rejects your application go to tribunal now this time there is no time limit for filing an application with tribunal you know under section 58 there is a time limit 30 days from notice of refusal or 60 days from notice of refusal next one 60 days in case of submission of delivery of documents 90 days from date of delivery of transfer deed with a public company we saw the time limits those time limits are not applicable in case of rectification of register of members suppose sir i'm a foreigner sir you know, I'm a resident of USA. I came to know that my name wrongly included in company register, sir. Now, can I come to, you know, is there any obligation on me to come to India and to file application with NCLT? No, you can file application with competent court specified by central government, competent specified courts outside India, you know, in case of foreign members. So simply rectification of register. Now, you know, tribunal upon inquiry proceedings, you know, upon a verification you know tribunal can dismiss the appeal or you know it may direct the company to rectify the register within 10 days and also compensate uh, you know the applicant you know concept uh, sorry compensate the petitioner whatever losses or damages uh, suffered you know just compensate uh, the petitioner a party aggrieved understood ma so voting right so during this time period you know i am the member but my name was not included in the register so during this process, during this time limit, if any general meeting is conducted, if any general meeting is conducted, I'm entitled to voting unless my voting rights have been suspended by the order of a tribunal. Understood? So suppose, you know, I'm the member and company is making delay to incorporate my details in the register of members. I filed a petition with NCLT. So that case is going on, going on. Suddenly, you know, 
company conducted general meeting now i am entitled to voting rights in that general meeting generally i am entitled to voting rights however if my voting rights are suspended by the tribunal then i am not entitled to attend general meeting i am not entitled to vote at that general meeting this is all about section 58 section 58 okay sir this 30 days 60 days what is this time limit sir this is for section 58 refusal to transfer shares clear ma so with this you know two third of uh, chapter 4 completed and the balance portion balance portion you know bonus issue buyback very very important concepts majority of share capital and debentures chapter completed i think within next half an hour uh, we are going to conclude we are going to complete share capital and debentures so next one is different ways of alteration of share capital sir in how many ways we can alter share capital sir in how many ways we can alter share capital you know in five ways ma alteration to share capital i am talking about you know this is uh, related to capital clause of moa capital clause of moa in incorporation chapter you know i told you alteration of registered office clause alteration of name clause alteration of object clause share capital clause we didn't discuss i told you we'll discuss it under section 61 so in five ways you know or uh, we can alter share capital one is increase authorized share capital and second one is diminish decrease diminution authorized share capital increase authorized share capital diminution of authorized share capital right now you know 10 crores ma i can increase it to 12 crores i can reduce it to 8 crores so unsubscribed shares unissued shares i can cancel diminution this is different from capital reduction capital reduction i'll discuss with you under section 66 don't worry next one consolidate and divide next uh, split split share split recently irctc you know one share uh, one share divided it into five shares ma you know originally face value 10 rupee now split happened now face value is 2 rupees only consolidate and divide means suppose you know face value 10 rupees ma so what we'll do we'll consolidate all these shares and we'll divide into face value of 100 rupees sir we'll divide shares into face value of 100 rupees you know consolidation and divide and last one conversion of shares into stock conversion of shares to stock or reconversion of stock to shares once again i'm repeating the point clearly told you in incorporation of company in capital clause you will find three components one is authorized share capital next one number of shares and third one is face value any modification you make to any of these components it, it comes under alteration to share capital suppose you know face value you are increasing under consolidation face value you are reducing under split alteration of capital clause if you are increasing authorized share capital you are reducing authorized share capital alteration of share capital clause number of shares you know when you increase authorized share capital automatically number of shares will increase when you reduce authorized share capital automatically number of shares will fall alteration of share capital finally consolidation of shares into stock and uh, reconversion of stock into shares uh, however uh, two conditions you have to remember only fully paid up shares ma only fully paid up shares can be converted into stock I repeat only fully paid up shares can be converted into stock first point second point direct issue of stock is prohibited direct issue prohibited in one attempt under ci ipcc this question was asked for 3 marks company is planning to issue stock directly without issuing shares no not permitted company can issue stock only upon surrender of original shares and that shares should be fully paid up okay so these are uh, types of alteration of share capital then procedure procedure for alteration of share capital sir is there any procedure for alteration of share capital yes sir what is the procedure sir first check whether aoa permits or uh, whether aoa permits the uh, alteration of capital clause or not aoa authorization must and should next uh, ordinary resolution is sufficient here next one roc filing roc filing i forgot after ordinary resolution you need to alter moa 
Now you need to file it with ROC within 30 days of alteration, ordinary resolution. Understood. So this is all about section 61. Section 61 also completed. So increase order is capital consolidation and divide. Consolidation and divide. One tricky point is there consolidation or division is resulting in change of voting powers of the shareholders. Then it shall be approved by the tribunal. So what is this? Sima, face value 10 rupee. Company decided to convert the 100 shares into face value of 1000. In the original face value 10, revised face value 1000. Now you know, when you give 100 shares to company, they will give you one share in return. 100 shares of 10 each, one share of 1000 each, both are same, yes or no? I am having 7000 shares, I will get 70 shares. I am having 700 shares, I will get 7 shares. I am having 70 shares only, now how many shares I will get? No. Sir, I am having just 7 shares, sir, how many shares I will get? No, you will get 0, 0. Why? Because fractions, you know, 70 divided by 100.7, 7 divided by 100.07. In that case, what we will do? We will try to acquire remaining shares in order to get one share or else we will surrender shares to the company directors, company, company. In that case, you know, public uh, voting powers, you know, voting power held by the public will come down. Promoters holding power will increase. Understood? See, if you are holding 7000 shares, you will get 70. If you are holding 700 shares, you will get 7. Suppose if you are holding 70 shares, how many shares you will get? Nothing. Company will ask you, acquire 30 shares so that we will give one share. And you are not in a position to get 30 shares. Now you are surrendering 70 shares. As a result, what happened? You know, your voting power will become zero. Why? Because you are surrendering shares. You are surrendering shares to the company. Directors, suppose directors are uh, taking those shares. Directors voting power, promoters voting power increasing. Now you know there is a change in voting power of promoters and public. So in this case, NCLT approval is must and should. After taking, after taking NCLT approval, you are permitted, you know, you are permitted with respect to what? You are permitted to consolidate. Understood? Understood. Okay, next one. Conversion to stock, split, cancel of shares, you know, diminution of share capital. Everything you have to intimate to ROC. Everything you have to give intimation to the ROC. Next one, section 62, you know, rights issue, other name rights issue. Further issue of share capital, why we are using word further issue? There is a reason. The reason is, at the time of incorporation, company will issue shares to whom? Subscribers. Company, definitely within two months of incorporation, within two months after incorporation, company has to issue shares to the subscribers. And that issue, we call it as initial issue, first issue. Subsequent to initial issue, all issues are classified as further issue only, further issue of share capital. Now first you need to give priority to the existing members, pre-M2 rights. Existing members will get a right to subscribe additional shares whenever company offer shares. Why? Because they are owners of the company. They, don't, they are not interested in losing ownership to someone else. And this is a non-dilutive pro-rata way of raising the money. So first right you need first uh, option you need to give to existing members. So rights issue offer to the existing members. So what are the conditions we need to satisfy, sir? You know you need to satisfy following conditions. First, you need to give letter of offer to the existing members, notice of offer or letter of offer. And you should give them a time limit. You know, you should give at least three days. You know, this notice shall be given at least three days before opening subscription. And that subscription period should not be less than 15 days and it should not exceed 30 days. See, subscription opening date, this point, for example, this point, for example, you know, 1st April 2024. At least three days before, you know, 27, 20 by 27 uh, March, 27 March, at least three days before opening subscription list, give letter of offer. And this uh, subscription period, it shall not be less than 15 days. You know, subscription closing date shall not be earlier than 15th April. It should not be later than 30th April. So subscription opening period minimum 15 days, maximum 30 days. And in case of private companies and IFSC public companies, you know, this condition of 15 days can be reduced provided all the members, you know, 90% of the members have given their consent in writing or electronic mode. 
so three days notice you can't reduce it you know three days before opening of issue this notice you can't reduce the time period however in case of private company time period of 15 days you know offer offer period subscription period can be reduced with the consent of 90 percent of the members and moreover existing members they had a right of renouncement of course in private company this right is not available private company you know privacy is important right so however if AOI of a company prohibits renouncement there is no renouncement option renouncement is nothing but giving right to some other person you know in capital gains you solved problems right rights renouncement uh, capital gain 100 percent taxable so there is no cost at all capital gain equal to 100 percent of sale consideration next one rights offer on expiry suppose you know offer period completed but still few people didn't file the application for right shares in that case you know board of directors had discretionary powers to dispose them in such a manner which is not disadvantageous to the shareholders simply there should be no loss at all not disadvantages some people some students write advantages no 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 this is not correct we don't want uh, losses we don't want losses like that we are not asking you profits but we don't want any loss at all we don't want losses means do you think we need profits 50 percent we need profits 50 percent zero also sufficient but no losses no losses like that you know not disadvantages to the shareholders and the company second option offering a ease ops to the employees first option go to the members no lawmaker really talented person why because you know under section 62 further issue of shares fish first priority you should give to existing members why because these people are owners of the company first ask them how by giving letter of offer at least three days before opening of offer period and offer period should be minimum 15 days offer period should be minimum 15 days maximum 30 days this 15 days can oh my god wait ma this 15 days can be reduced in case of private company ifsc companies provided 90 percent of the members should give consent I told this point right okay if existing members are not uh, not having any money or if existing members are not willing to subscribe right shares then you know okay company can go to employees under employee stock option plan but for this special resolution is compulsory no sir we need more money sir in that case chapter 3 will apply simply you know others are outsiders others are outsiders if you want to uh, if you are preferring private placement section 42 shall apply if you want to make public offer then chapter 3 part 1 you know section 23 to section 41 provisions will apply 40 41 is all about gdrs right 40 shall apply so for this first thing you need to get special resolution from existing members next thing valuation valuation of share price so report from registered valuer and such other terms and conditions as may be prescribed but those terms and conditions are prescribed under chapter 3 prospectors and allotment of securities so first priority second to the employees why because they are internal to the organization third you can go to others outsiders so employee stock option plan you know to employees unlisted public company you know special resolution listed company sebi regulations follow straight away follow sebi regulations and private limited company instead of special resolution ordinary resolution is also sufficient no no need of special resolution ordinary resolution is sufficient provided company is regular in filing uh, annual returns with roc company is regular in filing uh, financial statements with uh, roc and for specified ifsc public companies also ordinary resolution is sufficient now other conditions you know you need to get approval from members right before offering shares uh, you need to get approval from members for that you will send notice calling for general meeting right along with the notice give explanatory statement also so explanatory statement you know make all adequate disclosures you know why you are offering shares under employee stock option how much consideration you are going to get hmm? and who are who who are getting shares under employee stock option so everything you discuss with members you know under explanatory statement next one freedom to determine exercise price so what is the exercise price you all know so right now market value is 1000 employee can become member at just 900 rupees only now this 900 you know company is having absolute freedom to fix this exercise price one year time gap so see 
after giving this uh, options to the employees minimum one year time period should be given you know between grant of options and vesting of the option so employee in order to exercise these options he need to wait at least one year Understood. In case of amalgamation demerger, you know the resulting company, the new company, has to offer shares under employee stock options to the employees. Lock-in period ma, you know, company is having absolute freedom to fix lock-in period for employee stock options shares. Sweat equity three years, and until employee gets shares, you know, no dividend will be paid on those shares. And these options are not transferable, not mod, you know, pledge hypothecation is also not possible. Once you exercise, once you get shares, then you can transfer those shares. Then you can pledge those shares. Next one, employee is permitted to get shares under employee stock option plan. If employee got deceased, then legal heirs, legal heir can exercise those options and legal heirs can become member of the company. In case of permanent incapacity of the employee, then you know employee can exercise those options or employee can wave of those options so all the options granted to him on the date of permanent incapacity shall vest in him on that day so if he had money he will pay them he will pay money and he will exercise those options or else options gets eliminated or wasted a resignation so those the employees who got uh, who leave the organization because of resignation so automatically all these options get expired these options get expired Next one, you know, employee definition under sweat equity, employee definition under ESOP, same permanent employee, permanent employee, whether you're working in India or outside India. Normal points only. Next one, sir, existing members, rights issue completed, employees under ESOP completed. So, suppose, you know, company is planning not to go to with existing members, not to go with employees, then they can go with the other persons. But before going with other persons, first of all, company should get special resolution. Why? Why? Because existing members ownership is getting diluted. Suppose company paid up share capital is 100 crores ma. It was held by some 10 people, 10 people holding 100 crores. Now these 10 people are having 100% control over the company, right? So company is planning to raise another 100 crores uh, money. Now this time company wants to offer these uh, securities to public. Now if public subscribe these securities, they will become owners of the company. So total share capital of the company is 200 crores. Out of 200 crores, existing 10 people, their contribution will fall to 50%. And new people, new people will get 50% ownership. So existing people ownership is getting diluted. Yes or no? So existing people are at risk only, no? So that's what, you know, existing members, you need to get approval from existing members first. Before you make allotment, you need to give offer to the existing members. If not, if they are not, if they are not uh, planning to subscribe or you know the amount is very high, then obtain resolution from them, special resolution. After getting special resolution, go with uh, how the outsiders. Again here one more condition that is you know obtain valuation report from a registered valuer. Compliance with applicable provisions of chapter 3. Chapter 3 I told you prospectors and allotment of securities. If you are making private placement section 42. If you want to make public offer section 23 to section 40. These conditions you need to satisfy. Next one. Non-applicability. Non-applicability. Tricky point. Remember this section shall not apply in case of increase of subscribed capital of a company caused by the exercise of an option where debentures or loans are converted into shares of the company. Oh my God, sir, section shall not apply in the following case means what, sir? Actually, what section 62 is telling, if you are offering shares to any person other than existing member, other than employees, first you need to get special resolution. Next, you need to get valuation report from registered value. These provisions are not applicable in case if you are offering shares to the debenture holders under conversion process, preference shareholders under conversion process. Understood? So, when you are uh, converting debentures, debt capital into equity capital, no need of special resolution. That is the point. That is the meaning of this point. Sir, why sir? Why? Because at the time of issue of convertible debentures, company is required to take special resolution as per section 70, uh, one I think 71 or 72 I'm not sure ma 71 only hmm debentures uh, section according to that section you know if a company wants to attach convertibility option if a company wants to attach convertibility option then company can issue convertible debentures only after getting special resolution from members 
already at the time of issue special resolution taken no so at the time of conversion no need of special resolution and next one no need of special resolution in this uh, in the following cases also that is company borrowed money from government ma see see ma see company company borrowed money from government company borrowed money from government and it company is not in a position to pay money to the government company is not in a position to pay money to the government now government considering public interest oh my god how many employees are working in this company and the products of this company you know there are many customers so considering public interest considering financial condition of the con company considering uh, you know uh, terms and conditions of the loan con terms and conditions of the debentures you know government shall pass an order asking company to convert this loans or debentures into equity share capital yes so when you borrow money from government or when you issue debentures to the government and when you are not in a position to pay money so government considering these factors you know public interest financial condition of the company terms and conditions of the issue of debentures or terms and conditions of the loan government will ask company to convert the loans into the shares if company converts no problem suppose you know company is not interested then company can go to nclt sir we don't want to follow government order please eliminate this government order please cancel the government order so now ball is in the hands of nclt so nclt will determine okay i'm cancelling government order or no no you have to follow government order accordingly company has to take an action suppose if company is not preferring any appeal then automatically the subscribed share capital authorized share capital to this extent gets increased suppose you know authorized share capital paid up share capital both same 100 crores 100 crores government loan some 60 crores is there government loan some 60 crores is there now by way of government order you know by way of government order automatically this paid up share capital and other share capital gets increased to 160 cr 160 cr automatic increase so that's what deemed increase in other share capital deemed increase in other share capital getting my point next so look at this chart once next one write about issue of bonus shares write about issue of bonus shares important topic ma. very very important topic now in two items a problematic question came i'll tell you i'll discuss with you i'll discuss that problematic question with you in this uh, marathon all bonus shares are shares issued by a company to its current shareholders as fully paid shares at free of cost so without collecting a single rupee from the existing members you know company will offer shares such shares we call them as bonus shares important point sources for issue of bonus shares free reserves securities premium capital redemption reserve account and revaluation reserve you can't utilize revaluation reserve means you know uh, by revaluing the assets by revaluing the assets suppose you know you purchased the asset at 10 crores today the value of asset is 100 crores now you revalued this asset to 200 crores so you are increasing asset balance you know asset balance from 10 to 100 corresponding credit you can observe you know corresponding balance in the liability side you can see revaluation reserve 90 crores revaluation reserve 90 crores earlier asset is 10 crores right now instead of 10 crores you are recording 100 crores uh, the effect of revaluation you will put it on revaluation reserve side you know liability side revaluation reserve 90 crores now you can't use this amount for issuing bonus shares next procedural conditions for issue of bonus shares first condition aoa authorization articles authorization is required next board of directors approval is required the board shall recommend and board will call for a general meeting in the general meeting you know members has to approve by passing ordinary resolution and you know bonus shares can be issued if company has not committed following defaults one is you know uh, deposits next one debentures with respect to deposits you know principal component interest component with respect to debentures or bonds interest component principal component company should not commit these defaults and company has not defaulted in respect of statutory dues of the employees such as contribution to the provident fund gratuity and uh, bonus so these defaults company should not commit at the time of issue of bonus shares next one 
partly paid up shares if any should be converted into fully paid up so before you offer bonus shares partly paid up shares should be converted into fully paid up simple by uh, simple make calls on shares convert them into fully paid up and bonus shares shall not be issued in lieu of dividend suppose you know in a general meeting company declared a dividend ma company declared dividend on each share we will pay 10% dividend so within 30 days dividend shall be paid in cash only so on 30th day you know company came forward and company is selling you know instead of dividends we are giving you one share for every 10 rupees we will give one share at free of cost permissible not permissible you can't issue bonus shares instead of paying dividends declared dividend shall always be paid in cash even dividend can't be paid in kind also dividend can't be paid in kind dividend shall always be paid in cash only next uh, the question got repeated i'm sorry this question got repeated twice so ignore now i'll tell you uh, the problem i'll tell you the problem Company A Limited is there, paid up share capital, 1 crore shares, 8 rupees each. You know, face value 10 rupee, paid up value is 8 rupee. So, paid up share capital 8 crores. Okay. Next one, general reserves 50 lakhs. Pre, uh, next, to profit and loss account surplus. You know, profit and loss account balance surplus in PL. 25 lakhs getting my point next uh, securities premium 25 lakhs capital reserves 25 lakhs next one reserve capital reserve capital you know uh, certain portion of capital reserved and it will be called up only in the event of liquidation okay next one revaluation reserve another 25 lakhs so these are uh, under you know reserves and surplus you know you'll you can find general reserves 50 lakhs profit and loss account uh, surplus 25 lakhs securities premium 25 lakhs capital reserve 25 lakhs revaluation reserve 25 lakhs these amounts are there now company is planning to issue shares you know bonus shares so what are the conditions company should satisfy aoa authorization ordinary resolution okay fine Apart from this, you know, this share should be fully paid up. Ma. This, uh, these shares must be converted into fully paid up. Now, you know, company should make calls on shares. Calls on share on each share 2 rupees. The moment company receives 2 rupees. So, this will be converted into 10 crore rupees. Now, you know, company is planning to offer shares, you know, in the ratio of 1 is to 10. Or company is planning to offer shares in the ratio of uh, 1 is to 5. Option A, 1 is to 10. Option B, 1 is to 5. 1 is to 10 means what? For every 10 shares, 1 share will be given as bonus share. 1 is to 5 means what? For every 5 shares you held, will give 1 bonus share. Now, which option is permissible? You have to calculate. You have to calculate. You know, today, paid up share capital of the company. You know, fully paid up shares, ma. All these shares are fully paid up. Fully paid up share capital is, paid up equity share capital is 10 crores. Now, 10 crores into 1 divided by 10 for every 10 shares will give one share right for every 10 shares will give one share right so total number of shares is 1 crore shares right yes or no total number of shares 1 crore shares 1 crore shares existing share capital 1 crore 1 crore into 1 divided by 10 equal to 10 lakhs and face value is 10 rupee so 1 crore so here i need sources up to 1 crore i need source uh, no sources for bonus issue is Free reserves, securities premium, CRR, CRR. I forgot that point. I'll write. I'll write here. CRR. CRR amount for the time being it is uh, fifty lakhs. Fifty lakhs. Okay. Now in in case of one is to five ratio, right now I'm having one crore shares into one divided by five. So I need to offer twenty lakh shares. Each share face value is ten rupee. So I need two crores. 2 crores rupees source. In option A, I need 1 crore rupees source. In option B, I need 2 crore rupees source. First of all, out of these reserves and surplus, which are eligible, you need to check. Which reserves are eligible, you need to check. 
general reserve eligible profit and loss account eligible free reserves only these two comes under free reserves only security premium eligible capital reserve not eligible revaluation reserve not eligible crr eligible so put together total how much 50 lakhs plus 25 plus 25 plus 50 put together 1.5 crore rupees we are having so under option one we need just one crore only we are having 1.5 crore okay one is to ten permissible one is to ten permissible now option b we need two crores sir however we are having only 1.5 crore not permissible now this question came twice in examination in previous examinations this question was asked twice two times this question came understood option a is permissible option b not permissible why because we are not having that much source we are not having that much source understood so with this bonus shares concept completed section 64 very simple ma whenever you alter share capital whenever you redeem preference share capital you know uh, alteration of share capital redemption of share uh, redemption of preference share capital see alteration of capital next one redemption of preference shares next one government order to convert uh, loans debentures into equity share capital in these three cases you know company has to file form number sh7 with roc within 30 days within 30 days of the event company has to file a separate notice with roc that is form number sh7 so in case of you know uh, default delay in filing each day 500 rupees is the penalty maximum 5 lakh rupees with respect to company with respect to officer in default minimum 500 rupees per day and maximum 1 lakh rupee that means you know if 20 days delay happen 20 days delay happen 20 days into 500 10000 no problem 200 days delay happen 200 days into 500 1 lakh rupee okay applicable suppose you know 300 days delay happens sir 300 days into 500 1 lakh 50000 officer in default is not liable for 1 lakh 50000 officer in default is liable for only 1 lakh rupees maximum penalty 1 lakh rupees given no so major 90 percent topics we completed sorry 80 percent topics completed we are left with only three concepts a reduction of share capital buyback debentures reduction of capital buyback debentures you know this section section 66 you know uh actually unimportant section many students are this is an unimportant and they ignore this section but one attempt ma no after uh, introduction of uh, you know companies at 2013 right from uh may 2014 onwards sorry november 2014 onwards till may 2023 almost 20 attempts ICA conducted examination 20 almost out of 20 attempts this question came only once remaining you know bonus buyback equity shares with differential rights you know you can't expect a paper without bonus or buyback concepts definitely bonus share or buyback question will come but in one attempt this question came one attempt this question came uh, somewhat tricky question ma. somewhat tricky question uh, many students can't understand this section section 66 you know reduction of capital reduction of capital many students will take choice with the re with respect to this question with respect to this concept first of all we'll discuss reduction of capital a reduction of capital will happen in three ways ma a reduction of capital will happen in three ways one is cancellation of unwanted capital oh my god what is this word sir we didn't heard this unwanted capital what is this see face value 10 rupees is there paid up value is 8 rupees and we don't want this 2 rupees sir there is unpaid value of 2 rupees we don't want this money sir we never need this money you know company is doing business profitably company is running in profits only we will never call this money Acha. so we want to cancel this money sir we want to reduce face value to 8. Achha. So after reduction of this face value, what will happen? You know, initially member liability is 10 minus 8, 2 rupees. But because of reducing this 10 to 8, there is extinguishment of member liability. 
member liability will become zero suppose if you reduce it to two, 9 9 minus 8 1 liability 2 is getting reduced to 1 either extinguishment of liability 0 or reduction of liability from 2 to 1 this is what case 1 case 2 return of excess capital A return of excess capital here face value 10 rupee paid up value also 10 rupee but we don't want 2 rupees sir we want to return it and we don't want buyback sir under buyback we will take shares no 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 we want we don't want to reduce shares sir we will keep number of shares constant and we'll reduce this paid up value by returning excess amount to the members members take this 2 rupees so now paid up value will fall to 8 rupees if you reduce face value also 8 rupees now uh, now, now again extinguishment of member liability actually 10 minus 8 to 2 rupees right we are returning 2 rupees to the member so future you can call 2 rupees but you are reducing face value to 8 and paid up value is also 8 extinguishment of members liability that's what you know return of excess capital and last one cancellation of lost capital I don't use these words in examination for understanding sake I am using these words cancellation of lost capital you know under internal reconstruction you did a problem you solved problems under internal reconstruction suppose you know paid up share capital is 10 crores you know face value 10 paid up value also 10 next one outside liabilities 10 crores fixed assets uh, 5 crores current assets uh, 5 uh, 50, uh, sorry 10 crores current assets uh, 10 crores profit and loss account uh, debit balance uh, mm, 2 crores just wait fixed assets uh, 7 crores 8 crores 8 crores now if you look at balance sheet tally 20 crores 20 crores 20 crores 20 crores balance sheet tallied or not yes now if you look at this balance sheet you know one portion you know one portion of asset is the p and l debit balance that is accumulated losses can you sell this asset no sir you can't sell this asset for a 10 rupees also and you know this much portion of capital i lost actually if you reduce it you know if you keep it on liability side you need to reduce this two crores from capital in sole proprietorship type of organization or partnership type of organization we solved problems right we solved problems whenever loss comes you know we'll reduce it from capital whenever profit comes we'll add back to the profit sorry we'll add back it to the capital yes or no so now out of 10 crores two crores worth asset is missing two crores worth capital is missing so now what i'll do i'll cancel this much capital sir I'll do I'll do one thing face value 10 rupees paid up value I'll reduce from 10 to 8 sir I'll reduce by 2 I'll reduce it by 2 rupees so it will come to 8 now you know revised balance sheet looks like this revised balance sheet you know uh, paid up share capital 8 crores outside liabilities 10 crores fixed assets uh, 8 crores uh, current uh, liabilities sorry current assets uh, 10 crores so now also balance sheet talent but you know there is a difference between these two balance sheets this balance sheet is telling that company is loss making company this balance sheet you know it is not telling like that yes or no so now what i'm doing under case 3 i'm cancelling the lost capital so in these three ways reduction of capital will happen one is cancellation of uncalled capital and i don't want it sir i don't want it cancellation of uncalled capital second one is cancel return of excess capital and third one is cancellation of lost capital in these three ways reduction of capital will happen thema not paid up simply not called next cancel any paid up share capital which is lost or unrepresented by available assets next one pay off paid up share capital in excess of wants of the company are you all getting my point so in these three ways reduction of capital will take place and the conditions for reduction of cap capital is first you need to get approval from members what kind of approval special resolution special resolution next nclt approval is must so you need to file application with nclt along with application you need to give special resolution copy and you need to give creditors details creditors list why because you know reduction of capital should not affect creditors interest actually it will affect creditors interest how when you are giving money to the existing members what about creditors do you have sufficient funds to repay money to the creditors yes sir Achha. 
NCLT will come, NCLT will verify and NCLT will give approval. Along with this credit list, you need to give uh, auditor certificate, auditor certificate regarding accounting treatment, regarding accounting treatment, auditor certificate regarding accounting treatment. Understood? So examples, you just give one time reading, you will understand. So prohibition on reduction of capital, you know, reduction of capital is prohibited in case, you know, deposits and interest on deposits. If there is any default with respect to deposits and interest on deposits, reduction of capital will not take place. Next one. Once, you know, company file, once company give intimation to the NCLT, immediately NCLT will forward this application to central government, ROC, if you are a listed company, SEBI and creditors. And it will ask the people, come on, if you have any objections, file your objections within three months. If no objection is received within the month, within three months from the date of receipt of notice, then deemed approval from these agencies, deemed approval from these agencies. Accordingly, NCLT shall give order to the company. Okay, you can proceed with reduction of capital. But before giving order, NCLT will observe whether creditor's interest is getting affected or not. Every creditor claim discharged. Have you paid? No, sir. Ah, oh, what are the dues? At least, did you provide any security to them? Or these loans are secured or unsecured? Secured only, sir. Finally, whether you obtain consent from them? Yes, sir, we obtain consent from them, sir. This is the consent of the creditors, sir. Then it will order for confirming reduction of capital. And also, you know, tribunal will verify the auditor certificate regarding accounting treatment, whether uh, section 133 has been complied or not regarding uh, accounting treatment for reduction of capital. Next one. Once NCLT issues order, this order shall be published in newspapers and this order should be filed with uh, ROC also. And ROC shall register the copy of NCLT order and ROC shall issue certificate to the company. So now registration certificate from that date onwards, you know, reduction will come into picture. You know, reduction will, uh, conditions with, re with respect to reduction, 100% satisfaction is uh, happened. Sima, the moment ROC issues a certificate regarding registration of our, our tribunal order, that's it. It's, it will act as a conclusive evidence. And at that, at that point of time, you know, what is the amount of share capital, number of shares in which share capital is divided into, and face value of each share, and paid up value of each share. You know, all these will come into effect to, will come into effect to from the date of registration by ROC. Next one, what is the new liability of the member, sir? What is the new liability of the member? Upon reduction, what would be the liability of the member? That liability will prevail. Suppose, you know, 10 rupees is a pay face value. 8 rupees is the paid up value. Originally, member is liable for 2 rupees. Tribunal approved, you know, you can reduce it to 8 rupees. Now, 8 minus 8, 0. So, what is the member's liability? Zero liability. What is the liability? Zero liability. So, no liability arises to the member in future. Next one, up to here, no problem. Ma. This is a procedure. You know, what is the uh, detailed procedure? What is the procedure? Ma? Can you tell me the detailed procedure? You know, special resolution, application with NCLT for getting NCLT approval. Along with application, you need to give creditors uh, details. So NCLT will shall forward the application to four people, central government, ROC, SEBI and the creditors. If there is no objection uh, from these people within three months from the date of uh, Delivery of notice, NCLT after verifying uh, accounting treatment, you know, uh, verifying the accounting treatment with respect to which auditor will give certificate, right? So after verifying the certificate issued by the auditor and uh, after going through the consent of creditors, you know, going through the consent of the creditors, simply whether creditors consent is obtained or not, whether they have been properly discharged or not, whether they are properly secured or not. So after going through this process, you know, uh, a tribunal will give order, order with respect to reduction of capital. Now company has to publish the NCLT order in newspapers and company has to register the same with ROC within 30 days of NCLT order. So from the date of registration of NCLT order, you know, the new capital structure comes into the picture. Number of shares, face value, paid up value, everything comes into the picture. And member is not liable for any, uh, you know, increased liabilities. Sorry, members' liabilities are restricted after reduction. Next one, 
suppose if predator is entitled to object and failed what it means total we are having a thousand creditors but in list we gave only 100 creditors you know 900 creditors names we made concealment we made concealment next one all these are unsecured debts but we projected them as secured debts next total liability is 100 crores but we ignored one zero and we told only 10 crores how nclt comes to know ma nclt is not doing business on behalf of company how nclt comes to know the list of creditors how, how nclt know the names or details of the creditors it's the company it is the company giving information to nclt now that information is not complete that information is incorrect that information is incomplete out of 100 creditors company no out of 1000 creditors company gave only 100 creditors list only all these are unsecured debts but company projected them as secured debts total loan amount is 100 crores but company projected it as 10 crores only the nclt can go through the document submitted by company nclt will not have you know that that much sense you know who will be the creators of the company come on nclt will not have that powers so nclt gave order later you know people came forward sir my name is not there in the list sir looking at the newspaper advertisement looking at nclt order i came forward my name is my name is not there in the list so my dues are pending sir now what nclt will do it will remove the order which it issued previously that means members original liability will continue members original liability before reduction what would be the liability that liability will continue and coming to the officers whoever commits this kind of uh, frauds they will be punished under section 447 understood everyone so in case of uh, fraud you know officers will get punishment under section 447 and members you know the persons who are members at the time of reduction of share capital those people will get original liability that means the liability before reduction of capital the liability before reduction of capital what is the liability that liability will prevail clear everyone everyone and we are left with only two topics under share capital debentures deposits separate topic debt capital right so under share capital we are having only two topics one is section 67 the other one is buyback so section 67 company is restricted to purchase its own shares comment correct exception buyback exception redemption of preference shares redemption of preference shares no money a company collected money through issue of uh, shares that money belongs to company the company can't pay that money for getting its shares back it's a fundamental rule ma fundamental rule no company is permitted to purchase its own shares its own shares unless it is a case of buyback buyback separate provisions will apply section 67 will not apply however we had uh, three exceptions this section is not applicable to private company which satisfies three conditions the three conditions are if you look at members of private company members of private company no member shall be a body corporate no member of a private company shall be a body corporate and private company total borrowings shall not exceed simply less than two times of paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less and company has not defaulted in repayment of such borrowings company has not defaulted in repayment of such borrowings if these conditions are satisfied then for private company section 67 is not applicable section uh, private company can purchase its own shares are you getting my point what are those three conditions members of private company you know there should be no body corporate and total borrowing shall not exceed twice of its paid up share capital or rupees 50 crores whichever is less and there should be no default in repayment of such borrowings understood everyone and for nidhi company section 66 sorry section 67 shall not apply why because in nidhi company you know uh, member will come member will go by transferring shares in nidhi company no when shares are purchased by the company from a member on its ceasing to be a depositor or borrower and should not be considered as reduction of share capital under 66 as well as 67 
Are you getting my point, students? Everyone. Okay, fine. I hope each and every point is clear. Next one. Sir, direct to purchase prohibited. Indirect to purchase is also prohibited. Sir, indirect purchase means what? Financing someone. I'm financing my servant. Come, take company shares. I'll give you money. Direct finance, indirect finance. Both are prohibited. Indirect finance means what? A uh, servant come to me, go to SBI. I already gave guarantee to SBI. SBI will give you money. With that money, come and acquire company shares. So direct financial assistance, indirect financial assistance, both are perme prohibited. However, we had three exceptions, very simple exceptions. One is lending business. Suppose SBI is there, banking company. The main business operation of banking company is lending money. So daily, you know, many people will come, many people will borrow money from SBI. And with the borrowed money, the people will do anything. Maybe, you know, borrowers may purchase SBI shares. It is not possible for SBI to monitor each and every borrower. What is this fellow is doing? What is that fellow is doing? It is not possible, right? So if that lending happened at ordinary course of business, that's it. You know, borrower can purchase uh, banking company shares. There is no problem allowed. Next one, lending money in a scheme. Suppose, you know, suppose company made an offer to the employees. Yes, you can also become members of the company. You can purchase shares. Employees said, we are not having that much finance. Achha, fine. Okay, we'll give you loan amount. We'll give you loan amount. So loan amount, it shall not exceed six months salary. It shall not exceed six months salary. Second condition, with this money, you should subscribe only fully paid up shares, not partly paid up. Only fully paid up shares you should subscribe. Third condition, employee excludes directors. Employee excludes directors. And next one, special resolution compulsory. Special resolution, there is no doubt at all. And you are offering shares to, when you are offering shares to the people other than members, you know, special resolution is compulsory. So employee should not be a director. Second one, uh, see maximum six months salary and third one third third condition only fully paid up shares he can he need to subscribe if any condition violated then section 67 shall apply exceptions will not apply i'm sorry i told third point here i told third point see employment not exceeding six months salary to purchase a other than its director's KMP, this point I told earlier. I told this point earlier. I told this point. So, yes, loan can be offered to the employees other than directors and KMP. Maximum salary, you know, six months sorry, maximum loan amount, six months salary. And third condition, he should purchase fully paid up shares. He should subscribe fully paid up shares. This is all about the third exception. Second exception, you know, here we are not offering a, a shares to the employees directly. Here we are asking, we are uh, forming a trust ma, and we will uh, appoint a trustee to manage this trust. Now company will finance this trust in order to purchase company shares and this trust should be beneficial for employees. This trust should be for the benefit of employees. Next one, before lending money under this scheme, special resolution is compulsory. So three conditions to be satisfied. One is special resolution. Second one, trust should be for the benefit of uh, trust for the benefit of trust should be for the benefit of uh, employees. And third one. Hmm. Special resolution, I told you, right? And third one, with that money, they should subscribe or they should purchase only fully paid up uh, shares. Understood? Lending business, exempted. Lending money in a scheme approved by members by way of special resolution and you know, trust for the benefit of employees. And then with the with the money 
advanced to the trust that money should be utilized for subscribing fully paid up shares only next uh, third exception is employee loans how much loan you can offer max six months loan to whom you can offer to the employees other than directors and kmp and next one with the borrowed money he should subscribe fully paid up shares we had practical questions with respect to these areas ma you know suppose you know employee salary is 30000 but company gave him a 2 lakh rupee to subscribe shares 30000 into 6 months you know 1.8 lakh how company can give 2 lakhs violation in case of violation penalty what is the penalty 1 lakh rupee to 25 lakh rupee officer in default imprisonment for a term which may extend up to 3 years and penalty minimum 1 lakh you know fine minimum 1 lakh maximum 25 lakhs clear everyone the last topic of share capital is buy back of shares very simple concept very simple concept i'll give notes for this buy back listen carefully buy back section 68 to 70 so let's discuss section 68 first and foremost thing you have to check aoi authorization next approvals ma approvals sometimes you need to get board resolution sometimes you will get you need to get special resolution you know if it is within 10% of uh, paid up share capital paid up equity share capital and free free reserves i'll tell you just wait so 10% of paid up equity share capital plus free reserves here free reserves includes securities premium if it is within this limit board resolution is sufficient sir more than 10% sir in that case you know you can't cross 25% ma 25% of uh, paid up equity share capital plus uh, pre reserves plus securities premium so 25% 25% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium you know with the help of special resolution you can make buy back but at a time you know limit there is a limit at a time in a, in a year in a year at a time one time the buy back shall not exceed you know buy back shall not exceed simply less than or equal to 25% of paid up equity share capital 25% of paid up equity share capital limits somewhat tricky limits somewhat tricky so in one case if you observe in one case it is paid up equity share capital maximum limit paid up share capital one time buyback in terms of shares 25% of paid up equity share capital here i am not adding free reserves here i am not adding securities premium try to understand so aoa authorization next approval if it is within uh, 10% limits board approval is sufficient beyond this special resolution but it shall not exceed in a year shall not exceed 25% of paid up share capital plus 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 securities premium sir what is the difference between these two limits sir you know this is count on shares count on shares and this is with respect to amount uh, finance amount finance amount understood a better clarity bet, better download tcs buyback uh, uh, notice you will get to know amount to finance involved in the buyback if it is within less than or equal to 10% of paid up equity share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium board resolution is sufficient amount exceeding this limit special resolution at a time you can make buyback of uh, 25% of paid up equity share capital this is all about uh, limits ma next one next one oh problem with one more just wait ah so next one debt equity ratio post buyback post buyback you know debt means both secured debt plus unsecured debt equity means you all know capital plus reserves and surplus so post buyback the ratio shall not exceed 2 is to 1 ratio shall not exceed 2 is to 1 so debt equity ratio condition ma next conditions next conditions 
यू नो टाइम गैप नेक्स्ट कंडीशन टाइम गैप बिटवीन टू बाई बैक्स शुड बी वन ईयर वन ईयर वन टाइम क्वेश्चन केम ऑन दिस पर्टिकुलर पॉइंट यू नो वन ईयर बिटवीन टू बाई बैक्स मीन वॉट सर यू नो वट इज द एक्सैक्ट टाइम लिमिट क्लोजर ऑफ एर्लियर बाई बैक क्लोजर ऑफ एर्लियर बाई बैक earlier buyback you know previous buyback when it get completed from that date onwards wait for one year after one year you can start new buyback you can start new buyback sir actually i am permitted to buy back 25% of capital sir but previously i bought only 5% i will make 20% buyback right now sir last month i bought only 5% sir this month i will make 20% buyback offer sir no once buyback completed You are prohibited from making buyback, a fresh buyback, up to one year. Closure of buyback onwards, you need to count one year. You can make fresh buyback only after completion of one year from the closure of earlier buyback. Understood? Next one, listed companies ma, you need to follow SEBI guidelines. For listed companies, SEBI guidelines is compulsory. Next one, next one, you know it's all about declarations. declaration to be prepared by directors you know board of directors at least two directors should sign this declaration one among this uh, two directors should be managing director so this de declaration is all about solvency declaration that means uh, after buyback for the next one year company will not wind up even if liquidation proceedings are initiated company assets are in a position to meet liabilities simply we are solvent for the next one year will be solvent only Why one year? I told you, I told you in uh, previous chapter also. One year assumption is under going concern. We are making one year assumption is because of going concern. So next to one year, company will not liquidate. Even if it get into liquidation, company assets will be in a position to meet its liabilities. Understood? Everyone, everyone getting my point? Okay. So next, next one. So with this, you know, buyback initiated, buyback initiated. Next one. Once buyback is completed, you know, once buyback is completed, the shares which you bought back shall be cancelled, shall be extinguished. Buyback shall be uh, the securities which you bought back shall be cancelled. What is the time period, sir? Within seven days, the buyback bought back securities shall be cancelled. and that shares shall not be offered to anyone up to a period of 6 months the shares involved in the buyback shall not be issued shall not be issued for a period of 6 months however in the following cases you can offer those shares one is you know bonus shares next one equity equity shares you can offer next three you can observe easily you know conversion of warrants into shares next one uh, conversion of preference shares conversion of debentures into equity shares here you can issue bought back securities but the point other than these exceptions other than these cases you can't offer bought back securities up to period of 6 months and one important point i ignored that important point is sources for making buyback ma sources for making buyback sources one is pre reserves profits available for dividends profits available for distribution in the form of dividends securities premium account securities premium account and proceeds of fresh issue proceeds of fresh issue sir which issue issue of any security other than bought back security other than security involved in buyback suppose you want to buy back differential rights now you can issue normal rights shares to finance buyback you can issue normal rights shares you can't issue differential rights in order to buy back differential rights so shares involved in the buyback shares involved in the issue should be of same kind or different kind different kind so sources of funds conditions of buyback i told you aoa special resolution limits post buyback conditions you no know, only fully paid up shares you know buyback is permissible only for fully paid up shares the big guidelines in case of listed company lock in period there is no such concept but the point is once buyback is completed for the next one year you are not eligible to make a fresh buyback clear and procedure before buyback you know you need to give explanatory statement to the members you know for getting special resolution you need to give notice calling for general meeting along with that 
explanatory statement in that you have to give disclosure of all material facts reason of buyback class of shares you involved in the buyback and how much amount you are investing in buyback and what is the time limit for completion of buyback you have to disclose all these details next one so from the date of special resolution or board resolution buyback should be completed within 12 months suppose if 12 months completed sir but buyback still not initiated then you know the special resolution or board resolution automatically gets lapsed once again you need to take approval from members once again you need to take approval from directors in respect to cases buyback from whom you can make buyback from existing shareholders or from open market you know in stock market stock exchanges or you can get securities from employees previously you offered shares to the employees under esop or sweat equity you can get those shares under buyback so declaration of solvency I already told you extinguishment of securities within 7 days of completion of buyback you need to cancel the physical securities and those securities those class of capital you know those that class of capital you shall not offer to anyone for a period of up to 6 months and we had uh, six exceptions bonus shares one sweat equity shares two employee stock options shares three okay next conversion of warrants conversion of debentures conversion of preference shares here another three so in six cases you can offer uh, Uh, same class of shares which you bought back recently and you need to maintain a separate register Regi register regarding buyback next filing of these documents with roc and if you are listed company then you need to file document with sebi also penalty penalty for default if you commit any default penalty is very simple 1 lakh to 3 lakhs 1 lakh to 3 lakhs company 1 lakh to 3 lakhs officer in default 1 lakh to 3 lakhs minimum 1 lakh maximum 3 lakhs and if you select profits for a buyback source you know profits then nominal value of shares which you bought back that amount you need to transfer to crr and crr shall be issued sorry crr shall be used only in case of issuing fully paid up bonus shares sir can i declare dividend out of crr no you can utilize crr only for one purpose that is the purpose is issuing fully paid up bonus shares and in some cases buyback is prohibited in one attempt i remember this question came for 5 marks this question came for 5 marks so list out the cases where buyback is prohibited you know buyback is prohibited when company makes a default when company makes default in repayment of deposits in payment of interest thereon in redemption of debentures in payment of repayment of preference shares payment of dividend repayment of term loan interest on term loan payments however if you rectify these defaults and after completion of 3 years you are allowed to make buyback so 3 years after completion of rectification of these defaults what are those defaults deposit to interest only debentures no interest preference shares dividends term loan interest on term loan if you commit any default in payment of these amounts then first you need to rectify them after rectification wait for 3 years after 3 years you are permitted permitted with for what sir uh, permitted for buyback and at the time of buyback you have to comply all these sections ma that means there should be no subsisting default with respect to you know 92 annual reports 123 dividends uh, provisions 127 punishment for failure to distribute dividends 129 filing financial statements you know preparation of financial statements preparation of financial statements so company company should comply all these provisions before it go with buyback so this is section 70 that is section 70 is this is it clear ma everyone with this we completed provisions related to share capital and it's time to start debt capital under debt capital we'll discuss debentures and deposits and the final part of chapter 4 is debentures section 71 covers provisions related to issue and redemption of debentures before we discuss section 71 let's discuss definition of debenture so what is a debenture sir debenture definition debenture includes debenture stock bonds any other instrument of a company evidencing a debt whether constituting a charge on the assets of the company or not 
so here we are not defining the word debenture in fact uh, we are giving a list of instruments covered under debenture so these instruments we can call them as debenture accordingly section 71 provision shall apply understood so debenture covers not only debenture but also debenture stock or bonds and any other instrument you keep whatever name but if it is an evidence a debt to the company if it is evidencing a debt to the company then it becomes a debenture and it is immaterial whether secured or unsecured you know constituting a charge on the assets means secured debentures understood that means section 71 covers both secured debentures as well as unsecured debentures next one the following instruments are not treated as debentures in that first point instruments referred to in chapter 3d of reserve bank of india act 1934 so whatever instruments got notified in chapter 3d of reserve bank of india act 1934 we can't call them as debentures even though they are evidencing a debt to the company understood so they are outside the scope of section 71 next one such other instrument as may be prescribed by central government in consultation with reserve bank of india so this point is giving power to central government power with respect to what yes in future central government can exclude any instrument from the scope of debenture so central government will decide after consulting reserve bank of india next one manner of issue and redemption of debentures so section 71 ma it is all about you know issue of debentures as well as redemption of debentures let's see the conditions with respect to issue of debentures ma section 71 issue of debentures and second one regarding redemption of debentures redemption of debentures so first one sir can a company issue convertible debentures or only non convertible debentures both if company want to issue convertible debentures it can issue convertible debentures sir what is convertible debenture sir you know at the time of redemption at the time of redemption instead of paying cash we will give them equity shares we will take debentures and we will give them equity shares so convertible debentures if company decides to issue convertible debentures then special resolution from members is required at the time of issue of convertible debentures so company can issue convertible debentures for that special resolution it has to take approval from the members and that approval should be special resolution next one with respect to non convertible debentures non convertible debentures generally board resolution is sufficient when uh, if existing debt listen carefully ma existing debt plus proposed debt that means you know new debt existing debt as well as proposed debt put together if they are, if they not exceed you know 100% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus uh, securities premium then board resolution is sufficient that means both old debt as well as proposed debt put together if they are less than or equal to 100% of existing paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium then board resolution is sufficient no 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 sir we are crossing the limit sir we are crossing the limit then one time special resolution is required with respect to non convertible debentures next condition sir can a company issue irredeemable debentures no no only redeemable debentures company has to issue and what should be the tenure sir maximum tenure 10 years maximum tenure 10 years for all companies whereas companies engaged in infrastructure projects infrastructure debt finance companies infrastructure finance companies if they want to issue debentures if they want to issue debentures then they can issue debentures up to the tenure of 30 years logic is very simple infrastructure companies they will have a long gestation period to complete the project suppose if you look into uh, you know metro metro in telangana state almost 10 years completed 10 years completed still work is going on now if you apply the same condition of 10 years just i'm asking you if you apply 10 years condition come on you know 10 years back you got money by issue of debentures right now redeem them sir just now work completed sir and we are collecting revenue we are collecting ticket fares so we are getting revenue from now onwards how can we redeem 100% as as on today understood so infrastructure projects you know generally they will have a long gestation period gestation period means you know the date of investment and the date of generation of revenue the gap between date of investment 
and date of generation of revenue is long for infrastructure projects. That's the reason for infrastructure companies, infrastructure debt fund financing companies for them, the tenure of debentures is 30 years. Understood. Next one. In definition, I told you charge compulsory or not compulsory. Actually, not compulsory. You can issue unsecured debentures. But to attract to more and more subscribers, definitely will provide security. In that case, you need to create charge on those assets. And this assets value, you know, assets value, assets value shall not exceed, sorry, assets value which you provide as a security to the debenture holders. This assets value should cover not only principal portion but also interest portion. Principal as well as interest. Both components are, uh, yes, assets uh, should cover. Understood. Next condition, next condition. You know, before making a public offer or before making offer to the existing members, you have to appoint a debenture trustee. Debenture trustee. So debenture trustee is required when, sir? You know, when you're making offer to the members, offer to members to subscribe debentures and those members exceeding 500 in number, exceeding 500 in number. And next one, when you're making public offer of debentures, yes, debenture trustee is important. The appointment of debenture trustee is required. Without appointment of debenture trustee, you can't offer debentures to the public or to the members exceeding 500. Next one, you have to execute a trust deed, debenture trust deed within 60 days. Within 60 days, ma. Within 60 days of making a, you know, a receiving application money and allotment, you have to execute a trust deed. Next, you have to create a deposit, sorry, debentures redemption reserve. This debentures redemption reserve shall be created out of profits available for distribution and payment of dividends. Understood. So conversion option we discussed convertible debt special resolution is essential. Next one, no voting rights. One more important condition. A company is prohibited to issue any debentures carrying any voting rights. As you all know, debenture holder is a creditor to the company. He is not an owner of the company, he is a creditor, outsider. So you can't give voting rights to them. If you issue any debenture with voting rights, then that issue is treated as void. Next, secured debentures. Secured debentures may be issued by a company subject to such terms and conditions as may be prescribed under rules. Next, uh, 10 years. Maximum tenure, how much more? 10 years. However, for infrastructure companies, you know, infrastructure projects, infrastructure finance companies, infrastructure debt fund, non-banking financial companies. Next one. Companies which are permitted by Ministry or Department of Central Government or by Reserve Bank of India or by National Housing Bank can issue debentures for a period exceeding 10 years, but it shall not exceed 30 years. Maximum 30 years. Next one, creation of charge. You offered the secured debentures, ma. You offered secured debentures. Then you have to create charge on the properties or assets of the company or its subsidiary company, holding company, associate company. So if you want to create charge, this charge can be created on any of these four companies. Our company, associate company, subsidiary company, holding company. And such assets and properties shall be of value which is sufficient for due repayment of the amount of debentures and interest thereon. I told you. Not only principal amount, but also interest amount it should cover. Next, uh, security. The security for debentures by way of charge or mortgage shall be created in favor of a debenture trustee. Generally, security will register in favor of a money lender. Money lender. Here, who, who comes under money lender? Ma? Debenture holders. Debenture holders. If debenture holders count is, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, up to 10, no problem. We can register we can register uh, security in favor of these people. But if you if you observe generally, these debenture holders, you know, they are 100 in number, sometimes thousands in number, lakhs in number. And it is not possible to create charge in favor of all these people. That's what, you know, we'll appoint trustee and in favor of trustee, we will register that security. Next one, appointment of trustee. As I told you, the company shall appoint a trustee before issue of prospectus. When you are making public offer, prospectus is compulsory and letter of offer for subscription of its securities. Further, not later than 60 days after allotment of uh, debentures, company has to execute a debenture trust deed. I told you, within 60 days of allotment, company has to execute debenture trust deed in order to protect the interest of debenture holders. And moreover, my dear students, debenture holders are prohibited from voting at general meeting. Yes or no? Why? They are not owners of the company. 
Def, uh, and moreover, if you look at them, you know, they are investing money in the company. Same like owners, they are also making investment in the company. Owners, they are permitted to general meeting. Debenture holders are not permitted to general meeting. Now, debenture holders, interest is there in company and they want to know what is happening to that interest. So that's what, you know, on behalf of debenture holders, one person will be there. We call him as debenture trustee. Clear. Next one, limits on borrowings from the debentures. Convertible debentures, special resolution. Non-convertible debentures, you know, borrowings by issuing debentures together with the amount already borrowed exceed company's paid up share capital, free resource and securities premium amount, you know, 100% of paid up share capital, free resource and securities premium. In that case, uh, in that case, even if issue non-convertible debentures, special resolution is compulsory. Next one, only board resolution. You know, in other words, if borrowings do not exceed as above, board resolution is sufficient. Next one, temporary loans obtained from company bankers in the ordinary course of business are not to be included in the borrowings. You know, short term loans like uh, uh, overdraft facilities, cash credit facilities, if any company obtained from the bankers, don't consider them while counting, you know, while checking the limit. I told you, right, existing debt plus new debt, existing plus new debt put together shall not exceed these limits. So while, while, uh, uh, while calculating existing debt, don't consider temporary loans, short term loans. Next one, debenture trustee, when required, when you make public offer. And second case, when you're offering say your debentures to existing members, exceeding 500, exceeding 500. So don't read this condition as a whole. Debenture trust is applicable in case of public offer, comma, offering to the members exceeding 500. In, the, in these two cases, trustee is compulsory. And uh, before you issue prospectus, you know the prospectus shall contain the details of trustee. Or letter of offer shall contain the details of trustee. That's what you know, content letter. Disqualifications of debenture trustee. See, you can't appoint any person as a debenture trustee. In order to appoint someone as a debenture trustee, he should not be disqualified. Sir, what are the disqualifications, sir? You know, he cannot hold shares beneficially in the company. Not, you know, registered shareholder. I'm not talking about registered shareholder. I'm talking about beneficial shareholder. Suppose, you know, uh, my father is holding shares in one company on behalf of me. On those shares, you know, all benefits, you know, I'm entitled to. I'm entitled to all the benefits of, of the shares held by my father. Now, I'm, I'm having beneficial interest. A company can't appoint me as a debenture trustee, even though I'm not having shares in my name. Why? Because I'm having beneficial interest in the company. Next one, promoter, director, key managerial person, any officer of four companies, cash, they call it as cash, you know, company, associate company, subsidiary company, holding company. So who are they ma? Promoters, hmm, shortcut, promoters, directors, KMP, officer. And uh, you shall not fall uh, under uh, another heading, ma? Oh, sorry. You shall not be relative of these above people, ma. You shall not be relative of a promoter or any person who is in employment of the company as director or KMP. Next up. And you should not be beneficially entitled to monies which are uh, to be paid by the company. Simply, debenture holder is disqualified. Creditor is also disqualified. You should not have any interest in the company. Either as a creditor or as a debtor too. Suppose, you know, if you look at fourth point, debtor is also disqualified. Why? Because it is all about independence. It is all about independence. If you appoint these people as a debenture trustee, you know, they won't make decisions uh, in favor of debenture holders. They will make decisions in favor of themselves. Understood? Understood. So only independent person should be appointed as debenture trustee. So creditor disqualified, debenture holder disqualified, debtor disqualified. With com coming to the debtor, you know, any of these uh, four entities, you know, if he is a debtor to these four entities, any of these four entities, then he is disqualified to act as a debenture trustee in our company. Has furnished any guarantee in respect of principal debt secured by the debentures uh, or interest thereon? You all know guarantee concept, right? Contract of guarantee. So in contract of guarantee, you'll find three parties, principal debtor, creditor, surety. Principal debtor will borrow a loan, ma. And surety will give guarantee. You no know, guarantee means in case your principal debtor makes default, I am personally liable to you and I'll pay money to you. That's what contract of guarantee means, yes or no? Now imagine a uh, company is there, company borrowed money from debenture holders by issuing debentures. So now debenture holder stands in the position of creditor and a company 
company will stands in the position of principal debtor to the same debentures you know to the same loan amount mr s is giving guarantee guarantee means what tomorrow if company makes any default with respect to payment of principal uh, sorry payment of interest or repayment of uh, principal i'll pay you i'm personally liable to you so that's what you know s is giving guarantee and uh, unfortunately s is also appointed as debenture trustee imagine debenture trustee now in company you know company is taking some company is making some policies which are against to debenture holders if these policies are implemented you know debenture holders interest will be affected so they are uh, changing the assets of the company whatever surplus they are having they are distributing entire surplus in the form of a dividends so definitely company will face uh, you know company will face cash crunch tomorrow and company may not pay interest or company may not redeem debentures so that scenario is happening in the company now as a debenture trustee immediately he should go and he should communicate with the uh, debenture holders my dear debenture holders your interest is getting affected company is making all wrong things sir. so definitely tomorrow company will file a uh, winding up proceedings you will get nothing come on take action immediately like that you know trustee has to trustee has to communicate that matter with debenture holders are you getting my point suppose if the same person is a surety also you know in the in our example surety is a trustee surety is a trustee now you know surety went to debenture holders and told company tomorrow or day after tomorrow they will close the business entire surplus you know they are uh, distributing in the form of dividends come on go and take action initially what debenture holders will do they will ask the company come on pay us claims company made default the moment the principal debtor makes default creditor will cash whom surety and who is surety trustee trustee so if trustee makes communication with debenture holders go and collect money from company and if company fails to pay the money then debenture holders will uh, ask whom debenture holders will claim money from whom surety only are you getting my point students are you all getting my points so tell me just tell me who will dig uh, their own uh, you know what ground ma just i'm asking you suppose uh, surety as a trustee if he make communication with debenture holders if company makes default then who will be held liable to debenture holders surety surety only that's what you know in this situation surety will not disclose any information with respect to company with debenture holders he will keep silence why because if he reveal any information and if company makes default obviously he will be held liable understood so he won't make any independent decisions his decisions will be subordinate to the company that's what you know surety is also disqualified guarantor is also disqualified from acting as a debenture trustee has any pecuniary relationship you know financial relationship with the company amounting to 2% or more of its gross turnover or total income so here the amount you have to decide you know just having financial relationship is not a sufficient ground for attaching a disqualification suppose if you observe you know me regularly i use you know jio sim cards you know uh, regularly i'll pay a uh, jio uh, reach, uh, recharges i'll do jio recharges regularly so i'm having you know jio setup box jio fiber net and jio sim card so every month i'm paying almost 1000 rupees to uh, mukesh ambani sir so there is a financial relationship between me and uh, reliance jio now am i disqualified to act as a debenture trustee no sir why it is not considering all financial relationships between you know company and the you know outsiders it is talking about a, a significant you know material relationship sir material relationship means how much 2% or more of its gross turnover or total income suppose you know jio is earning for example jio is earning 2 crores rupees revenue in that 2 crores you know 40 lakh rupees i am contributing imagine suppose 40 lakhs i am contributing now there is a pecuniary relationship between me and uh, reliance jio infocom uh, limited accordingly i am disqualified to act as a trustee so here you have to apply the limit the limit is 2% or more of its gross turnover or total income or rupees 50 lakhs or such higher amount as may be prescribed whichever is lower right now till today central government didn't prescribe any higher amount so just ignore this point 50 lakhs is the ceiling limit 2% of its turnover or you know total income or 50 lakhs whichever is lower you have to consider 
and this relationship you have to check you know last two preceding financial years so right now we are in current you know we are in the financial year of 2023-24 last two years means what you know 2022-23 2021-22 and apart from these two years and during the current financial year current financial year means 2023-24 so you have to check three years whether there is any pecuniary relationship between you know proposed candidate and company if there is a pecuniary relationship disqualified no pecuniary relationship not disqualified next one is a relative of any promoter or any person who is in employment of the company as director or kmp already told you so remember these disqualifications ma same disqualifications are also applicable to depositor trustee deposit trustee so next topic deposits no in that we'll see the point same points apply in deposits also next one filing of casual vacancy in office or trustee now we appointed Mr. T as a debenture trustee and you know after six months uh, there arises a vacancy that vacancy is of two types one is you know casual vacancy a reason you know uh, deceased you know he died or disqualified you know some of the above disqualifications got attracted so this we call it as you know casual vacancy other than resignation so any reason other than res resignation you know board is having authority to fill the casual vacancy Understood. Board is having a power to appoint uh, any person as a trustee in order to fill casual vacancy. But if it is a case of resignation, you now why this person is making resignation? Maybe he have observed some deficiencies in a company. He have observed some uh, wrongful activities in a company. So tomorrow he may be liable if he if he can't report them to the debenture holders. Chance is there. Chance is there. So in that case, you know. Any person, yes, company can appoint as a debenture trustee. However, it should be ratified by simply, you know, that vacancy, uh, appointment of a person in, uh, to fill that vacancy, it should be approved by the majority of debenture holders. Majority, more than half. In writing, they have to give consent for appointment of any person as a debenture trustee in order to fill vacancy arising due to resignation. Removal of trustee. Yes. Debenture trustee can be removed by debenture holders. Suppose total debenture capital is total debenture capital is you know 50 crores. Now you know holders, you know, people holding not less than 3 fourth in value. So 3 by 4 into 50 crores. How much it is? 12 and of 37 and of crores. So holders holding not less than 37 and of crores rupees, 37 and of crores rupees debentures can remove debenture trustee from the position now, what is the role of debenture trustee sir you know he has to take all steps to protect the interests of the debenture holders initially i told you debenture holders are not owners of the company they can't make any decisions they can't participate in any decisions however their interest is there in the company they also invested money in the company so they want to know what is happening in the company understood so debenture trustee will take care of all these uh, things shall take all the steps to protect the interests of the debenture holders next meeting of the debenture holders in order to protect the interests of debenture holders uh, yes debenture trustee is having the power to call for a meeting accordingly the meeting of all debenture holders shall be convened by debenture trustee on requisition in writing signed by debenture so if any debenture holder holding not less than one tenth of value one tenth in value of the debentures for the time out being outstanding so I told you 100 crores is uh, right now debenture capital. Now person or persons holding not less than so simply 10% of this 100 crores. So persons uh, holding not less than 10 crores, they can file a requisition with trustee. Requisition with respect to what? Come on, call for a meeting. We have to uh, take some important decisions. Or the happening of any event which constitutes a breach, a default, or which in opinion of debenture trustee affects the interest of debenture holders. Suppose, you know, last two to three years, company is not a regular in paying a uh, interest on debentures. Understood. So immediately debenture trustee will get a power. Yes, call for a meeting and uh, take any decision with respect to debenture holders, uh, you know, protection of their interest. Next one, liability of debenture trustee. The liability means what you know if he if he fails to fulfill his obligations then he will be held responsible to compensate the loss to compensate the loss suffered by the debenture holders like that so any terms in debenture trust deed are void void terms in debenture trust are void when if those terms are exempting the liability for breach of trust 
even without exercising a degree of care and due diligence required from him as a trustee suppose you know company at the time of executing company at the time of executing a trust deed it mentioned a point tomorrow if anything went wrong tomorrow if anything went wrong and a trustee as a responsible person he should communicate with debenture holders however there is no obligation on trustee to communicate with debenture holders with respect to deficiencies in the company even if debenture trustee fails to communicate with debenture holders regarding deficiencies in the company he is not at all liable like that any clause you find in trust deed those clauses shall become void understood however the liability of trustee can be exempted by passing a resolution by not less than 3/4 in total value of the debentures of such class so tomorrow suppose you know uh, this debenture trustee is not regular in uh, doing the works he is not taking steps in order to protect the interests of the debenture holders so definitely he will be held liable responsible to the debenture holders however 3/4 of the total value of debentures holders if they give approval okay no problem exempt debenture holder from the punishment then he will not get any punishment next pay interest on redemption so on what terms and conditions you received money through issue of debentures fulfill all those terms and conditions next petition before the tribunal by trustee suppose you know if a company is not in a position or company financial resources are not sufficient so tomorrow if due date comes company can't redeem debentures company can't redeem debentures you know if trustee observed any situation like that you know trustee is having a power to file an application with the tribunal and trustee can demand a tribunal you know trustee can request a tribunal and tribunal will ask a company don't incur any additional liabilities from here onwards after clearing all dues to the debenture holders you can incur new liabilities up to that point of time don't incur any new liabilities don't borrow funds failure to redeem or to pay interest you know c point uh, sorry ninth point ninth point if you observe today is not due date due date you know after one year or two years but when you analyze financial statements you came to know that company is not in a position company will not be in a position to pay debts to the existing uh, debenture holders in that case you know trustee can go to the tribunal trustee can file a petition with the tribunal coming to the d point you know it's a present tense sir you know today is the due date but company is not in a position to pay interest or company is not in a position to repay principal the maturity date also came but still company is not making any payments in that case you know either trustee or debenture holder see either trustee or debenture holders can file an application with the tribunal now tribunal upon verification of you know state of affairs of the company it will pass such other order as it thinks fit next one procedure to be prescribed by the central government you know or the manner for securing the issue of debentures format of debenture trust deed procedure for the debenture holders to inspect a trust deed inspection of trust deed so quantum of debenture redemption reserve so how much uh, debenture redemption reserve i have to maintain every year and all other matters as may be prescribed you know these points you know these uh, things you know who is having power to fix central government is having the power to fix power to fix the following uh, things next one coming to the debenture redemption reserve ma. coming to the debenture redemption reserve you know simple chart ma simple chart all india financial institution they are not required to maintain debenture redemption reserve sir how we create this reserve you know every year company will do business yes or no so in the profit and loss account you know definitely there will be profits company will have some, some profits in this profits a certain portion you have to divert to debenture redemption reserve and balance portion you can use it uh, you can use it for payment of dividends for uh, issue of uh, you know shares uh, for balance profits yes balance profits you can use for payment of dividends or for issue of bonus shares for issue of bonus shares also we saw free reserves right we also solved one problem the remaining power profits it's your discretionary powers but coming to the debenture redemption reserve this reserve shall be used only for one purpose that one purpose is redemption of debentures and uh, and what is the quantum of debenture redemption reserve i have to maintain every year every year you have to maintain 10% of outstanding debentures maturing next year so whatever debentures are getting matured you know in the coming year in the coming year on that amount you know apply 10% that amount you have to maintain a reserve so future is uncertain so today you are having money and you invested money in a real estate sector 
you ho- you you had a you, you had a hope that you know by month end you will get the funds two months completed you are not getting funds now debenture holders came to the company sir come on pay our dues then how can you pay those dues so some amount you have to maintain uh, you know you have to maintain a secrecy secrecy reserve so how much sir you know with respect to all india financial institutions zero private placement also zero financial institutions covered under company side now limits will be specified by rba now coming to the listed company not applicable debenture redemption reserve not applicable coming to the unlisted companies for nbfc not applicable for others for others uh, you know 10% of the debentures both under public issue as well as a private placement next one investment requirement whatever funds you kept as a reserve you know that amount you have to invest in in a in an asset which is which is having high liquidity character how much minimum 15% actually there is a mistake ma see 10% i am making a reserve and how how government expect me to maintain 15% uh, of amounts uh, in a liquid assets government is asking me to keep aside a 10% of uh, debentures maturity maturing in the coming year and it is asking me to maintain 15% liquid assets in order to meet this obligation should be either 15 15 or it should be either 10 10 so 10 keeping reserve and 15 you have to investment means uh, senseless provision next one those amounts you have to maintain you know in the form of uh, deposits with scheduled banks securities in the central government of any state government security bonds mentioned in section 20 clause a2 clause f of uh, indian trust act uh, 1882 so like that we had a list in these assets you can purchase any asset ma abo investments can't be charged for security any loan etc also it should be only used for redemption of debentures so deposit uh, sorry de- debenture repayment debenture redemption reserve shall be utilized for only one purpose the one purpose is redemption of debentures so with this debentures topic we completed so we discussed you know issue related conditions and we discussed uh, redemption related conditions and our next topic is deposits are you ready very small chapter ma very small and very simple chapter very simple chapter examination point of view you can expect six marks from this topic six marks you can expect from this topic acceptance of deposits only four sections we have to uh, discuss definition of the deposit so the term deposit includes any receipt of money by way of deposit or loan or in any other form by a company whether it is a private or public but does not include such categories of amount as may be prescribed in consultation with reserve bank of india so definition of deposit is also similar to definition of debenture ma debenture includes debenture stock bonds any other instrument of a company evidencing a debt yes or no so here deposit means receipt of money any receipt of money by way of deposit or loan or in any other form See here any other form means you know don't uh, think like this suppose sir we sold goods to one debtor for one month credit sir after one month he paid money now this is also receipt of money no sir can we call that receipt of money as a deposit no 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 here in any other form is talking about loan that means if you are receiving a money in the form of debt loan deposit we call it as deposit you know broader definition it covers all money receipts by way of deposit or loans or in any other form however it excludes uh, some categories sir what are those categories sir let us discuss those categories very important ma very very important you know total we are having uh, some 15 plus points i think so total we are having uh, 18 points ma out of these 18 points one point can be asked for 2 to 3 marks any point can be asked for 2 to 3 marks ma so very very important repeat very very important listen carefully so we are talking about exclusions of exclusions from deposits exclusions from deposits you know certain categories are not categorized as deposits or not considered as deposits even though they looks like a loan debt a receipt of money in that first one is amount received from government or guaranteed by government so if you are receiving uh, amounts from government sources first point is all about government sources government sources cover you know central government state government hmm? local authority statutory authority so if you receive loan or debt from 
you know government departments you know governments governments central government state government local authority statutory authority even though it looks like a loan it is not a deposit sorry even though it looks like a deposit it is not deposit that means chapter 5 acceptance of deposit rules will not apply next one funds received from foreign sources second point is foreign sources this money we have to return after completion of purpose we have to return this money understood but these are not considered as deposits in that first one government source funds second one foreign source funds foreign governments international banks multilateral financial institutions like world bank foreign governments owned developed financial institu institutions export credit agencies foreign collaborators foreign bodies corporate and foreign citizens foreign authorities or person resident outside india person resident outside india so if you receive any money from these people in the form of loan or in the form of deposit it is not treated as deposit very simple next one loan facilities loans loans from any banking company axis icici state bank of india notified banking institution corresponding new bank and any cooperative banks so all these you know again loans from public financial institutions like lic life insurance corporation so if you borrow any money from these institutes uh, institutions uh, they are not considered as deposits next one commercial papers commercial papers you know in order to finance uh, short term needs commercial papers we can issue we can issue commercial papers in order to finance uh, short term needs so any amount received against issue of commercial papers or any other instruments issued in accordance with guidelines or notification issued by reserve bank of india it is also not treated as a deposit now the doubt is whether debenture is a deposit or not whether debenture is a deposit or not that point is also there under exclusions understood we'll discuss and students you forgot to ask me one point there is sir what is the difference between deposit and debenture sir both are debt only no yes both are debt but coming to the debentures shares when you are making a public offer you have to satisfy conditions specified under chapter 3 prospectus and allotment of securities you have to get minimum subscription you have to receive minimum application money if you fail to achieve these two conditions if you fail to fulfill these two conditions you know minimum subscription and minimum application money then you can't make allotment of securities you have to return money to the applicants but coming to the deposits such conditions are not applicable such conditions are not at all applicable and you'll just issue you know a notice to the members or issue an advertisement to the public so we are ready to accept deposits interested candidates can come to the company and fill deposit form deposit your money sir what is the benefit to the company sir see ma whenever company need funds first one they will go with the uh, existing members sir i need funds only for short term purposes sir say for suppose you know uh, i need funds for only one year sir or some two years maximum three years sir within three years i'll definitely return the money Achha, in that case you know issuing equity shares again making buyback issuing debentures and again redemption of debentures you know for three years requirement why unnecessary these things understood everyone and moreover sir you can go to bank and you can borrow money from banks no sir i agree but the point is banks will give me loans up to certain limit beyond that limit you know banks will no, never show interest and moreover banker will charge you know 11 percent interest on the loans i borrow from bank at the same time, you know, bankers will give only some 6% interest to the deposit holders. If you deposit money in SBI, you know, for a long period, you know, SBI will pay you just a 6% return. And same SBI, if they lend money to my company, they will charge 11%. Are you getting my point? So the difference 5% is a margin to the State Bank of India. Now what my company is doing, you know, what my company is planning to do. So my company... Instead of going to banks, you know, my company is planning to accept deposits from public. So I'll issue an advertisement to the public. I'll give an advertisement to the public. Interest people will come to me and they will make deposit in my company. And I'll promise them. So I'll pay you 8% interest. Now from deposit holders point of view, now from deposit holders point of view, if you see, so they are getting 8%. From banks, they will get only 6%. From my company, they are getting 8%. And from my entity point of view, it is sufficient to pay just 8%. No need to pay 11% to the banks. Yes or no? Are you getting? So both the parties are getting benefited. In this manner, you can differentiate, you know, deposit from, you know, bank loans and debentures. 
are you all getting my point so we we completed defini definition of the deposit and we are discussing the exclusions from the definition of deposits so we completed five points one is government sources foreign sources loan from banks loan from financial institutions commercial papers next one intercompany loans intercompany loans you know my holding company is giving loan to me or i am giving loan to my subsidiary company or i am giving loan to my holding company just telling you so one company financing another company it is also not covered under deposit so any amount received by a company from other company not a deposit share application money share application money chance of getting practical question is very very high very high under section 42 we uh, we had one point ma whenever you receive application money within 60 days of receipt of application money make allotment of securities make allotment of securities or else within 15 days after expiry of 60 days refund that application money either make allotment within 60 days of receipt of money or refund within 15 days after expiry of 60 days from the date of receipt of application money do either of these things sir i didn't made allotment i didn't made refund sir then from uh, from the next date onwards that share application money is no more called as application money it will become a deposit it will become a deposit see if the securities for which application money was received can't be allotted within 60 days from the date of receipt of application money such application money or advance is not refunded to the subscribers within 15 days from the date of completion of 60 days such amount shall be treated as deposit under these rules and accordingly you have to pay interest refund you have to refund ma suppose you know company made an adjustment with respect to that money for example listen carefully suppose you know company sold some goods to mr x goods worth 20 lakhs value of the goods is 20 lakhs next week you know x came to company x deposited some 50 lakh rupees sir, as an application money company you are making uh, you made private placement of securities right my name is also included in that list so against that uh, against that i am paying you 50 lakh rupees so please allot securities in my name and company didn't made any allotment now what company has to do company is required to refund the application money within 15 days from the date of completion of 60 days from the date of completion of 60 days company has to refund application money to these subscribers within 15 days now what company did you know uh, mr x we are not making any allotment last week you uh, you bought goods from us you know worth 20 lakhs right so from these 50 lakhs we will deduct to 20 lakhs and we will refund you 30 lakhs like that you know company refunded 30 lakhs to mr x 30 lakhs to mr x now sir is it a valid refund first of all is it a valid refund the answer is no with respect to 30 lakhs refund okay but with respect to 20 lakhs I will not consider it as a refund and I'll consider this 20 lakhs as a deposit. Now onwards, acceptance of deposit rules will apply with respect to 20 lakhs. If I'm talking about refund, you have to refund that money. Adjustments not permitted. I repeat, adjustments not permitted. If you adjust against any other transaction, we won't consider them as a, depo a refund and we will treat the same amount as a deposit. Accordingly, you have to pay interest. Interest at the rate of 12% per annum next one loan from directors so here companies are classified into two types ma private companies you know private companies and public companies private public private company can get loan from directors as well as directors relatives private company can get funds from directors as well as directors relatives now coming to public company it can borrow money only from directors now loan from directors loan from director relatives in case of private company are not treated as deposit provided one condition they have to fulfill the condition is they have to submit a declaration declaration is with respect to you know amount is not being given out of funds required by him by borrowings or accepting loans or deposits from others and the company shall disclose the details of money so accepted in the board report so i'm a director to my company my company need funds you know i'm contributing some funds to the company in the capacity of director 
along with the loan you know i should furnish a declaration stating that this money is out of my savings out of my pocket this is my own saving amount this is not from the borrowed sources like that you know director or director relative has to furnish a declaration and the same details shall be updated in the board report next one bonds and debentures bonds and debentures another tricky point ma another tricky point secured debentures secured bonds not a deposit not a deposit but that security you have to provide only on tangible assets intangible assets are excluded intangible assets are excluded so secured debentures secured bonds not a deposit next one convertible debentures sir convertible debentures compulsorily we will convert them into equity shares within 10 years sir then also it is not a deposit convertible debentures also not a deposit secure debentures not a deposit convertible debentures not a deposit next one non convertible securities however if they are listed on a recognized stock exchange then also not a deposit then also not a deposit non convertible securities which are listed on a recognized stock exchanges then also not a deposit so simply unsecured non convertible unlisted debentures comes under sorry unsecured non convertible unlisted debentures comes under the definition of deposit convertible debentures conversion within 10 years not a deposit secured debentures not a deposit non convertible securities but they are listed on a recognized stock exchanges sir then also not a deposit and secured debentures you know you have to consider one point that is value of security should cover principal as well as interest of the debenture first thing second thing if you provide security on intangible assets such intangible assets shall be excluded so you have to consider only tangible assets now tangible assets value debentures value just compare sir equal matching matching sir no problem you know if it covers interest as well as the principal amount no problem it is not a deposit it is a debenture remember that point next one security deposit from employees security deposit from employees is also not treated as deposit provided two conditions company has to satisfy one is one is maximum 12 months ma maximum 12 months salary company can accept a security deposit and second condition the deposit should be non interest bearing deposits non interest bearing deposits these two conditions company should satisfy then only it is not treated as deposit so what are those two conditions maximum 12 months salary second one non interest bearing deposit suppose my salary is 30000 rupees in a company my salary is 30000 now company can take security deposit from me up to 3.6 lakh up to 3.6 lakh suppose if i am making a deposit of 4 lakhs if i am depositing you know if i am making a security deposit of 4 lakhs then it will be considered as a deposit and second one i made only 3 lakh security deposit and company is paying interest on it sir then it will be treated as deposit accordingly acceptance of division uh, deposits rule shall apply next from trust any interest bearing any non interest bearing amount received or held in trust suppose you know company a limited is there company a limited is there you know it has been appointed as a trustee for the benefits of uh, one party or one group accordingly it received uh, some funds ma some funds from any party you know government or you know donors anything anything so a limited received certain funds uh, you know some funds for the welfare of one group now this receipt of money definitely company has to spend on that group for the welfare of the group so as long as it spend that money you know it looks like a loan it looks like a, a deposit to the a limited however acceptance of deposit rules shall not apply provided company should not pay any interest on such amounts company should not pay any interest on such amounts next one advances received for commercial transactions you know business advances ma business advances suppose if you look into you know lalita jewelry's uh, gold schemes you know every month you'll pay some amount you know chit amount right so you'll pay some 5000 rupees so after payment of uh, 12 months you know you'll be given an ornament without making charges etc etc yes or no so now lalita jewelers it's a private limited company now lalita jewelers company is receiving a uh, you know money from its customers money from its customers now the point is 
is that receipt of money comes under the definition of deposit answer is no provided that advance shall be adjusted within six, 365 days from the date of acceptance of such advance so within 365 days yes lalita jewelry is private limited has to a lot or simply has to uh, you know uh, sell a gold ornament to that customer however in case of any advance which is subject matter of any legal proceedings before any court of law the said limit 365 days shall not apply under negotiable instruments act also we discussed this point suppose you know have been given a check ma my company received a check from another company and the check was dishonored due to insufficiency of funds immediately i filed complaint on that uh, company under section 138 of uh, negotiable instruments act uh, okay so legal proceedings are going on meanwhile court ordered mr drawer come on pay him 20 percent deposit 20 percent amount with this company if you won the case if, if you won the case you know payee will return money to you if you lose the case you need to pay balance amount what is the point ma see i provided some services my company v limited provided some services to b limited b limited issued check to me and the check was dishonored due to insufficiency of funds immediately you know i'm payee so i filed case in a court legal proceedings are happening legal uh, no discussions are going on meanwhile court ordered b Come on, deposit some twenty percent of the instrument amount, twenty percent of check amount with V Limited. So if you win the case, you know B Limited. If you win the case, you know V Limited will return that money along with interest. If you lose the case, you have to pay balance amount to V Limited. That is the you know uh, case happening between me and B Limited. Now accordingly, I received some amount from B Limited. Now in this case, the condition of three sixty five days shall not apply, ma. So you can keep that money, you know, for two years, three years, four years until court gives a decision, a decision, you know, you can keep that money. It is not at all a deposit. Next one, advance for immobile property. Under capital gains, you saw you solved many problems with respect to sale of immobile property, transfer of immobile property, right? So if you receive any advance and finally, you know, that buyer, proposed buyer is unable to pay remaining amount and you forfeited that advance amount then that advance amount shall be reduced from cost of acquisition accordingly you will calculate capital gains in uh, subsequent sales remember that point okay so any advance for immobile property it is also not treated as deposit next so security deposit for goods or services a security deposit for performance of a contract or for supply of the goods or provision of services this is also not treated as deposit and next one advances for long term projects Next, advances for AMC contracts. Example, you know, when you purchase a car or uh, you know, uh, two-wheeler vehicle or any any item, so they will ask you, sir, we'll provide you extended warranty facilities if you deposit, you know, 1,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees or 10,000 rupees. General warranty, one year, sir. But we provide you five years warranty. For five years, you know, we ne uh, you need to pay some 1,000 rupees. Now, you'll pay 1,000 rupees to the company. So, this 1,000 rupees is revenue to them for a period of five years. After completion of five years only, you know, they can book, you know, complete revenue. Each and every year they will fix, uh, they will uh, apportion some portion. They will uh, transfer some portion to the revenue. But balance amounts, even though they look like a loan or even though they look like a deposit, it is not treated as deposits. So advance for long-term projects, advance for AMC contracts. Next one, sectorial permitted advances. Sectorial permitted advances. So under prospectus and allotment of securities, we had a topic. So company, company, if it want to convert securities into DMAT form of securities, some companies, you know, mandatorily, mandatory obligation on them to convert uh, physical securities into DMAT form of securities. For that company has to deposit a uh, two years fees with, uh, you know, NSDL CDSL, National Security Depositories Limited. CDSL, Central Depository Services Limited. So NSDL, CDSL will provide DMAT form of security services. For that services, you know, companies are required to deposit two years fees as an advance. This rule was imposed by SEBI. This rule, you know, SEBI imposed this rule. According to this rule, you know, if NSDL or CDSL is receiving advances from companies, then such advances are not treated as deposits 
next one advances for subscriptions advance for subscription you know today amazon hmm? netflix geo some some people you know they will go with monthly subscription some people will may go with you know one year subscription or two years or five year subscription now advances against these subscriptions are also not treated as deposits next one loan from the promoter loan from the promoter Sir, so loan from the promoter is also not treated as deposit provided three conditions company has to satisfy. One is this loan company is taking because of condition imposed by the lending institutions. And this loan is provided by the promoters to the company or promoter themselves or by their relatives or by both. And third one, it should be unsecured loan. A loan from promoter should be unsecured. And such exemption shall be available till the loans of financial institutions or bank are repaid and not thereafter. Suppose, you know, company went to SBI, sir, we want to start a new project for that, you know, total 200 crores we need, sir. SBI agreed to finance 200 crores to company on a condition that promoters of the company should contribute at least 50 crores. We will finance you, but at least 50 crores promoter has to contribute in the form of unsecured loan. In the form of unsecured loan, promoter should contribute. If promoters contribute 50 crores, we will contribute 200 crores to the company like that you know they imposed a condition now accordingly promoters you know they are giving a loan to the company amount 50 crores so this loan should be you know unsecured first one and next one and next one as long as this amount 200 crores returned to the sbi you know simply company repay the entire amount to the sbi till that time this 50 crores is not at all treated as deposit once this 200 crores become zero from that point onwards you know this 50 crores this 50 crores from the promoter will comes under the definition of deposit next one nidhi company you all know nidhi company the main objective of nidhi company is to cultivate habit of savings so nidhi company any amount received by from the members by the nidhi company if uh, this uh, chapter provisions will not apply this chapter provisions will not apply for the deposits accepted by Nidhi company. Next one, chit fund companies. Amounts issued by chit fund companies, even though they look like a deposits, they will not come under deposits definition. Next, collective investment schemes, you know, mutual funds. Mutual funds will receive amounts from its clients and that amount they will invest in various securities, a, a basket, basket of securities. So the, their main objective, you know, a risk reduction. They will try to avoid risk, you know, they will not invest money in a single entity, single company. So they will select a, a, some 10 to 15 companies and they will subscribe securities of those companies using funds contributed by the clients of mutual fund companies. Now, you know, any amount received by mutual com fund companies under, you know, collective investment schemes, it is also not treated as deposits. Next one, startup companies. We had startup companies. Startup companies, you know, more than 25 lakhs. Under a single transaction, if a startup company received 25 lakhs or more in the form of debt only and will, which will be, you know, repaid by issuing a convertible securities. So today you deposit 30 lakhs with, with, with me, we will execute a loan agreement with you. We will execute loan agreement with you. So after expiry of certain period, we will convert that uh, loan into the equity shares. If this is the situation then amount received by the startup companies are also not treated as deposits and last one you know amounts received by company from alternate investment funds domestic venture capital funds infrastructure investment trust real estate investment trust and mutual funds registered with us sebi in accordance with regulations made by it so those amounts are also not treated as deposits clear now out of 18 three four points you know they are asking the repetitively what are those points sir? Share application money, promoter contribution to the company, debentures point. You know, very frequently these points are getting uh, tested in the examination. No need to buy heart all these 18 points. Ma. Just uh, understand the crux of the concept. That's it. Why? Because in examination, they won't ask you uh, what are the amounts excluded from the definition of the deposit. They won't ask you like that. They will give you a situation and they will ask whether it is covered under the deposit or not clear next one uh, meaning of depositor very simple you can see 
So in this entire chapter, you know, two sections are very important. Section 73 and section 76. Section 73 and section 76. 73, acceptance of deposits from members. Company accepting deposits from members. 76, acceptance of deposits from public. One is from members. The other section is from public. So not all companies can accept deposit from public. Ma. Only eligible company can accept deposits from public. Only eligible company can accept deposits from public. So normal companies, you know, other than eligible company, they can accept a, a renew deposits only from members. And, and next point, this chapter, chapter 5, acceptance of deposits, they are not applicable to some amounts which we discussed under question number 2. You know, 18 amounts, this chapter will not apply. And next one, few companies, this chapter will not apply. So non-applicability of this chapter, you know, one branch, 18 points, 18 amounts, another branch, companies. So this chapter will not apply to any banking company, will not apply to non-banking financial companies, will not apply to housing finance companies, will not apply to national housing banks, and will not apply to any other company as central government may specify after consultation with Reserve Bank of India. Clear ma? Remember these two points. Next one. Provisions relating to acceptance of deposits from members. Sir, what are the conditions we need to fulfill for accepting deposits from members? First condition, ordinary resolution. War is sufficient. First, you need to take approval from the members. Next, you need to issue a letter called circular. You need to issue circular to the members. So, yes, company is accepting deposits. So, right now, what is the position, financial position of the company? Simply balance sheet. And what is the credit rating? You know, investing funds in my entity. Is it risky or safe? Will be decided under credit rating certificate. Next, sir. Till today, how many depositors we are having? And how much amount we are due to them? And such other particulars as may be prescribed. So, this, uh, this uh, matter, you know, this particulars, I need to furnish in a circular. And mode of sending this circular, sir, in which mode you need to send this circular to the member, sir? Any mode, ma, you know, uh, either registered post with acknowledgement due or by speed post or by electronic mode, but it should be in form number DPT1. Publish in newspaper. Publish in newspaper. Generally, eligible companies can make publication in newspaper. Understood? So, private companies, other than eligible companies, you know, publication in newspaper is prohibited. The circular may be published in English language, in an English newspaper and in vernacular language in a vernacular newspaper having wide circulation in the state in which register office of the company is situated. The next one, CA certificate regarding non-defaulter. Important point. You know, any company which makes default, default with respect to interest on deposits as well as deposit is prohibited from accepting deposits for the next five years after rectification. After rectification, after rectification, there is a prohibition period on you. There is a ban period on you. That ban period is five years. So until you complete five years from the year of rectification of the default, you are not permitted to accept deposits from members. Sir, no default, sir. Since incorporation, we never committed any default, sir. Achha, fine. Obtain the same on a certificate from statutory auditor of the company. You know, statutory auditor has to certify that company has not committed any default in repayment of the deposits or in payment of interest on such deposits. Even if committed default, five years had been lapsed since rectification of the default. Like that, you know, statutory auditor has to give certificate. So in case of default, five years cooling period, just now I told you. And authority. Such circular shall be issued on the authority and in the name of board of directors of the company. So who is having authority to issue circular? Board of directors. Sir, from whom? From uh, board of directors will get authority from whom? No, board of directors will get that authority from members of the company. You now members in general meeting by passing ordinary resolution, they will authorize the board of directors to issue circular to accept deposits from members. And if you are making any advertisement, you know that advertisement is valid. That advertisement will have a validity period. That validity period is earliest of the six months from the closure of financial year. Suppose, you know, on 1st uh, November 2023, I'm making this advertisement. 
when I'm making the advertisement, 1st November 2023. Now this advertisement is valid up to 6 months from the closure of financial year. That means closure of financial year is 31st March 2024 plus 6 months. So 30th September 2024 or date on which financial statements are laid before the company at the AGM or due date of AGM if no AGM is held. Or suppose my AGM date is 27th September 2024. And what is the due date of AGM you know? Generally AGM shall be conducted shall be conducted on or before 30th September 2024. So now you are having total three dates ma. Total you are having three dates. In these three dates you have to consider earliest day. You have to consider earliest day. One is six months from the closure of financial year. Second one date of AGM or due date of AGM whichever is earliest. So out of these three dates earliest date is 27th September 2024. Next one, press circular for each financial year. So every year you have to issue circular. So last year I issued circular. No. Current year can I accept deposits without issuing circular? No. Filing of circular with ROC. You know ROC filing is compulsory. Next, sir. deposit repayment reserve account. Similar to debenture redemption reserve. Every year company has to separate certain portion of profits and it has to reserve that amount under deposit repayment reserve account. Sir, what is the date? What is the due date for uh, fulfilling this condition? The due date is 30th April of every year. 30th April of every year. Right now we are in the financial year 23-24, right? So with respect to uh, this financial year, 30th April 2023 is the last date for maintaining deposit repayment reserve. At least 20% of the amount of deposits maturing during the following financial year. It's not current financial year. It's a following financial year. Following financial year means what? upcoming year not current year the next year so with respect to financial year 24 25 repayment of deposits you have to maintain reserve on or before 30th april 2023 suppose for the 24 25 we we are in a uh, we should return deposits uh, to the volume of 50 crores 50 crores we have to return during financial year 24 25 now by 30th april 2023 by 30th April 2023, you have to create deposit repayment reserve not uh, less than 10 crore rupees. Further, such a amount shall not at any time fall below 20% of the amount of deposits maturing during the financial year. You can use this reserve only for repayment of deposits. Ma. Upon repayment, if this amount falls, immediately you have to increase the reserve. Immediately you have to transfer certain portion of profits and certain cash balances or bank balances to deposit repayment uh, reserve as well as uh, liquid assets certification as to no default in repayment yes this point I already told you you have to obtain a certificate from statutory auditor next provision of security ma you can accept secured deposits or, or you can accept unsecured deposits but if you promise them we'll provide security then you need to provide security only you know tangible assets first thing we discussed earlier right and you know the charge value, the charge value should cover not only principal amount but also interest amount. So company may provide security if any for due repayment of the amount of deposits or the interest thereon. Further, if security is provided, the company shall take steps for creation of charge on the property or assets of the company. If you are accepting unsecured deposits, you know separate disclosure you have to make in the circular. If no disclosure is there, general presumption they are security deposits. Next, relaxation for private companies. Relaxation for private companies. Here, companies classified into three types. Ma. One is startup company, startup private company. Second one, private company accepting deposits up to 100% of paid up share capital and free reserves. Limit, limit. It, will, it is accepting deposits, you know, maximum existing plus new deposits not exceeding 100% of paid up share capital and free reserves. And third one, private company which is satisfying two conditions first which is neither an associate nor subsidiary to other company and total borrowings from banks financial institutions or other body corporate is less than twice of its paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less and no default with respect to repayment of those borrowings which we discussed in the above point so private company satisfying these three conditions one is neither an associate nor subsidiary next to loans sir Loans not exceeding twice of its paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less. Third one, not defaulted in repayment of uh, 
aforementioned loans in that case these three companies are exempted from fulfilling certain obligations one is no need of preparing circular no need to issue circular no need of filing a circular with roc no need of these reserve accounts and no need of any certificate from statutory auditor regarding default no default certificate so these conditions these obligations are not applicable to this three private companies one is company which is accepting deposits to the extent of 100% of paid up capital plus free reserves the other one is startup company and the last one is company which is neither associate nor subsidiary and its borrowings not exceeding twice of its share capital or 50 crores whichever is less huh. sorry it's not exceeding it is uh, less than it is not not exceeding less than so you know loans borrowing from three parties banks financial institutions other body corporates is uh, less than twice of its paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less and no default with respect to repayment of such borrowings clear and every company after accepting deposits it has to file certain forms with roc clear next one repayment of deposit you know once tenure is completed you have to return deposit amount to the deposit holders if you fail to repay then you know aggrieved party can file an application with a nclt aggrieved party can file an application with nclt now nclt will decide the matter using the amount of dr or a come on tell me my dear students deposit repayment reserve account can be utilized for only one purpose that one purpose is repayment of deposits you can't declare dividends out of drra understood next one you can't issue bonus shares from drra you can't write off preliminary expenses using deposit repayment reserve account deposits repayment reserve account shall be utilized only for one purpose that is you know repayment of deposits next one tenure for deposits so tenure important point ma mcq point of view also important minimum a company can accept deposits of 6 months maximum 36 months minimum 6 months maximum 36 months however a company can accept deposits for a period not less than 3 months also general tenure is 6 months to 36 months ma beyond 36 months not permitted less than 6 months not permitted but in some cases in order to finance very short term uh, needs 3 uh, months condition is there 3 months tenure uh, deposits is also there but less than 3 months not permitted and uh, for 3 months also you can't accept you know deposits a uh, uh, limits uh, <clears throat> sorry you can't accept as much as deposits for a uh, 3 months tenure there is a limit on 3 months deposits also maximum 10% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium See, for the purpose of meeting any of its short term requirements of the funds the company may accept or renew deposits for repayment earlier than 6 months subject to following conditions max to max 10% of aggregate paid up share capital free reserves and securities premium and minimum 3 months tenure minimum 3 months tenure and next one maximum amounts of deposits from the members so this is a condition with respect to limit on deposits see if this condition is not there then everyone every person what they will do see companies are paying more interest right so instead of depositing money with banks they will deposit money with company now you'll find all money with companies only you'll find nothing in banks so liquidity crunch will happen that's what you know this condition is there so maximum a private company a ineligible public company can accept 35% deposit from its members 35% 35% on what 35% on paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus and securities premium understood so from this limit point of you know that those 18 exclusions are very important suppose you received a employee security deposit if it is within the limit you know 12 month salary non interest bearing security deposit then that amount i won't consider it as a deposit accordingly that space is available to you you can accept that amount from members understood my paid up share capital 1 crore ma reserves and surplus securities premium total 1 crore now total how much 2 crores 2 crores into 35% means how much you know 70 lakhs existing deposits plus new deposits i can accept up to 70 lakhs suppose above 18 exclusions are there in that one amount comes under the deposit for example employee security deposit you received a 24 month salary as a security deposit total 8 lakhs you received from employee as a security deposit 
Understood. So conditions violated. So we will call it as a deposit. How much amount? Uh, 8 lakhs. Now exclude 8 lakhs. So balance 62 lakhs. You can accept the deposits from members. Understood. So existing plus proposed deposit shall not exceed 35% of paid up share capital plus reserves and surplus plus securities premium. And to this we had some exceptions. Exception to rule 35% means what? You can go beyond 35% also. You can accept deposits beyond 35%. Sir, what cases, sir? You know, specified IFSC public companies and private companies can accept deposits for not exceeding 100% of aggregate paid up share capital free reserves and securities premium account. General rule 35%. Ma. Once again, I'm telling you, general rule 35%. Coming to specified IFSC public companies and private companies, they can accept deposits up to 100% of aggregate of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium. And next one, no limit, no limit for some entities. Here, you know, 35% limit is not applicable, 100% limit not applicable. You can go up to 5,000 percentage, 10,000 percentage, 1 lakh percentage also. Sir, which company, sir? You know few private companies which falls under this category one is startup companies up to five years from the date of incorporation second one you know any private company which fulfill the following conditions just now we discussed these conditions you know neither an associate nor subsidiary to other entity and the borrowings are not exceeding a sorry it's not exceeding no i'm i'm wrong borrowings sir total borrowings sir less than twice of its a paid up share capital or 50 crores whichever is less and uh, company has not defaulted in repayment of such borrowings so with respect to private company which falls under these two categories two categories they can accept deposit more than 35 percent more than 100 percent more than 1000 percent no limit and you remember again you know these companies only you know these uh, three companies you know these two companies and this private company accepting deposits from its members not exceeding 100 percent so these three companies you know condition of uh, no default certificate circular filing of circular with ROC huh? these conditions are also not applicable privileges simply privileges next one appointment of trustee for depositor same concept ma. under debenture trustee we discussed no same concept shall apply nothing new even disqualifications also same to same powers role of trustee same to same Next one, ceiling on rate of interest and brokerage payable on deposits. You know, central government is having power to fix a maximum rate of interest a company can pay to the deposit holders. Brokerage, maximum brokerage amount it can pay to the deposit holders. So there is a ceiling on it. Central government is having power to prescribe that rates. Next one, filing of application by the depositor. So intending depositor shall submit an application in order for a company to accept or renew a deposit. The application shall be in the form prescribed by the company so without application a member can't uh, deposit money with company and company is not allowed to accept that deposit along with the uh, application form only company can accept the deposits sir can i make deposit in joint names sir yes but maximum three joint deposit holders so not exceeding three company can issue dep deposit certificate uh you know it shall not exceed you know it will it can have a names of deposit holders not exceeding three you know single person making deposit i'll get a certificate in my name two or more persons if they deposit a single amount with the company then company can issue deposit certificate but that certificate will contain owner's names not exceeding three next up nomination as usual deposit receipt Deposit receipt. So within a period of 21 days from the date of receipt of money or realization of check or date of renewal, the company is required to furnish a deposit receipt to the depositor or his agent. So what is the time limit for issuing deposit receipt? Not 21 days. Do you remember time limit for issue of a share certificate? At the time of incorporation, two months. At the time of allotment of securities, two months. In case of transfer or transmission. In case of transfer or transmission, what is the time limit? The time limit is one month. Allotment of debentures, six months. Deposit receipt, come on, tell me deposit receipt. The time limit is 21 days from the date of receipt of money or realization of check or date of renewal. Next, the receipt will be valid 
only if it is signed by duly authorized officer you know that receipt shall have this following particulars one is date of deposit name and address of depositor amount of deposit rate of interest and maturity dates clear every company accepting deposits has to maintain register of deposits another important point for multiple choice question that is premature repayment of deposits premature repayment means you know before due date if company is making payment we call it as premature repayment sir why company will make premature repayment sir reason applicant you know deposit holder deposit holder came to company and is asking sir i need money suppose he made a deposit for one year ma so for nine months completed and he came to company and is asking sir please return my deposit amount please return deposit amount in this case you know company is liable to pay interest however company can deduct 1% from interest rate as a penalty suppose you know company agreed to pay 8% interest ma 8% interest for one year and this fellow before completion of one year came to company in order to get money now company is liable to pay interest minimum 7% now company is liable to pay interest at the rate of 7% 7% for 9 months. So amount is for example 1 lakh rupee. 1 lakh into 8 minus 1. 1 is you know penalty. Okay. Into 9 months divided by 12 months. For 9 months only you know company is having that money. So 7000. 7000 into. So 1 lakh into 7% means 7000. 7000 into 9 divided by 12. So he is entitled to interest of just 5250. Now this 1% reduction is just you know discouraging factor. So to discourage uh, early repayments, you know, this 1% uh, uh, reduction privilege is available to the company. Next, <clears throat> next one, filing of return of deposits with the registrar. No right to alter the terms. Once, you know, you accepted deposits, you had no right to alter terms and conditions. You can't change interest. You can't convert the secured deposits to unsecured deposits. Next, final, you know, disclosures in the financial statements. And if company makes any delay in returning deposit amounts, then you know 18% penal rate of interest is applicable. 18% for overdue period, company is liable to pay 18% penal rate of interest to the deposit holders. And uh, in this uh, under this chapter, if company makes any default with respect to complaints of section 73, 73, then you know the punishment. The punishment. So fine extendable to 5000 rupees and in case of contravention is continuing one with a further fine of 500 for every day failing to send the deposit receipts within 21 days for example if you fail to send deposit receipt within 21 days then this punishment is applicable and there is a separate punishment for violation of section 73 and uh, section 76 ma separate uh, punishment is there so this question also covered in previous question ma exception separate question we made exception separate question we made we already discussed this question next one last part of this deposit chapter is you know eligible public companies who are permitted to accept deposits from public sir you know only eligible public companies only eligible public companies are permitted from accepting deposits from public and uh, what comes under eligible public company category sir first of all it should be a public company compulsory public company and next condition net worth not less than 100 crores so calculation of net worth you know paid up share capital plus pre reserves plus securities premium next one it excludes you know p and l debit balance accumulated losses it excludes miscellaneous assets not written off miscellaneous assets which doesn't have any value not written off so this is the formula for calculating net worth a revaluation reserve everything is excluded ma so simply paid up share capital plus uh, pre reserves plus securities premium minus uh, losses accumulated losses minus miscellaneous assets not written off so you will get net worth net worth not less than 100 crores so greater than or equal to 100 crores turnover not less than 500 crores either of these two conditions should satisfy either of these two conditions should be satisfied one is you know one category public company with turnover 500 crores or more or public company with a net worth 100 crores or more such companies we can uh, we call them as eligible companies and eligible companies can accept deposits from both members as well as non-members however uh, special resolution is required you are going outside right 
you can accept deposits from uh, uh, you know non members yes or no so special resolution is compulsory and this special resolution you need to file it with the roc however uh, however if the proposed deposits and existing debts are within the limits of you know section 180 subsection 1 clause c you know section 180 is all about powers of the directors powers of the directors you know directors can borrow money on behalf of company to what extent they can borrow sir you know without members approval they can borrow money you know up to what limits you know existing debt plus new debt existing plus new debt put together not exceeding you know 100 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium if this is the case you know under new debt proposed deposits is there ma proposed deposits is there so after accepting these proposed deposits total debt if it is within the limit if it is within the limit then ordinary resolution is sufficient or else special resolution is required next one eligible companies for accepting deposits you know conditions as usual ma section 73 subsection 2 conditions but extra conditions you know it is required to obtain credit rating every year and the same shall be furnished in a circular letter as well as advertisement next one charge creation yes if you accept deposits by creating charge on any assets then such charge shall be filed with roc such charge shall be made only with respect to two tangible assets and market value of these assets uh, uh, shall cover not only deposits principal amount but also deposits interest amount too total value of security should not be less than amount of the deposits accepted and interest payable thereon next one market value of assets subjected to charge shall be assessed by registered valuer you know whether uh, assets value is covering deposits total amount or not you know registered valuer will make assessment of it and security same under debentures you know we register security in favor of debenture trustee here also will provide security in favor of depositor trustee tenure for deposits already discussed minimum six months maximum 36 months you can accept deposits for a period not less than three months provided that amount uh, shall not exceed you know 10 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium you know my advice when you find you know such equations try to write in an equation format try to write in an equation format don't read like this you know blindly so you just write like this you know 10 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium so that you can reverse it more and more number of times appointment of trustee similar to debenture trustee ma similar to debenture trustee and these points already we discussed now coming to the maximum amount of deposits this is the extra point we need to discuss so from its members you know eligible company can accept deposits maximum 10 percent of from ag you know aggregate of its paid up share capital free reserves and securities premium account and from persons other than its members maximum 25 percent sir can i interchange these limits sir for example i'll accept 15 percent from members 20 percent from non-members no wrong it is wrong it is wrong it is not permitted so here 10 and here it is 25 and whereas for government companies there is no limit at all government companies 35 percent it can go with public 35 percent it can go with uh, you know members there is no such problem just uh, with respect to amounts point of view you know limit on deposits i'll give you one chart limit on deposits eligible company eligible company from members it can accept deposits up to 10 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium non-members non-members 25 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium however these terms and conditions are not applicable to government company government company not applicable once again i'm telling you once again i'm repeating you this 10 percent 25 percent you know it's not about you know proposed deposit it also covers existing deposits too suppose already there is an existing deposit sir now you know existing plus proposed deposit from members shall not uh, exceed 10 percent of these limits same with respect to non-members also 
existing deposit plus proposed deposit total put together shall not exceed 25 percent of paid up share capital plus producers plus securities premium so total if you ask me eligible company can accept deposits up to 35 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium and the same rule is also applicable to other companies ma you know here other companies are of two types one is ineligible public company ineligible public company you know public company with uh, turnover less than 500 crores and private company with a uh, turn uh, paid net worth less than 100 crores if it is the case if it is the case you know ineligible public company we call it as ineligible public company next one private companies next one private companies ineligible public company maximum it can accept deposits you know up to 35 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus uh, securities premium from whom they can accept deposits from members they can accept deposits and coming to the private company it can also accept you know it will also accept deposit from members only it will also deposit a sorry it will also accept a deposit from members only but the limit 35 percent is not applicable to them some private companies you know they can make a deposits up to sorry they can accept a deposits they can accept deposits up to 100% of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium and coming to the startup companies no limit at all startup companies there is no limit at all and next one you know companies uh, satisfying three conditions what are those three conditions you know in which uh, uh, sorry the company which is neither associate nor subsidiary to another body corporate total loans from banks financial institutions uh, and uh, other body corporates uh, less than twice of its paid up share capital or 250 crores whichever is less and no default with respect to existing uh, loans such companies can also accept deposits exceeding 35 percent exceeding 100 percent there is no problem at all so this is you know total summary about uh, limits on deposits and all these amounts you know you can accept minimum tenure you know tenure minimum tenure that is of six months uh, maximum tenure 36 months the six months can be reduced to three months however you can accept deposits for a period of three months uh, there is a limit the limit is 10 percent of paid up share capital plus free reserves plus securities premium that's it that's it so this is all about deposits now this is all about deposits every point i covered next one penalty penalty if company violates provisions with respect to non repayment of, you know with respect to payment of deposits with respect to repayment of deposits then you know what is the punishment company minimum fine 1 crore maximum 10 crores this is the only section with a minimum fine crores rupees generally punishment you know 1 lakh 3 lakhs 5 lakhs huh? so far we discussed you know many penalties 5 lakhs this is the section you know where minimum fine itself is 1 crore even under section 8 company minimum fine is 10 lakhs maximum 1 crore but coming to the deposits you know company minimum 1 crore maximum 10 crores officer in default both imprisonment as well as fine ma fine minimum 25 lakhs maximum 2 crores sometimes you know imprisonment sometimes both imprisonment or fine or both clear section 76 a 76a is punishment for contravention of provisions of uh, 73 to 76 so this punishment is applicable when this punishment is applicable when you fail to repay when you fail to return deposits when you fail to return deposits this condition is applicable when you violate section 73 to 76 then this punishment is applicable suppose you are a private company you can't accept deposit from a uh, public till you accept a deposit from public and you are an eligible company you can accept maximum 25 percent from non-members 10 percent from members 10 percent from members and you cross these limits you know from members you accepted 20 percent deposits from non-members you accepted 30 percent deposits in that case this section will apply according to this section the punishment is same you know one crore minimum 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 one crore or twice the amount of the acceptance of deposits you know two times of deposits accepted against to the company sector whichever is less 
no under minimum we had two amounts out of these two amounts whichever is less you have to consider maximum 10 crores maximum punishment 10 crores sorry maximum fine 10 crores minimum how much ma 1 crore maximum 10 crores you should not write like that you should not write like that minimum 1 crore or twice the amount of deposits accepted whichever is less maximum 10 crores coming to the officer in default you know 25 lakh rupees to 2 crores and imprisonment up to 7 years imprisonment up to 7 years and in case of you know a fraud section 447 is applicable punishment under section 447 is applicable clear i'll give you one example with respect to fraud ma with respect to tax authorities with respect to tax authorities just see actually my sales my sale income is 100 crores all my expenses including purchase you know it is the uh, 80 crores now net profit how much ma 20 crores on this i need to pay tax ma 25 percent is the rate of taxation if your turnover is less than 400 crores you know 25 percent is the rate of taxation so 20 crores into 25 percent how much is the taxation come on tax amount is how much 5 crores right yeah tax amount is 5 crores the company has to pay tax of how much 5 crores now what company did you know what company did you know it reduced sales by sorry it reduced sales to 80 crores 80 crores yes it reduced sales to 80 crores and profit to 0 rupees now tax amount how much 25 percent on 0 0 reduction of sales happened what about collection from debtors what about collection from debtors suppose you know sales means uh, the entry would be the entry would be bank account debit 100 crores to sales account 100 crores you know if it is a cash sales i'm talking about cash sales if it is a cash sales the entry would be like this bank account debit to sales yes or no credit sales you know initially debtors debtors account debit to sales next cash account debit cash or bank account debit to debtors account yes or no so sales they reduce it to 80 crores more then what about this point you know what about you know bank amount balance bank bank account balance is there no 20 crores excess amount is there in bank account how it is possible is it possible not possible so that's why you know what company is doing you know it is making an entry like this it is making entry like this bank account to debit 80 crores bank account to debit 80 crores to debtors account sorry not debtors i'm writing consolidated entry right so to sales account 80 crores for 20 crores it is writing entry like this bank account to debitor 20 crores to deposit holders to deposit holders like that you know it is creating a liability 20 crores now bank balance tallied bank balance tallied everything is perfect so if you look at the balance sheet what happened you know we created a deposit liability of 20 crores is it a real deposit sir is it a real deposit no you, you created this deposit in order to reduce your sales in order to reduce taxes so during investigation if this matter comes into the picture that means you committed a willful fraud you committed uh, you committed this act willfully with the intention to deceive tax authorities now what tax authorities will do they will definitely file a petition against the company and company uh, will get punishment as discussed like this you know company will get punishment minimum 1 crore or twice the amount uh, of the deposit whichever is lower maximum 10 crores officer in default will get this uh, this punishment and you know person responsible for this fraud you know person behind this fraud will get punishment under section 447 is it clear everyone so with this deposits also we completed our next topic is registration of charges section 77 to 87 very small chapter and examination point of view you can expect four to six marks as you all know Loans are of two types, secured loans, unsecured loans. Without providing any asset as a security, if you obtain loan amount, we call it as unsecured loans. By providing asset as a security, 
if you obtain loan amount we call it as secured loans so providing security means what tomorrow if you fails to pay interest amount or if you fails to repay principal amount then the money lender will get complete rights over the property he will sell the property he will occupy the property in order to get his due amount yes or no and these loans actually three types one is pledge second one hypothecation third one mortgage if you provide mobile property as a security and if you are transferring possession of mobile property to the money lender we call it as pledge example gold loans you transfer mobile property to the banker you will also transfer possession of gold to the banker and you will obtain loan amount yes or no upon payment of interest and repayment of principal amount you will get your gold back this comes under pledge and if you provide mobile property as a security and possession of the property remains with you only the possession of mobile property remains with the borrower such kind of loans you know it is it comes under hypothecation example vehicle loans you know possession lies with borrower yes or no c book particularly you know c book on c book you will find the name of banker you know financer it comes under hypothecation and third one mortgage if you provide any immovable property as a security it comes under mortgage here you won't transfer possession of the property to the banker or you know money lender you will transfer property documents sir, and you will execute a mortgage deed in favor of a money lender is it clear so all these three loans if you observe in all these three loans if borrower commits any default in payment of interest or repayment of principal portion definitely the money lender simply banker will have complete rights over the property will have complete rights to sell that property in order to clear their dues are you getting my point now charge means what sir charge is nothing but an interest or lien created on the property or assets both are same no difference property or assets of a company or any of its undertakings undertakings you know group of assets ma meant for a single purpose you know meant for a purpose suppose if you look at itc company no they had different different uh, uh, wings suppose itc hotels are there itc tobacco manufacturing unit is there itc fmcg manufacturing unit is there now each and every unit i call it as undertaking in each and every undertaking you will find group of assets so for the for the purpose of obtaining loan if you create any interest or lien on any property or assets of the company or any of its undertakings or both we call it as charge we call it as charge simply here company what it will do so it will provide a few assets as a security in favor of banker who lends money so tomorrow if company fails to pay any interest amount or fails to repay principal portion banker will get right over this property banker is free to deal with this property banker can sell this property are you getting my point so technically speaking charge and charge includes mortgage charge includes mortgage our chapter name is not charge ma our chapter name is a registration of charges so creation of charge is alone not sufficient you should register that charge with a roc sir what is the background you know what is the logic why we need to register charge with roc a very simple point ma see ma today company is having one immobile property immobile property so definitely it will have a you know title deed document showing a uh, title of the owner yes or no document showing title of the owner so title deed so today you know company is going to access bank sir i'm having this immobile property i want some 20 lakhs loan amount sir so please take this property documents and please please give me 20 lakhs loan amount you know company filed an application with access bank access bank keeping this title documents is yes granted 20 lakhs loan to company ma so very next week you know company went to to registrar office sir i lost a property document sir please issue me duplicate set sir yes upon filing an application with registrar definitely they will issue duplicate documents ma after one month you know company went to state bank of india sir i'm having one immobile property i'm the owner of this immobile property you can check in government records also i'm the sole owner of this property the value of property is uh, 50 lakhs please grant me a loan of 20 lakhs you know sba also granted 20 lakhs loan to company again after one month company went to registrar office 
again told same story managed the registrar and got duplicate documents now company is going to punjab national bank file an application with punjab national bank punjab national bank my property value is 50 lakhs give me loan of 20 lakhs punjab national bank also granted loan of 20 lakhs so now company total you know 20 plus 20 plus 20 it obtained 60 lakhs in the form of loans providing a same property as a security finally company defaulted in payment of interest uh, repayment of principal now all these banks came forward in order to sell that property in auction and all these banks came to know, came to know that a single property was provided as security to all these three banks now whose interest is getting affected outsiders public interest is getting affected to avoid this yes government came up with a concept called registration of charges company whenever you create an interest or lien on any of your assets or properties or any of your uh, your undertakings in favor of some third party or in favor of a money lender creation of charge alone is not sufficient you should register the charge with roc compulsory registration sir company defaulted in registering charge with roc sir then what would, what is the consequence very simple government will not consider that charge as a valid charge government will consider it as unsecured loan so tomorrow if company you know if company went into liquidation all these you know money lenders who granted loan against this security they will not be termed as a secured creditors they will be termed as the unsecured creditors and settlement will be done in that order only you all know during liquidation proceedings first priority will be given to creditors with fixed charge you know secured creditors to avoid confusion secured creditors next uh, unsecured creditors so if you want to stand in a queue under a secured creditor section yes creation of charge alone is not sufficient charge should be registered with the roc next one ma you know this charge can be created on any type of property whether it is tangible or intangible no problem you can create charge on any asset tangible or intangible and uh, the property may be located within india or outside india the location of property it is immaterial whether it is in india or outside india Whenever company creates a charge, the charge shall be registered with ROC. And this charge is of two types. Ma. Fixed charge, floating charge. Fixed charge, floating charge. In a company balance sheet, you can observe, you know, fixed assets, current assets. What is the difference between fixed assets and current assets? You know, fixed assets, fixed in nature. Fixed in nature. Uh, changes in these fixed assets, you want to observe frequently. Suppose if you purchase land and building, land and machinery. You know, this remains constant over a period of time, fixed assets, current assets, you know, sundry debtors, inventory, inventory, they are uh, not fixed in nature. They are not fixed in nature. Suppose today I'm having 10 debtors. Do you think after one year, will this uh, same 10 debtors will continue? Do you think same balances will continue till the year end? No. So debtors and inventory, do you think, you know, today I produced some 10,000 units of goods. Do you think after one year also you... Can you observe only these goods are lying in the stock? No. The amounts in the sundry debtors, amounts in the inventory keep on floating or fluctuating in nature. Over a period of time, they are fluctuating in nature. So if charge is created on current assets like, you know, sundry debtors, inventories, hmm, we call such charges floating charge. You know, charge created on assets which are fluctuating in nature, floating charge. Fixed assets, sir. Identified assets, sir. Specific assets, sir. Present assets, sir. We call it as fixed charge. Under fixed charge, you know, a company can't sell such properties without prior approval of a banker or money lender. But coming to the current assets, you know, floating charge, company is free to deal with those uh, assets. Company can sell the inventory. Company can sell the inventory. Company can realize money from the debtors. So with the realized money, they can purchase, they can procure raw materials. And they can process raw materials into finished goods and those finished goods can also be sold to new new customers so company is having complete freedom to deal with uh, uh, assets which are under floating charge but company has no freedom to use you know to dispose the assets which are covered under fixed charge understood next one next one crystallization crystallization means what you know sometimes floating charge will be converted into fixed charge 
such process we call it as crystallization sir when suppose you know when a company violates terms and conditions of the loan agreement terms and conditions of the loan agreement immediately floating charge will be converted into fixed charge so until crystallization happens company is free to deal with the products you know free to deal with the assets which are covered under floating charge but once crystallization happen a company can't sell them without prior approval of the money lender so here you know under charge you'll find two parties ma one is company borrower the other party is charge holder in favor of whom you are creating charge you call him as charge holder so two parties remember so money lender money lender comes under charge holder uh, point and the company comes under borrower position clear so registration of charges whose duty to register charges it is the duty of company so it is the duty of company to register the charges i told you charge can be created on either tangible assets or intangible assets the property may be situated whether in india or outside india it is the duty of company to register charge with the roc if company fails to register charge then charge holder can also apply registration you know can also uh, file an application with roc for registration of the charge no problem next one registration by the purchaser suppose company c limited it provided one immobile property as a security to state bank of india and this charge was registered with roc now who is having a a uh, duty who who is having a duty to register charge with roc initially c limited is having a duty to register charge with roc if c limited fails to register charge then charge holder can file application with roc in order to procure his you know in order to protect his interest in order to protect his interest he can file an application for registration of the charge next step suppose you know c limited registered charge with roc everything is fine C Limited financial position is uh, becoming, you know, very very bad, and C Limited want to sell this property to D Limited. So with the consent of charge holder only, C Limited sold this property to D Limited. Now D Limited obtained charged property. So now borrower changed. Initially borrower is C Limited. Now you know the asset is transferred to D Limited. D Limited is having two options: repay money to SBI completely or register charge. Register charge. this time you know borrower who is a borrower d limited so that's what registration by the purchaser d limited acquired charged asset from c limited and it is uh, still under charge now it is a duty of d limited to register charge with uh, roc so three parties ma one is uh, by company by the charge holder by the purchaser how to register charge sir simple file chg1 form with uh, roc is there any time limit for filing a chg1 form with roc sir yes there is a time limit of 30 days of creation of charge within 30 days of creation of charge it is a duty of company to register charge with roc so verification of instrument of charge verification is nothing but authentication signing each and every electronic form you file with roc initially it should be signed by the authorized person authorized person if property is situated outside india generally uh the charge documents forms will have a common seal ma in case common seal if there is no common seal then you know any director or company secretary representing company will sign that charge document or else uh, under the hand of some person other than company who is interested in the mortgage or charge who is interested in the mortgage or charge suppose you know director of the company on behalf of company providing us asset as a security yeah possible ma director can give loans to the company or director can give guarantee for the purpose of getting loans in favor of company so director wants to provide his personal property as a security in favor of sbi in order to get loan to the company in order to get loan for the company loan for the company now you know interested person you know director the person who is having interest in that mortgage he will sign the charge documents suppose if it is a property situated in india obviously first two points common ma you know company secretary or any authorized person on behalf of the company will sign this forms next one normal time limit general time limit is 30 days what is the time limit for registration of charge 30 days 30 days sir 30 days completed sir now can i register charge after completion of 30 days yes yes is there any additional time limit yes there is additional time limit sir what is that additional time limit sir so here charges are classified into two types 
one is created before second uh, november 2018 the other one is uh, charges created after uh, charges created after on or after second november 2018 why because you know company amendment ordinance came uh, in the year 2018 and it came into effect uh, it came into force uh, with effect from second november 2018 so charges created before the 2nd November 2018, old provisions will apply. So according to old provisions, the normal time limit is, normal time limit is 30 days of creation. Within 30 days of creation, you have to register charge with ROC or else you will be given 270 days additional time limit, you know 270 days additional time limit. So 30 plus 270 equal to 300 days, 300 days of creation on payment of additional fees. If not registered in 300 days, then register within 6 months from 2nd November 2018, you are, you are given a extra time limit, you know, say by 2nd November, by 2nd November 300 days also completed sir, or no, don't worry, we are giving you 6 months additional time, within additional time of 6 months, you just register charges with ROC, so for old charges, the time limit for registration, normal time limit, 30 days, additional time limit, you know, 270 days so total 300 days sir 30 and 300 both completed sir don't worry from 2nd november 2018 onwards you have been given six months time period so within six months register charge with uh, roc now you know new charges charges created on or after 2nd november 2018 here the normal time limit is 30 days normal time 30 days you know government observed why we should give 270 additional days what is the sense of giving additional 270 days so they reduce the 270 days time limit ma normal time 30 days if you file forms with roc within 30 days only normal fees will be levied normal fees you know 600 rupees 500 rupees 400 rupees depending on other share capital normal fees will be levied if not registered within 30 days you will be given additional 30 days time limit so up to here 30 plus 30 is 60 days time limit but here you you have to file forms uh, along with additional fees you have to pay additional fees sir 30 and 30 60 days completed I didn't register charge with roc sir now roc approval along with roc approval you need to pay ad valorem fees ad valorem fees means you know proportionate to the uh, document value ma proportionate you all know customs duty ad valorem taxes so proportionate stamp duty you have to pay proportionate fees so for suppose loan amount 1 crore no uh, straight away pay 1% as a late fees late fees understood so for that you know additional 60 days time limit is given so total if you observe you know three time limits are there 30 additional 30 and final additional limit is 60 so total 30 plus 30 plus 60 120 days time is there for filing forms with uh, roc sir 120 days also completed sir file application with the government file application with roc you know uh, and along with application file a declaration with the uh, roc so in the declaration mention it you know the reasons for delay and due to this delay the creditors interest will not creditors interest is not getting affected sir company position is good only company is in solvency position only so none of the creditors will have a negative impact due to delay in registration of charges so convince the government Convince the ROC. If they say okay, then registration is permitted. Understood? So same matter, ma. Same matter. Uh, it is there in flowcharts, and the same matter you can observe in uh, material also. So come on, tell me the time limits, ma. Old charges, thirty days, additional two seventy days, so total three hundred days, and another time limit six months from second November two thousand eighteen. Now coming to the new charges, thirty days normal fees. 30 days normal fees additional 30 days with roc approval and uh, on payment of additional fees see on an application by the company allow such registration roc can allow uh, roc may allow such registration to be taken within a period of 60 days of such creation you know another 30 sir 30 plus 30 both completed sir then within 60 days here at valorum basis next i told you right Procedure for extension of time limit, you know, it should be supported by a declaration from the company signed by secretary or a director that belated filing, you know, late filing shall not adversely affect the rights of any other intervening creditors of the company. Next, uh, issue of certificate of registration, you know, the moment you file documents with uh, ROC for registration, 
ROC shall register the charge and issue certificate of registration of charge in form number CHG2. And this certificate will act as a conclusive evidence. Yes, you have completed all the provisions of Companies Act and rules made there under. Understood? So this will act as a conclusive evidence. Now the moment you know the charge is registered, you know it becomes a public information. It will be available on public domain, you know mca.gov.in website. So now you know second person you know with whom company is filing application for loan. Now the second person, it is his duty to go through public domain, to go through the charge documents and to get a you know conclusion whether the property is charged property or freehold property. Then only he should lend money to the company. Suppose you know second person ignoring charge documents, ignoring public information, if he lend money against same property, then will he get any, uh, you know, will he get any privileges over the property? The answer is no. The answer is no. It is his duty to go through the public information that is available in MCA. So without uh, going uh, through that information, if you lend money, you know, doctrine of constructive notice shall apply. Accordingly, you won't get any privileges over secured property. Next one, subsequent registration not to prejudice uh, rights of the charge holder. You know, even if you make any delay in filing, you know, uh, in filing uh, charge documents with ROC, there will be, it will not have any negative impact on charge holder. Consequence of non-registration, I told you, even though it is a charged property, even though uh, under various other acts and as per mortgage deed norms, mortgage deed terms and conditions, you know, the charge holder may have a right over the property. But according to the Companies Act, that the charge is null and void and charge holder will have zero rights over the property. Simply if company, you know, without repayment of loan, if company went into liquidation, that the lender will not get any control over the property, will not get priority with respect to uh, repayment of uh, debts. Next point. Section 77 shall not apply to the certain charges. Futuristic point. Government is having power to exclude some charges from chapter 6 scope. Okay. Under deposits also we had same point. So this is a futuristic point. Government is having power to exclude certain charges from this chapter per view. Next one. Application for registration of charge by a charge holder. I told you. It is a duty of company to register charge within 30 days of creation of the charge. If company fails to file application with ROC for registration of charge, then charge holder will get a right. Sir, why charge holder will file form with ROC? Why? Because if charge is not registered, then the charge becomes null and void. Charge holder rights over the charge in property will become null and void. Will be null and void. So he will not get any control over the assets. He can't sell the asset according to the Companies Act 2013 provisions I am telling you. Maybe under Transfer of Property Act, he had control over the property. However, there is a, however, if conflict arises between Transfer of Property Act and Companies Act, you remember special provisions always override general provisions. As per Transfer of Property Act, if you execute mortgage deed, you are bound by the mortgage deed. You are liable to pay money to the banker or else banker can take over that property. Coming to the Companies Act, creation of mortgage deed alone is not sufficient. You need to register that mortgage deed. You, you need to register that charge with ROC or else charge holder rights will be zero. So generally charge holder will file application in case company makes default. In practice it is entirely different. In practice you know uh, banker will ask company first file charge documents with ROC. Show me the proof. Then only I'll disburse you the loan amount. Until then I'll hold the loan amount. I'll hold the loan amount. I won't release a single rupees. First you file these forms with uh, ROC. Practice different. Book different. So practice, you know, bankers will always do the things, uh, you know, will do anything to protect their interest. Understood? Okay. Next one. On receipt of application from the charge holder, the registrar shall give a notice to the company. And if no objection is received, allow such registration within a period of 14 days after giving notice to the company on payment of prescribed fees. So immediately when you, you know, if charge holder files an application with ROC, don't think that ROC will register the charge. First, uh, ROC will give an opportunity of being heard to the company. Is it true company? Is it true? Did you created any charge? That fellow came to me. Come on, give me reply. And you know that notice is valid for 14 days. That means company has to respond within 14 days. 
if company give positive consent or if there is no reply from company then you know roc shall register the charge and issue registration certificate in favor of company as well as charge holder if company give negative consent no 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 sir we entered into the agreement but we didn't borrow any money we had you know we have um, our opinion is uh, sorry we didn't give any consent to the banker sir we didn't agree to terms and conditions imposed by the banker so we declined the loan proposal sir so like that you know if company gives any negative consent then roc will reject the registration of charge clear now under this section ma 78 who is filing application with roc for registration of charge charge holder is filing a charge form with roc yes or no now who will file fees you know who will pay fees to the roc a normal fees or additional fees who will pay charge holder will pay actually whose duty to register charge with roc company whose duty to pay money to the roc whose duty to pay uh, fees to the roc company so company 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 but who is paying the fees charge holder so whatever amount paid by the charge holder charge holder is entitled to recover that amount from company and company is liable to reimburse the expenses incurred by charge holder in registration of charge next section 79 company acquiring property already subject to charge already subject to charge that means d limited created charge on one asset in favor of state bank of india now you know d limited is acquiring that asset d limited is acquiring that asset now it is the duty of d limited to file charge document with roc this time you know borrower it's not c limited d limited d limited it shall be the duty of company acquiring it to get the charge registered in accordance with section 77 next write about modification of charges under section 79 see modification of charges modification originally you obtained 6 crores loan amount at rate of interest 9% per annum with a tenure 30 months or 36 months you know 3 years by providing immovable property located at uh, mumbai from sbi from state bank of india you know these are the terms and conditions loan amount 6 crores rate of interest 9 percent tenure 36 months property situated at mumbai and the uh, money lender is sbi now change of any of these terms and conditions is nothing but modification suppose you know loan enhancement happened 6 to 7 crores rate of interest reduced or increased suppose 10 or 8 percentage tenure increased to 60 months property changed property changed so yes we don't want uh, mumbai property we will provide delhi property or you know this charged property you know another company acquired this charged property from company or you know loan takeover happened suppose you know sbi sbi services for example c limited thought that sbi services there is some delay so we'll go with uh, icici bank so what they did so they transferred a loan from sbi to icici all these are modification change in parties change in terms and condition comes under modification so now under modification you need to register the modified terms and conditions document with roc simply at the time of creation of charge what procedure you followed what is your duty same duty same procedure you have to apply under modification also understood however if if, if a modification happened because of operation of law in that case no need to register charge uh, no need to register that modification with roc for example for example uh, rate of interest ma rate of interest fixed 9% some cases floating rate of interest whatever rba prescribes so that interest will apply so according to the terms and conditions when you look into the terms and conditions rba rate of interest uh, they mention at the time of taking loan you know it is 7% after 2 years it went up to 9.5% so loan rate of interest increased no sir can we call it as a modification yes is there any obligation to file modification of charge with roc no why because this modification didn't happen through the consent of the parties through the consent of parties this modification didn't happen this modification happened through operation of law next so if modification happened through the consent of the parties that modified uh, charge should be filed with roc and what is the time limit sir same time limit mentioned under section 77 you no know, 30 days within 
within 30 days from the date of modification the 30 days completed sir additional 30 days the additional 30 days also completed sir then additional 60 days on payment of regular fees after getting roc approval can get uh, i mean can file a uh, can register charge with roc understood next one demur notice of charge under section 80 demur notice simple simply doctrine of constructive notice we assume that buyer is aware of the charges so buyer once acquired charged property once if he acquired charged property he is responsible to pay loan amount principal amount interest amount you can't argue that sir i don't know about the charges sir i don't know the charges created by the company so don't ask me money so yes buyer can't claim like that a rule of estoppel a rule of estoppel so simply doctrine of constructive notice will apply to all charged properties it is the duty of buyer to go through the charge documents to go through the you know public information that is available in mca mca uh, sorry available on mca websites then he should take a decision the transaction without knowledge of charge buyer is still liable to the charge holder next one write about reporting of satisfaction of charges satisfaction of charge now for what purpose you created charge loan you repaid entire loan amount now the purpose got fulfilled when the purpose got fulfilled technically speaking we call it as satisfaction of charge the moment uh, charge is satisfied you need to register satisfaction of charge with roc sir what is the time limit 30 days so 30 days completed sir don't worry additional 270 days so total 30 plus 270 300 days so within 300 days they can file a, a satisfaction of charge with roc and you know for additional uh, 270 days you need to pay additional fees okay so this notice can be given by the company or you know charge holder or acquire buyer of the property buyer of the charged property any person can file a, an application with a roc for getting a, a certificate of registration of satisfaction of charge suppose if company gives intimation to the roc yes we complete we paid all the amounts to charge holder immediately roc should not register the satisfaction of charge it has to give notice to charge holder so charge holder come on respond within 14 days from the date of uh, this notice just respond within 14 days if you had any uh, objection with respect to satisfaction of charge file your objections if there is no objection you know if there is no objection or charge holder give positive consent yes sir all charges cleared sir now roc will register the satisfaction of charge and will issue certificate of registration of satisfaction of charge memorandum of uh, satisfaction Call it as you know entering a, of a memorandum of satisfaction in the register of charges kept by a ROC and accordingly he shall inform the company of having done so. So in this entire section you know important point is uh, satisfaction of charge should be filed with ROC within 30 days of satisfaction. Extension time limit is you know 300 days of satisfaction. Next one registers charges maintained by the company and ROC very simple concept man. registers you know records simply records. So company will maintain record with respect to its charges whereas coming to the ROC, ROC is required to maintain registers with respect to all company charges you know company particularly itself you know charges created by it you know fixed charge floating charge so separate register company has to maintain but coming to the ROC it has to maintain register covering all companies and all types of charges and this information is available to public at a large ma. simply uh, mca.gov.in go into the website mca.gov.in uh, view public documents in that select charge documents you know select company on payment of 100 rupees nominal fees you can download all this information and coming to the company registers yes you can go to register office you know these registers will be maintained at register office you can go to register office and you can verify these uh, records inspection is also permitted inspection is also permitted okay on payment of prescribed fees next one ma. the preservation of register this document shall be preserved for a period of eight years from the date of satisfaction of charge it's not creation of charge so when you satisfy charge from that date onwards you have to maintain these registers for a period of eight years next one write about power of registrar to make entries of satisfaction and release in absence of intimation from company generally whenever company repay the loan amount company is, is having a duty to file satisfaction of charge with roc suppose company failed 
ROC can still register, can still register satisfaction of charge. Sir, how ROC will know, sir, about satisfaction of charge? Very simple. Company, it created charge for seven years, ma. The loan tenure is seven years. Ten years completed, but still there is no reply from company. Now, ROC will make some inquiry proceedings. ROC may call company or ROC may call the charge holder. Whether any dues to you? No dues, sir. No ROC shall enter a satisfaction of charge in his, in a, in his register. And accordingly, ROC will issue certificate of satisfaction of, oh, sorry, certificate of registration of satisfaction of charge. Understood. So, ROC is having suo moto power. On its own motion, it can register satisfaction of charges. So, before doing that, you know, definitely ROC will give in information to the affected parties. And finally, ROC will issue certificate. Next one. Write about intimation of appointment of receiver or manager. You know, company is having one immovable property, ma. A five-floor building. Five-floor building. And from these five floors, company is getting a rent amount. Imagine, you know, a two lakhs rent amount. So showing this property, company obtained uh, some two crores loan amount from State Bank of India. So every month, company has to pay 1.6 lakh rupees installment to State Bank of India. And State Bank of India imposed one condition. If company fails to pay installment for a period of three months consecutively, then I will appoint my person as in charge to this charged property. I will appoint one manager to this property. Now what this manager will do? You know, this manager will come and he will collect all these rental incomes, you know, 2 lakhs. Out of 2 lakhs, manager first, he will credit that amount to SBA. So 1.6 lakh he will credit to SBA. Balance if any, you know, that manager will return to the company. So simply he will manage charged property. He will manage charged property. Understood. So two years completed, company made default with respect to payment of installment. Now, charge holder will get a power to appoint manager. So whenever charge holder appoints any person as a receiver or manager, charge holder should give an intimation to ROC as well as company within 30 days of appointment. So it is the duty of charge holder to give intimation to the company and ROC. So what is the time limit, sir? 30 days. And you know, company came into the good condition and company started paying installments to the banks regularly. Now what a bank will do? Bank will cancel the appointment of a manager or bank may remove the manager. So upon termination of that role, you know, again company, you know, again charge holder has to give intimation to both company as well as ROC. A simple point. It is a, it is a, uh, sorry, it is a power as well as duty. You know, power to appoint a receiver or manager to manage charged property. Duty to intimate the same with uh, duty to intimate the same to ROC as well as uh, company. Time limit 30 days. Next, next one punishment for contravention of section 86. Now, this entire chapter only one punishment. If you if you violate any provisions of uh, registration of charges, now the punishment is company 5 lakh rupee, officer in default, penalty of rupees 50,000. In case of fraud, you know, punishment will be under section 447. Remember this punishment. Ma. Remember this punishment. Next, section 87 is all about, you know, central government powers. If company makes any uh, mistake in charge documents filed with ROC, or if there is any delay in filing these uh, forms with ROC, or any mistake in the registers. So to rectify these documents, to rectify this uh, charge documents to rectify these registers and moreover uh, you know in case of delay filings delay filings in order to permit company to register the documents with ROC yes it is the duty of company to get permission from central government so section 87 is all about permission of central government in rectifying the documents filed with ROC understood so no intimation or omission of any particulars in any filing previously made to the ROC. So if you want to rectify them, prior approval of central government is required. Then you can make changes to the documents uh, you file with ROC. So with, this is all about registration of charges. My very, very small chapter, I told you, right? Very small chapter. Next one, management and administration. One point before I start management and administration, one point. 
I'm not going to discuss complete provisions of management and administration. I'll discuss only the provisions which are which have been asking very very frequently, which have been tested very very frequently. So very important important provisions I'll discuss with you. Clear. I'm not going to cover all the provisions of management and administration. Very important provisions from examination point of view. I'm going to revise them only. Clear. Then only we can manage time, time resource. Hmm. So section 88, I'll discuss ma. Section 88, multiple choice questions point of view, important. Section 88, register of members. Register of members. I'll give you a crux of section 88 ma. Important, important topic points. So it is the duty of every company to maintain register of members whether it is a private company or public company listed company or unlisted company government company non-government company small company or other than small company every company is required to maintain a register of members the company here indicate includes you know private as well as public duty to maintain a register of members separately for each and every class of security you know separate for each class of security for equity shares with normal rights one register equity shares with differential rights one register preferentials one, preference shares one register so equity shares one register preference shares one another register so this register of members format is mgt1 in case of shares mgt2 in case of uh, other than shares so other securities for shares you know mgt1 form for other securities mgt2 form and these documents shall be maintained at registered office of the company so maintenance you know maintain place where we can keep all these registers sir first priority registered office sir other than registered office can i keep these books sir can i can i maintain register of members other than registered office at a place other than registered office yes for that special resolution is compulsory with the approval of members you know special resolution you can maintain registers at any place any place in city town village where registered office is situated suppose you know company register office is in jubilee hills now you can maintain these registers at any place in hyderabad hyderabad next one or you can maintain these registers at any place in india at any place in India where not less than one tenth of total members reside, one tenth of members whose names are mentioned in the register, you know, reside. Suppose company is having total 1000 members, out of 1000, you know, 100 members are residing in uh, Delhi. Company register office is in, uh, you know, Hyderabad. However, 100 members, 100 out of 1000, you know, one tenth of the members are reside in Delhi. Now you can maintain this register office, uh, sorry, you can maintain this uh, register of members in Delhi. After getting approval of uh, members, you know, special resolution. Understood. Next one, updation. Sir, is there any time limit to update the, the, these register of members? Yes, ma. Within seven days of board approval, board or committee approval, committee approval. You know, once allotment is completed, within seven days, register shall be updated. Transfer or transmission approved, within seven days, uh, register of members shall be updated. Upon incorporation, upon allotment of shares, within seven days, register of members shall be updated. So, updation should happen within seven days. And you know, who will sign these registers, sir? Simply authentication of registers. Authentication. Who will authenticate these registers? First option, company secretary. If there is no company secretary, then any person authorized by board of directors. Any person authorized by board on this behalf, board of directors, can authenticate these registers. And sir, uh, how long I should maintain these registers, sir? Is there any time limit for maintenance of these registers? Yes, ma. In case of equity shares, sir, you know, till liquidation. Till liquidation. In case of other registers, you know, preference shares, debentures. In those cases, you know, up to 8 years. Sorry, up to 8 years. I'll write up to 8 years from redemption onwards from redemption date onwards up to eight years you have to maintain these registers so this is the time limit 
next one next uh, one more important point that is index index you know starting place you can see you can observe index so index is not mandatory for all companies it is mandatory for the companies having a 50 or more members so if company is having 50 or more members then index is mandatory remaining cases you know if company is having 49 members only sir then index is just optional is it clear so violation of section 88 provisions will attract a penal provisions will attract penalty so this is the crux of section 88 ma the section 88 crux question is lengthy question is lengthy you can see you know all these points i covered question is lengthy why because you know particulars in the register you know name of the member date of becoming member date of succession uh, amount of guarantee in case of company without share capital any other interest instructions if any given by the member regarding sending of notices so these contents are there and i'm telling you the crux is very small topic the crux of this section is very very small all these points i covered ma. next foreign register yes if a company is having you know members from abroad you know members from foreign uh, if companies having members in foreign countries they can open foreign register in form mgt3 mgt1 for shares mgt2 uh, for other securities mgt3 foreign register format mgt3 next one you know whenever you open foreign register the details has to be updated with ROC within 30 days from the date of opening of foreign register. And you know, exact duplicate copy of foreign register company has to maintain at uh, register office also. So original register, you know, in foreign, we call it as foreign register. Apart from foreign register, India is, uh, in India, you are required to maintain main register. We call it as principal register. We call it as principal register. And exact duplicate copy of foreign register, we have to maintain in India. So total you will find three registers one is principal register other than foreign foreign register and the contents of foreign register again you have to copy in separate register we call it as duplicate register so total you have to maintain three registers and company can close foreign register but the moment if you want to close foreign register all the particulars in foreign register shall be updated to another foreign register in another country or shall be updated in a principal register maintained by company at registered office authentication time period everything is same next penalty if you avoid if you violate section 88 provisions then you know company 3 lakh rupee penalty office rent default 50,000 rupees penalty clear the authentication of entries also i discussed with you the remaining sections not that much important ma you know in previous examinations if you go through previous examination papers remaining sections are not that much important so those sections I'm ignoring. You all know management and administration is not a small topic. Compared to share capital and debentures, this is somewhat lengthy, very big topic. And uh, considering time constraint, I'm discussing only important provisions. Next one, closure of register of members. Power to close register of members. You all know, company will conduct general meeting. To the general meeting, who will attend? Ma? Members of the company, yes. Members of the company. But you know section 56 transfer of shares company shares are freely transferable yes or no yes sir company shares are freely transferable so today i may be member tomorrow i may not be a member why because today evening itself you know i'll transfer shares to another person not which person sir we should give notice to whom sir we should give notice to whom who are entitled to attend general meeting who are entitled to vote at general meeting who are entitled to bonus shares who are entitled to write shares who are entitled to do dividends so for that we'll freeze registers sir freeze freeze means no updation will happen simply speaking closure of register closure of register means don't think that registers will be closed no closure of registers means details updation will be kept hold so during the time period, you know, any transfer or any transmission happen, you know, those details will not be incorporated, will not be updated in the register. So why we are uh, closing the registers only to decide the members, to decide the members entitled to vote at general meeting, entitled to bonus shares, entitled to write shares, entitled to dividends. So for closing of register of members or other security uh, registers, you know company has to follow a procedure the procedure is first it has to give notice intimation to the uh, members intimation to the persons whose names mentioned in the registers so seven days prior notice is compulsory if you are a public company along with intimation you have to give an advertisement in the newspaper two newspapers vernacular newspaper and english newspaper so finally th that information you know you have to share with uh, 
that information you have to share with the members sir how long i can close registers sir how long i can close registers you know at a time you can close register for 30 days ma at one time you can close register for 30 days understood and during the year the register you can close the register for 45 days suppose i told you uh, four instances entitled to vote entitled to dividends right shares bonus shares so four situations i told you in each and every situation you can close register for 30 days but cumulative to all these uh, situations you know it shall not exceed 45 days in a year one time 30 days throughout the year 45 days if you close register more than this period then penalty you know 5000 per day 5000 per day subject to maximum of 1 lakh rupee penalty is applicable so this is all about uh, provisions related to closure of registers next one annual return contents of annual return is not important you know contents of annual return is not important but the time limit signing of annual returns is important sir who will sign the annual return sir who will sign the annual return first of all this annual returns you know you need to file in form number mgt7 all companies coming to opc and small companies small companies definition you remember opc and small companies mgt 7a is applicable abridged form of original mgt 7 abridged form so this form should be signed by director of the company and company secretary coming to opc small companies company secretary is not mandatory right company secretary provisions will not apply so if there is no company secretary by company secretary in practice this provision is for all companies coming to OPC and small company. You know, if there is no company secretary, then one director signature is sufficient. So what is the difference between company secretary and company secretary in practice? You know, in your company, if you had company secretary as an employee, he has to sign this annual return. Sir, there is no company secretary in our uh, payroll records, sir. In our employee records, there is no company secretary. Then go to practicing prof uh, professional company secretary get signature from that person understood get signature from that person but one person company and small company if there is no company secretary no need to go to uh, independent you know practicing professional just director signature alone sufficient next one next one certification you know along with mgt7 you know another form mgt8 is there ma this certification is not applicable for all companies it is applicable only to the listed companies and company having paid up share capital of 10 crores or more or or companies turnover 50 crores or more only to these companies you know certification is required and who can certify sir only company secretary in practice not in employment independent practicing professional can certify mgt8 mgt8 is all about you know compliance certificate so during the year uh, yes, company has complied all the applicable rules and regulations like that. Compliance certificate. Next one, ma. Due date for filing uh, annual return is important. So, what is the time limit for filing annual return, sir? 60 days from the date of AGM. If AGM is held. If AGM is not conducted, then within 60 days from the due date of conducting AGM. So, what is the due date of AGM? You know, within 60, within uh, 6 months, every company. Within six months from closure of financial year, company is required to conduct AGM. So majority of cases, 30th September is the due date for conducting AGM. So from this date onwards, add 60 days, I think November 29 or 28. So October you will have 31 days, November so 28th most probably. By November 28th you have to file annual returns. Sir, AGM conducted sir, on 1st September AGM conducted sir. Add 60 days. No, 30th October by 30th October file these forms with ROC this is the time limit penalty for contravention you know rupees 10,000 in case of continuing one 100 per day maximum 2 lakh rupees clear for company and officer in default same punishment and if company secretary if he is giving MGT8 in a wrong uh, manner suppose you know not in accordance with this uh, section 92 then he shall be liable to penalty of uh, 2 lakh rupees is it clear so in the entire section 92 you have to remember signing of uh, annual returns who can sign annual returns director and company secretary no company secretary then come director plus company secretary in practice for opc and small companies if there is no company secretary then director signing annual return alone is sufficient next one what is the time limit for filing annual returns for within 60 days of agm you know in examination they can ask you question like this 
company failed to file annual returns uh, with respect to financial year 2023-24 on inquiry board of director contended that company has not conducted agm so far so that's the reason they didn't file annual return do you agree with the director's contention no so the time limit for filing annual return is within 60 days from the date of agm actual date of agm if agm is not conducted then 60 days from the due date of AGM, company is required to file annual returns with the ROC. Understood? Next one, you know, uh, maintenance of registers, all these points I covered. Ma. The next important topic is meetings, general meetings. Meetings. You know, meetings gained importance because of one reason, ma. that is, you know, separate legal entity. You all know, company is separated from its owners. Owners, will contribute their money whenever company need funds and company will do business with the funds belonging to the owner on behalf of company board of directors will do the business yes or no now each and every member definitely he has some interest in the company and he want to know something about the company results company performance so everyone will have an interest yes or no suppose if you invest thousand rupees in one company share every day regularly you will check the share price you will monitor you will monitor the share price yes or no whether it is increasing or not now owners invested money in the company definitely they will they want uh, details of you know they want they want uh, uh, updates of the company for that you know government came up with the topic uh, with a concept called meetings so every year company is required to conduct one general meeting and that general meeting is nothing but annual general meeting annual general meeting any general meeting other than annual general meeting we call it as extraordinary general meeting general meeting between two agms we call it as egm to discuss emergency matters urgency matters sir we can't wait till agm sir then you can con you can call for extraordinary general meetings and there is one more meeting called class meeting under section 48 we discussed variation of rights of the members variation of rights of the members we discussed that point yes, sir no so call for a class meeting if you if class meeting is permissible obtain special resolution from that class where you know members exceeding 200 are there then you have to take approval under postal ballot type of voting in that case you know meeting is not required okay Sima, every general meeting or every meeting is valid only if it satisfy three conditions one is you know properly called properly called next properly constituted next properly conducted understood so properly called so before meeting you need to satisfy two conditions one is notice calling for meeting the second one is explanatory statement and properly constituted properly conducted here we'll see quorum chairman proxy votings resolutions and last one you know after conclusion of the meeting properly concluded simply you know minutes of the meeting maintenance of minutes of the meeting so we'll discuss these points ma so i'll discuss with you section 101 102 103 and then 105 clear next one 118 so very frequently we are getting uh, questions from these areas only apart from these uh, five sections you know we'll also discuss section 97 to 90 100 96 to 100 time limit for calling agm provisions related to egm okay the first one Notice calling for general meeting. Notice calling for general meeting. Notice is nothing but intimation, ma. Notice is nothing but intimation. So and so day, so and so time, so and so place, so and so and so day, at so and so time, at so and so place. We are conducting general meeting. And in that general meeting, we'll discuss the following points. Simply agenda of meeting. So company will give intimation to the members in the form of a notice. That notice, if you look at the contents of the notice, if you look at the contents of the notice, you know, day of general meeting, date of general meeting, time of general meeting, place of general meeting or venue, place or venue, and then statement of business to be transacted at general meeting. You know, I call it as agenda. Technically speaking, statement of business to be transacted at general meeting. Sir, who is having authority to issue authority to issue notice calling for general meeting? You know, one is uh, board of directors. Normal cases, board of directors, ma. Sometimes, you know, requisitionist. You know, members, 
may uh, may ask a company to call for extraordinary general meeting if company fails to call extraordinary general meeting then members themselves can call for extraordinary general meeting such members we call them as requisitionist and sometimes national company law tribunal is also having a power you know if company fails to conduct agm then any member can file a petition or sorry can file an application with nclt for calling general meeting now nclt is having a power to call for annual general meeting in that case who will give notice calling for general meeting nclt so finally who is having authority to issue uh, sorry who is having authority to issue notice calling for general meeting sir board of directors requisition is nclt and next one sir to whom the notice we have to provide you know to whom we have to give notice sir every member of the company every member of the company in case of death of the member to its legal representative in case of insolvent member you know to the official assignee understood next one every auditor of the company internal auditor external auditor both next one every director of the company every director of the company clear so board of directors by passing board resolution they will fix a day time place and agenda of the general meeting and that notice shall be given to all the members of the company auditors of the company as well as directors sir directors only passing the resolution no sir no there is no condition that all directors should present in a to that board meeting in order to pass board resolution for approving day time place and agenda maybe some directors absent you can observe absence of directors to that meeting independent directors etc next you know apart from these people you know debenture trustee depositor trustee are also there ma person interested interested persons you know debenture trustee is also entitled to receive notice call, is also entitled to receive notice next one sir is there any time limit for sending for dispatch of these notices yes there is a time limit for section 8 companies come on tell me what is the time limit for section 8 companies 14 clear days it's not normal days 14 clear days sir what is the essence of clear i'll tell you and other companies other companies 21 clear days 21 clear days you now this clear indicates you have to exclude date of notice date of dispatch of notice you no know, date of dispatch of notice and date of meeting excluding these two dates there should be 21 days time period excluding these two dates there should be 21 days time period and next one if you are sending notice through post or if you are sending notice through electronic mode if you are sending notice through post then you have to exclude 48 hours time period for putting the same into the transmission for putting the letter into the transmission generally some time is required you know 48 hours you have to exclude that means that means 21 days exclude 48 hours so total if you are sending notice through post you know 21 days normal time period plus you know date of meeting plus uh, date of notice plus 48 hours you need to add whereas coming to electronic mode no need to of considering 48 hours simply 21 plus 1 plus 1 so total 23 days considering considering date of notice and considering date of meeting whereas under post 25 days are you getting my point sir can i give notice for a shorter period sir simply you know shorter notice shorter notice can i give notice for 18 days can i give notice for 12 days no question comes from this area only shorter notice sir shorter notice is it valid or invalid valid if it get approval from the authority members so valid when in case of agm in case of agm shorter notice is valid only if 95 percent of members entitled to vote 95 percent of members should approve the shorter notice such approval can be given a, a day before general meeting or at the time of or at the time of beginning of general meeting so 95 percent members should approve in case of egm companies are classified into two types one is company with the share capital the other one is company without share capital and is company with share capital the other one is company without share capital in case of company with share capital two conditions you need to satisfy one is majority of members sir majority of members more than half of the members holding not less than 95 percent of uh, paid up share capital so two conditions ma two conditions 
majority alone is not sufficient 95 percent of paid up share capital alone not sufficient suppose you know in a company you and me you people you know you are 99 in number and i am one in number i am holding 95 percent paid up share capital and you all holding five percent paid up share capital now this company want to call for an egm 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 with shorter notice in this case me alone giving approval is not sufficient or you 99 people giving approval is not sufficient here two conditions you know more than 50 percent members should approve at the same time the people approving shorter notice shall possess at least 95 percent of paid up share capital and coming to the company without share capital here only one condition members having 95 percent of voting power members having 95 percent of voting power shall approve the shorter notice or else shorter notice is invalid are you getting my point or else shorter notice is invalid suppose sir you said that notice shall be given to all the members right in case of omission sir you know i forgot to give notice calling for general meeting now you know burden of proof lies on the company ma company has to prove whether that omission is accidental or not if it is accidental omission sir purely accidental sir it is accidentally we omitted in that case proceedings at general meeting all the proceedings at general meeting are valid in case of intentional omission willful omission in that case you know proceedings at general meeting stands invalid general meeting stands invalid all the decisions taken at the general meeting stands invalid understood so with this section 101 completed section 101 completed so 21 clear days accidental omission so meetings held at shorter notice contents of the notice persons entitled to the notice calling for notice authority to call a notice you know board next mode of sending the notice so each and every point we discussed under section 101 next section 102 section 102 it is all about explanatory statement ma so it will contain the details you know it will contain the information why a com why members should approve the resolution so it will contain you know detailed disclosures of a proposal explanatory statement is not mandatory in all cases ma i'll tell you so uh, for section one or two point of view a business 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 means not you know buying and selling of goods and uh, uh, buying and buying and selling of goods so under companies that you know business is nothing but you know decision making this business is of two types you know decisions are of two types one is ordinary business the other one is special business you know four items comes under ordinary business you know very regularly all these four items will happen all these four items will happen sir what are those items sir you know what are those decisions sir you know adoption of financial statements audit report and board report next one appointment of auditors next one declaration of dividends and next one Appoint, uh, reappointment of retired directors reappointment of uh, persons in the place of a retiring one so all these four items regular in nature these four items comes under ordinary course of business others you know removal of auditor appointment of managing director appointment of cost auditor i'm telling you next uh, alteration of name issue of bonus shares buyback of securities issue of preference shares issue of sweat equity shares issue of debentures everything apart from these four items all items comes under special business with respect to special business along with the notice calling for general meeting you have to give explanatory statement mandatory mandatory in the explanatory statement you can observe following contents ma contents of explanatory statement you know all material facts with respect to the proposal you have to disclose all material facts with respect to proposal and then you have to disclose interest of interest of directors kmp in the proposal if director or kmp is having any interest you know if uh, if their personal interest is there in the proposals you have to disclose that information also and all relevant information apart from statutory information so what statute is asking any relevant information you have to provide and finally you have to provide date and place for verifying uh, uh, for verifying related record records related records so with respect to uh, any agreement you know in which you know director or kmp or relative of the director or relative of the kmp is having interest 
so date of verification of those records place of verification of those records you have to mention in this explanatory statement violation sir not complete sir in that case any benefit received by the any benefit received by the you know promoter director or kmp or relatives the relatives you know they can't enjoy with the benefits you know that benefit shall be returned to the company benefit shall be returned to the company along with this you know penalty you know punishment sir what is the punishment sir liable to find maximum you know maximum punishment prescribed ma option a 50000 rupees option b five times of uh, amount of benefit involved five times of the benefit involved so without proper disclosures if you give explanatory uh, if you give uh, notice calling for general meeting just wait so without mentioning without uh, disclosing the complete information if you obtain any uh, approval and if you obtain any benefit that benefit shall be returned to the company along with that you know fine how much sir maximum 50000 or five times of the benefit received by these people whichever is higher remember these words whichever is higher so this is all about section 102 ma this is all about section 102 all these points I discussed with you. So 50,000 or five times the amount of benefit accruing to the promoter, director, manager, or their relatives, whichever is higher. Clear? Next important section is quorum. Next important topic is quorum. So this is all about, you know, constitution of the meeting. Quorum. Quorum means what, sir? You know, minimum number of members, minimum number of members to be present at that meeting in order to constitute a valid meeting how many members are required sir so quorum you know limits limits it is different for private company it is different for public company for private company you know two members two members personally present for public company you know as per register of members if it is up to 1000 then applicable quorum is five members personally present Sir, register of members, you know, 1001 to 5000, sir. 1000, you know, as per register of members, total there are 1001 or up to 5000. In that case, 15 members personally present should attend the general meeting. Above 5000, sir, simply, you know, 5001 or above. In that case, 30 members personally present. These limits or the limits mentioned in AOA, whichever is higher, you have to consider. Suppose myself, public company having 10,000 members. In my AOA, nothing is prescribed. Then 30 members personally present shall avail, shall apply, shall apply. Suppose in my AOA, I clearly told 500 members should present at general meeting. In that case, you know, 500 members is the applicable quorum. So first as per statute, next as per AOA, whichever is higher, you have to follow. Whichever is higher, you have to follow. Understood? So this is the limit. Sir, who will check, sir? Who will check this uh, uh, quorum is, who will check whether quorum is present or not? You know, chairman chairman appointed or chairman of the meeting as per section 104 you know chairman will check the uh, presence of quorum and time limit sir what is the time limit to check the quorum sir within 30 minutes from the scheduled time of meeting scheduled time within 30 minutes of scheduled time suppose you know 10 o'clock morning 10 o'clock is the meeting time so by 10 30 chairman has to check whether quorum is present or not sir absence of quorum sir in case of absence of quorum if there is no quorum then you know here meetings are classified into two types agm called because of requisitionist and all other meetings other meetings in the absence of quorum you know if it is agm called because of requisitionist then meeting stands cancelled meeting stands cancelled in all other cases you know meeting stands adjourned meeting stands adjourned Sir, adjourned to which date, sir? If nothing is specified, then adjourned to same day, same day, same time, same place, but next week. Next week. If anything is prescribed, sir, then, you know, uh, decided date, decided time, decided place. Either of the cases, you know, it is the duty of company to send a notice, notice calling for adjourned meeting. So what is the time period for sending this notice, sir? Three days, ma. General meetings, you know, 21 days. For adjourned meeting, three days. 
so three days you have to give notice to all the members individually sir not possible sir three days before meeting you have to give notice sir not possible sir in that case by way of advertisement you have to give notice by way of advertisement you have to give notice you know while counting quorum i clearly told you five members personally present members personally present so members personally present you know it excludes the representative persons ma representative person we had a technical name that is you know proxy representatives are excluded proxies are excluded while counting for quorum understood everyone so this is all about you know quorum provisions now all these sections under all these sections you can see you know this provision is not applicable to specified ifsc companies and private companies if their articles of association prescripts otherwise so that point is common for these provisions ma so you can check the limits time limit adjournment okay next one representation of a president representation of governors so this point i need to discuss with you in case of state government companies who is the member ma governor in case of a central government companies you know government of india undertakings you know president is the member as per protocol you know they had a privilege so they can attend meetings personally or they can send their representatives to the meetings so this representative looks like a proxy but still this representative is counted for the purpose of quorum for the purpose of quorum this representative is considered generally proxies are excluded while checking quorum however representative of president representative of governor shall be considered for the purpose of quorum is it clear so all these points are covered next next one section 104 is not that much important ma section 105 proxy proxy mm. tell me proxy benefit is it available to is it available to all companies no ma proxy benefit is not available to companies without share capital if their aoa is silent if their aoa is silent you know proxy benefit is not there first of all proxy means what you know generally companies will conduct general meetings on uh, working days ma because you know only employees will authorize uh, sorry employees will conduct meetings company will conduct meetings but who will uh, arrange all these proceedings ma who will arrange who will make arrangements obviously company employees right so generally on weekdays only general meeting will be conducted now i am a member of a company i'm occupied with some works during weekdays i want to attend that general meeting but i can't why because i'm having i'm, I'm occupied with personal works however i'm still having interest in that general meeting i want to know what is happening in that general meeting what kind of decisions they are making and you know what is the uh, you know what members what members uh, what kind of opinion you know members are having so i want to know the discussions happened at that meeting but i can't attend the general meeting because of uh, occupied works because i'm occupied with my job or my practice works i can't attend the general meeting in such situations member can send his representative to the general meeting and that representative we call proxy so proxy is having two meanings one is instrument appointing proxy so proxy means proxy instrument the other one person named in that instrument person whose name is mentioned in that in that instrument he is also a proxy so proxy is having two meanings one is instrument the other one is uh, person named in the proxy instrument we call him also proxy we call him as proxy coming to the disabilities of proxy you know proxy shall not have right to speak at such meeting and he is not considered for the purpose of quorum he is not counted for the purpose of quorum he is not entitled to vote at the general meeting under show of hands however under poll he can cast his vote clear so companies without share capital generally proxy benefit is not there however articles of association if company articles of association provides the benefit of proxy then proxy benefit is available and sir who can appoint proxy you know member satisfying two conditions can appoint proxy two conditions one is member entitled to vote at general meeting member entitled to attend general meeting ma two conditions ma one is entitled to attend general meeting and entitled to vote at a general meeting if these two conditions are satisfied then that member can appoint proxy you know in one attempt a question came for two marks ma the question is member already casted vote under electronic voting 
member already casted voting under remote electronic voting under remote electronic voting you already casted vote now that member is entitled to, to attend general meeting however member is not entitled to vote at the general meeting why because day before yesterday under remote voting he exercised his voting power now voting power is not there now such member can he appoint proxy to the general meeting answer is no he is not entitled to appoint proxy why because he already exercised voting power so who can appoint proxy ma member entitled to attend and entitled to vote at general meeting only that person can have proxy only that person can appoint proxy and you know there is uh, there are some limitations on the proxy ma limitations one proxy can represent maximum 10 members maximum how many members he can represent in the meeting 10 members or he can represent members he can represent members holding not less sorry holding not more than 10 percent you know 10 percent of uh, paid up share capital i'm sorry it's not 10 members it's a uh, 50 members just wait and proxy can represent max 50 members or he can represent as uh, that much number of members but whose holding you know cumulative holding shall not exceed 10 percent of uh, company paid up share capital suppose each and every member is holding one percent capital ma in that case this proxy can represent only 10 members so either of these two conditions you know both of these two, two conditions should be satisfied so each person holding one percent of paid up share capital now he can represent only 10 members understood sir each and every member is holding five percent paid up share capital sir in that case he can uh, represent only two members Sir, each and every person is holding 20% paid up share capital, sir. In that case, he can act as a proxy to only one member. You know, if a person is holding more than 10% of paid up share capital, he can have proxy and that proxy can represent only this member, not any other members. Either 50 or, you know, from holding point of view, 10% of paid up share capital, whichever is less, you have to consider. Next. So that point is important point. Next one, proxy instrument, you know, uh, time limits for submission of proxy form. Here, you know, time limits. For time limits, separate point, ma. time limit. One is deposit of proxy form. Deposit of proxy form. Second one is inspection. Inspection of proxy form. You know, remember 24, 48, 72 hours. Or you know with respect to this one day two days three days so deposit of proxy form you know member who is appointing proxy has to give intimation to company at least 48 hours before commencement of meeting you know before meeting time before meeting time he has to deposit proxy form with company that means you know company should receive proxy form company should receive proxy form from the member at least 48 hours before meeting time by articles of association, one can reduce this time limit, but one can't increase this time limit. Now, inspection of proxy form. Any member, if he is having intention to inspect proxy form, then he has to communicate his intention at least, you know, three days before general meeting. Three days before uh, general meeting has to give notice to company regarding, uh, regarding his intention to inspect proxy forms. And this inspection shall be carried out. You know, inspection period, inspection period is 24 hours, 24 hours before commencement of meeting, 24 hours before commencement of meeting and ends with, you know, start time. This is start time. Next one, end time. End time is meeting uh, end time. So he can inspect proxy forms during the period starting from you know 24 hours before commencement of meeting and ends with meeting time so the moment meeting gets concluded inspection of proxy forms uh, is also will also gets concluded understood so 48 hours for deposit of proxy form notice of uh, intimation about uh, inspection of proxy forms you know notice you know sorry notice for inspection of proxy forms at least three days before uh, calling for meeting sorry three days before 
meeting not calling for meeting three days before general meeting and inspection time period is 24 hours before commencement of the meeting ends with a meeting and such inspection shall be carried out only during business hours not during a uh, night times you know i told you 24 hours before commencement of meeting right so sir during night can i inspect proxy forms no only during business hours you can inspect a uh, proxy forms so this is all about uh, information about proxima one point i missed that is who can act as a proxy who can act as a proxy for section 8 companies only member can act as a proxima that means in section 8 companies a member can appoint another member as a proxy outsider not permitted and for all other companies you know you can appoint an outsider as a proxy you can appoint another person as a proxy and uh, you know me uh, faculty practicing chartered accountant and you the students of uh, company law you know that you know proxy benefit is there how other people knows about the proxy benefit how all other members know the benefit of proxy it is possible only through intimation yes or no so in notice calling for general meeting it is the duty of company to mention the benefit of proxy member if you are unable to attend the general meeting you can send your representative so there should be a separate disclosure regarding appointment of proxy understood if company failed to satisfy that condition then company as well as officer in default is liable to a penalty of rupees 5000 5000 penalty is applicable understood and moreover you know appointment of proxy is a complete 100 percent freedom to the member member can appoint any person as a proxy so company can't circulate a document yes member if you want to appoint a proxy you can choose only a person whose name is mentioned in the list you can select a person the you can select any person but the person details should be mentioned sorry you can select any person as your proxy only from the list so we'll giving we are, we are giving you 100 persons details you can select any person out of 100 only like that if company impose any condition like that if company imposes any condition in such cases you know there is a penalty of 50,000 rupees penalty of 50,000 rupees so while reading this point you know many students get confused many students get confused reading at this point I'm telling you the meaning of this point is company should not circulate a document containing a or uh, the details of the persons who are willing to act as a proxy it is completely you know it is at the discretion of member you know member can appoint any person as his proxy so you can't place restriction on a member so you have to choose a person whose name is mentioned in the list if you do like that you know 50000 rupees penalty is there so next one you no know, voting all these are simple points only ma types of voting you can give one time reading just give one time reading so next important topic is minutes ma minutes the last topic of uh, management and administration so very frequently you can observe uh, questions from minutes hmm. so minutes minutes is nothing but you know a document containing summary of proceedings happened at that meeting. So meeting start time, uh, presence of quorum, appointment of chairman, and you know discussions held, uh, objections raised by the members, replies given by the management, everything. So minutes will contain a summary. It will contain a summary. So those who didn't attend the general meeting, if you go through the minutes, they will come to know what happened at the general meeting. So minutes is a summary document. So what happened in the general meeting, all that uh, points will be incorporated in a separate record. We call it as minutes. So each, it is the duty of every company to prepare, sign and keep minutes regarding general meeting, regarding creditors meeting, regarding resolutions passed by the postal ballot and regarding board of directors meetings as well as uh, committee meetings, you know, audit committee meetings, Next one, uh, mm, allotment, com uh, sorry, allotment, allotment of securities committee, CSR, corporate social responsibility committee, like that separate, separate committees will be there in the company. So committee meetings, board meetings, postal ballot resolutions, creditor meetings, general meetings. You have to maintain minutes for each and everything. Separate minutes, separate minutes for each and every meetings. 
next one contents it should contain fair and correct summary of the proceedings that took place at the consent meeting particularly it must have all the appointments you know that minutes shall contain the contents related to the appointments made at that meeting in case of board meeting so those who attended the board meeting you have to mention the name of the directors attended the board meeting name of the persons with respect to general meeting no need to mention the name of the members attended the general meeting why because you know members there is no limit in case of public company you can have unlimited members so now you know suppose 3000 people enter uh, 3000 people attended general meeting now writing all those 3000 people names you know it will take time and it will it require more and more records more and more papers i'm talking about minutes right so with respect to minutes with respect to board meeting only you have to mention the name of directors present at that meeting and with respect to any resolution if any director is not casting vote or if any director is casting vote against to the resolution i'm not talking about votes in favor ma votes in favor no problem votes against or who is not at all casting any vote those director details you have to mention in the minutes important important tricky point tricky point see any director you know casting vote against to the proposal or not giving consent to the proposal his details you have to incorporate in minutes that means directors casting votes in favor of the proposal no need to mention the details of such directors next one chairman is having a absolute discretionary powers to exclude certain matters from minutes but that matters you know they should be either defamatory of any person or they are irrelevant the matters are irrelevant or immaterial to the uh, meeting proceedings or if you include that matters it will have some negative impact negative impact on the company detrimental to the interests of the company so irrelevant matters or matter which is defamatory of any person or matter detrimental to the interests of the company such matters in the opinion of chairman in the opinion of chairman can be excluded from the minutes apart from these matters you know apart from the matters other than this chairman had no discretionary power to exclude each and every matter should be on record understood and there is a practical question on this topic ma you know certain members demanded chairman to exclude certain matters from the minutes now is there any obligation on chairman to exclude such matters from the minutes the answer is no chairman is having 100% absolute discretionary powers to whether to include or exclude matters from the minutes next one important one signing of minutes signing of minutes and last point is you know time limit for maintenance uh, time limit for uh, signing of minutes just see ma minutes time limit and signing so with respect to general meetings extraordinary general meetings hmm? minutes shall be uh, kept ready minutes shall be kept ready within 30 days of meeting within 30 days of meeting you know you have to complete the record of minutes coming to the signing here here meetings are of what two types one is members meetings members meetings two types just wait the other one is board meetings board meetings who can sign you know general meetings sir general meeting minutes general meeting minutes option a chairman of the meeting chairman of the meeting has to sign general meeting minutes in case if chairman is not available you know chairman got deceased or chairman left the country due to some emergency situations in that case any director authorized by board on this behalf authorized by board on this behalf so only these two people can sign members meeting minutes coming to the board meeting minutes chairman of the board chairman of the board shall sign the minutes in case if this chairman is not available no worry no problem chairman of succeeding board meeting sorry succeeding chairman or you know uh, chairman of next board meeting 
suppose you know for quarter two company conducted one board meeting minutes was kept ready but before signing you know chairman got chairman died no problem for quarter three you are conducting board meeting right in that board meeting you will appoint one person as chairman right so this chairperson will sign q3 board meeting minutes and he is all he is also having a duty to sign quarter two board meeting minutes that's what you know with respect to time limit of maintenance of minutes uh, uh, regarding board meetings committee meetings there is no specified time limit with, uh, with respect to member meeting minutes it should be maintained you know it should be completed within 30 days of meeting who can sign ma member meeting minutes shall be signed by chairman of the meeting the chairman decided any director authorized by the board on this behalf coming to the board meeting minutes chairman of the current board meeting or chairman of the upcoming board meeting so inspection of minutes is also permitted ma inspection of meetings is also permitted if you want any copy you know extract of the minutes you can get it by paying sufficient money and by making a written request so member is also entitled to get extract of the minutes so for that he need to pay sufficient money and he should give uh, he should submit request in writing then within seven working days you know company is having a duty to submit a copy of minutes to the members violation of this section you know penal provisions as usual ma penal provisions as usual how to remember so this is all about you know minutes next important topic is meetings general meetings section 96 section 100 so this is the last topic of uh, management and administration see ma every company whether it is you know private or public except opc except opc is required to conduct one general meeting once in a year we call it as annual general meeting sir is there any time limit for conducting annual general meeting yes for first agm the time limit is within 9 months 9 months from closure of financial first financial year first financial year with respect to subsequent agms with respect to subsequent annual general meetings first time limit is within 6 months from closure of financial year within 6 months from closure of financial year second one time gap between two agms time gap between two annual general meetings shall not exceed 15 months and every year one annual general meeting every year one annual general meeting so whichever is earliest we need to consider so every year right so year closure date year means year calendar year year closure date would be 31st december 31st december so out of these three dates whichever is earliest will apply for first agm 9 months from closure of first financial year sir first financial year closure date first financial year closure date is there any definition with respect to first financial year closure date yes ma if you are a company incorporated on or after first january on or after first january then financial year closure date will be 31st march of following year following year other cases you know other cases 31st march of relevant financial year relevant year that means if a company is incorporated on 1st january 2023 then financial year closure date will be 31st december 2024 so here you can observe sorry 31st march it's not december 31st march 2024 so here in this case you can observe financial year is of 15 months 15 months allowed ma allowed why because you know company incorporated on 1st january just imagine you know every company upon incorporation you know within 30 days they need to file register office address with roc within 30 days they need to appoint a you know auditor within 30 days uh, and then within 180 days company has to file a uh, commencement of business form with roc so company has to comply various uh, norms upon incorporation so there is a very little time to do business they will find only little time for doing business again for that you know you need to prepare financial statements those financial statements should get audited and those financial statements should be placed in front of members in the general meeting you need to take approval from uh, members of the general meeting why unnecessary compliance first why unnecessarily you know more compliance in the just first year of incorporation 
the two only three months only for three months only for three months why this much uh, uh, hectic uh, procedure so that's the reason you know uh, government came up with the concept you know financial closure date will be not 31st march of that year 31st march of next year so if a company is incorporated on the 1st january 2023 then financial year closure date will be 31st march of 2024 from here onwards nine months time limit is given for conducting first AGM. so 31st december 2024 is the last date for conducting first agm are you getting my point in other cases suppose you know company is incorporated on first uh, december 2022 suppose first december 2022 then financial year closure date would be 31st march 2023 from here onwards just add nine months to get a uh, due date for agm first agm so 31st december 31st december 2023 is the due date for conducting first agm with respect to subsequent annual general meetings the time limit is you know six months from the closure of financial year and previous annual general meeting add 15 months previous annual general meeting date add 15 months so out of these two limits whichever is earliest you have to consider and you know there is a, a, a power to roc to grant extension for agm due date you know roc is having power to grant extension and that extension benefit is uh, applicable only for subsequent agms so here roc can grant extension up to three months up to three months roc can grant extension for first agm that privilege is not there so in examination you know definitely a question will come like this you know company filed an application with roc for an extension of uh, first agm for extension of first agm so can roc grant extension you know is roc having a power to grant extension no roc is having no power to extend first agm due date however he can extend the subsequent agms up to three months up to three months he can extend it by the 10 days 20 days one month one and a half month two months up to three months he can extend next one next two provisions you know day time place of general meeting day time place of annual general meeting you can call for general meeting you know you can conduct a general meeting on any day any day any day except national holiday any day except national holiday you can conduct an annual general meeting for the time being we are having a three you know only three days were declared as national holidays one is you know 26th january republic day 15th august independence day and 2nd october gandhi jayanti these three days are declared as national holidays so except on these three days you can conduct general meeting on any day suppose sir we fixed 22nd august 2023 as a date of general meeting sir we issued notice calling for general meeting subsequently central government announced 22nd august as national holiday then can we conduct meeting on 22nd august 2023 you know can we conduct or not sir you can conduct for that year for that year 2023 you are allowed to conduct general meeting on 22nd august why because already arrangements started already you issued notice calling you issued notice calling for general meeting so now how can you change the date so for 2023 you can conduct meeting on national holiday but next year onwards 2024 onwards you are not allowed to conduct general meeting on 22nd august next sir, time time of meeting now meeting commencement time should be between 9 am and 6 pm meeting you know you one can't start meeting before 9 am one can't start meeting after 6 pm meeting commencement time should be between 9 am and 6 pm however meeting can be continued even after 6 pm there is no problem commencement time should be during business hours that too between 9 am and 6 pm and coming to the place of general meeting you know at the registered office of the company first priority registered office or any place in city town village where registered office is situated understood any place in city town village where registered office is situated only two options are there coming to unlisted companies you know with 100 percent members approval with all members approval you can conduct general meeting at any place in india 
understood so section 8 companies are having privileges some privileges unlisted companies are having some privileges government companies are also having privileges at the end you know government of india ministry of corporate affairs are ha is having a freedom to exempt some companies from complying this provisions so this is all about section 96 ma first stage within 9 months from closure of first financial year subsequent stage held within 6 months from closure of financial year and gap between two annual general meetings shall not exceed 15 months extension of first stage am not possible extension of subsequent stage am possible up to 3 months power lies power vested with roc and time place everything we discuss unlisted company if all the members give approval in advance then unlisted company can conduct meeting at any place in india section 8 companies you know day time place this can be decided by members in uh, in a previous agm itself next government companies certain privileges are there and government is having a power to exempt certain class or classes of companies from complying above norms for the time being you know one example opc ma opc you will have only one member in opc you can have only one member so for one member how can you call for a meeting understood next one egm extraordinary general meeting you know extraordinary general meeting is of three ways one is you know board of directors on their own motion board of directors on their own motion can call for egm the matters requires uh, emergency approval suddenly company decided to change object clause suddenly company decided to change its name uh, next egm you know it is it will be after uh, eight months right now we need to take a decision rectification of name right now we need to take approval so in that case you know no need to wait till uh, agm ma you can conduct a general meeting other than agm we call it as egm so board of directors can call for uh, egm on their suo moto basis in that case you know coming to the day time place day time place relaxations is there ma relaxations are there with respect to day you can conduct egm on any day including national holiday you can conduct general meeting on national holiday also coming to time any time need not be 9 to 6 midnight early in the morning you can conduct meeting place any place in india any place in india suppose if you are a company where 100% of share capital is held by a foreign company or company incorporated outside india you know foreign company is holding 100% of paid up share capital in our indian company in that case this company egm can be conducted even outside india so any place in india in india or outside india outside india any place either in india or outside india understood next one board of directors on a requisition on a requisition so this requisition requisition means what you know certain members certain members how much how many sir if it is a company with share capital company with share capital members holding not less than 1/10th of paid up share capital entitled to vote on date of receipt of requisition you know when company is take when company is getting this requisition you know when company is receiving this requisition on that date these members whoever signed this requisition should possess 1/10th of paid up share capital and they are entitled to vote at the general meeting so if these conditions are satisfied then that requisition is valid in case of company without share capital company without share capital same 1/10th ma but it is not paid up share capital 1/10th of voting power entitled to vote as on date of receipt of requisition by the company so if these people sign the requisition then that requisition is valid that requisition will contain a matters to be discussed at the general meeting and explanatory statement is not required with respect to requisition no need to give explanatory statement just matters to be discussed at general meeting is sufficient so the moment uh, board of directors receive requisition moment board of directors receive requisition imagine you know date of requisition equal to date of receipt of requisition you know if it is in electronic form you know if it uh, if sending this requisition is in electronic mode i mailed you suppose you know by mail i am uh, requesting company to call for a general meeting so today i send the mail company received mail today itself 
that's what you know date of requisition equal to date of receipt of requisition assumption remember so from here onwards you know within 21 days within 21 days board of directors has to take all steps calling for general meeting calling for general meeting and within 45 days within 45 days general meeting shall be conducted general meeting shall be conducted within 21 days board has to take all the steps in calling for general meeting and within 45 days of uh, you know uh, date of receipt of requisition general meeting shall be conducted suppose if if board failed to call for general meeting within 21 days board failed to conduct meeting within 45 days in that case you know uh, the power to call for meeting will go to members you know requisition is requisitionist will get a power to call for general meeting and they should conduct the general meeting within three months from the date of requisition within three months from the date of requisition the meeting shall be conducted remaining provisions are same in case you know if requisitionist are calling for a general meeting then you know day of meeting it can be any day except national holiday it can be at any time but during business hours it can be at any place either at registered office or city town village where registered office is situated simply you know agm related uh, rules and regulations will apply if a meeting is called and conducted by requisitionist understood the so first board of directors has to call for a meeting within 21 days that meeting shall be conducted within 45 days if board fails to satisfy any of this condition then power will go to requisitionist a requisitionist shall call for EGM and that meeting shall be conducted within three months from the date of requisition. And if this meeting, in this meeting, if there is no quorum, then there is no concept of adjournment. The meeting automatically stands at uh, cancelled. Meeting automatically stands cancelled. Understood? Everyone. So with this, I'll conclude uh, management and administration. Next topic, Declaration and Payment of Dividends, section 123 to 127. Small chapter and scoring chapter. Examination point of view, you can expect 6 to 9, mo nine marks from this chapter. So don't ignore this chapter, ma'am. So first of all, what is the meaning of dividend? What you know about dividend? So dividend means division of something. From company point of view, distribution of certain amount of profits among the owners of the company nothing but members of the company it is nothing but dividend you all know company will not distribute all its profits in the form of dividends it will reserve certain portion of profits we call them as retained earnings it will reinvest that retained earnings uh, into the business and the portion which is distributed among the members of the company we call it as dividends understood so if you look at the definition of dividends you know dividend includes a uh, interim dividend so it is an inclusive definition it is not defining the word dividend in fact it is giving a list you know list of items covered under this definition you know dividend includes interim dividend in the entire company side 2013 wherever you see the word dividend it includes interim dividend that means provisions of company side 2013 are applicable to final dividend as well as interim dividend unless other intention appears so first of all, sir, what is meant by interim dividend? What is meant by final dividend? I'll tell you, ma. The final dividend, it is a dividend recommended by board of directors. Final dividend. Who will recommend uh, final dividend, ma? Who will recommend final dividend? You know, recommendation will be done by board of directors. And uh, approval, you know, approved by members in annual general meeting. In AGM, you know, members will approve the final dividends. Who will make recommendation board of directors you know board of directors looking at a uh, financial position and financial performance of the company they will recommend you know for example eight percent dividends now members in annual general meeting they will declare this dividend you know they can reduce the rate of dividend they can't increase the rate of dividend if they increase it if they want to increase it suppose they are passing a resolution you know they fixed a 10 percent as a dividend now is that resolution valid sir no invalid section 6 we discussed section 6 sir Act shall override MOA, AOA, any resolutions passed 
by the board or members and any agreement executed by the company so if there is any inconsistency between companies act and these five things you know companies act shall always prevail so members can't increase the rate of dividend recommended by the board of directors members can reduce the rate of dividend understood so final dividend it is recommended by directors and uh, approved by the members generally final dividends are declared at uh, agm only so now we are in the financial year 2023-24 so first april 2023 is the start date 31st march 2024 is the end date and you all know the due date of agm just now we discussed the due date of agm is the within six months from the closure of financial year and the time gap between two agms two agms shall not exceed hmm, 15 months yes or no generally the due date for agm is 30th september 2024 understood so now on a in agm if members declaring something as a dividend we call it as final dividend clear final dividend with respect to which year sir final dividend with respect to financial year 2023-24 now coming to the interim dividend you know it is a dividend recommended by the board of directors and declared by the board of directors so with respect to interim dividend who will recommend ma recommendation will be done by board of directors declaration will also be done by board of directors at the end of the year you know in the annual general meeting members will ratify members will ratify interim dividends too are you getting my point so if any dividend is declared by the directors recommendation and declared by the directors then we call it as interim dividend generally interim dividend is declared between two annual general meetings is it clear so any dividend declared between two annual general meetings we call it as interim dividend and who is having power to fix the rate of dividend board of directors who is having power to approve interim dividend board of directors clear next one next one you know important point is sources of uh, dividends important important point sources of dividends sources sir from where we get money in order to pay these dividends sir First one, current year profits. Current year profits. Second one, previous year's profits. You know, accumulated profits. Simply accumulated profits. You know, a surplus in profit and loss account. General reserves account. Understood. Next one, both combination of above. Sometimes, you know, money provided by government. Money provided by government. So, out of these sources, you can declare dividends. And there is one small adjustment. The adjustment is you can declare dividend out of profits only after providing depreciation. That means from current year profits, you need to adjust depreciation. Depreciation is a non-cash expenditure. Depreciation is a non-cash expenditure. So you have to deduct depreciation. That depreciation you can't calculate according to your interest. You have to calculate depreciation according to Schedule 2 norms after reduction of depreciation whatever profit left over from that profits only you can declare dividends sir is there any obligation to transfer certain portion of profits to general reserves sir is there any obligation on company to transfer certain portion of profits to general reserves no there is no such obligation to transfer profits to the general reserves it is uh, completely at the discretion of board of directors if board of directors want to transfer some portion of profits to general reserves they can but there is no mandatory obligation under companies act 2013 in order to transfer portions to general reserves understood understood my everyone next one next one sir within how many days time limit within how many days we have to pay these dividends sir we have to pay these dividends for the time being remember these two points ma. remember these two time limits one is within five days of declaration within five days of declaration transfer dividends to a separate bank account separate bank account and within 30 days of de declaration within 30 days of declaration the dividends should be distributed among the members so payment should be completed payment should be completed within 30 days of uh, declaration are you all getting my point everyone so sources it is very clear current year profits suppose you, i'm talking about you know dividend i'm talking about you know dividend with respect to financial year 2023-24 now the first source is first source is financial year 23-24 profits sir not sufficient sir or current year you know losses sir then you can use 
previous year's accumulated profits you know profit balance as on you know 31st march 2023 so profit balance lying in the uh, you know general reserves or credit balance of profit and loss account you can use that balance subject to, to some conditions those conditions i'll discuss with you later clear so now let's look at the interim dividend mark interim dividend may be declared by the board of directors at any time during the period from closure of financial year till holding of annual general meeting so what they are telling just see ma financial year 2023 you know first april 23 31st march 2024 this is the closure date now you know board of directors can declare interim dividend during the period from closure of financial year that means you know 31st march 2024 till the date of annual general meeting so annual general meeting date you know 30th september 2024 so during this period board of directors if they want to pay interim dividend they can pay interim dividend suppose you know the recommended dividend on 31st july 2024 they recommended dividend on 31st july 2024 can they pay this dividend sir yes yes now coming to the sources for interim dividend you know surplus in the profit and loss account profits of the financial year in which such dividend is sought to be declared or or profits generated in the financial year till the quarter preceding the date of declaration of the interim dividend so here you are having a three sources one is surplus in profit and loss account that means opening balance of profit and loss account opening balance of profit and loss account next so profits for the financial year profits of the financial year in which such dividend is sought to be declared suppose you know board of directors if they decide that you know this dividend this interim dividend belongs to financial year 2023 24 you know this the interim dividend belongs to 2023 24 then they can use profits of 2023 24 they can use profits of 2023 24 in order to pay interim dividend and we had third point that is profits generated in the financial year till the quarter preceding the date of declaration of interim dividend now if you look at the declaration date you know it is uh, covered in financial year 2024 25 you just observe carefully 31st july 2024 it is in the financial year 24 25 so you can use current year profits current year profits you know till the date of you know quarter preceding the date of declaration if you observe 31st july exactly before 31st july we had you know quarter ending date that is 30th june 2024 you can also use the sources you know uh, profits that were generated in quarter 1 of financial year 24 25 it's up to you opening balance of profit and loss account or profits of the financial year you know dividends ought to be declared and next uh, profits generated in the financial year till the quarter preceding the date of declaration of interim dividend here date of declaration is 31st july 2024 so this is uh, declared and you know recommended and declared by board of directors so this is an interim dividend for this you can utilize profits earned during financial year 24 25 till the till the closure of quarter 1 next one ratification at agm so all interim dividends you know declared and paid by the directors shall be ratified at the upcoming annual general meeting by members so don't ask me questions sir what if if members don't ratify so they already accepted money yes sir no whenever company paying interim dividend they already accepted that money so demod ratification already done this is just a formality sake in case of losses if company has incurred loss during the current financial year up to the end of quarter immediately preceding the date of declaration of interim dividend then such interim dividend shall not be declared at a rate higher than average of dividend declared by the company during the immediately preceding three financial years so what this point is what this point meaning see ma company completed three quarters ma quarter 1 quarter 2 quarter 3 quarter 1 they got loss of 100 crores for quarter 2 they got profit of 50 crores for quarter 3 they got profit of 30 crores and they want to declare interim dividend on 31st of january 2024 looking at the market competition in order to attract more and more uh, uh, shareholders you know more and more owners you know they decided to declare interim dividend now if you look at the position you know performance of the company in the uh, year in the financial year 2023 24 2023 2024 if you look at that uh, financial year overall performance of the company overall performance of the company is minus 20 crores so quarter ending date if you look at the point you know end of the quarter immediately preceding the date of declaration of uh, interim dividend so 31st january date of declaration of dividend 
So preceding quarter ending date is uh, 31st December 2023. So up to that date, during that year, the performance of the company is minus 20 crores. Can they declare dividends sir? Yes, they can declare dividend, but there is a restriction. The restriction is rate of dividend shall not exceed. That means rate less than or equal to average of last three years dividends. Average of last three years dividends. Sir, last three years company paid dividend of 8%, 9%, 10% sir. In that case, if you look at the average, you know 9%, 8 plus 9 plus 10 divided by 3, 9%. So company can pay interim dividend up to 9%. Next one, separate bank account. I told you the amount of dividend including the interim dividend shall be deposited in a separate bank account maintained with a scheduled bank. Within how many days? 5 days from the date of declaration. The same norm is applicable to final dividend as well as interim dividend. Same provisions for final dividend. The final dividend is declared at AGM of the company. It is also known as final dividend. And rate of dividend recommended by board cannot be increased by the members. Clearly, I told you. Next one, you know types of dividends, ma? not important from examination point of view. Uh, provisions regarding declaration and payment of dividends, very important. You know profits of the current financial year after providing depreciation. Profits of any previous financial year or years which remain undistributed. Suppose our previous years we got profits, 100% of profits already distributed, sir. 100% of profits already distributed. Now undistributed profit is zero. Now you can't use uh, previous year profits. Next one, combination of A and B. Next one, provision of money by the government. Sometimes, you know, government will promise public. You come and subscribe company shares. Definitely company will pay dividends to you. If company fails to pay dividends, I'll contribute money to company and company will distribute that money among you in the form of dividends. Sometimes government will do that promise. If government make that promise, you know, government will provide money. So the money provided by the government can be used for declaration and payment of dividends. Next one. So note point I'll explain you later. Just wait. So meaning of free reserves, you know, free reserves name itself is selling free from obligations. And these profits are available for distribution and payment of dividends. Now, while calculating, you know, free reserves, certain reserves shall be excluded. One is revaluation reserve. Revaluation reserve generally it is not a business profit. You purchased one asset, you know, 10 years back, a decade back, you purchased one land. Now, you know, indexation, etc., etc., demand for land increased. Now, the price of the land, you know, the value of the land got increased. Now, can I increase my value of the asset? Yes, you can increase it. Corresponding credit balance, you can, uh, depo you know, you can credit to revaluation reserve. Now, this reserve is not in the form of cash. Yes or no, this reserve is not in the form of cash. You increase the value of asset. So, this is an unrealized gain. This is just a notional gain. You can't use revaluation reserves for distribution and payment of dividends. Next one, fair value adjustments. Any change in carrying amount of an asset, liability recognized in equity, including surplus in profit and loss account on measurement of the asset or liability at fair value. For example, Infosys company is providing services to a US company. At the time of service, you know, the contract agreement value is, contract value is $1 million, simply $10 lakh into at the time of uh, providing that service at the time of providing that service dollar value is just 80 rupees now total contract value is 8 crores so they recorded asset like this you know debtor 8 crores sales 8 crores they recorded after one month you know 31st march came into the picture on 31st march you know current assets will be can be valued at uh, fair values you know can be valued at closing price of the dollar so closing price of the dollar you know it went up to 84 rupees ma 84 rupees now how much amount uh, you know you can realize from the debtor sir it's not 8 crores so 1 million dollars into 84 so you can realize 8.4 crores so originally you recorded asset for 8 crores now the value of asset went up to 8.4 crore why there is an inflation sorry there is an increase in dollar value increment in dollar value so 40 lakhs is a gain no sir from this 40 lakhs, can I distribute dividends, sir? No, no. Any change in carrying amount of an asset, carrying amount of a liability, you know, you can't utilize that amount for payment of dividends. Understood? Next one. Uh, need for providing depreciation out of profits before declaring dividend. Common point, ma. You know, not important from examination point of view. So I'm ignoring this point. Next up, before declaring dividend, company must transfer a certain portion of profits to reserves. Is it true? 
no under company act 2013 there is no obligation on company to transfer the portion of profits to the reserves it is completely at the discretionary powers of directors understood old company act the provision is there new company act the provision is not there next one write about conditions for declaration of dividends in case of inadequacy or absence of profits suppose you know current years profits are not there you know losses but still company want to declare dividends why members expect something members definitely expect something in annual general meeting and moreover you know it's a reputation matter competitors they are paying they are declaring and they are paying dividends if we want to declare dividends definitely our members will sell our shares and they will go to competitor companies so that is you know that creates bad image in the market yes sir no so to satisfy members company can declare dividends sir but current year profits are not adequate no sir current year profits are inadequate current year profits we are not having current year profits we are having losses sir still you can declare dividend out of accumulated profits subject to some conditions sir what are those conditions sir condition 1 the rate of dividend declared shall not exceed average of uh, the rates at which dividend was declared by the company in the immediately preceding 3 years 3 years suppose you know company 1 last 3 years it declared dividend uh, rate of uh, rate of dividend is 8 9 10 10 now average it ma 8 plus 9 plus 10 divided by 3 so average is 9% suppose company 2 sir last 3 years you know one year they didn't declared any dividend sir one year they declared dividend 10 another year they declared dividend uh, 12 now average is 10 plus 12 divided by 2 it's not 3 why because if any year you know company didn't declare any dividend don't consider that year don't consider that year suppose sir company 3 it didn't declared any dividend last 3 years sir complete transfer of profits to the reserves only in that case condition 1 is not applicable in that case company can declare you know unlimited dividends condition 3 condition 1 will not apply see however this condition shall not apply if company has not declared any dividend in each of the three preceding financial years so last year if company didn't declare any dividend now there is no restriction on rate of dividend they can declare unlimited dividends But last three years if they declare any dividend now you have to average it next one condition number 2 what is condition number 2 total amount to be drawn from such accumulated profits shall not exceed 10% of paid up share capital and pre reserves so withdrawal withdrawal shall not exceed 10% of paid up share capital plus free reserves condition 3 amount so withdrawn shall be first utilized to set off current year losses so first adjust current year losses next one balance of reserves after such withdrawal shall not fall below 15% of paid up share capital simply reserves and surplus post withdrawal you know after withdrawal shall be greater than or equal to 15% of paid up share capital so now satisfying these three conditions just one problem i will explain just one problem why because in examination there is an instance you know a problem was tested for four marks just look at this question mark paid up share capital of the company you know 100 crores current uh, accumulated reserves and surplus is uh, 30 crores clear current year losses ma current year losses is uh, 3 crores losses 3 crores now company want to declare a dividend for the current year last 3 years you know average rate of dividend suppose last 3 years mm, year 1 year 2 year 3 the declared dividend 110% 15% 20% now you know maximum 10 plus 15 plus 20 divided by 3 so it is 15% so maximum rate of dividend uh, a company can declare that is 15% next uh, condition number 2 maximum withdrawal you know 1 10th of paid up share capital plus free reserves so 1 10th of uh, 100 plus 30 that is you know 13 13 crores they can withdraw third condition out of 13 uh, first i'll tell fourth condition ma balance after withdrawal balance after withdrawal in the reserves and surplus should be minimum of 15% of paid up share capital minimum of 15% of paid up share capital so reserves and surplus reserves and surplus how much amount we can withdraw sir so paid up share capital into 15% so maximum withdrawal this is the equation current reserves and surplus how much 30 crores minus paid up share capital into 15% means 100 crores into 15 percentage so maximum i can withdraw 15 crores ma 30 minus 15 i can withdraw 15 crores uh 
uh, above condition it is 13 crores whichever is less you have to satisfy two conditions you have to satisfy two conditions so whichever is less that is you know 13 crores 13 crores now i can withdraw 13 crores now don't distribute entire 13 crores in the form of dividends first set of current year losses current year losses how much 3 crores 13 minus 3 crores you know 10 crores you you are having funds now this 10 crores means how much 10 crores out of you know paid up share capital is how much ma 10 crores divided by 100 crores that is 10 percentage now if you look at the first condition company can declare dividend up to 15 percentage you know with respect to rate maximum 15 percent but coming to the funds it is having just 10 crores only now you know 10 crores or 15 percent 10 crores is nothing but you know 10 percent 10 percent or 15 percent whichever is less you know 10 percent simply company can declare dividend and can pay dividend only rupees 10 crores understood no confusion at all you have to satisfy all conditions as per condition one company can declare dividend up to 15 percent now coming to the sources it is not having 15 percent funds 15 percent means how much ma 100 crores into 15 percent 15 crores sir but coming to the funds it is having only 10 crores it is having only 10 crores permission how much permission they are having 10 crores they can distribute they can pay only 10 crores that's it next one these rules are not applicable to 100% government company 100% government company means you know 100% of uh, control 100% of capital held by governments state government central government state, state governments you know combination any combination so you are having problem also here you can solve it ma you can you can solve it for the time being mm, very simple problem only see average rate of dividend you know 10.33 percent we got paid up share capital plus prices 440 lakhs so maximum we can draw 10 percent that is 44 crores after withdrawal you know balance uh, balance in free reserves should be not less than 15 percent of paid up share capital so if you look at uh, free reserves balance of free reserves yes free reserves how much ma reserves is 240 lakhs so 240 lakhs minus what is the capital of the company 200 lakhs 200 lakhs into 15 percentage so 240 minus 30 you know 210 lakhs 210 lakhs up to 210 lakhs you can declare up to 210 lakhs you can declare but according to condition to only 44 uh, lakhs only 44 lakhs so 44 or 210 whichever is less you know 44 or 210 lakhs whichever is less you know 44 from 44 first you need to set up current year losses that is you know 30 lakhs so you will get only 14 lakhs now 14 lakhs 14 lakhs means how much 14 lakhs divided by 200 lakhs that means you know 7 percentage only sir if you look at the rate you know 10.33 percent is permitted no but coming to the source we are having only 14 lakhs so you can declare dividend up to 7 percent you can declare dividend up to 7 percent of the paid up share capital that's it suppose ma if a company passed a resolution declaring dividend out of capital declare it they, they want to declare dividend out of capital or out of crr capital redemption reserve or out of drr dementia redemption reserve deposit repayment reserve then such a declaration is it valid no ultra virus beyond the powers given by companies and it is illegal and punishable understood next deposit and payment of dividend i told you so within five days from the date of declaration of dividend yes you have to deposit the amount in separate bank account why because it is no more your funds you have no control over the funds you have to transfer that amount and within 30 days of declaration that amount should be distributed among members of the company understood now coming to the 100 percent government company this rule is not applicable why 100 percent ownership you know if 100 percent ownership you know central government or state government is having why again transferring to separate bank account directly transfer to government next one payment of dividend to the shareholder so dividend shall be payable only to the registered shareholder or to his order or to his banker. The company is liable to pay dividends to share registered shareholder or his order suppose, uh, as per his instructions. Next one to the banker. Shareholder but not a member. A purchaser of shares whose name is not entered in the register of members cannot claim payment of dividends to him through though he might have made full payment to the seller of shares. In this regard will will uh, sorry dividend may be kept in abeyance 
pending registration of transfer of shares unless registered holder has authorized the company to pay dividend to the purchaser now this is section 126 ma according to section 126 suppose situation you know transfer or transferred shares to transfer so transfer happened transfer he paid full consideration to transfer and all these documents were sent to the company for registration of transfer you know what company did you know company didn't register the transfer the reason is closure of registers we discussed in previous chapter closure of registers so company gave notice to all the members company gave advertisement also so this uh, 10 days the uh, company will not register any transfer after 10 days company will register the transfers so the transfer is pending for registration transfer is pending for registration during the time period company declared dividend and you know in this situation actually to whom company should pay dividend actually company should pay dividend to the member who is the member actually transferer is the member why the transfer still not yet registered right transfer still not yet registered so as per register of members transferer is the member so legally company should pay dividend to the transferer However, transfer already paid consideration to transferor. Transfer already paid consideration to transferor. So transferee is entitled to those dividends, but transferee name is not yet updated in the register of members. So to whom we have to pay dividends? So there is a confusion. So don't pay any dividend to anyone. Just keep it uh, in unpaid account directly. Unpaid dividend account directly transfer that amount to unpaid dividend account. Generally, unclaimed dividends, unpaid dividends shall be transferred to unpaid dividend account within 7 days from the closure of 30 days from declaration. Understood? But coming to this particular situation, don't wait for 30 days. Immediately transfer this amount of dividend to unpaid dividend account. Once transfer is registered, transferee will file application with company. Then company can pay dividends to the transferee. Of course, if transferor give instruction to the company, company pay dividends to transferee only. Don't pay dividends to me, pay dividends to the transferee. In that case, you know, company will transfer dividends to the transferee without transferring to unpaid dividend account. And during the time period, you know, any rights or any bonus shares were issued. You know, all those shares, all those options will be kept hold, will be kept in abeyance. Once, you know, Transfer registration completed, then transfer is permitted. The transfer is eligible for all these benefits. Next one, payment of dividends payable in cash, or check, warrant, or in any electronic mode, you know, NEFT, RTGS, payable to the registered shareholder of the share and or to his order. So, or to his order, that means as per instructions of the registered shareholder or to his banker. Coming to the Nidhi company, if any member didn't claim any dividend, then no need of transferring dividends to unpaid dividend account. Just credit the amount to the account of a member. Credit the account of a member means simply, you know, in balance sheet, you know, write the name of a member who didn't claim dividend and write the amount. Suppose, you know, one member didn't claim any dividend, 50 rupees. Now just uh, credit that amount to, to member account, member account in books of accounts, not member bank account, member, member uh, account in books of accounts. So the moment he comes to the company, just pay that amount to the member. Until then, you know, that amount, you know, company will hold and for that amount, you know, member will be the uh, creditor, member will become creditor for that amount and company is liable to pay as and when member comes to the company. Very simple topics, ma. Very, very simple topics. Next one, dividends on partly paid shares. Section 51, we already discussed in share capital. Next, dividends are payable in cash and not kind. Correct. The dividends in lieu of bonus shares is also prohibited. Whenever dividends, uh, whenever company declare dividends, 100% of dividends should be paid in cash only. Kind, bonus shares, you know, uh, company uh, products, company products not permitted. Always it should be paid in cash mode only. Cash. Next one. Next one. Applicability of section 2 Nidhi companies already discussed with you. For Nidhi companies, directly transfer. Uh, uh, that that much amount to member account member account you know it's simply write an entry like this many students will get confusion here you know you write entry like this dividend payable account debit 50 rupees to member account so recognize member as a creditor for this dividend if member fails to claim any dividend no need of transferring dividends to the unpaid dividend account no need of transferring amounts to the iepf account investor education and protection fund no need just uh, Transfer that amount to member account. Member account means not member bank account. You know, member, you know, open member ledger in your books and credit that amount to the member ledger. 
next one write about circumstances for prohibition on declaration of dividends you know only two companies are prohibited from declaration of dividends very important in past a question came for two marks with respect to this points only so two companies in entire companies act you know two companies are prohibited from declaring and paying dividends what are those two companies sir one is section 8 company in section 8 company i told you clearly section 8 companies are prohibited from declaration and payment of uh, dividends and the second one is company failed to comply deposit provisions company failed to comply deposit provisions these two companies you know can't declare can't uh, pay dividends to its members write about unpaid dividend account I told you so within seven days you know within seven days you know company declared a dividend but has not been paid or has not been claimed within 30 days from the date of declaration the company shall within seven days from the expiry of the set period of 30 days transfer total amount of unpaid or unclaimed dividend to a special account so this account also belongs to the company but this account you know will be kept aside company will not use money of this account you know separate account it's a reserve account we call it as you know technically we call it as escrow account so deposit you will have powers withdrawal you will not have any powers for withdrawal you have to follow a specified procedure next one Sir, you know, company made a default, sir. Within seven days, they failed to, I mean, within seven days, they didn't transfer dividend to separate bank account, sir. They failed to transfer dividend to unpaid dividend account, sir. In that case, you know, for the delay period, company is liable to deposit also. Company is also liable to deposit 12% interest. See, ma, what actually happens, you know, what actually happens? Suppose, you know, company is there, Infosys company, Infi Limited, Infosys company is there. On 30th September 2023, 23, they declared a dividend, ma. 10 rupees per share they declared. You know, one member holding 10 shares. So he will get dividend of how much rupees? You know, 100 rupees. So the moment you declare dividend, within 5 days, repeat, within 5 days, within 5 days, transfer to separate bank account. You know, separate bank account. That means, you know, open one bank account for the purpose of payment of dividends. And the, you have to deposit amount in this bank account. Now, within 30 days from the date of declaration, within 30 days from the date of declaration, so including 5 days, 5 days once again get included. So, within 30 days of declaration, you have to deposit it uh, in members' accounts, deposit or transfer to members' accounts, member accounts. Suppose if any member didn't claim any dividend, didn't claim dividend, for example, you know, this person, one person, you know, rupees 100, he didn't claim at all. He didn't claim at all. Now, from here onwards, from here onwards, within seven days, within seven days, transfer amount to unpaid dividend account. This is also one bank account. This is also a bank account opened by the company in any bank, you know, in any scheduled bank. So, this is one bank account and this is second bank account, you know, unpaid dividend account. This is second account, unpaid dividend account. These two accounts, you know, company will open with banks. First, you deposit a dividend amount within five days from the date of declaration in a separate uh, bank account. So, within 30 days, transfer to the members any unclaimed or unpaid dividends from this bank account. Um, from this bank account, transfer to second bank account named unpaid dividend account. So, both accounts belong to the company, and company is not permitted to use this money for business. Suppose if a company makes delay in transferring this amount uh, to unpaid dividend account. Now, along with unpaid or unclaimed dividend, it has to deposit 12% extra interest. Interest at the rate of 12% per annum. 12% per annum. Understood? Understood. See, ma, I am not, uh, not revising it in a fast manner. I am making, I am no, I'm stressing some points which will confuse you. As you all know, this is not a complete class. This is a marathon class. In actual class, you know, I teach dividends for 7 hours. 6 to 7 hours. Understood? So, this is a marathon. Roughly, I will take, you know, 40 or 50 minutes to complete this topic. So, don't think that, you know, I am teaching in fast manner. So, this is a marathon. You all know, right? Okay. Not rushing you. Disclaimer. Next one. Preparing of a statement of unpaid dividend. Within 90 days of transferring any amount to the unpaid dividend account, the company shall prepare a statement containing the names, last known address and amount of unpaid dividend to be paid to each person and place such statement on its website. So, within 90 days of transferring the amount to unpaid dividend account, 90 days. So, total if you look at the time limits, this is you know date of declaration. From here onwards, 5 days, one condition, 
again from here onwards 30 days another condition now second one you know from here onwards 7 days one one time limit and from here onwards 90 days another time limit and again from here onwards there is one more time limit that is you know 7 years within 7 years if this dividend remains unclaimed then along with this unclaimed dividends you know consecutively 7 years if any person is not claiming dividends now all these 7 years dividends and shares shall be transferred to investor and investor and uh, investor education and protection fund understood so that is what you know question number 11 consecutive 7 years if any person fails to claim for dividends for a period of 7 consecutive years no, along with the dividend, shares shall also be transferred to the IEPF. Suppose, sir, you know, one, two, three years he didn't claim dividends, sir. Fourth year he claimed dividends, sir. Again, fifth, sixth, seventh years he didn't claim dividend. Now, can he transfer shares to unpaid dividend account? No. Why? Fourth year he claimed, fourth year he claimed dividend, right? So, this is not five, six, seven. This is one, two, three. Consecutive seven years. In between, if he claim any dividend, then you know, seven consecutive years condition gets failed. You have to count one from the next year onwards. Next one. You know, there is a logic behind this section. You know, no one should become rich at the cost of others, right? If a person is not claiming dividends means, that means, you know, he is no more in existence. He, is, he may be no more in existence. So if there is no provision like this, you know, what company will do? It will check the status of the member. If member is no more, then you know, any of the directors may manipulate books and they may get those shares. So they are becoming rich at the cost of uh, members. Yes or no? This should not happen. So you have to transfer all these monies to the government. Why? Government is there for public, by public, you know, for the public, of the public, etc, etc. So no one should become rich at the cost of others except government. Why? Because you know, government is meant for the public. Next one. So along with the transfer, you have to file a statement with a IEPF. Next one. Right of owner of transfer shares to reclaim. So if any person came to know that yes, last three years or four years or last ten years, I'm not claiming dividend. So if any person who get uh, uh, this matter, <clears throat> suppose you know his shares got transferred to IEPF, his dividends got transferred to IEPF. Now if you want to claim them, he can claim them. So by filing an application with a IEPF. He can claim all his dividends as well as shares. So punishment for contravention. Very simple punishment. Ma. Remember that punishment. Remember that punishment. And this is a small chart. Just go through this chart. Ma. Next one. IEPF. You know credits, debits. Credit means deposits. Deposits of amounts with IEPF. Debits means you know expenses of IEPF. Payments of IEPF. Simply point A is all about receipts of IEPF. And next one, it is all about, you know, B point is all about uh, payments from IEPF. So if you look at the receipts, you know, very simple amounts, uh, you know, central government grants, uh, central government donations, uh, you know, in budget, uh, if uh, in budget, in uh, sorry, suppose in a budget, in a parliament session, you know, finance minister announced 50 crores uh, amount to the IEPF. So grant, next donations by the central government amount lying in unpaid dividend account amount in the general revenue account of central government you know under 1956 act under companies act 1956 so uh, government have maintained general revenue account or government have maintained old iepf account now balances lying in these accounts shall be transferred to new iepf account and income from investments so whatever shares held by iepf you know whatever dividends generated on those shares whatever income generated on those shares you know all those amounts again transfer to iepf Amount received through disorgement or disposal of securities. You know, under section 38, if you make personation of securities, that means by filing a duplicate applications, if you obtain two or more securities, if you obtain securities illegally, all those securities shall be surrendered to IEPF. So surrendered to IEPF is nothing but, you know, received for IEPF. Next one, application money, which remains unpaid for a period of seven years or more. Mature deposits, which remain unpaid for a period of seven years or more. If you look at this point other than banking companies, why? Because for banking companies, time period is completed. Automatic renewal is there. Automatic renewal concept is there. But with respect to other than banking companies, Reliance, you know, automatic renewal concept is not there. For renewal also, deposit holder should come to the company and he has to file renewal application with company or else company should not renew those deposits. So those deposits shall be transferred to IEPF 
if they remain unclaimed for a period of seven years from the date of its maturity same for mature debentures interest thereon and even preference shares also the amount remain unpaid so for a period of seven years or more shall be transferred to iepf so amount received from sale proceeds of fractional shares so any fractional shares you know suppose you know company transferred uh, uh, some 890 shares to iepf ma next year you know company declared bonus bonus in the ratio of 1 is to 100 1 is to 100 now 890 shares held by iepf so accordingly 1 is to 100 means 8.9 shares bonus shares you know company has to declare in the name of iepf so 0.9 i told you shares will not be available in fractions stock is available in fractions shares you know always natural numbers now 0.9 is a fractional share so these fractional shares iepf will authorize company to sell to someone else now sale proceeds from fractional shares should be transferred to iepf similarly preference shares redemption and, ne and next one any other amounts as may be prescribed so this list has been prescribed ma all these amounts shall be transferred to iepf next one utilization of fund you know refund of uh, unclaimed matured matured debentures deposits you know if application is filed for refund of these monies iepf shall transfer these amounts to the respective owners next one for conducting awareness programs educating investors they may conduct some workshops for conducting those workshops you know expenditure uh, they will incur expenses from this account only next one distribution of dissolved amount among eligible and identifiable identifiable uh, applicants suppose one person you know he he got profits illegally he got profits not in a legal manner for example harshad mehta harshad mehta he projected some companies you know those companies share price will increase in coming days so he showed some greediness to the investors investors they bought these shares at higher prices understood so all the profits were held by harshad mehta sir now whatever profits you know held by harshad mehta sir whatever profits transfer to iepf that amount shall be distributed among the eligible applicants next one reimbursement of legal expenses incurred in pursuing class action suppose you know uh, uh, cheating happened to the members company cheated members so members definitely they can file a case on company for in, uh, for meeting legal expenses yes iepf will help them iepf will pay some amount in order to meet legal obligations or any other purpose incidental there too understood ma see ma central government is having a power to constitute authority to monitor to administer this fund that authority name is investor education and protection fund authority and you know with respect to authority you know how many members are required who will take the position of chairman you know everything you know uh, government of india will look into those matters so as of now you know chairman who is the chairperson sir you know secretary of mca is the ex official chairperson of the authority in addition there shall be six members maximum seven and a ceo who shall be the conveyor of the authority so these people will look after the fund and you know procedure for administration of the fund and consultation you know uh next one maintenance of books of accounts filing of uh, annual returns audit of books of accounts of the fund everything you know government will prescribe after consulting c and ag controller and auditor general of india next one utilization of money in iepf account audit of the fund preparation of annual report by the authority so everything you know government of india will prescribe next one write about right of dividend right shares and bonus shares to be held in abeyance pending registration of transfer of shares just now i told you section 126 same amount ma transfer of sorry same provision transfer of shares has not been registered by the company it is in pending it is pending so in that case don't pay dividends to either of the parties straight away transfer that amount to unpaid dividend account if there is any rep representation from transfer so please pay amounts to transfer then pay amounts to the transfer and during that time period if company declares any rights or sorry bonus shares or you know uh, have given rights option all these options will be in hold abeyance is nothing but hold next last provision of dividends the so time limit for distribution of dividends i told you 30 days from the date of declaration in case of delay suppose commit company committed delay company didn't pay dividends within 30 days then company has to pay dividend plus 18 percent interest on dividend interest on dividend suppose total dividends declared 100 crores it is the duty of company to pay these dividends within 30 days ma 
now it is 45th day now company is paying dividend on 45th day now don't pay 100 crores along with 100 crores pay interest also 18 percent into 45 days divided by 365 days so just calculate how much amount comes you know that much amount interest you know company will pay company will pay to the members now officer in default he will get punishment you know imprisonment up to two years and officer in default it's not officer in default here in this one case you know we will call director only director is liable not officer in default director who is in default so director who knows about the defaults but still not doing anything you know simply all directors of this company shall be punishable with imprisonment up to two years if he is a knowingly party to the default that's what i told you director in default imprisonment up to two years minimum zero days maximum two years and fine how much thousand for every day during such default continues suppose 15 days delay happened no come on pay 15,000 rupees the company shall be liable to pay simple interest at the rate of 18 percent per annum that's why you know i uh, multiplied that amount with 45 by 365 exemption from punishment you know sir delay is there sir but if the delay falls in these five categories if delay falls in the, under these five categories then there will be no punishment there will be no punishment sir what are those uh, cases sir first one you know operation of law operation of law suppose if you look at section 126 just now we discussed if you look at section 126 hmm, under section 126 uh, if transfer registration is pending sir registration of transfer is pending sir so don't pay dividend to either of the parties keep it pending you know keep it transferred to unpaid dividend account you know law it's law is telling you don't pay to don't pay any party don't pay to sorry don't pay amounts to any party so in that case 50 days or 60 days companies are not liable to pay any interest on it next one specific directions could not be complete suppose you know member told you know don't issue checks in my name you just directly transfer amount to my account you know neft net electronic funds transfer you just transfer amounts to me directly and you know he mentioned one account number ma so company took that account number and that account number is not uh, you know while entering that account number the so pop-up message came account number wrong so company unable to comply those directions and company has already communicated the same with the member the two conditions should be satisfied there should be a specific direction non-compliance and next one sorry not compelled and same shall be communicated to the member now you know delay is not from company side delay is from member side so delay is from member side so how can you expect company to pay 18 percent interest disputed ownership you know member got deceased and he is having a two sons son one son two now there is a dispute between son one and son two son one is telling that i am a nominee i am the nominee son two is telling that no 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 sorry son one is telling i am the legal representative i am the elder son son two is telling i am the nominee i am eligible for dividends so there is a dispute with respect to ownership now don't pay dividend to either of the parties keep it pending no need to pay any interest adjusted against the dues adjusted against dues suppose you know company issued shares ma partly paid up and you know company made calls on shares one member particularly one member he is holding 1000 shares and you know two rupees didn't pay he didn't pay two rupees to the company you know two rupees total 2000 rupees calls in arrears is there from this member and now company declared a dividend of uh, two rupees ma company declared dividend how much two rupees now he is holding thousand shares right thousand into two total two thousand rupees so company didn't pay single rupee ma company adjusted these two thousand against calls in arrears now is this a legal adjustment is this, is this a valid adjustment yes so if you adjust against legal dues then also company is not liable to pay any interest next one default in process by others you know mistake is not on company company you know company uh, transferred pay amount ma amount is debited in company bank account but the same amount is not credited to the member's account due to bank system failure or company issued dividend warrants because of postal strike or you know covid lockdown the the warrants didn't receive uh, the warrants didn't uh, you know sorry members didn't receive those warrants within the time so this is you know a delay not from company side delay happened due to some other reasons not from company end the delay is not within the control of the company so in that case also no need of payment of dividends no need of sorry no need of payment of interest on the dividends no need to pay any interest on those dividends understood so very frequently you know this point you know specific directions could not be compelled so this point was tested i think two times in previous examinations clear so with this dividends completed ma with this dividends completed just give one time reading ma so don't ignore this chapter very small chapter 
scoring chapter understood everyone next topic accounts of companies section 128 to 138 uh, examination point of view minimum 6 marks you can expect 6 marks from this chapter lengthy and moderate chapter ma so i'll cover all the provisions that are important for examination so i'll start with section 128 provisions related to books of accounts first of all you know applicability of section 128 ma applicability you know it is applicable to every company whether it is a private company one person company public company small company government company all companies you know all companies has to follow section 128 as per section 128, you know, every company shall prepare books of accounts and other relevant books and records and financial statement for every financial year. So every company, every financial year. And books of accounts should give true and fair view. Yes, books of accounts uh, will express true and fair view only if you maintain them under double entry system. Both credit and debit aspect you have to record and you have to follow accrual basis, not cash basis. Remember these two points. Double entry system and accrual basis. Automatically, books of accounts will express true and fair view. So, state of affairs of the company, including branch offices and books, shall also explain the transactions affected both at register office and its uh, branches. Simply writing entries is not sufficient. Supporting evidences should also be there. Accrual and double entry system, accrual basis. So, income generated, expenses incurred, sufficient. No need of cash receipts, no need of cash payments. You need to record all those entries in the books of accounts. You know, income incurred. When risk and reward is transferred, you know, it is a correct point to record sale entry. Next, double entry system. Dual aspect of debit and credit. You need to record. Next, coming to the definition of books of accounts. You know, books of accounts are, covers only four things. Books of accounts means don't write, you know, general ledger, huh? subsidiary books, trial balance. This will not come under books of accounts. You know, books of accounts cover four items. One is receipts and payments. Next one, sales and purchases, assets and liabilities. Next items of the cost as may be prescribed under section 148. So this point is applicable only to the companies uh, to which section 148 is applicable. Section 148 companies is required to maintain uh, cost records. Remaining entities, you know, ABC common, receipts and payments, sales and purchases, uh, and then uh, assets and liabilities. So books and paper is a broader definition. Books and paper includes books of accounts. Extra items, you know, MOA, AOA, agreements, ochers, deeds, documents, minutes, registers, all these put together we call books and paper and book or paper. So book and paper includes books of accounts. Sir, maintenance, you know, place of keeping these books of accounts, sir. First priority registered office, ma. Registered office. Second option, you know, after getting board approval and filing of this uh, information with ROC within seven days of board approval, you can maintain these books of accounts at any place in India. My registered office, you know, my register, my company registered office is situated at Hyderabad. First, I need to maintain books of accounts at Hyderabad registered office. Second option, you know, after getting board approval, board resolution, you can maintain these books even in Delhi, Kolkata, Hyderabad, uh, no, uh, Bangalore, Chennai. Subject to two, two conditions. One is board approval. Second one, filing of information with ROC. What is the time limit? Seven days. Next, branch office. So branches, you know, yes, today, you know, expansion activities are happening through branches only. So company, main office, head office at one location, branches, other locations. Now, you know, there is obligation on branch office also. Branch offices are required to maintain books of accounts. And uh, periodically, they need to submit uh, summarized returns. Summarized returns, you know, they need to submit uh, periodically, you know, quarterly. They need to provide summary form of returns to uh, registered office. So registered office. At register office, we need to maintain books of accounts related to head office as well as branch offices. Understood. So, company shall prepare books, books and paper, financial statements. So, it should be placed at register office of the company or any other place in India as the board of directors may decide. And they are open for inspection for directors. So, coming to our company, the director or inspect, uh, director, uh, sorry, director can inspect our company books of accounts. With respect to subsidiary company books, sir. You know, a director authorized by the board, director authorized by the board can inspect books of accounts of the subsidiary. See, inspection of books of accounts of subsidiary by a person only on authorization by board directors. And these books of accounts shall be preserved for a period of eight years. Failure in compliance, then fine 50,000 rupees. 
So this is the case, you know, where members approval is not required. Books of accounts in order to shift from register office to other location in India, no need of members approval, only board approval is sufficient. And remember my dear students, point uh, one point, you know, members are not allowed to inspect books of accounts. Members can inspect financial statements and related documents. Members had no power to inspect books of accounts. That's the reason members approval is not required. Board approval is sufficient. And within seven days, you have to file that information with ROC. Filing information with ROC is sufficient. Next one. The inspection by the directors. I told you any director with respect to our company C Limited, any director during business hours can carry inspection activities. But coming to the subsidiary company, not every director, not any director, only director who is authorized by the board. First of all, why we inspect subsidiary company books of accounts? So we want to know whether you know company is following uh, you know LIFO or FIFO method for valuing closing stock, depreciation, straight line method or WDB. Why? Because our company, if it is a holding or holding to another company, you know, suppose we are having subsidiary company. The holding company is required to prepare consolidated financial statements. In consolidated financial statements, we will consider the figures of S Limited. So now S Limited, what methods they are following in valuing closing stock, in valuing, you know, fixed assets, what kind of, what method of depreciation they are following. So to get knowledge of these things, inspection is required. Now with respect to subsidiary company, only a director who got authorization from board will carry inspection activities. So while you know director while doing inspection, officers of the company, employees of the company should provide 100% assistance to the director. So whatever director asks, you know, employee or officer should provide that information. Next coming to the branches located outside India, you know, uh, with respect to branches located outside India and financial information of the such branches, you know, director is having power to get that information. The company branch should produce that information to the director within 15 days of date of receipt of a return request. And director can seek information only individually, not by or through his agent, attorney holder or representative. So director, director representative is not permitted to inspect books of accounts. Only director in his individual capacity is permitted to inspect books of accounts. So total ma, if you look at uh, this question, you know, if you look into this question, three aspects, you know, head office books of accounts, subsidiary and branches located outside India. So with respect to company books, any director can carry inspection activities with respect to subsidiary company, only director who got permission from the board, who got authority from board can carry inspection activities. Now with respect to outside India, financial information with respect to branches outside India, you know, director can request financial information and officers and employees are located at that oh no sorry officers and employees of that branch should provide that information within 15 days of a written request next sir how long i should preserve these books ma eight years eight years last eight years books of accounts i need to maintain or current year books of accounts i need to maintain next eight years both are same both are same last eight years you have to maintain books of accounts you have to maintain books of accounts with respect to last eight years if company is incorporated less than eight years, suppose incorporation happened in the year 2020, right now we are in the year 2023. Now, how can you expect company to maintain last eight years books of accounts? So it's the existence, period of existence is less than eight years. In that case, no need to maintain eight years books of accounts. It is sufficient if you maintain books of accounts from date of incorporation onwards. Once again, I repeat, last eight years books of accounts you, know, you have to maintain or current year books of accounts you have to maintain for next eight years. Both are same. Effect is same only. Effect is same only. But you have to write a first point. So company is required to maintain books of accounts with respect to last eight years immediately preceding the relevant financial year. Right now we are in the financial year 2023-24, right? So last eight years. So 22-23, 21-22, 20-21, 22-23. Next one, 19-20, 18-19. Hmm, 17, 18, 16, 17, 15, 16, so 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So from 2015, 16 financial year onward, onwards, you know, you have to maintain these books with respect to current year. Suppose next year, 24, 25, then no need to maintain 15, 16 books of accounts. It is sufficient if you maintain books of accounts from 16, 17 onwards. That's it. Next one. Suppose, you know, if government ordered company so you have to maintain books 
not for eight years you have to maintain books for 12 years in that case that company particularly that company has to maintain books of accounts related to last 12 years so government central government government of india has is having power to increase the time limit with respect to particular companies not all companies you know government by issuing a, an order it will order the company to maintain books of accounts for a longer period longer than eight years and you know persons responsible under section 128 they are managing director full-time director in charge of finance cfo any other person of a company charged by board with the duty of complying provisions of section 128 so what is the reason of reading these person's names very simple violation of section 128 these four people will get punishment will get reward reward is you know less than not less than 50,000 rupees fine but which may extend to 5 lakh rupees next one sir can i maintain books of accounts in electronic form you know in a sap form in tally tally erp9 hmm? oracle java etc can i maintain books of accounts in electronic form you can maintain books of accounts in electronic form provided you have to satisfy all the following conditions conditions are those books of accounts which are maintained in electronic mode should remain accessible in india in one attempt there is a question for two marks ma companies maintaining books of accounts in electronic mode shall remain accessible in a, a country outside india remain accessible in a place outside india permitted or not permitted not permitted they shall remain accessible in india understood next one audit trail compulsory so this is a particular feature ma uh, you know audit trail it gives you information regarding you know when the transaction was recorded when the transaction got modified who recorded the transaction who deleted the transaction that complete information system will provide you that feature we name it as or we call it as audit trail you know it is a compulsory with from with effect from first day of april 2023 so from first april of 2023 onwards it is a mandatory obligation on every company to maintain audit trail if they maintain books of accounts in electronic mode. Next one, retention in original format. In which format you recorded entries in electronic mode? In that format only the books of accounts should be retained. And information received from branch office shall not be altered. So no modifications permitted. Next, legible form. Legible form. So I entered figures, you know, in numbers, Indian numbers. Later when I open system, you know, uh, Chinese numbers, Japan numbers are getting appeared. Is it an illegible form? No, 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 no. Understandable form. Next one, storage and retrieval. So storage capacity and as well as retrieval backups should be there. So every periodically you have to take up backups. Ma. So periodically it is daily basis. So like these points are very important from MCQ point of view. So daily backup is compulsory. And you know, if uh, you are maintaining books of accounts in a cloud server, you know, uh, in an electronic mode only, but the cloud server is not with you. Some service provider is providing that services. Some service provider is providing that services. Then you have to furnish the details of service provider. Next one, write about definition and concept of financial statements. You know, definition, financial statements cover five aspects. Ma. Balance sheet, profit and loss account, cash flow statement, statement of changes in equity. So it helps you uh, to look into the matters of you know promoters contribution promoters shareholding and shareholding by persons other than promoters so if there is any change you can observe by looking at this statement next one explanatory statements explanatory notes or explanatory notes shortcut we call it as notes to accounts notes to accounts however you know opc small company dormant companies you know inactive companies private company being a startup may not include cash flow statement beginning of this marathon lecture small company benefits i told you no need to maintain cash flow statement sorry no need to prepare cash flow statement one of the reporting responsibility eliminated next one so these exemptions are possible only if company is regular in filing a annual returns with roc as well as copy of financial statements with a roc and financial statements should be presented in schedule 3 format and financial statements should be prepared in accordance with accounting standards so for preparation of financial statements you need to comply accounting standards for presentation of financial statements you need to comply schedule 3 understood next one 
write about concept of financial year this concept i already told you in management and administration chapter the company is incorporated on or after first day of the january of year then period ending on 31st day of march of following year next year next calendar year 31st march of next year will be the financial year closure date in other cases 31st march of every year is the closure of financial year accordingly we calculated due dates for first agm next one suppose you know your company is an holding company or your company is a subsidiary company and your holding or subsidiary companies are located outside india you are a subsidiary your holding company is located in canada and this holding company is preparing financial statements for a period you know jan to december they are following jan to december as a financial year now you are asking me to follow april to march so for the purpose of consolidation again i need to prepare financial statements related to jan to december so once again a burden on me so in such cases you know subsidiary company can request you know government central government sir my holding company is following different year sir so uh, permit me to follow different year so if government gives permission then you can follow jan to december suppose sir myself holding company i am having 10 subsidiaries sir i am having 10 subsidiaries in canada all these 10 subsidiaries are following jan to december ka cal calendar year as a financial year sir so if i follow april to march again for preparing consolidation of financial statements you know for the purpose of consolidation only this concept is all about consolidation my holding company in order to prepare consolidation again you know i need to prepare jan to december my subsidiary companies has to prepare financial statements for april to march in order to prepare consolidation financial statements of my entity so instead of uh, uh asking all these 10 companies to follow april to march so permit me to follow jan to december year sir so i'll follow jan to december year as a financial year so if government gives permission holding company in india is permitted to follow jan to december as a financial year understood next one write about preparation and presentation of financial statements i told you preparation should be according to accounting standards presentation should be according to schedule 3 so if you comply these two norms automatically financial statements express true and fair view but this accounting standards schedule 3 these conditions are not applicable to big companies sir big companies you didn't give any definition no sir big companies means banking i means insurance g means generation or supply of electricity generation or distribution of electricity under section 133 and shall be in the form or forms as may be provided for different class of companies in schedule 3 so non applicability insurance banking electricity i told you right generation or supply of electricity so to any other class of companies for which a form of financial statement has been specified in or under the act governing such class of companies but still following the respect to schedules following the respect to act still you know those financial statements will express true and fair view only and there is a condition if you want to uh, if you don't want to follow any particular accounting standard or if you want to uh, come out of schedule 3 suppose you know not able to follow accounting standards best example valuation of inventory inventory should be valued at uh, cost or nrb whichever is lower your closing stock nrb is very less but still you are following cost as per accounting standard 2 you need to follow nrb which or is this you know you have to you have to show the figure nrb but you are showing cost so why what is the reason for such deviation first you need to mention the deviation and you have to tell what is the purpose of uh, not following accounting standard 2 and impact impact you know because of non compliance of accounting standard 2 so my actual cost is 1 lakh nrb is 60000 still i am showing 1 lakh so the actual impact is 40000 40000 i am overvaluing the inventory i am making over valuation of inventory amount how much 40000 rupees so like that you know you have to disclose that matter next one laying of financial statements at every annual general meeting yes i told you under ordinary business members uh, you have to present financial statements in the annual general meeting and members will approve those financial statements consolidated financial statements you know every company having subsidiary or subsidiaries and associate and associate then this company is required to prepare consolidated financial statements consolidated financial statements is nothing but individual stand alone financial statements plus subsidiary financial statements addition 
consolidation of uh, accounts consolidation consolidated financial statements we are having problems right to solve problems also next one next one so there is one exception ma tricky point i need to discuss that point exemptions from preparation of cfs exemption from preparation of cfs cfs means not cash flow statement consolidated financial statements so if all these three conditions are satisfied then no need to prepare consolidated financial statements one is it is a wholly owned subsidiary you know our company c limited ma it is a wholly owned subsidiary or is a partially owned subsidiary of another company and all its other members including those not otherwise entitled to vote have having been intimated in writing and for which the proof of delivery of such intimation is available with the company do not object to the company not presenting consolidated financial statements condition 1 what is this condition see our entity is already a subsidiary to another entity h limited first of all we is having subsidiary company ma or c limited is having subsidiary then carefully c limited is having a subsidiary company now c limited actually it is required to prepare consolidated financial statements in one situation no need to prepare consolidated financial statements what is that situation first thing it is a subsidiary either wholly owned subsidiary of another company or normal subsidiary to another company in that case you know c limited has to communicate that intention with our remaining members also see this time we are not preparing cfs and all the members of the c limited should approve it okay we have no objection no need of preparation of consolidated financial statements second one this c limited must be an unlisted company the c limited must be an unlisted company suppose c limited if it is a listed company then exception will not apply compulsorily c limited is required to prepare consolidated financial statements next one ultimate holding company you know h limited ultimate holding company prepares and files cfs its ultimate or any intermediate holding company files consolidated financial statements with the registrar which are in compliance with applicable accounting standards suppose h limited sir it is it is preparing consolidated financial statements covering the figures of c limited covering the figures of s limited sir then c limited is exempted see three conditions c limited has to fulfill one is c limited should get approval from its members c limited must be an unlisted company and a company which is holding c limited is required to prepare consolidated financial statements is required to file consolidated financial statements with roc in that particular situation our company is exempted from preparing consolidated financial statements next non compliance of accounting standard india is i told you so deviations should be reported reason for such deviation and financial effects and government is having a power to exempt certain class or class of companies from following accounting standards and schedule 3 so far you can see banking company insurance company electricity companies are not required to follow them and moreover certain exceptions you know if you look at uh, defense companies defense companies are not required to comply Uh, you know segment reporting segment reporting accounting standard is not required common sense ma segment reporting you have to disclose you know value of stock lying at each and every segment now if a defense equipment company if if it disclose like you know in mumbai we are having 20 equipments in visakhapatnam we are having 10 equipments you know in uh, chennai we are having some 20 ve- mel- 20 vehicles 20 military vehicles if they disclose that information if they file that information with rbs it becomes public information even terrorists can download that information and terrorists will attack our military bases so companies engaged you know government companies which are engaged in production of defense equipment no need to follow accounting standard regarding segment reporting and this benefit is available only if that government company is regular in filing financial statements with rbs and annual returns with roc so these two conditions they need to fulfill next penal provisions ma same under 128 we discussed you know penal provisions same privilege same penalty under 129 managing director whole time director in charge of finance cfo person charged by the board with the duty of complying with the requirements of the section in the absence of any of these officers then all the directors shall be punishable with respect to violation of section 129 imprisonment up to 1 year or fine 50000 to 5 lakhs or both next periodical financial results you know this is a, a latest amendment you now this section is not part of original companies act 2013 very recently this section was incorporated 
according to this uh, section 129a apart from preparing financial statements you know uh, annually annually you are required to prepare periodical financial statements say for suppose quarterly and this is not a new section sorry this is not a new provision every listed company according to sebi norms is required to prepare quarterly financial statements and required to file this information with uh, stock exchanges now this concept was made uh, you know this concept was introduced for other companies also unlisted companies also required to follow this uh, concept so they are they are required to prepare periodical financial statements so periodical results limited review not complete audit you know only limited review and that information you need to file with roc within a period of 30 days of completion of relevant period understood so q1 quarter 1 completed right so by 30th july file the information with roc next reopening of accounts on court order or tribunal order under section 130 and next one you know 131 is all about you know uh, revision of financial statements revision of board of directors report so you can look at this chart ma section you know 130 see ma four parties any of these four parties repeat any of these four parties central government income tax authorities sebi any other person concerned statutory regulatory body so four persons are there fifth person any other person having interest so if they are of opinion that you know if they are having a opinion that financial statements are prepared fraudulently sir so actually the profit will be 200 crores but company reported only 20 crores sir in order to avoid taxes or actually company is a loss making company sir but in order to attract investors in order to attract investors they disclosed a profit of 20 crores sir the so financial statements are prepared fraudulently sir so if they are having that opinion you know they had power to file an application with a, either court or tribunal so please open reopen the financial statements sir so we'll look into the sales we'll look into all the expenses so we'll arrive at correct figures so based on correct financial statements will be prepared you know this happened uh, in uh, sachem computers uh, scam uh, sachem computer scam this this section was uh, implemented you know no court or tribunal will pass an order to the effect that yes you can reopen books of accounts you can reopen books of accounts so this is possible only under two cases one is earlier accounts prepared in fraudulent manner or efforts of the company were mismanaged you now board of directors diverted certain funds to other related entities or to other countries and they are claiming those amounts as expenses so we had a doubt with respect to company financial statements so please permit us to reopen books of accounts so court or tribunal is having a power to order for reopening of books of accounts then you know notice will be served to the applicants okay so we'll take representation you know we'll take representation into the consideration of if any and we'll pass order to reopen books of accounts and the re revised accounts shall be final so for reopening you know maximum period is 8 years ma 8 years immediately preceding the current financial year why because under section 128 we discussed you know company is required to maintain last 8 years books of accounts right so reopening is also permitted for 8 years reopening is also permitted for 8 years beyond 8 years not possible however if a government already uh, gave an order you know ordered company to maintain books of accounts for 12 years in that case you know revision or reopening of books of accounts is permitted up to 12 years a question came on this section ma I think uh, 2022 in 2022 a question came on this concept sebi or you know income tax authority filed an application with a uh, court or tribunal in order to reopen particular company books of accounts and they are requested a uh, court to order in order uh, to order company to re reopen its books for the last 11 years for the last 11 years so is it permissible or not permissible the answer is not permissible why up to 8 years reopening is permitted logic is simple company is required to maintain books of accounts only with respect to last 8 years next one voluntary revision of financial statements voluntary revision of financial statements for this also we are having a chart we we'll look into the chart see section 130 a revision reopen of books of accounts you know who can file application whether income tax sebi government or you know statutory body 
or any other person but coming to section 131 you know revision of accounts here who will file application sir you know only directors will file application directors will file an application with the tribunal sir you know a particular year financial statements particular year board report are not in compliance with uh, section 129 and 134 sir so please uh, give us approval in order to revise the financial statements in order to revise board reports sir now you know tribunal before giving approval you know tribunal will give notices to uh, you know government of india income tax department everyone you know government of india income tax department see particular company is asking for uh, revision of financial statements particular company is asking for revision of financial statements so if you have any objection please come and file your objections if you want to verify company books of accounts you can come and you can uh, look into the financial statements you can look into the board report it's up to you so board if they are of opinion that financial statements or board report is, uh, doesn't complied or didn't prepared in accordance with section 129 or section 134 then they can file application with the tribunal so tribunal before giving approval it will consider the recommendations of government of india as well as income tax authority and you know revision is possible only once in a year only one time revision is permitted second time third time revision not permitted and that revision is subjected to last three financial years only beyond three years you can't go so if you ask me sir differences between uh section 130 and section 131 section 130 and 131 you know 130 four people can be applicants you know there is a uh, uh, sorry central government hmm, income tax authority sebi statutory body any other person coming to 131 who can file applications are only board of directors section 130 is applicable you know if financial statements are prepared fraudulently board repair and then affairs of the company affairs of the company are mismanaged so let me write here why unnecessary confusion ma so section 130 reopening of books of accounts section 131 a revision of uh, financial statements so applicant applicant so here you can see central government next one sebi hmm. next income tax authority next any statutory body but coming to revision of financial statements you know board of directors will file application sir with whom with whom application with whom with whom under 130 application can be filed with either court or national company law tribunal whereas under 131 you know application can be filed with only tribunal ma and you know when sir when section 130 when it will be applied sir you know financial statements are prepared fraudulently and next one affairs of the company have been mismanaged affairs of the company are not managed properly sir mismanaged these two circumstances coming to the section 131 you know financial statements board report financial statements are not prepared according to section 129 board report uh, we didn't complete section 134 next one coming to the time period ma coming to the time period so reopening of uh, books of accounts is possible for eight years revision of financial statements is possible only for three preceding financial years are you all getting my point students so these are somewhat differences between uh, you know now 130 and 131 uh, remaining points just you one time reading ma so crux of the section i explained you crux of the section i explained you next one nfra not that much not that much important of course there is a question uh, one time there is a question from this section but not that much important why because this is not a practical concept this is a theoretical concept you have to buy heart you have to remember and you have to reproduce in examination so constitution of nfra national financial reporting authority of india so statutory body right you know statutory authority statutory authority uh, i told you right under deposits chapter i told you funds received you know from, from government state government local authority statutory authority okay so nfra shall perform its functions through such divisions as may be prescribed so if you look at functions of nfra maintain details of particulars of the auditors so details of the auditors next one recommendations to the central government with respect to accounting policies accounting standards auditing policies auditing standards 
Next one, monitor and enforce compliance with accounting standards and auditing standards in such manner as may be prescribed. The first one, you know, uh, it will maintain details of the auditors. It will give recommendations to the government with respect to formulation of accounting policies, auditing policies, uh, auditing standards, accounting standards. The next one, you know, monitoring whether all the companies and all the auditors complying these uh, norms. Next one, italic content just give one time reading, not relevant, not important for examination. Italic content just give one time reading. Oversee the quality of services of the professionals associated. So, you know, uh, auditor has to express an uh, opinion on the financial statements, whether they are free from material misstatements or not. So whether auditor is negligent or other auditor is uh, uh, providing, you know, quality to services or not, you know, monitoring. Next one, promote awareness in relation to the compliance of accounting standards and auditing standards. So whenever new standard comes into the picture, you know, impact of the standard, how to follow it, how to complete, just promote awareness uh, programs. Next, cooperate with the national and international organizations of independent audit regulators in establishing and overseeing adherence to accounting standards and auditing standards. Next, finally, you know, perform such other functions which are necessary and incidental to the aforesaid functions. For following above functions, we need staff, sir. Okay, recruit staff. We need branch officers, sir. We need branches in each and every state. Okay, establish your branches in each and every state. Like that. Next one. Who is having power to constitute NFRU, sir? You know, government, ma. central government is having power to constitute NFRU and to delegate powers to the NFRA. Next, powers of NFRA. So, power to investigate. Next one. It will have same powers that are vested in the civil court. You know, conducting investigation proceedings. Next one. Uh, discovery and production of books of accounts. Summoning and enforcing the attendance. You know, issuing summons to uh, people. So, you need to come to... Uh, office so by so and so time so and so place and you need to produce uh, documents and information so inspection of any books registers and other documents issuing commissions commissions is not money ma it's a notice intimations okay notices so issuing commissions for examination of witness or other documents in case of any professional misconduct or any other misconduct you know nfra is having a power to levy penalty so if any auditor commits default with respect to his duties, so auditor is subject to the punishment, you know, not less than one lakh, which may extend to five times of uh, fees received in case of individuals, not less than five lakh rupee, but which may extend to ten times of fees received in case of uh, firms. So if it, uh, if auditor, you know, if a partnership firm is acting as an auditor, firm of auditors or individual auditor, individual auditor, punishment maximum one lakh rupee, one lakh rupee. Not less than 1 lakh rupee, right? It's okay. So minimum 1 lakh rupee and maximum 5 times of the fees. The next one, you know, with respect to form of auditors, you know, it is 10 times. 10 times of the fees received or 5 lakhs. At the same time, an FRA is also having power to debar the member, you know, uh, ban period. So for example, 5 years, you are not permitted to do practice related activities. 5 years, you can't audit any entity. 5 years, you can't provide any consultancy services to any entity like that you know debarring member from institute and still you know if you had any objection you can file appeal with a uh, national company law appellate tribunal appellate tribunal against orders of the nfra understood next one so debarring uh, the member of firm from being appointed as an auditor you know external auditor as well as internal auditor for any undertaking you know for any uh, entities Next one, performing any valuation as provided under section 247. So from these two activities, you will be debarred. For a period minimum how much? Minimum six months, maximum 10 years. If you are opposing NFRA order, if you want to oppose NFRA order, then you can file appeal in national company law appellate tribunal. Understood? So next one, administrative aspects of NFRA, you know, not important for exams. So I'm not revising this topic. Just give one time reading. That's it. Sufficient. You know, uh, who will be the members of the NFRA and what are the powers of uh, members of NFRA? Everything is there. Meetings of NFRA. So maintenance of books of accounts. Who will audit NFRA books? You know, annual reports, etc. etc. Not at all important, ma. If you had time, just give one time reading. Next one. 
write about class or class of companies covered under NFRA. So NFRA will regulate some companies, you know, what companies are? All listed companies, all listed companies, no exception. And coming to the unlisted company, paid up share capital minimum 500 crores or unlisted companies having turnover 1000 crores or more or unlisted public companies in aggregate, you know, outstanding loans, debentures, deposits of not less than 500 crores as on 31st March of immediately preceding financial year. Either of these conditions is satisfied, then unlisted public companies will come under the purview of NFRA. NFRA is having complete powers to monitor, to recommend and to issue any order against these companies. So special entities, you know, insurance, banking, electricity and companies regulated by special act for the time being enforced, body, corporate, no, all these entities are also under the scope of NFRA only. NFRA will closely monitor these entities. And entities referred by central government any other entity you know which is not covered above but if government notifies it then nfra will also monitor such entities so material sc or ac of the above so subsidiary companies or associate companies of the above simply related companies so already up uh, d uh, we, we saw four companies right listed company unlisted company satisfying any of the criteria and you know special entities and entities referred by central government. Now subsidiary companies to these entities, associate companies to these entities will also will also be monitored by NFRA. Understood? Now with respect to auditors of all these entities, you know, uh, definitely NFRA will monitor them. Next. Section 133. Section 133. So write about prescribing of accounting standards by central government under section 133 of Companies Act 2013. Actually, you know, one committee in ICI, ICI, uh, Accounting Standards, National Advisory Committee on Accounting Standards, I think, NACAS, NACAS, will formulate accounting standards, auditing standards and will recommend to ICI. ICA will recommend to NFRA. NFRA will make further recommendation to central government and central government will prescribe the standards of accounting, standards of auditing. And every company is required to prepare financial statements according to accounting standards. Except, I told you this one only, NACAS. Except, you know, banking company, insurance company, electricity companies. Is it clear, ma? Everyone. Everyone. Okay, fine. Next one, section 134. Section 134 covers two aspects. One is contents of board report. Second one is approval of financial statements and board report. So first one, you know, authentication of financial statements, simply approval of financial statements. So who is having authority to approve financial statements initially? You know, board of directors. The board of directors by passing board resolution, they will approve company standalone financial statements as well as consolidated financial statements. After that, it shall be signed by the following people. First one, in case company is having a chairperson and if the chairperson is authorized by the board, so he will sign the financial statements. So if chairperson is not authorized, then two directors out of which one shall be the managing director. And next, uh, CEO of a company, if appointed, CFO of a company, if appointed. CS of a company, if appointed. Suppose, sir, myself, private company, I'm not having company secretary, CFO, and then uh, CEO, sir. Then who will sign my company financial statements? You know, two directors. One shall be managing director. Understood? Next one, coming to one-person company. So, in one-person company, minimum one director is required. So, board resolution, board approval, not required, ma. Just uh, signing by one director is sufficient. And submit these documents to the auditor for audit. So auditor report shall be attached to every financial statements. Compulsory, you know, wherever you read the word financial statements, sir, are they audited financial statements or unaudited financial statements? The answer is audited financial statements. Why? Because we need to attach audit report to the financial statements. Once you are attaching audit report to the financial statements means the financial statements are audited ones. So company had no authority to circulate unaudited financial statements. Company have to circulate audited financial statements. See ma, something we call it as an attachment. That means, you know, it is not detachable. You can't separate it. 
Understood. A signed copy of every financial statement, including consolidated financial statements, if any, shall be issued, circulated, published along with a copy of notes to accounts, audit report, and board report. Next one, contents of the board report, ma. So contents of the board report. Board report shall be prepared based on the standalone financial statements, but not consolidated financial statements. If you look at company, you know TCS, Tata Consultancy Services. It is having more than 46 subsidiary companies, ma. If I'm not wrong, more than 50 subsidiaries it is having. So TCS is required to prepare individual financial statements. We call it as standalone financial statements. Next, consolidated financial statements, including the figures of subsidiary companies. Now, board report uh, shall always cover the matters related to standalone financial statements. Board report will include the figures of standalone financial statements, but not consolidated financial statements. You know, board report is nothing but a report prepared by the board of directors. It is a communication by the directors to the members. So, whatever directors want to tell to the members, so they will communicate all that matter through one report called board report. And that board report always uh, prepared based on standalone financial statements, but not consolidated financial statements. However, it shall cover, you know, it shall report on the highlights of the performance of subsidiaries, associate and joint venture companies. So simply highlights means, you know, what is the total turnover of the subsidiary company and what is the net profit of the subsidiary company. And next one, what is the paid up share capital of the company, net worth of the company. So simply provide highlights, highlights in the board report. Next one, contents of the board report not important for exams ma so just i'll give a summary you know contents you know web address where annual return has been placed and how many meetings of uh, you know how many board meetings were conducted and who attended the meeting next one director responsibility statement so this one is important so contents of director's responsibility statement i'll discuss with you in the next question so details in respect of frauds reported by the auditors under subsection 12 of section 143 you all uh, know section 143 subsection 12 you know auditor while performing his duties if he suspect or if he came to know that a fraud happened if the fraud amount is you know one crore or more then auditor has to report to the government of india so he should write a letter you know addressed to secretary ministry of corporate affairs if the amount of fraud is just uh, you know less than one crore no need to report to government of india just report it to the company now you know uh, directors have to express their opinions on such matters so details in respect of frauds other than which are reportable to the central government next one statement on declaration given by the independent directors if company is having independent directors then you know you have to uh, get a declaration from independent director regarding his independence and the same shall be included in the board report next in case of a company covered under subsection 1 of section 178 you know, nomination and remuneration committee, stakeholder relationship committee, you know, company policy on director's appointment and remuneration, including criteria for determining qualifications, positive attributes, independence of a director and other matters provided under subsection 3 of section 178. So you have to cover these matters too. Next one, you know, with respect to auditor qualifications, you know, any reservation or adverse remarks made by the company auditor or, you know, company auditor or, you know, cost auditor or you know secretarial auditor you know company secretary so for all these uh, you know negative remarks so what you know board of directors are giving uh, answers so what are the explanations given by the board with respect to these qualifications reservation or adverse remarks done by the auditors in their audit report next one particulars of loans guarantees investments under section 186 so next one particulars of contracts or arrangements with related parties so whatever you know loans guarantees investments happen under 186 and next uh, contracts or agreements entered with related parties so all those documents information you know particulars you have to furnish in board report and then state of company affairs position of the company financial position of the company amount if any which it proposes to carry to any reserves under dividends i told you under uh, in dividends topic i told you there is no compulsion on company to transfer a portion of profits to reserves it is a completely left to the directors board of directors so if any word is used if any if they want to transfer to reserves so what is the amount the amount if any which it recommends should be paid by way of uh, dividends so one is you know retained earnings the other one is distribution of profits material changes and commitments you know that occurred between the end of financial year and to which the financial statements relate to and the date of report generally you know board reports uh, were prepared after closure of the year you know some three to four months after 31st March. If you look at board report, 
you know you'll get dates like this 31st march 2023 is a closure of financial year and if you look at the board reports you know board reports will have date like this you know 30th july 2023 now the point is during this time period any material changes happened in the company material changes important significant any changes in the company suppose managing director of the company resigned from his post on 1st may 2023 so up to 31st march he is the managing director subsequently he resigned so like that you know you have to report in board report next one conservation of energy technology absorption foreign exchange earnings and outgo so this is all about you know future related points so how uh, what kind of equipments you are using in order to con in order to save energy for future generations technology absorptions and foreign exchange earnings exports revenue imports revenue outgo simply imports in exports such manner as may be prescribed next one statement indicating development and implementation of a risk management policy for the company including identification therein of elements of the risk it's like an antivirus in our computer system so what antivirus will do it will detect virus and it will remove virus from our system so risk management policy you know it's a policy prepared and implemented by the directors in order to identify the uh, possibilities of risk and eliminate the risk uh, at root level itself the details about policy developed and implemented by the company on corporate social responsibility initiatives taken during the year so this is all about csr we'll discuss it under section 135 in case of listed company and every other public company having paid up share capital as may be prescribed how much amount it is 25 crores or more see listed company without any limit listed company without any limit unlisted public company you know unlisted public company if it's a paid up share capital is uh, 25 crores or more then a statement indicating the manner in which formal annual evaluation of performance of the board its committees of individual directors has been made so annual evaluation it's like you know self-evaluation so to what extent company is achieving success in fulfilling its objectives and what, to what extent you know they are able to fulfill the promises made to the members of the company so during the year what kind of activities we initiated up to uh, what extent we completed the works it's all about self-evaluation and this self annual evaluation is applicable only to two companies one is listed company second one is unlisted public companies having paid up share capital 25 crores or more next one such other matters as may be prescribed next one ma you know with respect to uh, sorry such other matters as may be prescribed some matters were prescribed under rules rule 8 of company account rules 2014 if you look into it financial summary or highlights so simply i told you right paid up share capital next one turnover next one net profit net worth you know highlights next change in nature of business if any so during the year if company changed the nature of business punish the details details of the directors or kmp who were appointed or have resigned during the year so composition of board of directors statement regarding opinion of the board with respect to integrity expertise and experience of independent directors appointed during the year so simply it's a opinion from the directors with respect to independent directors integrity expertise and experience a name of companies which have become or ceased to be its subsidiaries so during the year it got two subsidiaries or you know it sold shares of subsidiary companies thereby a cessation of subsidiary relationship happened so those details you have to provide and the deposits details deposits details so details of deposits which are not in compliance with requirements of chapter 5 you have to include all this information details of significant and material orders passed by the regulators or courts or tribunals impacting the going concern status and company operations in future suppose you know company didn't pay gst amounts recently you know uh, i saw one uh, one notice you know revenue department of government of india issued notices to dream level so to pay taxes understood now you know uh, company challenged the notice in high court suppose if they win the case they are not required to pay any amount to the government of india if they lose the case then they are required to pay the amount to the government of india now if they are having sufficient funds to pay that much amount no problem sir they are not in a position to pay that much amount sir next what happens you know binding up proceedings will be initiated yes sir no so material cases you know in how it is impacting going concern status next one details in respect of adequacy of internal financial controls with respect to financial statements so internal financial controls one kind of risk management policy so are they working you know 
accurately adequately sufficient or not like that and next one you know disclosure with respect to maintenance of cost records as specified by central government uh, under section 148 so disclosures with respect to cost records the next one is statement that company has complied provisions regarding constitution of internal complaints committee under sexual harassment of women at workplace you know protection of women protection of women and next you know details of application made or any proceeding pending under insolvency and bankruptcy court next details of differences between amount of valuation done at the time of uh, you know one time settlement and valuation done while taking loan from banks or financial institutions along with reasons thereof so simply at the time of getting loan so you you valued your property and at the different time you know uh, after some time you valued the same property if any differences you found you have to report them in board report so don't worry ma you know this much lengthy question they won't ask you they won't ask this much lengthy questions this much lengthy questions for 2 to 3 marks okay so practically this chapter is important from practical practical questions point of view next one abridged board report ma so if you look at the points we covered so far so generally you know formal assessment formal annual evaluation subsidiary companies financial performance financial positions highlights of the subsidiary companies you know uh, joint venture companies everything we saw but these points are not relevant for small companies one person company why because one person company can't become a member of uh, another company one person company can't invest securities in body corporates can't invest uh, securities of a body corporate as yes or no small company it can't it should not have holding company it should not have subsidiary company are you getting my point so opc small companies you know they won't have holding companies they won't have subsidiary companies so why that information why we need to ask that information you know opc provide information of your subsidiary sub, uh, small company provide information of your uh, uh, holding company subsidiary company what is the need of asking them actually th these points are not applicable to them yes or no so the points we discussed so far which are not applicable to these entities no need to report them accordingly after removal of those points you know we get another board report and it is a abridged board report the abridged board report will have a only few points compared to normal other companies like you know web address number of meetings director responsibility statement and you know uh, 143 12 you know fraud less than 1 crore next one uh, every qualification reservation adverse mark uh, made by the auditor with respect to these qualifications so explanations given by the board state of company affairs financial summary or highlights material changes details of the directors who have been appointed or resigned details of significant and material orders passed by the regulators during the time period you know of uh, closure of financial year till the date of preparation of uh, board report so that's it ma other than that you know not required other information is not required so it will have only it will contain only 12 points that's it next one board report in case of opc so who will sign board report in case of opc single director signing a board report is sufficient so in case of opc the report of the board of directors to be attached to the financial statements under this section shall mean a report containing explanations or comments by the board on every qualification reservation adverse remark or disclaimer made by auditor in his report coming to the signing one director signing board report is sufficient in case of opc with respect to other companies it should be signed by at least two directors and one should be the managing director understood or by the director where there is only one director example opc coming to the financial statements you can see you know a chairperson if authorized by board or two directors one must be managing director next so ceo cfo cs if appointed but coming to board report coming to board report these many options you know these many people are not required only two directors signing board report is sufficient one should be managing director in case of opc single director signing board report is sufficient next punishment for contravention you know as usual company penalty relax officer in default penalty 50000 every year you know company is required to file financial statements with roc financial statements includes you know financial statements are also includes audit report as well as board report now you need to file audit report and board report with roc so central government uh, you know it will verify few documents on sample basis if it come to know that you know company violated the provisions of section 134 it didn't provide information related to subsidiaries it didn't provide information related to holding companies 
etc etc in that case you know government is having a power you know mca is having a power to levy penalty on the company penalty is 3 lakhs officer in default penalty 50000 rupees next one contents of a director's responsibility statement being a director some additional you know some duties are attached some duties were placed on you being a director you need to fulfill some responsibilities in that first responsibility while preparing financial statements you have to comply accounting standards sir i have a, i have complied accounting standards in preparation of financial statements next one accounting policies like you know with respect to depreciation straight line method return down value next coming to the valuation of closing stock you know uh, fifo first in first out lifo last in first out weighted average simple average do you remember these uh, you know methods of valuing closing stock and methods uh, of uh, depreciation right so first year whatever policies you implemented next year also apply the same policies then only you know users of financial statements will feel better in comparing the results in comparing the results they will feel better so compared to last year this time profit went up compared to last year this time sales went up you know apply accounting policies consistently in case if you are uh, you know if you don't want to apply previous year accounting policies then just report it report it you know in the following areas so we didn't apply the previous year financials you know previous year accounting policies due to these reasons and what would be the impact what would be the effect on the financial statements you clearly explain them next sir directors had taken proper and sufficient care for maintenance of adequate accounting uh, uh, records so whose responsibility maintaining ac uh, uh, accounting records ma directors so safeguarding the assets is also the uh, responsibility of director ma today member is coming to the company and he is just investing money in the company is not he is not eligible to participate in day to day affairs of the company why because separate legal entity company is separated members are separated company is separated owners are separated so it is the responsibility of the directors to take care of uh, assets of the company next one directors has prepared annual accounts on going concern basis as i told you previously if company is going concern assumption is appropriate then financial statements are prepared based on you know cost historical value basis if going concern assumption is not proper then you know uh, all the assets shall be valued at realizable values so directors have to prepare annual accounts on going concern basis if going concern assumption is appropriate the directors in case of listed company had laid down internal financial controls to be followed by the company and that such internal financial controls are adequate and were operating effectively next up, all these points already covered must safeguarding of assets company policies prevention and detection of fraud accuracy timely preparation of reliable financial statements next one the directors has devised proper systems to ensure compliance with provisions of all applicable laws you know for doing business in india you have to comply various laws and regulations example i'll tell you you know if you are a manufacturing entity you need to comply factory act you need to comply factory act next protection of environment related provisions next with respect to employees you need to apply you need to follow epf act employee state insurance act provision of gratuity act payment of gratuity act payment of bonus act minimum uh, pay, minimum wages act understood next the payment of wages act huh next one being a company you need to follow company act and you are earning a revenue so you need to pay income tax so income tax act next one uh, indirect taxes next if you are making any exports then you know custom duties so yes every time you have to comply all the applicable laws and regulations so now you know your director has to tell yes we devised proper systems so periodically we are verifying ourselves whether we are in compliance with all the applicable laws or not so if any deviation we are rectifying it like that you know director has to specify in its uh, in his director's responsibility statement so this is all about section 134 ma next one section 135 corporate social responsibility corporate social responsibility you know today company is doing business with a uh, various natural resources ma various natural resources if you take any oil companies oil uh, you know uh, petroleum diesel companies hmm so they are doing business from the raw material which they are getting from nature crude oil non renewable resources sir no so company is uh, carrying some manufacturing operations definitely it require labor so labor comes from society only and you know once uh, production is completed once finished uh, once product is finished now for selling the product you know 
company needs customers customers come from society only so today company is surviving only because of society yes or no now it's your responsibility to contribute something for the benefit of society every company sir no only companies covered under section 135 so what is the criteria to cover under section 135 one is you know net worth 500 crores or more you know every company whether it is a private or public whether it is a opc or you know small company a government company a listed company every company you know it is immaterial every company having net worth of 500 crores or more sir my net worth is 100 crores only sir next second condition turnover 1000 crores or more sir my turnover is 600 crores only sir and uh, our, our net profit 5 crores or more. Sir, my net profit is 5.1 crores, sir. That's it. CSR provisions will apply to you. You have to comply with section 135. The moment uh, section 135 is applicable, the next minute uh, you have to constitute CSR committee. Every company we can have maximum 15 directors. Suppose in our company also there are 15 directors. Out of 15, you know, Call three people, call three directors to form a committee called CSR committee. If your company is having independent director, then you know, out of three directors, one shall be independent director. So during the preceding financial year, any of these conditions satisfied, net worth 500 crores or more, turnover 1000 crores or more, net profit 5 crores or more, then CSR provisions shall apply to you. Accordingly, you have to constitute CSR committee. So now the strength of CSR committee should be three or more directors general rule. Coming to private companies, you will find only minimum two directors, right? So for private company, CSR committee can have two directors and no need of independent director. If independent director is there, then one independent director should participate in the, in the CSR committee. Next one, holding subsidiary company, foreign companies. Every company, including its holding subsidiary foreign company, you know, defined under section 2 clause 42, having its branch office or project office in India, you know, foreign companies having branch project offices in India, which fulfills the criteria provided in this section. And these rules shall apply, shall comply with the provisions of section 135 and these rules. Suppose, you know, PUBG is there. Initially, it is a foreign company. It is having a business in India. So we people, you know, for playing those games, we are depositing our money, we are paying some money. Now, you know, from India, if they're doing a business of, you know, turnover of 1000 crores or more, and in India, if their net worth is 500 crores or more. In India, if they're getting profit of 5 crores or more, then CSR is applicable to them also. So whatever revenue, whatever incomes they are generating from India, out of that uh, revenue, out of that profit, they need to spend certain portion on welfare of the society, on the development of the society. So meaning of net worth already told you under uh, deposits chapter, uh, paid up share capital plus reserves plus securities premium, minus uh, uh, accumulated losses not written off uh, minus miscellaneous assets uh, i told you right but it's not included revaluation reserves the revaluation reserves are not covered while calculating net worth so once you know csr is applicable to you the very next minute you have to constitute csr committee next one cessation of csr applicability sima for the current year, for the current year, financial year 2023-24, whether, whether CSR applicable or not, you have to look into the preceding financial year, that is 2022-23 balance sheet and profit and loss account for net worth, turnover and net profit. So you have to check on yearly basis. Previously, previously, for the last two, three years, if you are not complying, if you are not covered under a, a criteria, then you'll be given freedom, no need of uh, following this section. Right now, that provision is omitted. So every year you have to check preceding financial year figures. Suppose in preceding financial figures, you know, your net profit is 6 crores. Assumed uh, remaining two are within the limits only. Net profit 6 crores. Now for financial year 23-24, you have to spend money on CSR. Suppose for financial year 23-24, net profit came to 3 crores only, sir. Then 2024-25, no need of CSR, no need to comply CSR provisions, no need of CSR committee, no need of incurring CSR expenditures. Next one, composition of CSR committee, I told you, minimum three directors that committee should have. Minimum how many directors? Three directors. In case of private company, two directors are sufficient. In case of uh, listed companies you know, or unlisted companies having a, uh, you know, the independent director, then that independent director should also uh, participate in CSR committee 
just look these points ma you will only have clarity you will only get clarity the private company having only two directors then board shall constitute its csr committee with two of such directors next one with respect to foreign company covered under these rules the csr committee shall comprise at least two persons of which one person shall be specified under clause d of subsection 1 of section 380 of the act and other person shall be nominated by the foreign company so just look at this summary box you'll get clarity next one disclosure of csr committee so you need to disclose the details of csr committee so who are the members of csr committee you have to disclose those details in annual return next one duties of csr committee ma very simple frm fraud risk management no f stands for formulate policies recommend recommend csr policies to board of directors and ask them to contribute so this much amount for fulfilling these uh, activities m stands for monitor monitor the performance of the csr committee monitor the progress monitor the progress of this project so recommend next formulate recommend and uh, you know formulate and recommend it to the board csr policy recommend the amount of expenditure needed for fulfilling these activities and monitor csr policy of companies from time to time and their annual action plan you know the list of csr projects or programs that are approved to be undertaken in the areas are subject to specified in schedule 7 so schedule 7 will contain you know activities uh, related to csr ma you need to spend money on any activity which is specified in schedule 7 the manner and execution of such projects or programs modalities of utilization of funds and implementation monitoring and reporting mechanism impact assessment sir impact assessment means what you know you created csr committee for the purpose of education and you know you diverted some 60 crore funds for providing education now under impact assessment you know we will assess to what extent uh, this object we are achieving uh, completely so you know out of six crores how much money is reaching to the public uh, for the benefit of the public so you divert you know you simply separate you you kept six crores money separately for the welfare of uh, people by providing education now, out of six crores how much money spent and how many people got benefited so that assessment is nothing but impact uh, assessment next one duties of the board you know csr committee will recommend the expenditure will recommend the csr policy now it is the duty of board of directors to approve the csr policy and allot uh, allot the required funds uh, for meeting the project needs so activities ensure that activities are included in csr policy of the company and are undertaken by the company so display csr activities on its uh, website sir how much amount i should spend under csr sir two percentage of last three years profits suppose last three years profits you know three crores 5 crores, 15 crores. Now, with respect to current financial year, you just average it. Ma, 15 plus 5 plus 3 divided by 3. 2023 20, by 3. Okay, I'll make it as 4. Ma, by unnecessary confusion. 24 by 3, 8 crores. Now, on 8 crores, you need to apply 2 percentage. No need to spend 8 crores. Ma, your profit, your average profit is 2 crores. Sorry, your average profit is 8 crores. Then, how can you spend entire 8 crores on CSR? So out of eight crores, spend not less than two percentage. You know, at least uh, two percentage of average net profits made during three immediately preceding financial years on CSR. In case of new company, sir, first year of incorporation, sir, in the first year of incorporation only we got a net profit of ten crores, sir. Now last two years company is not in existence, right? So ten crores directly you take ten divided by one, so average ten crores, ten crores into two percentage. So it might be twenty lakhs, right? Yeah. Failure to spend the required minimum amount. So company failed to spend such amount, sir. Then disclose the same in board report. Whatever amount unspent, you know, just to transfer that amount to unspent CSR account, like unpaid dividend accounts. You have to open separate account called unspent CSR account. So unspent amount to the fund specified in Schedule Seven within a period of six months from the expiry of financial year. So right now we are in the financial year 2023-24, right? So last three years average profit is 20 crores. 20 crores into 2%, 40 lakhs you need to spend. Sir, so far I spent only 30 lakhs in this financial year, sir. Then remaining 10 lakhs you need to transfer to unspent CSR account. Uh, sorry, it's not unspent CSR account. Unspent CSR account is applicable for ongoing projects. So this is the case, you know, other than ongoing projects, right? Ongoing projects means, you know, projects having longer duration. 
multi year projects simply more than one year if a project requires time of more than one year we call it as ongoing projects so other than ongoing projects you have to spend money completely within the year or else within six months from the closure of financial year transfer that amount to the fund specified in schedule seven next one unspent amount for ongoing project unspent amount for ongoing projects in case of ongoing projects you know you need to transfer that amount to unspent csr responsibility csr account and such amount shall be spent by company in pursuance of obligation towards csr policy within a period of three years from the date of transfer no sir we didn't utilize within the three years then within 30 days from the closure of third financial year transfer amount to the fund account so very simple ma you need to decide whether the project is ongoing or not suppose if it is ongoing ongoing you didn't spend complete amount remaining amount is transferred to unspent csr account unspent csr account so you will be given three years time to use that fund three years completed but still you're not using that funds then within 30 days transfer to within 30 days from expiry of that three years transfer to fund specified under schedule 7 they are not ongoing projects are not ongoing project now any amount uh, remained with the company within six months of closure of financial year transfer the amount to fund directly so no need of unspent csr account clarifications not that much important ma just uh, clarifications just you one time reading so in that you know uh, one important clarification is one, one uh, important clarification is suppose if a company spent uh, you know uh, 10 percent of average profits on csr 10 percent profits it spent on csr ma in that case eight percentage they can they can carry forward to next years so next year even though they didn't incur the csr expenditure no problem out of 10 percent you know already you incurred 10 percent in the last year right so excess will be carried forward to next year excess amounts excess amounts you spent will be carried to the next year the next one administrative overheads ma see ma for uh, spending money on csr related activities definitely i need staff yes or no i need staff so i need to pay salaries to them and those people will visit projects regularly traveling expenses uh, salary expenses nothing but you know indirect expenses overheads so for meeting these expenses in order to fulfill csr provisions we call them as administrative overheads you can incur administrative overheads up to five percent of total csr expenditure suppose 40 lakhs is the amount kept aside for meeting csr expenses out of this five percent that means you know only two lakhs up to two lakhs you can incur administrative overheads beyond this if you incur we won't consider them under csr expenditure you need to spend additional amounts next one any surplus arising out of csr activities shall not form a part of business profits ma shall not form part of business profits suppose you know uh, providing education you know you constructed buildings school buildings and you know you appointed teachers and you are collecting some nominal fees for providing education now at the end of the year you know incomes you received is more than expenditures you spent on that uh, uh, education so there is there arises a surplus now you should not add this surplus to the business profit this surplus you have to invest on promoting the uh, same similar objects so those amounts are disqualified from declaration and payment of uh, dividends so treatment of exp excess expenditure spent i told you so immediate to succeeding three financial years carry forward option is there simple like income tax act you know if you have any business losses unspeculative business losses uh, those losses shall be carried forward for next eight years so next eight years if you get profit you can set up the losses with the profits so capital assets for csr activities so for csr activities if you purchase any capital asset sir can i purchase any capital asset yes you can purchase capital asset and that capital asset capital asset shall be held by you know the registration of capital asset shall be uh, in the name of you know section 8 company or registered public trust or registered society having charitable objects and csr registration number under sub rule 2 rule 4 is compulsory the beneficiaries of said of said csr project in the form of self help groups collectives entities or any public authority now ma you can uh, choose any activity specified under schedule 7 you can spend money on it you know that amount will qualify as csr expenditure that amount will qualify as csr expenditure but certain expenditures are excluded from csr expenditure ma that means even if you spend this much amount even if you spend this amount 
this amount will not be qualified as csr sir what are those activities sir you know normal course of business normal course of business activities undertaken in pursuance of normal course of business of the company just wait ha huh. suppose ma you started a dairy company ma a milk company and what you are doing you know for promotion of that business activities you are providing some goods on sample basis at free of cost free samples you are distributing free samples you are distributing now the point is sir can we can we uh, take that expenditure under csr expenditure no not permitted and next one myself you know educational institute company company providing educational services and you know my net profit during the year was 10 crores now i need to spend some portion of amount some sorry certain portion of profits on welfare of the society so now what i did you know i selected some 10 students you know uh, uh, from poor families you know the track record is very poor their family record is very poor now i selected 10 students i told them free education to you free education services to you see ma my primary business is education now if you select any students and giving scholarships to them who join in your institute so those activities will not qualify as csr expenditure those expenses will not qualify as csr expenditure but there is an exception you know with respect to covid pandemic you know dr reddy laboratories sun pharma companies you know sipla all these companies you know are, are already in drug business right so are already in medical businesses so now for development of a vaccine or a medicine in order to cure covid so if they spend any amount on experiments you know research and development so all these expenses shall form part of csr uh, expenditure only actually this is also a normal course of business only this also looks like normal course of business but this is permitted so a medical company spending uh, money on research and development related to development of vaccines drugs and medical devices particularly with respect to covid pandemic during the financial years 2021 21 22 22 23 so all those expenditures are eligible or qualify uh, no are qualified under csr subsequent years not qualified next any amount is spent on activities outside india outside india right you have to give priority to india you are earning profits from india you have to give priority to india so any activity undertaken outside india is not eligible csr activity next so donation to the political parties next one giving benefits to the employees sponsorship services all these are disqualified expenditures accordingly you should not consider them sponsorship activities ma supported you know uh, example you know byju sponsorship to indian cricket team yes or no india cricket team jersey if you observe you know byju they will uh, sorry so the dress code the shirts of indian cricket team sorry jersey jersey will have a byju symbol yes or no jersey will have byju symbol for that you know byju will pay some 4000 or 5000 crores to bcci every year now sir this 4000 or 5000 crores we are spending on sponsorship related activities can we account them under csr expenditure no next one statutory obligations activities carried out for fulfillment of any other statutory obligations under any law in force in india suppose if you look at section 8 companies you know they are having a statutory obligation they need to spend money compulsorily on the welfare of the society so like that you know if any company is having a statutory obligation like that so expenditure incurred on that statutory obligations will not be accounted as csr expenditure for example if i want to start a hotel business first and primary requirement is fssai license food license for getting food license i need to pay fees to the government of india central food license i need to pay fees to the government of india now payment of this uh, uh, you know statutory fees taxes will they come under uh, csr expenditure the answer is no so you have to remember these points my you know points excluded from csr expenditure very very important so with this provisions related to csr we completed ma first important point applicability next composition of csr committee 
next one you know uh, quantum of csr expenditure you know 2% of last 3 years average profits next one unspent csr money if it is related to ongoing project just transfer to separate bank account utilize it in the next 3 years failed to utilize in the next 3 years now within 30 days you have to transfer to the fund specified under schedule 7 if it is not ongoing project then you know within 6 months from the closure of financial year transfer unspent csr amount to fund specified under schedule 7 next one ma you know if company want to spend csr expenditure directly they can spend they can spend directly you know board shall ensure that csr activities are undertaken by company itself directly or indirectly through any section 8 company or through registered public trust or through society which is registered under section 12a and adg of income tax act 1961 you know exempted under section 10 subsection 23c clause 4 5 6 7 a so you can incur cxr expenditure through these entities also simply you know transfer amounts to these entities now these entities spending uh, money on the public sufficient you know you only directly spending on uh, uh, you only spending amount directly on the public we assume that you are spending that money on the public directly next one a company established under section 8 of the act or registered trust or registered society established by the central government or state government or any entity established under act of a parliament or state legislature you know statutory authorities next a company established under section 8 of the act or registered public trust or a registered society exempted you know under these sections having an established track record of at least three years in undertaking similar activities so you can select these entities and you can transfer money directly to these entities and these entities will spend money on the welfare of the society so we assume that you have complied the provisions of section 135 or you know you can collaborate with other companies also suppose you know reliance foundation is there tata foundation is there so collaborate with these companies and spend amount on uh, and amount related to corporate social responsibility that's fine to us so next remaining points you know just give one time reading ma remaining points are not that much important not that much important the applicability all these points are very very important and one more point with respect to multiple choice question you know impact assessment just i told you impact assessment so to what extent a company is fulfilling the objectives you know specified under csr so you know how many people are getting benefited through this csr activities so for doing that you know impact assessment is required but impact assessment is not compulsory for all the companies is it clear so every company having average csr obligation of 10 crore rupees or more csr obligation how much more 10 crore rupees or more in the three immediately preceding financial years shall undertake impact assessment through an independent agency of their csr projects having outlets of one crore rupees or more and which have been completed not less than one year before undertaking the impact study so companies having csr obligation 10 crores or more in the last three preceding financial years are required to undertake impact assessment and with respect to impact assessment yes you can incur expenditure maximum you know two percent of total csr expenditure or 50 lakhs whichever is less now people who carry impact assessment you have to pay a uh, remuneration to them right that remuneration amount shall not exceed you know two percent of csr expenditure or rupees 50 lakhs whichever is less next one ma schedule seven related activities just give one time reading just give one time reading that's it Next one, section 136, section 136. So do you remember section 1011 notice calling for meeting? You know, company has to give notice to all the members of the company. Huh? If any member is deceased, then you know, legal representative of the member. If any member become insolvent, then official SNA of the member. Next, uh, every trustee of the debenture holder as well as deposit holder and all the persons other than such members or trustee being a person so entitled to simply you know auditor of the company directors of the company so it is the duty of company to circulate audited financial statements you know along with audit report and board report at least 21 days before the date of uh, annual general meeting so simply notice related provisions ma 136 is similar to section 101 
so conditions for a period less than 21 days that means you know we call it as shorter notice so for shorter notice you need to get approval from the members sir what kind of approval sir Sima, majority number of members entitled to vote and uh, they should represent not less than 95 percent of paid up share capital entitled to vote at the meeting so if it is a company having SC means what company having share capital if a company is having share capital and if that company wants to circulate financial statements for a period less than 21 days so then prior approval from members is required and what kind of approval majority of members and they should possess at least 95 percent of paid up share capital at the time of giving approval and if it is a company not having share capital then members holding not less than sorry members having not less than 95 percent of total voting power shall give approval to the shorter notice so additional conditions for listed companies you know listed companies will have uh, unlimited members ma you know lakhs of members they can they, they may have lakhs of members so circulation they have to circulate they have to circulate but complete uh, set of financial statements you know uh, standalone financial statements consolidated financial statements so submitting all these reports to all the members definitely it's a cost making thing and time taking thing cost making as well as time taking thing so it is sufficient you know if they post if they post all these the statements and reports on company website and summarized form of you know uh, financial statement summarized form of statements it is sufficient to circulate summarized form of statements that's it so listed company publish on website a listed company shall also place its financial statements including consolidated financial statements if any all other documents required to be attached there to on its website which is maintained by or on behalf of the company so if you look here you know statement containing salient features of the documents in the prescribed form or copies of the documents as the company may deem fit is sent to every member of the company and trustee of the holders or any debentures issued by the company not less than 21 days before the date of meeting unless unless shareholder ask for full information full financial statements so initially we will send them abridged financial statements later if any member requests for full financial statements then company has to submit full financial statements to the requested member logic is very simple you know listed company will have unlimited members so if you look at itc you know it will it may have you know 3 million members 30 lakh members now 30 lakh copies you need to print it out and 30 lakh copies you need to circulate so cost thing costly thing next one time taking thing so to uh, you know to save money and to save time this provision came into picture next one every listed company having a subsidiary or subsidiary shall place separate audited accounts in respect of each of the subsidiary on its website if any and provide a separate audited or unaudited financial statements as prepared in respect of its uh, each of its subsidiary to any member of the company who asks for it the subsidiary information you have to provide to the members of the company foreign subsidiary same norms ma. foreign subsidiary so if foreign subsidiary financial statements are not available in english language then prepare financial statements in english language if audit is mandatory in foreign countries then you have to provide audited financial statements if audit is not mandatory then you have to provide unaudited financial statements that's it audit is not mandatory in that country then how so is there, there is no need of getting audited uh, understood next uh, nidhi company exempted ma nidhi company is exempted from provisions of section 136 no need of no need of circulation of financial statements just place it on uh, company notice board so at the registered office definitely you'll have notice boards so in that notice board you just place the financial statements so the people who is having interest in it or people who had adequate knowledge with respect to uh, accounting standards and schedule 3 they will come and they will look into the matters that's it so just go through this chart once so this chart is providing information with respect to section 136 complete information ma. every you know copies of audited financial statements including consolidated financial statements if any audit report other documents sent to every member of the company debenture holder trustee and other entitled persons what is the time limit sir at least 21 days before general meeting the circulation of financial statements for listed companies they can choose electronic mode public company where net worth is more than 1 crore and turnover more than 10 crores so dispatch of uh, physical copies two options are available to them uh, 
electronic mode or dispatch of uh, physical policies understood so with respect to electronic mode you know shareholders holding shares in dmat form and shareholders not holding shares in dmat form and where consent is given for electronic mode of documents then submit those documents in electronic mode in other cases you know deliver documents in physical copies only so the chart information is there under this question next one section 137 filing of financial statements with roc under section 137 so filing of uh, annual returns under section 92 we discussed already so what is the time limit ma within 60 days of agm if agm is conducted if agm is not conducted then within 60 days of due date of agm right due date of agm you have to file information with uh, you have to file annual returns with roc that is with respect to section 92 section 137 is all about filing of financial statements with roc sir what kind of financial statements are you know adopted financial statements sir when we call financial statements as adopted financial statements the answer is when members pass ordinary resolution approving the financial statements we call it as adopted financial statements so what is the time limit for filing adopted financial statements with roc sir you know 30 days of date of agm within 30 days of date of agm you have to file adopted financial statements with roc if agm is not conducted then you have to file unadopted financial statements with roc within the same time period 30 days of due date of agm 30 days of due date of agm sir agm conducted sir in that AGM financial statements were not approved because of so and so reasons sir. Then you know file unadopted financial statements with ROC within 30 days of uh, AGM. And you know conduct adjourned annual general meeting with respect to adoption of financial statements. So in adjourned annual general meeting if financial statements got adopted. Then again file adopted financial statements you know this time adopted. Last time unadopted. Last time unadopted financial statements you filed. Now you file adopted financial statements with ROC within 30 days of uh, approval. So XBRL extensible business reporting language ma. This is applicable to a few companies. And remember the criteria ma. Remember the criteria. So AOC4 is available in two ways. One is you know XBRL format. So if you want to open file which is uh, there in XBRL format, you must have uh, relevant softwares. Then only you can open this this AOC for other companies. You know normal form normal filing is sufficient. XBRL is not required. So XBRL is applicable to all listed companies and their subsidiaries. Next one unlisted company. If that company is having paid up share capital five crores or more, and if that company or or if that company is having turnover hundred crores or more. Or all companies which are required to prepare financial statements in accordance with IND AS. So if your company is falling within this category, then you have to file AOC4 under XBRL mode. Other companies, you know, other mode. Next one, XBRL is not applicable to these entities, even though you know they are listed. Suppose SBA is their listed company, XBRL is not applicable to them. Understood. Next one, non-banking financial companies, housing finance companies, companies engaged in the business of banking and insurance sector. So even though your paid up share capital is 5 crores or more, hmm, 5 crores or more, still no need to follow XBRL reporting method. Next one, once applicable, always applicable. Ma. So applicability is forever. Once you start filing under XBRL, so subsequent years, even though you are not fulfilling the criteria, but still you have to follow XBRL method of filing only. Next one, if the financial statements are not adopted, I told you, AGM conducted but financial statements are not adopted. So file them as unadopted financial statements as provisional, you know, temporarily take these financial statements. And if the financial statements are adopted in adjourned AGM, then they shall be filed with registrar within 30 days of date of such a adjourned AGM with relevant fees. Now coming to the one person company, general meeting is not required, right? So 30 days of AGM, what is the general time limit? 30 days of AGM. For one person company, AGM rules and regulations will not apply. So for one person company, the filing of these forms, you know, the time period is 180 days from the closure of financial year. What is the time period, ma? 180 days from the closure of financial year. 
so generally you know 27th september recently you know very recently i filed two one person company annual returns two one person company uh financial statements so that's what you know i remember this date so by 27th september they need to file these forms with uh, roc next one in case company is having subsidiaries then subsidiary information is also sorry then company is also required to file subsidiary information if subsidiary or subsidiary companies have been incorporated outside india and we shall not establish uh, their place of business in india then that financial statements you know our company is required to file it with roc sir with respect to subsidiaries in india this this provision is not applicable why why because they will file copy of financial statements with roc under section 137 see ma tcs is having two subsidiaries one is a limited in india the other one is f limited in foreign so for f limited which is incorporated outside india and which is doing business outside india our companies act provisions will not apply so accordingly f limited is not required to file any annual returns with roc any financial statements with roc a limited indian subsidiary definitely it will file financial statements under section 137 understood so indian subsidiaries not required whereas foreign subsidiaries you know which is not having place of business in india you know with respect to that entity holding company indian holding company has to prepare financial statements and subsidiary financial statements shall be filed with roc agm not held sir agm not held then you know file unadopted financial statements as you know provisional and disclose the details why agm was not conducted what is the reason you know why agm was not conducted disclose the reasons uh, reasons so the moment you conduct annual general meeting you know adopt the financial statements now from the date of annual general meeting file adopted financial statements with roc this time you know permanent financial statements previously provisional right now permanent penalty violation of section 36 136 this penalty sorry violation of section 137 you know this penalty provisions shall apply and last section of accounts of companies you know internal audit internal audit in this entire internal audit section you know this is the important topic ma important you know criteria of applicability of internal audit internal audit is applicable for all listed companies irrespective of paid up share capital irrespective of turnover irrespective of outstanding loans and borrowings so i don't check the limits if you are a listed company internal audit is mandatory coming to the unlisted public companies not private companies unlisted public companies paid up share capital 50 crores or more during the preceding financial year or sir my paid up share capital is just 5 crores sir acha so what is your turnover sir my turnover is 250 crores sir okay internal audit is applicable to you so turnover 2 crores or more during the preceding financial year sir my turnover is just 100 crores sir okay so what is your outstanding loans or borrowings sir my outstanding loans and borrowings is just 110 crores sir okay internal audit is applicable to you so 100 crores or more at any point of time just observe ma ab points you need to check financial year ending date financial year ending date as on 31st march but coming to c point coming to c point at any point of time cd points at any time at any time during the financial year say for suppose on 1st april 2023 my total borrowings is just 50 crores on 31st december 23 it uh, total borrowings increased to 101 crore and 31st march 2024 total borrowings fall into 40 crores now internal audit applicable or not applicable the answer is applicable why because at one point of time you know as on 31st december 2023 your total borrowings exceeds 100 crores that's it internal audit is applicable for the current year so with respect to point c and point d we are not checking as on 31st march of the financial year we will check at any point of time during the financial year Now coming to the private company, you know BC points are applicable. BC, BC. One is you know turnover. The other one is outstanding loans or borrowings from banks or public financial institutions exceeding hundred crore rupees or more at any point of time during the preceding financial year. Next one, generally for external auditors, you know statutory auditors, you know Companies Act will determine the scope of audit. 
coming to the internal audit you know if company is having audit committee audit committee will decide the scope of uh, internal audit if there is no audit committee then you know board of directors will decide the scope of internal audit next who can be an internal auditor you know with respect to company auditor statutory auditor independent person chartered accountant holding certificate of practice but coming to the internal auditor any person can act as an internal auditor he may be a ca or cma or cs whether in a practice or whether in employment it is immaterial even company can appoint a employee company can appoint its employee as an internal auditor there is no problem first of all internal audit function should be there understood so with this provisions related to accounts of companies we completed